What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to the complete, full movie of What If I Was Reborn as Krillin, the strongest Z fighter. On to the synopsis. One day, our protagonist was walking home from work, and unfortunately for him, he was met by Trukuin just a few blocks away from his house. After a talk with God, he reincarnated in the Dragon Ball universe with nothing else besides his scattered knowledge about the anime slash manga. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. I was making my way from my crappy job at the convenience store, it wasn't anything big. I was the cashier while I was also moving stuff from time to time, unloading the merchandise, putting it on the raft, stuff like that. I was only a couple blocks away from my house as I was making my way on the crosswalk, there was no traffic, no cars, nothing. But suddenly out of nowhere a big truck which had an ice cream logo on the side hit me full on. As it drove by my body and sped away, I could feel my life leave my body. I chuckled, nothing important happened to me all my life. I was your average guy with average hobbies, a crappy 9 to 5 job to pay the bills, average grades in school, no girlfriend. All relatives already dead. I wasn't bothered by my unseemingly close death. I just closed my eyes and let nature take its course and take its course it did. The next morning on the news my body was found on the crosswalk, it was painted as a tragedy by the media and forgotten three seconds later. I found myself in a white room. I stood on a brown wood chair. In front of me stood an empty desk with no one behind it. I just waited. I couldn't move nor talk. It was like I was frozen in time, even though I could still perceive everything that was around me. After quite a long time, a man dressed in an all-white suit with a fade haircut and a neatly trimmed beard came in with a pitifully small dossier of papers in his hands. He put on some black rimmed glasses and started to read the papers, ignoring me completely. After what felt like an eternity for me, but in reality was ten minutes or so, he stopped reading, he put his glasses in his suit chest pocket and looked towards me with quite the peculiar gaze. It seemed like it was a combination of pity and what seemed to be also amusement. I could finally start moving as I felt the invisible constraints disappear. I started to stretch a bit and said, Didn't expect purgatory to be like this. The man chuckled and said with amusement tinged into his voice, No questions about who I am? Why are you here? I shook my head and said, It's obvious I still remember my death, so of course I was sent to purgatory to be judged by God. So of course you are God, however. I never thought that God would have such a fresh fade. You must have a really good barber. The man nodded and said, Yes, indeed, I'm God. You had quite the abnormal reaction. Most people would shout and scream after they get unbound by the spirit rope. However, you were quite calm. I like that about you. However, now let's get to business. Also, thank you for noticing my new haircut. I nodded towards his words and asked, So what now? Heaven? Hell? Reincarnation? The man took the small dossier in his hands and said, Not enough sins to be in hell, not enough good deeds for heaven, reincarnation is an option, but I doubt you would like to live the same life on earth anymore. I could spice things up for you since the life you have led up until now was so painfully average. At his words a smile suddenly appeared on my face. No eternal torment that's at least good for me. Heaven would have been a better option, I was pretty done with life anyway. But reincarnation in a different world than normal earth sounded pretty enticing for me, so I bit what he fed me and asked. So do I get to choose where do I get reincarnated or? He immediately denied me. No, you have no good karma. Good deeds get you in heaven. Sins in hell, good karma gives you benefits in reincarnation. Your good karma is zero. You are a blank slate in all regards for all of these things. I nodded towards his words and asked him, So where will you send me then? A cheeky smile appeared on his face after he heard my question and said, Even though gambling isn't quite a big sin, you have indulged yourself quite a bit in it last life. God forgives and forgets, so it wasn't truly added to the list of your sins. It isn't anything major anyway. But it left something on your record that I know about you. So I decided in this situation to give you quite the simple gamble. 
A red card and a blue card appeared one in his left the other in his right. He put them on the desk and said, Choose. I will not disclose the worlds you will go to until you choose one. Quite the annoying thing, I had only one chance at gambling myself into a good world. I didn't read many anime and mangas I knew particularly few well. From what I inquired from his words I guess he will reincarnate me into a world with superpowers, maybe even the DC or Marvel Universe. I quickly stopped thinking. God wasn't rushing me either so I decided to pick the blue card. It was my favorite color in my last life so I just decided to go with it. I turned the card with its face upwards on it, there was an image with a midget with six small holes on his forehead. Three on the left and three on the right. In the middle of his forehead, he wore an orange GI with a blue undershirt. His orange pants were hoisted by a blue belt, and he wore blue shoes with red lining. I recognized the look, it was Krillin from the Dragon Ball franchise by Akira Toriyama. I wasn't the biggest fan of it, I watched the original Dragon Ball, the Dragon Ball Z till the Frieza Saga, Dragon Ball GT, and the whole of Super and quite a few movies here and there when I was a kid and a bit in my teenage years, but I can't say I knew everything about the franchise, I forgot quite a lot about it with time. But I still remembered a bit about the characters, their backstories, and how they ended up, etc. So did Krillin meant I was going in the Dragon Ball universe? That was kinda sweet even though the universe was full of homicidal maniacs who destroyed planets with their pinky finger, and lazy cat gods who would destroy the being of someone making them unrevivable because he didn't get his evening pudding, as long as I played it smart I could avoid dying gruesomely. Or so I thought God started to smile at me and said, Oh congratulations Mr. Krillins and it seems you drew a good option. Let me reveal the other card for you. On the other card, there was a dark bluish haired kid with a hairstyle that from the back looked like ducks behind. He had dark eyes a fair face and wore blue ninja themed clothes with white parts at the cuffs of his shirt and white shorts. He also wore blue ninja sandals. The Naruto universe by Masashi Kishimoto. Also wait what the hell. He called me Krillin. Does that mean the characters on the cards mean I will become that character in the universe? God damn it, I didn't want to become a midget. Well at least I would have a hot wife in the future I guess. But Sasuke was also kind of badass I didn't know a lot after Shippuden because I stopped watching. There was also a Boruto anime that came out. But people said that it was kind of trash. It seemed to follow the kids of Naruto and the gang. Anyways I truly didn't like that I was going to become Krillin but there wasn't much I could do about that. God's smile told me that. He clasped his hands and said for the last time I could hear him in a very long 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 time. Have fun Mr. Krillin, I hope you won't die as many times as the original. I just swallowed back the words that I wanted to say because I couldn't say them my mouth wouldn't move, my body wouldn't as well, I was back to being immobile. I took one last long look at God's face as everything turned to dark. I started thinking about my next life when something suddenly hit me. That damn hairstyle was too fresh, too bad I won't have any hairstyle as Krillin, it would just look dumb on him. I always thought that when he grew out his hair he looked quite bad. It seemed the bald look was the only one he could sport. He did look a bit better with short hair in Super but his best look was still bald. I guess I would just have to rock the bald look from now on. I suddenly started to see light, it seemed my journey finished or so I thought till I got hit on my buttocks and I started crying like the newborn I was. It hurt quite a bit to be spanked on the arse the moment you were born. I was held by the doctor upside down by my left leg before he picked me up properly and handed me towards my mother. She held me in her arms, it seemed she loved me if the expression on her face said anything. She wasn't particularly beautiful, she looked quite average. I looked around the room and I saw my father, it wasn't really hard. Now I see where Krillin inherited his midget genes from. Well, my midget genes now, my father was as tall as I would be when fully grown maybe a bit smaller. He had a clump of black hair on his head and no visible nose. He motioned to my mother and said, Can I hold him, dear? She nodded her head tiredly, it seemed my birth sapped her off quite a lot of energy. I was in my father's arms now, he didn't seem particularly strong. I wonder where did Krillin get his martial arts talent from? Even though in the show he wasn't that strong compared to the whole universe Krillin was quite a powerhouse in the top 20 of the universe not including gods. He was just overshadowed by the science and androids and pink magic beings, and a whole lot of people he wasn't ready for. In my opinion, after Goku got very strong the other Z fighters kinda started to slack off, thinking Goku would always be there to fight invaders, never truly training seriously. Only Piccolo continued to train till Pan's birth happened and after that, he became a babysitter. Unknowingly to me, I was breastfed while I was thinking, I was pretty much done with eating after I came to from my thoughts. 
I was alone with my mother in the hospital room. My father nowhere to be seen. I guess he had a job or something that required his presence. I tried to move my tiny baby hands or legs. It was impossible. They felt like they weighed tons. My bones were also very weak. It seemed human children were born with power levels below zero. Goku was born with a power level of two that meant he was almost half as strong as a normal untrained adult human. Scion physiology was damn broken. While I couldn't train my body, I could train my mind. A clear mind was very useful for martial arts, my soul was of a fully developed adult so I could try to do some mental training. But I wasn't quite sure how to train. I didn't know jack about key or mental training. Maybe I could try to envision something inside my mind like I don't know. A ball or something. I tried to concentrate on the rotund shape of a ball in my head and well nothing happened. I continued like this for a few hours before I grew tired and directly go to sleep. When I woke up I was in a car in the back seat my mother was crying. My father was solemnly sitting on the driver's seat. They fastly driven towards a nearby temple and left me on the steps and sped away in their car. I started to shiver the stone steps were cold. No one was coming so I started doing what normally a baby would do in such a situation. I started crying and shouting. A kindly looking bald old man in a brown monk robe came out of the temple and looked down at me and said, Another young life abandoned at our Oran Temple Sai. Okay young one you are our tenth child this month. Let's take you in. He picked me up from the ground and took me in the temple. He called over a nun to look over me while he got back to praying and meditating. I didn't know much about Buddhism but this temple looked pretty Shaolin to me or whatever they are called. It was a martial art Buddhist temple. The nun had me in her embrace. She suddenly noticed a note on my chest. On it, it read Krillin. She smiled and said, So your name is Krillin, little one. I just giggled as any baby would do. Nothing else I could do right now besides interacting with her. After a while, she fed me with some baby formula and she put me down on a mat down on the ground. It wasn't comfortable but I could kinda endure it. She left me alone to sleep. But I didn't do that I continued my mental training. Focusing on a ball shape in my head. I could feel the ball I could touch it. Smell it but it wasn't there. Was this what they meant by super imagination? Imagination so strong you could hallucinate and even think what you imagine is real. But it wasn't that I could feel my soul strengthening. It seemed mental training enhanced the soul. In my last life I never trained in martial arts thus my soul grew only with age so it wasn't particularly strong. But with the mental training I could do and the Dragon Ball world laws it could strengthen at a fast pace. Maybe I could even get telekinesis like Frisia if I trained hard enough. While training my body and unlocking my key would take a while, training my soul would be done immediately. Even though it drained me quite a bit, I was already quite tired over a few minutes of training. I suddenly closed my eyes and started sleeping. When I woke up the nun was holding me, and she had some baby formula in her hands she started feeding me, and I accepted. Nothing much I could do as a baby, most I did was trying to stay up on my butt on my own and mental training. At first, I would tire and need to sleep after a few minutes of mental training. After a few months, my time of training increased up to 15 to 16 minutes. Also, I was needing less sleep to fully recuperate. I also started to be able to move small things by a few millimeters. I could only push and pull not levitate yet. I could also proudly say I could crawl like a pro and get up on my butt on my own. I was also introduced to other children and babies the temple adopted. There were three baby boys and two older girls. The girls were supposed to take care of us when the nun was busy. The girls were pretty attentive to us the nun taught them well. One was a brown-haired girl with clips in her hair called Lulu, the other was a girl with blonde hair, angular face and green eyes called Karia. The other three boys were called Tu, Zhu, and Pu. They were brothers all three abandoned at the same time, triplets. I didn't care about any of them. There were also older children here and there but they were either getting trained by other monks or meditating. We were too young so we were left to our own devices. I ignored the other children and continued my mental training. Now instead of envisioning a ball I was envisioning a pear. While I also envisioned how I took a bite out of it how I ate it completely and threw its remains in a rubbish bin. It was always good to change the things you envisioned so you wouldn't get bored fast. It also increased the training speed if you would change them regularly as it would stimulate the mind and soul with different images and scenarios. The other children played together ignoring me. The girls left me alone only calling for me when it was time for food. 
My time in the temple was pretty uneventful. I could hardly wait to grow up, start training my body, unlocking my key, flying, shooting beams out of my hands, etc. It will be so cool, I thought to myself, as a kid I would always do the Kamehameha pose, but now in the future, I could truly throw one out. I truly couldn't wait, but time has to go before good things come. So I just continued to train my mental power, ignoring everything else unrelated. I was one year old now, and I could levitate things with my mind for a small amount of time, of course I showed no one about this. This was my little secret. I also didn't want to become famous and get recruited by that master crane. The children started to realize my behavior was odd, but I gave them no mind. They weren't important. Training so I could protect the planet that I live on, and get my hot blonde android wife, those were important things. I had set my priorities straight some months ago and I decided I would only get Android 18 as a partner. Bulma was kinda annoying even though she looked good. 18 was pure wife material. She was good with the kid and very supportive, or so it showed in Dragon Ball Super. She was also kind of playful and top one in the hottest of the Dragon Ball characters. Chi Chi was too bitchy. Bulma was kinda annoying. Launch was Dr. J. Kyle and Mr. Hyde. Basically two personalities in one body, one cute and nice the other angry and not law-abiding. Master Rashi or Tien can keep her. The others would be too young for me later, like Videl or her blonde friend Eresa. 18 was the best choice for me. So the future looked good for me right now. Psychic powers will be useful in the battles that are to come. I could also feel that my key would also get a boost when I unlock it from all my mental training. Maybe I could even get some better training methods from the temple when I grew up enough. It was a martial temple after all they should have a full package of training techniques. Anyways from now on, I could fully focus on my goals as my body and soul integrated into each other after my first year of existence in the Dragon Ball universe. Life will be good for Krillin, no more deaths as well if I could help it. A time comes and goes and I was already five years old. It seemed Krillin wasn't born with those six dots on his forehead. I realized this when I looked into a mirror the nun had for some reasons I am not sure of. I looked like a normal kid albeit without a visible nose, and just a bit shorter than normal kids. I wore a yellow monk robe on my body and little shoes made from bamboo. The male children wore the same things that I did, albeit in different colors, the females wore big and long gowns that covered their whole bodies showing only their faces. It was finally time for the physical training of the temple. Every child could start as early as five years old. My training in the mental department gave me quite the big boost already. I could move things on for hours, I could even lift other children while they were asleep, but they weren't really heavy since we didn't eat very much at the temple, everyone weighted at a maximum of 20 or so kilograms. I didn't feel strained at all though, it seemed my upper limit wasn't there yet. I could also feel my key was ready to be unlocked. Right now with the help of the training techniques of the temple I could unlock and temper my key. The old man who took me into the temple came in front of us. We were in the temple's garden, the official training ground of the children. He had an amiable smile on his face. He was looking a bit more wrinkled than before as five years had gone since I came to the temple. He started his instructions. There are two training techniques our Oran temple practices, one for body and one for mind. Everyone who joined the temple will learn them before they decide if they want to continue staying or leave for better lifestyle. We do not impose any rules on those who trained in our techniques besides not killing haphazardly and doing evil. The children listened quietly. They didn't truly know what evil was, so they just waited for the training instructions. The old man started to do some special poses like in yoga and started to explain to us, this is the body training technique, it's made so you can be flexible and also strong at the same time. While you do the poses your muscles start to grind against each other strengthening themselves while not increasing much in mass, this training technique is made to achieve a balanced physique. All in all 30 poses would train all the groups of muscles each pose is training more than one group. This is the only training you will do physically since you are still young. We can't have you train your bones yet as they are still quite frail. You can start training them once you reach 8 years old after you turn 11 you can also leave the temple if you all wish so. The children quietly continued listening some of them looked at each other when they heard about leaving. It seemed not everyone liked the living conditions here. The old man sat cross-legged before us and started another explanation. As for the mental training, I will impart all of you our special chant that will strengthen your mind and wills. There's also a breathing technique, just watch me and copy. He started to say the chant out loud and he breathed in and out in a peculiar method. 
This was great. With my prior mental training, I could combine the simple physical training with my mental training to get double the training speed. After he made sure everyone understood what to do, he left and called one of the older middle-aged monks to supervise us to make sure we didn't injure ourselves during the training. I started to do the poses the old man did perfectly combine my strong soul after five whole years of training I could flawlessly remember everything I saw by only looking at it once. As I started doing the poses while reciting the chant and breathing in and out I could feel the strengthening of my soul and muscles at the same time. My muscles hurt quite a bit as I didn't truly train my body up till now as my body was too weak and I feared that I would get some hidden damage that would impend my growth. But the pain didn't last too long but I felt sore all over after two training rounds of the 30 poses. I could feel my muscles grow a bit and my soul was also strengthened quite a bit it seemed the mental training technique was way better than envisioning stuff it was faster and more effective, while it also didn't put such a strain on my soul, but I could attribute that to my soul's already huge strength after 5 years of tempering. After I rested a bit I continued with the poses I could feel a heat spreading through my body, it seemed my key was gonna unlock right now, I could feel it spread through my body nourishing it strengthening it it seemed key had great benefits towards the body, besides being able to fly shoot beams and do unnatural feats, it strengthened the body to a certain degree passively. If combined with conscious strengthening which was temporary as long as key remained, you could even punch a planet into dust with your physical body alone. As I felt the changes going through my body searing pain started to go through my forehead. Immediately six dots appeared on it and they started to bleed. The middle-aged monk was surprised as he hurriedly made his way towards me. He inspected me but he didn't see anything wrong with me beside the holes on my forehead. He took me to the resting area and cleaned my forehead off blood, and then took me to the old man. The old man was surprised to see the holes on my forehead and exclaimed with a surprised tone in his voice. This little's one talent is pretty high being able to unlock the six dots of serenity after only one training session. He has a bright future ahead of him. I asked him what he was talking about in a childlike oblivious voice and he started to explain to me. The six dots of serenity are unlocked by our Orin's Temple special training technique, but it takes a huge amount of time to unlock them, and only extremely talented people are known for unlocking them. There has been only one other known person that unlocked these dots and he was our founder. I nodded my head and I was excused. The old man only knew that the dots indicated talent and not what they truly did. But I felt they were truly quite special. I was excused for the rest of the day so I made my way towards the sleeping quarters. I could feel that the dots on my forehead weren't so simple. So I sent some key towards them, one dot started shining and I could feel my whole key from my body going berserk, it was like I was twice as strong as before, I tried to activate another and my body key went another upgrade to four times as much but the consumption increased exponentially and I had to stop. It seemed every time one dot activated I would get double my power level so technically I could get 64x my power level, the consumption of key was quite high, but I guess as my key grew and I constantly trained in this special state I could make the consumption negligible or almost go away for full. Just like how Goku trained to be able to keep his Super Saiyan state on for longer periods in the hyperbolic time chamber. Now I had a technique that could make me keep up with the Saiyan's transformation well at least Super Saiyan 1. Maybe I could put the Kaioken over this state and maybe the full power technique of Rashi's to reach even greater heights of power. I wonder why Krillin couldn't use these dots to multiply his power in the anime slash manga. Maybe he never truly learned how. Or I could do it because my soul was way stronger than his at the moment. It was a complete mystery. But it didn't matter I could feel the key through my whole body and I could surmise a bit of how strong I was. I couldn't sense key externally yet but I could assess myself. I was pretty strong for a 5 year old. I could say that my power level was almost 30 maybe 27 to 28. This was all only from my mental training over the years. I was almost half as strong as Goku was when he started his journey. For the plans of the future tough. I didn't want to remain a midget, and the first wish they would use with the Dragon Balls was quite a waste, so I decided when I turn 11, it was almost the same time when Goku would start his search for Dragon Balls. Goku started to train with Rashi one year later, so I would meet with Goku earlier and while they would be captured by Pilaf I would take the wish to wish that in the future I would grow at least as tall as my mother. She was of average height and I didn't want to become a giant. The full power technique from Rashi would also increase my height somewhat so it was something as well too. For now, I will have to continue training using the poses and chant and breathing techniques of the Oran Temple. I couldn't wait as I was practically giddy with excitement at the thought of meeting Goku, the main character of the Dragon Ball franchise. He was one of my favorite characters excluding Piccolo and Gohan. But I still had to wait quite some time, 6 years, but with those 6 years I could increase my power level by quite a lot, maybe even reach 200 power level or so. 
By the time Raditz came maybe I would be as strong as Vegeta, let's not even take into account my multiplier technique. Life would be good for me as Krillin, adventure and friendship were waiting for me, right around the corner. Even love. I could already imagine my bald head smothered between 18's big breasts. I was already 10 years old time was going by so fast. One more year and I would start my journey for the Dragon Balls, along with Goku and Bulma. It will be fun. I was in the training room of the temple I was promoted from the garden two years ago when they saw how strong I was. It was at the time when they started teaching us how to strengthen our bones. We had to hit an iron sandboxing bag quite a few times to strengthen our knuckles. Humans didn't have many training techniques to train the other type of bones though, but I knew one training that would help, gravity training but it was too early for that I was still a bit quiet young. Plus there was no gravity chamber to train in. My mental training also came along quite nicely. I could lift giant stones with my mind and I could keep them up for hours with no strain. I also started being able to read minds and memories. My psychic power was so high right now that it almost tangible it was also quite heavy. I tried to feel it by pushing it on myself. This gave me an idea I could pressure myself with my mental force field to make my training harder. It was a type of gravity training and resistance training at the same time. It would also strengthen my mind and soul. My key was also purer and more controlled. I could say that my power level was among the highest on the planet, maybe at 100 plus. I was stronger than Goku when he will start his journey, maybe by two times. My training speed was quite fast, but compared to a science, it was still lacking very much. But for a human, I was pretty much considered a genius that came by a few million years. Humans weren't particularly talented at martial arts. That's how they were built. The human Z fighters were true prodigies, even among the universe. I'm not sure how all of them were born on Earth. As seen in the Tournament of Power, most of the fighters came from the Earth, Goku excluded. Maybe this planet had a destiny about it or something I wasn't sure. The gravity training was exceptionally good at tempering all of my bones. All the weight put on my body combined with the special poses from the temple gave me double the training efficiency. I could feel my ki and body grow stronger every day. I also sparred with the adult monks of the temple even the old man. I needed some fighting experience after all, I was strong but I had no experience as in my last life I never went into a true fight, I didn't use my full power and I got my butt kicked for a few days before things started to take motion. I learned extremely fast, by the first month none of the adults was my match in the technique, I even gave the old man a hard time, by the second month of sparring no one could fight me at all. They were all pretty strong and quite experienced most of them had a power level between 10 and 25, the old man had a power level of 30. When he was younger it might have been even higher, maybe even 40 or so. But in his old age, his power level started to go down and decline quite heavily. I also started to try to shoot key blasts and fly. It wasn't very hard, my key control was extremely good because my soul was also extremely strong. I now also could turn on two of my dots on my forehead that meant four times my power level. I could keep it up for 20 minutes at most before I was truly spent. Also, I tried to pry in the secret of key weapons and key shaping, the only thing I liked about Goku Black was his rose aura and his damn key sword and scythe. They were so damn cool. So I tried to get my key sword, I failed miserably even though my key control was good, my key wasn't strong enough to become shaped yet. Maybe if I had a power level of 500 or above without the use of my multiplier technique, I could try again to create a key sword or scythe or a weapon. I could even do mini Kamehameha's they weren't strong, and they weren't truly the Kamehameha they were beams. I didn't truly know the steps behind the Kamehameha fully to truly use it. Maybe if I saw Rashi do it I might be able to copy it. I even forewent sleep to train more instead of sleeping I would enter my special mindscape to spar with myself. It was a special type of training I saw Gohan and Krillin do in the anime. I think it was a filler episode before the fake Namek arc. My mind truly didn't need rest anymore as it was extremely strong. Only my body still did and it would still do in the future it was a mortal body after all. I guess only after I gained God Key I wouldn't particularly need sleep anymore, Wis never. Slept and Beerus only slept because he was lazy, I think food wasn't needed anymore either when you had genuine God Key and a God position, Wis and Beerus enjoyed the food, but I don't think they were hungry since Beerus could go thousands of years without food only sleeping, Wis too. Goku and Vegeta still needed food because they were science, and they didn't have a godly position in Universe 7, also I would never imagine Goku or Vegeta ever stopping from eating food, they liked it way too much. All of the children from the temple avoided me. I was a freak in their minds. I was too strong I even beat all the adults and even the old man which he was the head monk of the temple. It was almost time for me to leave. There was nothing I could get from the temple anymore I got whatever belongings I had and packed them up. It was still not time to go to Mount Paozu. There were still five months left. But there was nothing to do at the temple anymore. 
I left after giving my goodbyes to the old man. The monks and the nun who took care of me when I was little, they didn't stop me. They knew I was extremely strong. They weren't worried and they respected my wish to leave the temple. I was wandering around the city, it was West City. I never left the temple during my training period so I didn't know in which city I was. I bought a map with my meager savings and looked for Mount Paozu. It was quite a distance from West City. It would take me at least 10 days by flight. I could rudimentary sense Ki now so all I had to do is avoid Goku till Bulma came and train on the mountain. I nodded my head everything will be easy peasy for me I was already so strong nothing could go wrong. But before I left the city I got some special magazines I needed them for Master Rashi later and I didn't want to have to go back to the city and waste my time to get them. I kept them in my satchel along with the clothes that I got from the temple and some Jenny. I started flying and I made my way towards Mount Paozu. It was so good to fly I felt the wind brushing against my face it was calming and peaceful. I didn't fly particularly fast I was enjoying the sensation. My blackish aura encased me as I flew. Sometimes I would land to rest or get something to eat from a nearby village that was en route. After 10 days of flight, I arrived at Mount Paozu and there were only a few more months before Bulma was supposed to make her entrance. It was simple to live on the mountain I could also feel Goku's key since he couldn't mask it and he was the strongest being on the mountain. I lived off fruits and animals I also intensified my training here since no one could peek on me here. I could endure basically what was two times Earth's gravity right now. I could intensify the gravity up to a maximum of ten times with my mind. It would increase with time and more training. Months when I could finally feel the presence of someone else making their way towards the mountain at a relatively high speed. It was Bulma. Time for the original Dragon Ball adventure to start. It will be a load of fun for me since I always dreamt of touring the world since I couldn't do it on the normal Earth. I could do it in the Dragon Ball Earth and also gather special balls that could give me one wish yearly. I could feel Bulma's key getting nearer and nearer to Goku's it was time to make my entrance. I flew nearby the road and observed how Bulma crashed into Goku with her motorcycle, that was my cue to go in. I descended and made my way towards them and said, Are you guys okay there? Bulma looked annoyed when she saw it was only another kid. Goku was protecting his fish it seemed he just came back from fishing. Goku frowned and said while pointing towards Bulma with his red power pole. I'm okay. But this monster tried to eat me and my fish. Bulma replied angrily towards Goku. It's not my fault you suddenly appeared in front of me. I do not want your fish. Also I'm not a monster I'm a delicate girl. Goku put his guard down when he heard she was a girl and said. Oh you are a girl. Grandpa said to be good to girls. Bulma smirked and said. It seems your grandpa is a smart man. Goku replied with a sad look on his face. Yeah. Grandpa was pretty smart. When Bulma heard the word was she immediately tried to console Goku by saying, I'm sorry I didn't know your grandfather passed away. Goku just shrugged all the sadness away and I interjected into their conversation by saying, Well, I was training nearby when I heard crashing sounds coming from here. What's up with you guys? Bulma seemed annoyed at my question but she still answered by getting out a radar with green glass that had some glowing orbs showcasing on the screen. I found this dragon ball back home and I read about it that if you collect all seven of them, you can get one wish from an almighty dragon called Shinron. I nodded towards her explanation and asked a question I already had the answer to. What are you going to wish for? Hearts appeared in her eyes and she blushed before saying, I wish for a perfect boyfriend. I sweat dropped, I didn't know how it was physically possible to get hearts in your eyes. I shook my head left and right and said, That's quite a waste of a wish in my opinion. Bulma immediately got angry but stopped and looked towards Goku seemingly remembering about something and said while showing him an orange rotund ball with two stars on it. Do you have a ball like this one? Goku nodded his head and said, It was Grandpa's he found it in the mountains. Bulma grinned and said, Could you show me it? Goku looked towards Bulma with suspicion in his eyes, it seemed he didn't want to give Bulma his ball but nodded reluctantly while saying, Well, Grandpa said to be good to girls, so I can't say no. I looked at the iconic Dragon Ball scene unfolding before interrupting it by saying, Can I come as well? These Dragon Balls sound interesting. Bulma was ready to refuse but Goku agreed. I followed them towards Goku's home, it was pitifully small on a pillow on a pedestal was the four-star Dragon Ball inside the house. Bulma got near it and started cheering. She was ready to take the ball in her pouch, but Goku used his power pole to defend it and said, Even though you are a girl, you can't have Grandpa's treasure. 
Alma suddenly started to lift her pink skirt and said, If you give me the Dragon Ball, it will be worth your time. Goku said with a puzzled look on his face. Why would I want to touch your dirty butt? Alma started fuming her whole face becoming red like a tomato and she asked in an angry tone of voice. Who has a dirty butt you brat? Goku nonchalantly replied with you. Bulma was ballistic, but she knew she could do nothing to Goku before me intervening into their conversation. She already crashed into him with her motorcycle and tried to shoot him with a machine gun. Ended just like in the anime. Bulma started to explain to him that she wouldn't take the ball forever and after she had her wish she would give it back to him. Goku didn't bite it and said that he wanted to journey together with her to make sure he got his ball back. I suddenly made myself more noticeable and said, since you are going to a worldwide adventure, can I join you guys? Alma was ready to reject me as she didn't like me for some reason, but Goku responded in her place. Yeah, sure. You can come, you seem strong. What's your name? I responded with a smile on my face. I'm Krillin. What about you too? Alma looked towards the side pouting. She didn't like how Goku ignored her opinion and said. Alma, Goku smiled and said. I'm son Goku. When we met you said you were training around here. I want to fight you. I chuckled his scion instincts were already in full flare. Even though he couldn't sense ki at all, he could feel my strength. I nodded and I got into a normal fighting pose learned from the temple and motioned towards him with my hand and said, You can come anytime Goku. Goku didn't wait even a few seconds he ran towards me with quite the high speed but I could see him easily. Bulma was flustered Goku was near her and she fell on her but due to how fast Goku ran towards me. I sidestepped his punch and gave him a key infused punch to the gut. It was a one hit KO, well not KO as I didn't make him unconscious. His two hands on his belly Goku got up and said, You are strong I don't think I can beat you. Bulma's jaw hit the floor if Goku was so abnormal she wondered how strong was I when I one shot him. A smile appeared on her face with two bodyguards like me and Goku she thought that the dragon balls were already in her hands. She tried to take the fourth star ball but Goku stopped her again and said that he would carry the ball the whole journey and no one else can touch it. Bulma agreed she couldn't do anything about it anyways. We made our way back to the road and Bulma popped open a capsule. The thing her family was famous for. And a motorcycle with two seats appeared. She looked towards me with a fake pity look and said, Unfortunately Goku destroyed my other motorcycle and this is the last one I have. It seems you can't join us in our journey. I smiled and started levitating Bulma's jaw hit the ground again and Goku looked amazed at my feet of flying. Goku immediately asked me how I did it and I said he would learn it by himself when he got stronger. He just took it as the truth and nodded his head. Bulma picked her jaw from the floor and got up on the motorcycle motioning for Goku to do the same. Goku imitated her and got on the motorcycle she started it suddenly and started to speed up in a few seconds she was already over the hill. A smile appeared on her face as she thought she outsmarted me but an ahem from above her immediately awoke her. She looked up and just continued to drive normally. I guess she finally gave up to get rid of me, huh? After a few hours of traveling, we stopped in a plane and Bulma opened another capsule that contained a house. Goku freaked out and asked if she was a witch forgetting how she did the same thing with the motorcycle. Bulma started to explain to Goku how the capsules worked but after the third try she gave up. I made my way inside the house. It was fully furnished with beds, kitchen and bathroom. Bulma took Goku to take a bath and I fixed myself a quick meal in the kitchen. Goku got out of the bathroom looking fresh and 20 minutes later Bulma came out too. I also took a bath and we all gone to sleep after. Well they did I continued to train in my mindscape so it wasn't considered sleep. The next day I was awoken by the scream of Goku on how Bulma lost her balls I chuckled. Bulma immediately got up from the bed and ignored my chuckle getting her hands on the dragon balls and said, It's okay Goku it must have been a nightmare the balls are alright. Goku just shook his head and didn't say anything. After a few hours we met a sea turtle by the name of shockingly, Turtle. We gave him some salt water despite Bulma's protests and he asked us to take him to the ocean. We agreed again despite Bulma's protests at the mention of it. Master Rashi was just around the corner and the third Dragon Ball as well. Before we could start our journey to the ocean, a giant humanoid bear appeared before us and told us he followed the turtle to us and that he wanted to eat it. Goku didn't want to give him the turtle thus he attacked. He easily fell after Goku gave him a punch between the eyebrows and died instantly. Bulma was scared even more of Goku now seeing how he instantly killed the bear. I just nodded my head. Goku was very strong and his potential was extremely great. 
Even though he was born with a power level of only two, he could train and get stronger extremely faster compared to the other scions. Take in comparison his mother who only had a power level below 1000 and she lived on planet Vegeta her whole life. Goku trained on 10 times normal gravity for below a year and got a power. Level of 8000 which was considered middle to elite class. Not all scions were talented but they were more predestined to getting stronger and fighting compared to humans. But there were also humans with more talent at fighting than scions but in general scions were stronger. As I mused about the differences between the races Goku already started to cook up the giant bear to eat it. He even asked me if I wanted some, but I just turned him down. I wasn't an eating machine even though martial artists have higher metabolism they still ate just two times or more compared to a normal human Goku ate a hundred times or more. After Goku got his fill we started our journey towards the ocean. We enjoyed the scenery while traveling. It was pretty relaxing and fun to travel the world. Goku also enjoyed it form down on the motorcycle. We arrived at the ocean and I could say it was quite beautiful, sparkling clean water. The boundlessness of the blue beauty was quite breathtaking. The turtle thanked us from saving him from the bear and getting him to the ocean. And he said he would inform his master about us so he would reward us. It took quite a while for the turtle to go and come back. But when he did a bald old man with a beard and sunglasses came. He wore a tropical orange shirt with palm trees on it and white shorts. He also had a walking cane in his left hand and he wore a purple turtle shell on his back. He came forward getting off the turtle and started blushing when he noticed Bulma. Bulma looked away with a disgusted look on her face, but when she noticed the dragon ball dangling on his neck she immediately said, Old man because we saved your turtle you should give us the necklace that you are wearing. The old man scoffed and said, I heard about how you didn't want to help turtle, so I won't give you anything. Only these two boys helped, so I will only give them gifts. He looked towards me and Goku and said, I can give you eternal youth, just wait a bit. He did a pose and shouted something about a phoenix. But the turtle reminded him that the phoenix died of food poisoning. He sweat dropped and shouted, Flying Nimbus. A yellow cloud made his way towards us and the old man continued by saying, This is the flying Nimbus, only those of pure heart can ride it, try it. Goku easily got on the Nimbus, I also tried to ride it but I just fell right through it. Bulma stuck her tongue out at me and said, It seems you aren't of pure heart like a maiden like myself. She tried to get on the Nimbus only to fall on her but She became red like a tomato and didn't say anything. Master Rashi started to caress his beard. Goku could use the Nimbus but I couldn't he truly didn't know what to give me but I gave him an idea. I know who you are old man, you are the turtle hermit, right? I would like to train under you after I finish my journey around the world with my companions. How about that as a reward? Rashi nodded his head, it was simple for him to take me in as a student when Goku heard about it. His eyes suddenly enlarged and he said that he also wanted to become his student. Rashi agreed as he didn't find any trouble with that. He could feel Ki and he could tell we were both strong. I lowered my Ki a bit so he wouldn't be suspicious of me. Bulma persuaded Rashi and she finally got her hands on the Dragon Ball at the price of her showing her whole body to Rashi. We left a knocked out old man with a severely bleeding nose on the beach and made our way towards the next destination on the radar. It was a small village with a few houses, no one was around the place was pretty deserted. Goku made his way inside one of the houses and he was hit on the head with a big axe. It shattered on contact with his head but he still nursed the wound and he seemed pretty annoyed. But the man who hit him quickly excused himself by saying that he thought he was the demon Alung who came for his daughter. All of the people made their way out of their houses and started to explain about their predicament. Bulma asked about the Dragon Ball and an old woman from the crowd said that she had one and that it was her family's heirloom and she couldn't part with it unless we beat Alung and we got all the girls he kidnapped back. It was easy peasy. A big red humanoid with horns made his way inside the village. It was Oolong before he could do anything I karate chopped him on the neck and he transformed back into a pig who wore a green military uniform. The villagers immediately started rioting realizing they got scammed by the pig. When the pig came up to and he saw he was tied to a tree he immediately tried to transform and escape but I just slapped him a few times. He realized how strong I was and gave up. He immediately did as he was instructed by the villagers. We made our way towards his mansion there we found the girls sunbathing and drinking cocktails. Alung was happy that we came to take them. All they did every day was complain and take his money. We kidnapped Alung and made our for the next Dragon Balls, but something was strange they disappeared and appeared randomly. We couldn't truly pinpoint their exact location as they were sometimes moving as well. We made our way towards the desert that was the general location the Dragon Ball resided in. We were in a boat which Bulma was driving, Oolong tried to escape again, 
But Bulma fed him a special kind of laxative which when triggered by her words made him come back so fast we didn't truly see if he left at all. We now were in the desert in a special capsule motor home, and we were eyed by a certain sand bandit. He made his way towards us with his hovering vehicle and said in a domineering fashion, Get out of the motor house and hand over all your capsules and Zenny you are robbed right now by the great bandit of the desert Yamchir. A little hovering blue cat was standing besides Yamcha and said in a low voice, That's right the great Yamcha will rob all of you. I let Goku deal with him. Now he wasn't hungry and he easily beat Yamcha in the ground like the scrub he was. Yamcha ran away with his tail between his legs, especially after he saw Bulma. He had that, I see a girl I'm getting flustered and weaker. We made our way through the desert unknowingly for my other companions Yamcha was following us. He didn't know about the dragon balls this time as he got beaten and he couldn't eavesdrop so I wasn't sure why he was following us. We made our way towards a nearby town to restock on gasoline and food. We were met a special type of guys. They wore militaristic uniforms and bunny ears on top of their heads. They tried to rob us, they got there but kicked instead. They came back with a rabid human looking guy. He tried to use his powers on Bulma but I just kicked him in the chin he was down like a baby. Nothing he could do. After that I made Goku use his power pole to extend it till he reached the moon and leave the weird trio there. We have almost gathered all of the Dragon Balls, my wish was near. Now I just had to let Pilaf capture them. While I was away then knock out the Pilaf gang and use the Dragon Balls for my own. Easy plan, with an easy execution. Everything was ready for my wish now it was only a little bit of time and traveling till we could get near the Pilaf gang's castle so they could attack us. We were in the motor house as we traveled the arid desert, Goku was panting his tongue hanging outside his mouth, Oolong was doing the same, I was taking in the heat as a form of training and Bulma was drinking a cool glass of juice. Oolong was giving Bulma the stink eye while Goku was licking his lips he was thirsty. Bulma motioned with her hand towards the glass of juice before downing it thoroughly before their eyes. Oolong was almost ready to go berserk and Goku seemed sad. His tail was twitching. The Dragon Ball radar suddenly started bleeping three dots nearing our four on the green glass screen. It was the Pilaf gang. They took the opportunity of Goku being weakened by the heat to steal the Dragon Balls I didn't interfere as I needed them to do that. They immediately ran away with their special robot suits, we followed them using the Dragon Ball radar and we arrived at a giant castle with a mushroom-like roof. Yamcha was right behind us as he followed us in, the castle was a maze, and we somehow met face to face. Yamcha was flustered when he saw Bulma again but Bulma was drooling when she took a better glance at him. She liked his bad boy look and his wild mane of hair. Yamcha didn't know what to do or what to say so he just ignored Bulma. This made Bulma want him even more. It was the bad boy situation. I sweat dropped at Bulma's antics she really could fall very easily for a pretty face this early. Suddenly we were trapped inside a cube-like room and a blue midget who wore a colored hat. A woman who wore a military uniform and had long hair and a dog who wore a ninja outfit appeared on the screen. The midget started to laugh out loud and said, You got captured by the greats Palafsama special room. There's no chance for you to get your Dragon Balls back and impend my plan of world domination, ha ha ha. The midget seemed pretty lively, but he started to gawk when he saw Goku make a small hole in the wall. He immediately pressed a button to release a stream of green gas out of the walls. They were all out like a light. Well besides me, my mental training was not for nothing and my body was almost very strong and encased in invisible key thus the gas couldn't get to me. But I still faked fainting to make Palaf think he got everyone down. When the monitor disappeared I got up the ground and made my way towards the nearby wall. A key infused punch immediately made a hole big enough for me to get out by myself. I let the guys sleep there, it was my time to shine now, with my key sense I found the Palaf gang reading some books about how to summon the dragon. It seemed that's why in the anime it took them so much to summon it, they didn't know how. I knocked all of them down easily they couldn't even put up a fight, the girl tried to shoot me and the dog tried to cleave me with his sword. Both gone down very easily. Let's not even talk about Palaf while he was pretty smart, and he could even help Bulma fix the time machine in the future. Strength will be never his forte. I got the dragon balls and made my way outside. It was time for one of my many wishes to come from this green dragon. I put them all on the ground and said the simple words that were needed to summon the almighty dragon who could give you a plethora of wishes. Arise, shun Ron and grant me my wish. A long tail started to come out of the dragon balls as it made its way out a long green Chinese style dragon appeared in the sky. The sky also turned black as if it was night when Shunron made his debut. He asked in a booming voice, Who has summoned me the almighty Shunron? I can grant you one wish. I immediately started to formulate my wish in my head before saying, 
I wish that in the future I would grow to at least the height of 1 meter and 79 centimeters, but make it so it doesn't look awkward or forced, make it look like I grew naturally and that was the original height that I could reach. The dragon's eyes glowed and he said in a booming voice before disappearing, Easy wish, it's granted. The dragon balls took the sky and they were ready to leave, but I jumped up and took the four-star dragon ball before it could leave. Goku still needed his dragon ball or he would get grumpy. I decided to wake them all up so Goku wouldn't transform into an Oozuru and get his tail cut. Also I didn't want to fight him. His power level would be almost 700 in that form and I couldn't light up my third dot properly yet for an increase of 8 times my power level. Even though my power level now reached 150 or so he also increased from 54 to almost 76. It was a hasty estimate as I wasn't a scouter it could be lower or higher for all I know. I just estimated my power compared to a normal human and I was 150 times stronger than one. I walked back into the castle with a petrified dragon ball in hand and woke them all up. They were all groggy but when they saw me with the rock looking dragon ball in hand and the big hole in the wall they all started to question me on what happened. I, of course, lied saying that I got up by luck because a random rock from the ceiling hit me over the head making me awaken when I suddenly saw that the sky go dark and the imposing dragon outside I hastily made my way outside before Palaf could make his wish knocked him up with his cronies and made another wish instead. When they asked me for what I wished I just told them it was a secret. I also handed the four-star ball to Goku and explained how it became like that. Goku naturally cherished the dragon ball as it was his last remaining memory of his dead grandpa and he put it in his GI's chest pocket keeping it safe. Bulma was fuming and glaring at me saying that I wasted the wish but I just nonchalantly said that her wish would have been even more of waste. She was so angry flames were basically getting out of her head but I just ignored her. While we made our way back to Mount Pauzu, we found a goddamn whole mountain on fire. It was the Ox Mountain, the property of Ox King. I remembered now one of the Dragon Balls was supposed to be taken from here in the anime. But the Palaf gang already had all three, I wonder how they got them. Ox attacked us thinking we were burglars that came to take his riches, but after explaining that we couldn't take his riches, even if we wanted to, he calmed down. Then he started to explain how he sent his daughter Chi Chi for the mystical Bansho fan which Master Rashi had. Unfortunately, she still didn't make her way back with it. Goku gave himself up to help. So he made his way out with the Nimbus and returned with Shishi after a long while. Master Rashi in tow as well. Master Rashi berated Ox King. Ox King being one of his few disciples. Gohan being the other. Goku also informed Rashi of this and both Ox King and Rashi asked how he was. Goku said sadly that he passed away quite some time ago. A somber air enveloped the men who knew him. Master Rashi came up empty-handed though as he wasn't sure where he left the Bansho fan. So he just scratched his beard and after a while said, While there's no Bansho fan, I can put the fire out with my special technique, the Kamehameha wave. Ox King nodded and Master Rashi immediately buffed up from his scrawny old man look. He now looked like an old man who hit the gym all his life and maybe even took a bit of steroids. He started chanting as he cupped his hands together. This was the time for me to learn the Kamehameha wave as well. I widened my eyes to thoroughly study the way Rashi used his key to create the wave. He firstly cupped his hands and put them on the left side of his body as key started to rotate into his hands. The key immediately started to gather up and he started to rotate it. Even more, the centrifugal force in his hands was extremely strong. Ka. Mi. Ha. Mi. Haya, he shouted as he put his hands forward and blasted the fire and mountain into smithereens. Everyone's jaws were on the floor Yamcha muttered something about strong old men. Goku immediately copied the Kamehameha wave by making a smaller weaker version of it which dented a nearby red car. I also copied it but my Kamehameha wave was way bigger and stronger than Goku's. I could even make it as strong as Rashi's but I decided it wouldn't be good to surprise the master too much. Master Rashi's jaw hit the floor after that how he saw both of us being able to use the technique he wasted 50 years on being used after a few minutes of observation by two brats that weren't even 14 yet. Master Rashi immediately picked his jaw up from the ground and coughed while saying with a proud look on his face. These two are some of my brightest disciples. I pointed out how we didn't train with him yet and he deflated like a balloon losing face in front of his former student. After that we were going for our different routes, Master Rashi and Goku were gone for the training and Bulma and Yamcha made their way to East City where Bulma lived. We all made our goodbyes to each other. Goku still got captured by Chi Chi as he left for quite some time before he came back to us to get back to Rashi's island. Rashi opened a capsule and out of it came a yellow plane with the CC logo on it. 
We all embarked it and he drove it towards his island. The flight was pretty slow and relaxing. Immediately that we landed, he said, Even though I accepted you as my disciples, I still need you to do one task before I can truly start training you. As he said that a blush immediately got to his cheeks and blood started to spill out of his nose as he continued. I need you to find me a pretty girl and get her to live here. Well, it seemed we still had to get launch. Poor girl, I even wonder what was her true backstory? She was forgotten so hard by Toriyama that we never saw her character get more depth besides having a double personality and being of somewhat comic relief. Whatever it was time to get her to this perverted old man's house so he could start to give us his training techniques, I didn't think that the anime showed everything there must be some breathing technique of the turtle school besides the Kamehameha. He could also teach me his buffed up state that I dubbed as the full power technique. I could stack it upon my six dots and get an even higher increase in my power level. Yes, the training and the Budokai Tenkechi were just around the corner, I could smell them. Also I had some more wishes that I wanted to Shinran to grant. Even though being tall was great, I already had some other things in mind. Eternal youth was only one thing that I wanted. Others were still on my mind. Thinking about their feasibility if this dragon could grant them. Well, there was still one year before I could use the Dragon Balls, so there was still quite a lot of time. Time which I could use by training as hard as I could under Master Rashi's tutelage. We used Goku's flying Nimbus to look around for a girl, and as fate decreed it we found Blonde Launch being followed by some cops we swooped in, and took her on the cloud leaving the surprised and befuddled cops behind. She at first tried to resist but she sneezed and turned blue-haired. She asked us some questions and we answered that as best as we could. We got back to Rashi's island with Launch in tow. Rashi immediately started whistling when he saw Launch but she sneezed and turned blonde and aggressive before sneezing again and turning back to docile. Rashi sweat dropped but accepted her nonetheless. At least he had a living woman he could look at instead of his dirty magazines and his workout show. Rashi coughed a bit and started to explain how he would train us. I already knew about all of that, he also informed me and Goku about the Budokai Tenkechi tournament and how he would like us to enroll in it, in reality he would enroll too and try to beat us, so we would think there are better people out there than us and make us never stop training and lose our passion. Rashi took his house in a capsule and took us to a different island, a populated one which was pretty big. His first test for us was like in the anime to find the inscribed Rocky throughout. I easily got it and made my way back with it. Goku tried to fight me for it when I found it but I beat him. It was a bit harder than before as he grew stronger but I didn't exert myself too much against him. Rashi nodded his head towards me and for that day we were done. We ate the food blue haired launch prepared for us and well Goku ate almost everything and we could only eat a little bit. Even though we were martial artists that needed a higher calorie intake. Unlike Goku we were humans and our bodies didn't need such a high intake of food we ate more than the normal human eyes but Goku ate more than hundreds of humans combined. I was flabbergasted at the sight that was in front of me I never thought someone could inhale food at such fast speeds. It looked comically in the anime but now that I had seen it with my own eyes it was pretty horrifying. Launch just smiled and nodded at Goku she even wanted to give him seconds. Saying that she cooked enough. I don't know how could this woman cook such high amounts of food she was almost equal to Chi Chi in cooking. After the feast and a night sleep Rashi tested us on our speed telling us about the limits of the human body. Goku neared the limits by a few milliseconds while I broke them easily. Rashi's jaw was on the floor, not even he was that fast. After that he also did an example and he was a bit faster than Goku. Unlike in the anime after this he imparted to both of us a special breathing technique and a mantra specialized from the turtle school. I could immediately say that it was way way more effective than Oren's temple one. It put it to shame it was like the difference between the sky and earth. I could feel my key around my body it ran way smoother than before like a calm ocean. But it could also transform into a storm of ki at only a thought. The mantra also increased my mind cultivation speed. But for Goku it just made his ki grow faster. Unlike me he didn't unlock his mental strength from a young age and he will unlock it later on Namek. As seen in the anime where he reads Krillin's mind. After he imparted us his techniques fully. He started to tell us in detail how the training from now on would go. This is the special turtle school training for the body and mind while we will also make the money to feed us with it. He started to explain how we will deliver milk, help at construction work, dodge bees he will throw at us and swim in shark infested waters. And so we started with the milk delivery first, it was easy peasy for me, my training from before already made my body quite strong and my mind was really firm. Goku was having a harder time than me but not by a lot. He didn't even look winded but he was sapping his energy by quite a bit. We had to go in zigzag when we found trees we had to walk up a lot of stairs. Rashi was observing me seeing that I wasn't challenged by the training he pondered if I needed to start using weights already. 
After we delivered the milk, it was time for construction work. The special thing was we had to use our hands to dig and we could only use some tools. We also did field work for some farmers. The swimming, dodging, and the other training were gone almost immediately after. Goku was left panting and weak on the floor while I was a bit winded by the training but not by much. Rashi nodded his head and pointed towards me while saying, Your body is already very strong due to your prior training I guess, so I will need you to wear this. He produced a big turtle shell which when he dropped on the floor it made a loud clang. It was quite heavy as I put it on my back it was 50 kilograms or so and it impeded me by a bit. Rashi nodded his head but Goku said he wanted to wear one too. After a lot of insistence from him Rashi gave in and gave him a 20 kilograms shell. I also used my gravity field around me to increase my gravity by two times. The training was way harder than before with it on and I could feel my key strengthen and purify itself while my muscles became stronger and my bones hardened. My organs also became stronger. Almost all of the zeni we made was used on the food we consumed with a very little minority distributed between the three of us as Rashi participated in the milk training as well. After quite a while of training I asked Master Rashi to teach me his full power technique. He agreed to say that I already was quite strong and I could learn it since I was his student. He also said that he wouldn't have taught me it if I didn't ask about it. He wasn't a responsible teacher when it came to techniques. Rashi immediately started explaining how the technique worked. He infused his muscles with ki but not a lot as to not reduce his speed by a lot. As the more ki expended into the muscles would put more of a strain on the body and bones reducing speed and increasing consumption. The full power technique was doing what its name mentioned, bring out the full power of the human body. Its multiplier wasn't much it was a 1.5 increase in power level but it could be stacked with other techniques so it was all good. Took me a while to master it combined with my daily training. Half a year gone by and there were only 6 more months before the Budokai Tenkechi would start. We also talked with Bulma on the phone and she told us that Yamcha would participate as well. Good for him I guess? After 6 months of training my turtle shell weight increased to 80 kilograms and I used 3 times earth gravity on myself, Goku's shell increased to 55 kilograms, he was getting strong fast due to his scion biology. He also saw me as his rival and he wanted to fight me and beat me, his scion blood told him to. We also sparred a lot during these 6 months of painful training. We learned everything that was to learn about each other and we became great friends. Goku was a fun guy to be around he exuded an aura of friendliness and innocence. Even though he wasn't that smart due to his accident and upbringing he wasn't annoying, he was just a bit well slower. Rashi also taught us basic things like math biology etc. I took them in easily but Goku was quite hard-headed and it took him way more time to learn what he taught us. But unlike in the anime he started to learn, in the anime Goku didn't care about such stuff, but when he saw how easy I picked up everything he started to take these things seriously too. Did I make Goku smarter by competitiveness? That's how science gets smarter? If they get beaten by someone in fights, they start to try to one-up or catch up that guy in literally everything that guy excelled in. Maybe that's why Vegeta who had such immense pride as being the best at fighting and a super elite started to take Goku as such a big rival and never gave him a breather. It was the scion blood in him which clouded his mind especially when Babidi took over. After the six months I asked Rashi to teach me one of his least known techniques, it was the Thundershock surprise. When he asked me where did I know about it, I answered with a lie that I made up on how I met someone who fought him in the past and that he used his technique on him. Rashi bought my lie since he fought lots of opponents in the past since he was really old so he might have thought he forgot about such a time he fought someone and he used his thundershock surprise. I learned the technique easily, I also learned the technique not because it was strong or anything like that, I needed to learn how to transform Ki into lightning. After a while of contemplation I realized that I could copy Killua's god speed from the anime slash manga Hunter x Hunter. If I could encase myself in lighting my thought process and my body speed will be extremely high, maybe it would be like the Kaioken technique where it would even multiply my power level by a bit. So I started to train with the lightning key after I mastered the full power technique. The next 6 months I also upped my shell's weight and the gravity Goku upped his as well. We trained and fought and repeated these actions continuously. As Rashi saw how hard we trained in secret, he also started to train extremely hard so he could become stronger than us and teach us humility during the tournament. Six more months gone by and we were almost at the day the tournament would start. Rashi gave us the go to let the turtle shells fall off. I also stopped using the gravity field, it was like I was a feather, I checked my key with my key sense and I was pretty surprised, my power level increased almost to 250, and Goku's was 170, Rashi's was 260 or so maybe more. My influence on the world made others grow stronger by seeing how strong I was, in the original they weren't this strong like at all, at this pace Raditz would get shit on by Master Rashi. 
Poor guy, I almost felt sorry for him, whatever who cares about him. Rashi took his house in a capsule after he came out of it wearing a black suit and a red tie and a black fedora he had his cane in his left hand and two briefcases in his right. He gave us the briefcases inside where the suits like his and behind the suits were the original turtle school uniforms, the orange and blue combination with the turtle kanji symbol on the front of the chest and the back. We both thanked Rashi, and we took his plane to the Papaya Islands where the tournament would be hosted. After we got there we met with Bulma and Yamchur at the registry, we all registered as we made our way inside Master Rashi also registered under the alias of Jackie Chun after we left him alone. Bulma was waiting outside with Oolong and Poir when Rashi excused himself saying he needed to go to the bathroom. Now we were all in the preliminaries room waiting for the random draws to see which opponents we would have. The preliminaries were decided, everyone was sorted into a group, I was in group B, Goku was in group A and Jackie Chun in group C, it seemed we wouldn't meet in the preliminaries just like in the anime, maybe it was fate? I stood near the group A stage Goku waved at me and showed me his number, it seemed he would start as the second match since he was number 3, I looked towards my lot, it said number 2 on it, I was in the first match. I got on the stage and across from me stood a buff giant man, he sneered at me and stared menacingly. He thought he was going to have an easy fight since I was a kid, very wrong for him. After the announcer counted down and the fight started I just pushed him outside the stage, he couldn't do anything against me, he had a power level of 10 at maximum, while he also had no technique or key. The same could be said about Goku's opponents and Rashi's as well, they were all too weak especially since we were stronger compared to the original story as well, while the other people were just as strong. The top three in the preliminaries would get a chance to fight on the main stage of the tournament, of course the first one was me, the second was an Indian looking guy named Namu and the third was a girl named Ranfan, the other groups had people that were not known well besides Yamcha, he got second in Jackie Chun's block. After a quick rest and meal before the fight, the blonde announcer with glasses and a suit made his way out to the main stage while he announced the order of the fights. They were Namu vs Ranfan, Yamcha vs Jackie Chun and me vs Goku. The other side characters would fight each other I didn't care about them, so I just tuned the others names out. The Namu vs Ranfan fight wasn't interesting in my opinion since I was stronger than both of them combined. The only fun thing was how the woman fought, she tried to seduce him, and she even threw her pants away in hope of distracting Namu, but Namu defeated her after an internal fight. From the anime I knew this guy wanted to use the money to buy water for his village. Yamcha vs Jackie Chun was even easier since Yamcha even though was a bit stronger than the original Rashi was way stronger than before, Yamcha put up a good fight and even used his wolf fong fist, but Rashi was just going easy on him as I observed the fight I could see the flaws in Yamcha's techniques, he wasn't that great compared to true blue martial artists but he had a strong body from training in the desert and he had great potential, for a human at least. The fight ended in Rashi's victory, Yamcha dejected about being beaten by an old man was sulking when he got out of the ring. When he saw me and my uniform his eyes brightened, the old turtle hermit was still pretty popular to the people known of martial arts. Yamcha made his way towards me and asked, Krillin you have trained with the great mutant Rashi? I answered nonchalantly, Yeah what about it? He sweat dropped at my response and said, Could you ask him if he could train me as well? You were strong before as I saw how Goku looked at you seemingly wanting to defeat you, and he beat me pretty hard back then. I chuckled and said, you could just ask him yourself after the tournament ends he should be around. Yamcha nodded with a smile on his face not knowing that Jackie Chun aka Rashi already saw potential in him, and he wouldn't mind if he asked him to be his student. It was finally time for one of the big fights before the finals me versus Goku and boy will it be good. I decided to suppress my power around Goku's for a more interesting fight. Winning in the tournament won't get me much besides the prize money and even if I got the money it would go to the food bill for the celebration feast after. We both made our way to the middle of the ring and the announcer started to spice things up saying of how we both were students under the same teacher the great turtle hermit Rashi. We both bowed towards each other before entering the turtle school fighting stance. Goku immediately started the fight with a right hook which I dodged. I fought him so many times during our training that I could predict what his moves were. But Goku was a fighting genius who could adapt his fighting style on the moment so I was kinda caught off guard when he tried to slap me with his tail. Did he want to pull a raditz on me like when the old Krillin got bitch smack trough the came house? Bad for him since I easily caught his tail and spun him ready to throw him out of the ring, but Goku caught the edge of the ring and jumped right back up in it before he could touch the grass outside the ring. He used his momentum to almost fly towards me with a punch since I couldn't dodge it due to his speed and my self-restricted power level I punched towards him and our fists clashed. 
His scion biology let him take the punch full on even though my body was stronger, but he also staggered backward due to the impact even though I didn't use the full power of my key. My body was more tempered due to the amount of key I had in it is higher than his. Our fight continued, punches and kicks Goku even used the after image technique on me to sucker punch me, but I punched him right back in the chin he got dazed and fell after that. I expected he would immediately try to attack me after he used the after image technique so I clenched my jaw so the damage would be minimized. Goku stood down on the ground as the announcer started to count. One, two, three, four, nine. But Goku suddenly sprang up from the ground and cupped his hands together. It was time for the final attack that would decide the match. I grinned and cupped my hands as well. Some of the people in the crowd knew of the legendary Kamehameha technique and gasped. Blue orbs started to rotate between our hands as we launched them towards each other. We were locked in a stalemate, but I decided to stop holding back and put forth all of my key into the attack. It engulfed Goku and he flew out of the ring, his clothes were burnt and his face was black. His hair also looked quite bad, he just got back up bowed while saying that it was a great fight and left for the stands, he was surely gonna go and eat something after the fight. The announcer asked me if I wanted to rest before the final fight, but I just gave him the go and that I'm ready and prepared for it. Jackie Chun made his way on the ring and we both bowed. I smiled and used my telepathy to talk with him. So master why didn't you tell us you will participate in this tournament? Rashi was stunned but he responded with his telepathic powers. Ah, I see you know quite a bit. Is my disguise that bad Krillin? It seems you also have quite a strong mind for you to be able to use telepathy at such a young age. I just smirked and nodded my head. The crowd didn't understand why we were standing motionless for a few seconds before I nodded my head. Our actions seemed strange in their eyes. The announcer already gave the go before I started to talk to him, but after I nodded to him immediately attacked. This old man had a lot of experience and quite a lot of tricks in his sleeves. If I didn't fight him seriously and take him by surprise he might even beat me. Rashi was surprised, but he parried my blows with his hands. He winced as my strength was almost near his and his body was quite old. We fought back and forth before the willy old man used his thundershock surprise as an attack after he used the after image technique. I took the attack full on but unlike how Rashi imagined it. I didn't get stunned instead the lighting started to arc around me as it started to turn from a dull yellow to a light blue instead. My clothes started to flutter as the lightning encased me. I used my key to take control of the lighting that was pouring around my body to forcefully integrate it with my aura. I achieved god speed with the help of Master Rashi unintentional help. I always tried to do it myself with my internal key that was transformed into lighting but I could never quite get it. It seemed I had to take in lightning from outside forces to achieve the Godspeed technique. I could feel my thoughts going a million times faster than before. It seemed like everyone stopped in time. I felt like I was using hits time skip at this moment. I tried something as I punched Rashi quickly three times in the chest with my fist. He flew outside the ring with three holes in his black martial suit. I made sure to not injure him hard as I restrained myself but he got taken down so easily. The announcer was dumbfounded as he looked at me his eyes were wide open behind his glasses. The electricity around me faded as he announced me as the winner of the tournament. After we got back into the building behind the stage the announcer gave me the prize money 300,000 zenny in cash. I smiled but my smile disappeared when Goku came and his stomach growled. I had a glutton scion who I had to feed now. We met back with Bulma and Rashi outside. Rashi already talked with Namu before we got out and he gave him a capsule that he filled with water from a nearby well. Yamcha was already on his knees ready to take Rashi as a master. It seemed he was desperate to become relevant. It was like he already had the premonition he would become useless in the future. We all gone to a nearby restaurant in the city and Goku ate almost half of my money. He ate only half because the others decided to pitch in when the bill came. Bulma could have paid it all by herself but she said that she forgot her wallet home. After that long adventure, and she was so stingy she didn't even want to pay for one meal. Whatever, after that Goku, decided that it was time to roam the world, and he said that he would meet up with us after a few years when the next Budokai tournament would be hosted. Every tournament was hosted once every three years, it was five years before, but the tournament's popularity made it reduce its delay. Goku left on foot, Yamcha made his way back with me to Master Rashi's house. Poor followed while Bulma also decided to come with us to keep Yamcha company while also to observe how we trained. We all made our way back on Rashi's island. And we were confronted by a blonde launch and a goddamn minigun that she pulled out of nowhere me and Rashi immediately got in front and plucked the bullets out of the air. 
Launch sneezed and she became blue-haired again and threw the minigun in the ocean, wondering how she got the gun in the first place. Bulma and Yamcha sweat dropped while the poor cat poor was terrified. Yamcha immediately wanted to start training so we had to relocate back to the other island. After we relocated it was immediately time for another session of training. I increased my gravity field to four times normal and put on a turtle shell that was as heavy as 100 kilograms. I also focused on training the turtle school's mantra. I was just waiting to get my hand on the information about Goku's adventures. The Red Ribbon Army would surely appear on the news. Maybe I could even join him on some, just for fun. I also wanted some of that super ultra divine water. It could increase my body's potential and also excavate some it so I would become stronger. I could also gather the Dragon Balls again with him or I could let the Red Ribbon Army gather them for me so I would just steal them. Yeah, I would do just that, let them gather the Dragon Balls and steal them. I already asked Bulma for the radar and I could use it to track their progress. My next wish will be very important towards my future martial arts potential. Maybe it could even make me rival the Almighty Scions and their thousands of different hairs and hair colors. It was time, by my calculations Goku would have fought with the Red Ribbon Army already. Seeing that Goku had the fourth Dragon Ball it would surely displease the Red Ribbon Army generals, and they would try to get it from him. Unfortunately for them none would be able to, and they would have to hire Mercenary Tao. I had to go to Korin's tower first and make sure that UPA's dad Bora didn't die so Goku wouldn't have to use the Dragon Balls to revive him. Thus making me wait one more year, or angering Goku making him displeased with my selfishness in the future. I didn't want to become Goku's enemy as there was no reason to. Also Bora's death can be prevented as I know everything that would happen more or less. I made my way towards Korin Tower by flying, and it took me up to a few days, and I waited to observe the duo of father and son that were camping under the tower. After a few more days of waiting and meditating Goku came in looking a bit ragged and mercenary Tao appeared as well. They immediately started fighting while Tao was taking advantage of Goku's weakness of him being concerned about the two persons below the tower. He tried to kill Bora, but I put on an invisible barrier that stopped his attack. Goku immediately headbutted him at the first moment he was distracted and tried to hit him with the Kamehameha. Due to being dizzy he was hit full on by it and he disappeared in a cloud of dust. I felt his key he didn't die. He would become a cyborg later and get defeated easily by Tien during the last tournament of the Dragon Ball anime. Goku wasn't sure why Bora didn't get hit by Tao's attack, but since he couldn't sense Ki properly, yet he was just glad nothing happened to the two innocent people. There was no reason now for Goku to scale Korin's tower that meant he wouldn't use the divine water yet. I think I changed the plot somewhat now. I guess he will try to get the water after he gets pawned by Piccolo. He was already a bit stronger than the original since Tao didn't beat him towards near death. In the original Tao beat the living shit out of him before trying to execute him with the Dadanpa Ray, a patented technique of the Crane School which could be a useful addition to my arsenal. It was faster than the Kamehameha and it had good piercing capability it was a weaker special beam cannon. Goku left after he made sure both of them were truly okay. He also had a Dragon Ball radar in his hands it seemed Bulma made him another one. He was smiling I guess Bulma informed me of taking the Dragon Ball radar and he thought we would meet during our adventure of gathering the Dragon Balls. He was right we would meet but only during the final phase. No reason for me to go over all of the planet to get the balls when the numerous people of the RRA can just do it for me. I'll just swoop in and relieve them of their balls just right after they fully get all of them. One ball was in a direction towards the north. One was with Goku and five others were all clustered together in a different location. The dragon ball up north started to move it seemed it was picked by a red ribbon army fellow. Time to follow them all back home just like Goku will do. I flew covertly as I followed the red ribbon army grunt in his plane. He couldn't sense my key, and I was flying way above him. He couldn't detect me at all. After a few hours of flight we got to the Red Ribbon's army headquarters. Goku was already wreaking havoc and its soldiers tried to shoot him. But the bullets just bounced off his thick skin. I wonder what kind of special bullets did they hit Goku in Super when they tried to rob him of his vegetables? These didn't do jack against him while he actually got scratched as an adult which was able to practically destroy the universe if he puts his mind to it. Was this what's called shitty writing? Whatever the writers of the Dragon Ball Super smoked when they thought of that scene I don't want any of that. The illusions were too much. After a while of fighting Goku was tied down by a black man in a mecha the funny thing was this man's name was Mr. Black. Toriyama had fun writing his manga back before people wouldn't get offended by every little thing. Mr. Black snatched the Dragon Ball from Goku and threw it towards his boss Mr. Red a guy who was shorter than the original Krillin. I already knocked out the soldier who had the Dragon Ball and took his uniform. 
while Goku fought with Mr. Black, which I knew would end pretty soon. I decided to directly make my way costumed as a red ribbon soldier towards the boss's room. The boss was practically glowing when he saw the last Dragon Ball well one of his eyes was shining as the other was covered by an eye patch. But before he could do anything I knocked him down by appearing behind him and chopping him on the neck. He got lucky in the original he was killed by Mr. Black after he heard of his wish of becoming taller. I don't blame him since I did the same wish albeit different as I would grow more in the future. Goku outside already killed Mr. Black with his Kamehameha the first had to be fast. I immediately summoned Shinron with his chant. Arise Shinron and grant me my wish. I already threw the dragon balls outside. The sky darkened as the dragon made his way out of the balls and said his normal introduction. Who has summoned me? I can grant you one wish. I immediately got down to business as I didn't want to explain Goku much besides that I got the dragon balls before Mr. Red could make his wish and I got a wish instead. Give me an extremely high healing factor which can stop my aging after I fully grew up to the maximum capability of my body, which will also increase my adaptability and key. Make it so it increases every time I'm healed from any damage I receive. Shinran started to contemplate and said in a booming voice. This wish is doable while it's kind of hard on my power to grant you such a power with so many possibilities it can be done. His eyes glowed and I could feel searing heat start to rush around my body. I could feel my key increase from it a bit from all the training and the wish from now I could sit at a power level of 300. The dragon ball scattered while I caught the four star ball before Goku came I tried to cut myself up with some key to see how I would heal. The wound that appeared on my arm immediately healed up and I could feel my key increase bit almost by a hum I could say it was a very minimal increase maybe not even one it was below one for sure but this wasn't even a flesh wound. Goku came looking around before looking at me and the petrified dragon ball in my hand. He immediately beamed happily at seeing me then he asked what happened. I said that I was making my way towards the base as it had all the dragon balls and I didn't have to search for them when I suddenly saw General Red which was outside and knocked out. I dragged him outside of course trying to talk to Shinron and express his wish. I just knocked him out and made a different wish instead. When Goku inquired about my wish I just told him that I would never age and grow old like Master Rashi. Goku nodded his head also thinking that Master Rashi's body was getting kind of frail in his old age. And he knew how important a martial artist's body was so he didn't doubt my words. I said three quarters of a lie and a truth so it was a truth for him. I decided to ignore Jero as he would make 18 who she was even though it would be hard on her. I wouldn't have to train her and worry about her being too weak if he didn't make her an android. Her becoming an android gave her infinite amounts of energy never being exhausted while also increasing her power level above normal super science level. She could also grow stronger in the future even though it would be painful for her it was a shortcut to power. I made sure to not let him take my blood though I didn't need Cell to become immortal with my newly got ability and Piccolo's cells. After we left an old man got out of the rubble and swore revenge under his breath. More on Goku rather than me as I didn't kill anyone. Red was still alive too I just knocked him out and stole the dragon balls. Jero maybe thought I was just a prophet or of what happened and that I knew Goku too. He wasn't particularly interested in me. We made our way to a city and Goku ate quite a lot. I ate too and I had to pay since Goku had no money. Good that I saved from training with Rashi while I also had the remaining money from the prize. After we caught up properly Goku decided that he wouldn't return to train with Rashi again as he wanted to explore the world more. I didn't stop him it was his adventure while I had mine which was a slow and steady rise to power. I had my gravity field which made the need of a gravity machine obsolete while my gravity field could increase infinitely with my mind's might. I should learn to materialize too so I could make my own weighted clothes whenever I want. But that would take some more time since I shouldn't go to Kami's now. The old man was a bit heavy-handed on humans that tried to get to him before he met Goku. I also didn't want to meet that creepy genie Mr. Popo. I returned to Rashi's island and continued my training. There was only one more year till the next Budokai Tenkechi anyways, so I had quite a lot of time to experiment with my new healing factor and properly master the Godspeed technique. I could also try to combine it with my full power technique and the six dots. For now, I could barely use four dots but the key increase was substantial even though the consumption was extremely high. With my base power level of 316 times it was 4800. I could already one-shot Raditz and maybe even fight Nappa a bit in my strongest form if I could combine it with the full power technique and got speed which gave me a power level multiplier of two points. Five increase my power level would be 18,000. As strong as Vegeta when he first came to Earth. 
that was without having the Kaioken, even though I didn't have the Super Scion form I had more techniques which would make me maybe as strong as a Super Scion 1 or 2, considering the 6 dots would give me a 64 times increase making it a bit stronger than an unmastered Super Scion transformation. I'm not sure if the multiplier will increase if I master it like the Super Scion transformation though. In general, it increased to 100 times when mastered, maybe mine will increase to 114 times? Anyways my healing powers were amazing after 6 months of training my power level increased to 390 and it was still increasing amazingly fast. I could also abuse my body even more and its durability and strength increased by countless times. I also started my hand into learning the Kienzen which was a broken ability considering Krillin's power level was almost 50,000 during the Frisia saga. And he could have killed Frisia which had a power level beyond 1 million with it shows how broken the ability was. Well, Krillin once hit Cell with it, but he dismissed it which showed that the Kienzen couldn't cut someone if the difference in power was extremely high, but that was perfect Cell which only a Super Saiyan 2 could defeat. Also, Cell could have regenerated from it even if he was cut. It was a broken ability against people who couldn't regenerate, so Cell and Bu were the only ones not particularly affected by it. It wasn't hard to master the technique, but it was quite draining. By creating the Kienzen I got insights into key forming and shaping, Maybe next I could even make a key blade or weapon instead of a simple disc. Things were looking well for me, Rashi also upped his training by a lot as he saw me train day and night. Yamcha was inspired by my training as well and he started to train with renewed vigor. I also did bonus training behind their backs through, but they won't learn about it or they would call me a freak with infinite stamina. Especially since my turtle shell now weighted above 200 kilograms. My training was going extremely well and I guess Goku was pushing himself quite a lot out there too. He knew I would become stronger while he was adventuring out there so he wouldn't slack off at all. I first thought that my life would suck if I became Krillin, but I realized that Krillin never reached his true potential nor used the Dragon Balls properly to catch up to Goku in the Dragon Ball universe, or well the author never cared about anyone else besides the main character. It was time for the second world tournament that we would participate in if I remember correctly Tien and Kayatsu would also participate in this one. I wonder if they got stronger after Goku beat there but now... I'm sure as hell Goku beat them since he was way stronger than in the original. I was wearing the Turtle GI, Yamcha was wearing one too, now being a proud Turtle School disciple. He thought he would surely win this tournament and wash away his shame from the last one. Too bad for him, there was a chance he wouldn't even get out of the preliminaries. His power level increased to 160, pretty good but not enough, my power level was already 430 or so, while Rashi's was 340. I was already as strong as Goku when Raditz came. By the time Raditz made his debut, he would die to Rashi, let's not even talk about how strong Goku will become. I was 14 and a half years now and I already grew quite tall compared to other kids my age. I was as tall as Yamcha now at 1 meter and 69 centimeters. Yamcha would also grow some more but I wasn't at my limit either. We used Rashi's plane to leisurely make our way towards the Papaya Island and we got ourselves registered and asked about Goku. It seemed just like in the original he would run late. And speak of the devil one minute before the registration closed Goku came in wearing nothing but a leopard skin and he had two meat sticks in his hands. He ran so fast clouds of dust appeared behind him. I wonder why didn't he use the cloud? After he registered Master Rashi also gave him a turtle school uniform. Suddenly a scoff was heard beside us as an old man with a crane hat glasses and a tiny mustache appeared. He wore green clothes with the kanji of crane imprinted big on the front. With him came a three-eyed youth who wore a white tank top and green pants he was Tien. Behind Tien was Kayatsu a little mime-like guy with a pale face and red dots on his cheeks. He wore something similar to the old man without the crane hat or glasses. Master Crane immediately started to laugh when he scanned us with his eyes and said, Erashi, it seems your students are getting worse every year. While mine are flourishing. He pointed towards Tien and Kaiatsu and I could feel their key they were pretty strong Tien standing at a steady 250 while Kaiatsu stood at a 100. But they were really weak compared to us. Tien could only beat Yamcha and Kaiatsu no one. Even if he used his telekinesis tricks it would be hard for him to bridge the gap especially since his body was quite weak as well. Goku's power level stood at a big 340 as strong as Rashi. I was impressed he seemed he wanted to become stronger than me. We made our way inside the preliminaries room. Bulma. Oolong Poir and Launch also came with us but they had to wait outside just like the last tournament. We drew the lots and surprise surprise Kayatsu tempered with them. Poor Yamcha won't even get to the finals as he drew Tien's group. Kayatsu also wouldn't as he drew Jackie Chun's group. Goku luckily didn't draw mine we would meet in the finals for sure. Maybe he would even beat Rashi this time? 
The fights in my block were pretty boring as no one was strong enough to even last a puff of breath from me. I didn't need to use any bit of key as my body was extremely strong, I just had to gently push them to make them fly away. The announcer that stood on my ring sweat dropped at how strong I was. He was a bit scared of me. He wasn't the main announcer, he was a monk at the temple near the tournament. Jackie Chun also breezed through his opponents. Kaiatsu tried to put up a fight, his physic tricks didn't phase Rashi at all. Rashi just beat him down and threw him out of the ring. Tian was angry at Rashi and he swore that he would defeat him in the finals. Yamcha gave it all his out, he even used the Kamehameha and a new wolf fong fist but he got his butt handed to him by Tian. Even though the fight did take a bit of time, I guess Tian didn't want to tire himself before the main fights. He also eyed me wearily seemingly his third I could see through my true strength a bit. Goku's block wasn't interesting too, he was quite bored and he even yawned a few times during the fights. Finally, the main tournament was starting since we all fought our opponents. The order was, Jackie Chun vs Tien, a dragon looking guy named Jiren vs Goku, and me vs the disgusting guy named Bacterian. I didn't have a visible nose but I still could smell him and damn he smelled like feces and gutter trash combined. That guy hasn't showered for months on end from the announcer's words, I was thoroughly disgusted by this unhygienic fellow. I went up first and I didn't even let the disgusting guy touch me, I just blew him away with a flick of my hand. A strong wind blowing him down from the stage. I wouldn't want to dirty my GI fighting such a human abomination. Jiren vs Goku was next the dragon tried to bind him with a pink gum. He spews out of his mouth, but Goku's superior power level made his try to become futile and useless. He got knocked out of the ring 20 seconds later. Jackie Chun and Tien came next. Rashi under his disguise was seen through by Tien, and he tried to unveil him under everyone's eyes. But Rashi's antics made him fail. Rashi shot a Kamehameha at Tien but he dodged it and smirked. Tien did the Kamehameha as well, and he said that it was a crude technique unlike the Crane School ones. The Crane Hermit Shin laughed from the viewer's stand and nodded his head. Rashi just grinned and didn't comment, he didn't even use 50% of his power in that Kamehameha, he was testing Tien, he was interested in his potential. He could also sense with his mental powers that he wasn't truly evil and he said in Tian's mind with his telepathy, Your heart was led astray by that willy old fox shin. I can feel the potential within you, and that you truly don't wish to become one who walks on the path of assassination. Why don't you join my school? Tian scoffed but he didn't deny outright. Rashi smiled at his response and walked out of the ring if he could persuade such a talented young man to walk the path of righteousness it didn't matter if he lost or won. Tien was dumbfounded. In the last moment his third eye scanned Rashi and he found out he was way stronger than him. He sweat dropped he didn't fully understand why Rashi let him win and that put him on thoughts as he recalled Rashi's words. Master Crane just whistled and laughed. It was time for Goku and Tien to fight after Tien rested for a while. They each made their way onto the stage and Tien said, I can now set the score with you for what happened back then in the mountains. Goku grinned and said, Well, you attacked me first so I had to defend myself. Tien immediately used his forearms technique and two more arms sprouted from his shoulders and he started to attack Goku using his extra limbs. As the saying was four arms are better than two, Goku was overwhelmed by the increased amount of limbs before he started to use his tail. After Goku started to use his tail the fight started to incline in Goku's favor but Tien used his patented solar flare to blind Goku and he tried to throw him out of the ring. Unfortunately for him, Goku used his other sense to dodge and headbutt him, even though the headbutt was quite weak it still pushed Tien away from him enough so he could recover his vision. Goku started to channel the Kamehameha while Tien took to the skies and started to charge his tri-beam. It was a way stronger technique than the Kamehameha but the drawback was that it used life force and overuse would put the user's life in peril. I observed how Tien used the technique and I would try to master it myself later. Tien cupped his hands in a triangular position while he started to charge his key which took a yellow tint. He told Goku that he should dodge this one if he wanted to continue living. Goku stopped his Kamehameha as he felt a threat from the tri-beam. Shun immediately shouted to launch it and Tien did. The stage was no more and Goku was nowhere to be seen either. Tien looked a bit sad as he didn't spot Goku anywhere. But suddenly Goku flew right out of the hole and uppercut Tien in the jaw making him go out of the set bounds and unconscious. Shun booed and Goku landed near Tien. Tien got up after a while and he was embarrassed at his loss, Master Shin's booze didn't help either, and he realized that training with Master Shin was kind of futile as he started to treat him worse and worse these days. His training techniques were also getting quite old, and they didn't make him grow strong at the same pace either. It was time for the finals, but there was no ring left. 
the blonde announcer with sunglasses sweat dropped, not surely knowing what to say. But afterward, a fat monk came and whispered something into his ear. The announcer started to talk into his microphone and said, The last fight will be moved indoors, and we will let the spectators come in as well. We will use the preliminaries room. The preliminaries room was quite small so not everyone could enter. The viewers roared and made sure to express their discomfort at not being able to see the final fight. But the blonde announcer said, While not everyone can see the fight live we have installed a few monitors outside which you can view it from. The crowd started to calm down before they made their way outside. But the preliminaries room was still pretty packed. I made my way towards the stage and Goku did the same. We did our salute before the fight and entered our stances while the announcer counted down. Three, two, one start. We started to trade blow at such high speeds the cameras couldn't truly show us. They could only show blurry after images the ones inside didn't see better anyway. Only Tien, Rashi, Kairatsu and Yamcha could see us properly and they all gasped while Rashi thought. I think this is the last time I will enroll, Krillin and Goku are getting stronger way too fast. They are leaving me into the dust. But that doesn't matter, I will stop training, I will continue as much as I can and try to catch up to my students. Our competitiveness and fight have ignited the old martial spirit of the Turtle Hermit. His blood was pumping and he looked like he grew a few years younger. Back to the fight, we just punched and dodged back and forth. I was testing Goku to see his current martial prowess. And I was impressed by fighting all over the world and experiencing tons of different styles did wonder for his technique. I had my healing factor so I could fight night and day without getting tired at all but Goku didn't have that advantage while I was also stronger. And I still could use my full power technique got speed and my dots which I decided to name simply as super mode science got super scion. But I was a superhuman that didn't reach his full potential yet. The end wasn't surprising at all, Goku got blew off the stage after he started to stagger and grew tired. I won the second Bidokai Tenkaichi tournament and the reward was doubled up to 600,000 zeni. The money would come in handy as I wanted to learn magic from Rashi's sister Baba, and she was a known miser who extorted exorbitant sums from her customers. While someone could fight to get a divination scot free from her, I doubt she would teach me without money. After the tournament, we had another feast, this time Bulma paid. Good for me since I didn't want to waste my money. I face-bombed. I actually forgot the money bag which I was supposed to get from the blonde announcer and made my way back to get it. When I was there, the announcer immediately gave me the bag and excused himself as he too forgot to give me the bag. Suddenly, a green-winged humanoid creature attacked me trying to kill me instantly with his left claw which tried to break my neck. Unfortunately for him, I was twice as strong as him or more. His power level was around 220. I immediately appeared behind him and I thirst my key infused hand into his chest and pierced his heart with my newly learned key blade. He gurgled and muttered something about Great King Piccolo and died. The announcer was shocked but he saw how I killed the creature in self-defense so he didn't comment and just ran away hurriedly. I deactivated the key blade it consumed quite a bit of key but the key immediately filled up again due to the healing factor. King Piccolo got unsealed by the Three Stooges, my Palaf and Shu, and it seemed he was also way stronger than the original. Did my interference with the world cause a butterfly effect which will also strengthen all of the villains? That meant when Raditz came he might be above 1000 power level, but it was unlikely since I didn't interact with anyone outside of Earth. Whatever I still had some wishes to do and with them, I could surely even pass up. Science and talent or at least rival them. By the time Raditz came, I would have mastered my dots and might have also gotten Kaioken. With my healing factor, I could push the Kaioken to 50 times by my estimations, but more than that and my body wouldn't heal the damage and it would just explode. I could heal myself back from the bodily explosion, but that meant I couldn't fully use Kaioken above 50 times in a fight. Anyways I thought that I would intercept Demon Piccolo's wish for eternal youth and get myself one more wish. Maybe I would make him spawn Piccolo Jr. early? But from what I saw even though I could defeat him, I don't think I could without using Godspeed or my super mode. It seemed his base was higher than me since his impure spawn had a power level almost at 50% of mine. Whatever I still had the radar from when Bulma gave me it last time, I would let Goku's ball get stolen so he would get trashed and he would go drink the ultra-divine water. While he drank the water I would steal Piccolo's wish for eternal youth. 
thus making him even weaker, and I would just let Goku deal with him. Piccolo Jr. was an indisposable ally in the future. He would also tutor Gohan. I didn't want to take care of Goku's child when he will go on his training spree God knows where when he got the urge to train. Gohan would need a paternal figure in his life and Piccolo would be it. Well at least till he will get to train with Goku in the hyperbolic time chamber. As I looked on the radar I could see Goku's ball and that four others were gathered. Two others were quite a distance from each other. Which meant the Palaf gang and Piccolo still had to gather these two before they would come for Goku's. Piccolo would also be more wary of martial artists as his spawn died, and he got the feedback from him. It's been a few days and all six Dragon Balls were gathered in the same location. Only Goku's remained. I looked at the radar and waited patiently. It was time for the old demon to try and get his hands on the last Dragon Ball. I waited on Rashi's island, Goku was still wandering the world he said that he would come back to train with us a bit later for the next tournament. I was with Tien, Yamcha, Rashi Kayatsu and Launch on the island. Immediately when Blonde Launch spotted Tien he started to flirt with him. She liked his rugged look and his three eyes for some reason. I left the island after the daily training my power level already increases to 460. I felt like the more I was training the more my body was unlocking its true potential with the help of my healing factor. I could feel that my body was already on its path of limitless growth, my mind was getting stronger and stronger but it started to hit a wall due to reaching the highest stage of Rashi's training technique. I flew towards the six dragon balls and masked my key. So King Piccolo couldn't sense me. After a while, I spotted the giant ship of the Palaf gang trio. I felt Piccolo's key inside the ship. It wasn't that strong it was only 420. A bit higher than Goku's by 80. It seemed that giving birth took a toll on his aged body and his energy reserves were already starting to go down. Even though he was as strong as Piccolo would be when Raditz came there should be a logical reason for this to happen. I wasn't sure but when Kami got weaker Piccolo got stronger before Piccolo Jr. was born. Maybe that meant Kami was in a pinch right now? I followed the airship from above as it made its way towards Goku's location which was pretty far in the wild. After a few more hours of flying we were at the destination. A fat green lizard looking humanoid flew out of the ship and tried to attack Goku with a flying punch. I sensed his key and it was quite low a little above 200. Goku easily dispatched of him with his Kamehameha. I heard a gasp of pain coming out of the airship. It seemed the second death of his progeny hit him quite hard. Literally since a bit of his life force was expended every time he gave birth, it was also linked with his kids. Piccolo was quite angry, his power level already dropped to 390 and he looked visibly older than he did in the main world. He was pissed his sharp teeth were gritted and if looks could kill Goku would have already died 100 times. King Piccolo said in a raspy voice as he levitated towards the ground in Goku's direction. So you are the one who killed Tambourine and now symbol as well. I'll make sure to torture you slowly before I take the Dragon Ball from you. Goku was a bit confused when he heard about Tambourine as this was the first green creature he killed, but he shrugged nonetheless. He didn't care. He could sense that Piccolo was strong his scion instincts told him so. So he just decided to go with it and fight him, at first he got the upper hand against Piccolo as he was old and quite weak after he lost two sons, but after a while Piccolo started to take the upper hand with his experience, Piccolo fought tons of martial artists and killed them ruthlessly before he was sealed by Master Mateo, Master Rashi's master. Unfortunately, Goku got distracted by one of Piccolo's tricks. While he was distracted Piccolo grabbed the scruff of his shirt, and threw him into the air, and hit him with a mouth beam. Goku fell from the sky unconscious and heavily damaged. Piccolo put his hand on his neck artery checking for a pulse when he found none he started to laugh. He took the dragon ball from his chest pocket and left. After Piccolo left Goku started coughing, and he crawled away slowly hoping to find something to eat to ease his pain and heal himself a bit. From what I observed it seemed he was trying to go to Corin's tower, he still remembered of UPA's and Bora's words that whoever climbed the tower could meet Corin and get special water from him which would make him stronger. He needed that water to stop Piccolo. He thought that even I wasn't as strong as Piccolo as I never truly thrashed him around as Piccolo did. I knew what would happen from now on. He would meet with Yajirobe the fat samurai and he would take him to Corin's tower. I decided to follow Piccolo so I could steal his wish it was time for my third wish this one was extremely important. It would resolve my lack of training techniques forever. All the other important techniques can be learned from other people but what I wanted only Shinran or Paranga could give me. 
Piccolo stopped a few kilometers away from the location where he had beaten Goku. He made the Palaf gang to carry the Dragon Balls down to him from the ship. As he started to prepare to call for Shinron I blitzed in my Godspeed mode and I hit him squarely in the head not enough to kill him but enough to give him a concussion and knock him out. The Palaf gang almost peed themselves in fear watching the great King Piccolo go down like a sack of potatoes. For convenience's sake I knocked all of them out as well. I started to chant Shenron's incantation. Arise Shenron and grant me my wish. Unlike in the past. Shenron said something that surprised me. Who has summoned me? Oh wait it's you again Goddamit does no one else gathers. These stupid things besides you. I sweat dropped seems Shenron wasn't an NPC who would have a single conversation line. Shenron continued. Whatever you know how things are already come and state your wish. I thought long and hard for a few seconds before I decided on my wish and intoned it loudly in a clear voice. Shunron give me the best training techniques that are suited for my body and mind so they can grow endlessly without any bottleneck stopping them. Shenron's eyes glowed and two training techniques appeared in my head. He didn't even bother to say farewell as he just dispersed. I grabbed the four-star ball for Goku before it made its way around the world. I left the wilderness leaving the knocked-out Piccolo and the Palaf gang to bask in the afternoon sun. While I was on my way to Rashi's house, I analyzed both of the mind and body training techniques given to me by Shinron. They were quite special. The body training technique would continuously temper the key and body at the same time with also purifying them, increasing my control of key to perfection at the same time. The mind training technique could be used endlessly to strengthen my soul and my psychic powers. I already could go up to 50 times Earth's gravity with my mind. This was my limit with Rashi's training technique, but now as I trained with this new technique, the gravity could increase to infinite amounts. The same could be said about my telekinesis and mind reading. If I trained my soul enough, I could even read Beerus' mind without him noticing no matter if my body's and key strength was below his. The training techniques were both tailored towards my physique and unique soul. No one else could train in them. Maybe my descendants could at diminished effects. I nodded to myself this way I had no use of the Dragon Balls for myself anymore anything else I could do by myself. As my mind grew stronger and stronger I started to get ideas on how to create my techniques. I already thought of learning something similar to Tien's technique. But I would have six arms and three heads and I would try to make the technique increase my power level. I was at the beginning stages of creating it. But with the new mind training technique it won't take me much. Before I would surely figure it out. Imagining myself with three heads, six arms, and a bunch of key weapons in my arms, I would surely look like an Azura from hell. I finally arrived at Rashi's house, and I could see on the news that a city was attacked by the great demon Piccolo. Rashi was sweating heavily, and his eyes were wide while he explained to others Piccolo's past achievements. I just listened, but I already knew all of this. Rashi volunteered himself to go and try to capture Piccolo again using the Mafuba wave, he wouldn't use all of his vital energy now as he was stronger than before. He also thought that time wore away Piccolo's prowess, and he was sure of himself that he could beat him with his Mafuba technique. I insisted on following him when I did Yamcha and Tien wanted to come too. We all flew towards the city instead of taking the plane as it was faster. We made our way to find the city in flames and countless civilians killed and devastated. Cries of sorrow and pain were everywhere. I was sad. Maybe I should have ended Piccolo there and then to prevent all of this pain brought to everyone. The Dragon Balls would be able to revive all of them next year, but it was a scar that would remain on their minds for their whole lives. Maybe I should also ask Shinron next time to remove the memories of today's happening while reviving them. King Piccolo appeared even more aged than before, but his power level somehow spiked back to 400+. plus. Maybe he was exhausting himself to put a strong front to scare us? Rashi wasn't one to talk with a deadly enemy in his face, so he immediately started to fight. He told us to stay back knowing that I was stronger than him. Maybe he thought that. Piccolo was stronger than myself and he wanted to sacrifice himself so I could have a good future. A lonely tear appeared on my face. This was the kindest thing anyone did for me in both lives combined. After my parents died in my last life things were hard on me. No siblings all alone. I did inherit the house but it was hard to live alone. I adopted a dog and a cat. I wondered if they were still alive after all the time I spent in this new world. While I was daydreaming Rashi took quite the heavy beating from the enraged Piccolo. He didn't recognize me as I hit him too hard and too fast. 
while I was also encased in the electricity of my god mode. When I looked at Rashi's sorry figure something immediately snapped inside of me. He wanted to sacrifice himself for me despite me being only his student. He thought of me as his family, like the saying was master for a day, father for a lifetime. I couldn't let Rashi die like in the original because of me a lot of people died today, I was blaming myself quite a bit. I could have ended this before it could happen. I blitzed my way towards King Piccolo and hit him in the gut throwing him away from Master Rashi. I gently took Master Rashi's wounded figure in my arms and gave him to Yamchur and Tien. They were both looking at me with wide eyes not knowing of my true strength as I never let them witness it. It was time for them to see it fully now. Piccolo got himself out of the rubble and with red eyes full of anger shot a mouth key beam towards me. I snorted and started to charge the Kamehameha wave, but I added a twist to it by giving it electricity. The beam immediately transformed from blue to pure white and sparks could be seen dancing in my hands. I shot the beam towards his and the beams clashed. A struggle started to appear but immediately my beam started to overcome his. Terror started to appear in Piccolo's eyes. Knowing his death was incoming he spat his last egg, his reincarnation, and it flew towards the horizon. I didn't stop it. As the beam engulfed Piccolo nothing of him remained. He was thoroughly dead. I sighed. I doomed a lot of innocents today and their lives made my shoulders sag a bit. I wasn't a saint by any reason nor a hero, but it felt quite bad to know you killed an innocent indirectly or not. At least they weren't dead permanently, this thought made me snap out of my reverie. Goku was flying fastly on his Nimbus towards us his power level increased to a whopping 550. He had a satchel with him which I guess could only have Senzu beans. He got off the cloud and dropped in front of us. He looked around and not seeing Piccolo anywhere asked Tien and Yamchu about it. They pointed at me and retold everything that happened. Goku's eyes started shining he didn't even let me rest a bit before he came at me punch coming on flying. His power level was above mine, so there was no reason to be polite as my muscles immediately swelled, and I transformed in my full power technique. My power was 690 in this form so I could easily hold Goku at bay, even though he became way stronger than before. He started pouting and stopped fighting, he knew he couldn't beat me. After taking a good look at Rashi he took a green bean from his satchel and gave it to him. His wounds healed almost immediately due to the Senzu bean's effect. I would surely need to either get myself to learn how to make them or ask Shinran or Paranga for an inexhaustible supply. Rashi got up and started to do a tiny dance of victory even though he was injured before he wasn't unconscious so he knew what happened. He hugged me and told me I did well by killing the monster I hugged him back. It felt just like back when I was a kid and I hugged my old grandpa and grandma. I was devastated when grandma died first only a few years grandpa left too. I grew up with them so it was quite a huge blow to my heart. My eyes watered. But I didn't let them leak. Yamcha and Tien looked puzzledly at me not knowing why I was sad. Goku was looking somewhere else so he didn't notice but Rashi noticed my mood and asked me about it. I just responded with a bit of my life story, how I was abandoned at the temple and I never truly knew my parents, and how I started to view him as a grandfather figure of sorts. Rashi started to smile he didn't mind me viewing him as his grandfather. He had no children of his own and as he trained me and Goku since we were 11 years old, he started to grow on us even he felt that we were like his grandchildren. In Dragon Ball Super Goku even called him Grandpa. After everything was accounted for, they decided to gather the Dragon Balls next year so they could revive everyone else who died in King Piccolo's attack not knowing that Piccolo Jr. was out there. He would appear only three years later during the next Budokai Tenkaichi tournament. And he won't target Goku this time. Even though I didn't need Kami's techniques now I still needed to learn a bit of magic and materialization, but before going to Kami's lookout I decided to get a visit to Baba so I could learn some of her techniques. She could contract ghosts as servants it wasn't a very useful technique but that meant no work around the house for me. Her being able to visit the other world could be learned from Kami, so I didn't need many techniques from her. When Goku heard of a new adventure he immediately piped up ready to go. So we made our way to Baba's palace when Rashi heard we were going to visit his sister, he decided to come as well. Tien, Yamcha and Kairatsu thus followed. Launch didn't want to stay alone at home so she came as well. So we were all now at Baba's palace. I walked towards Yurinai's Baba palace with my whole crew they were all interested into her special abilities to find anything in fortune telling. 
Rashi was boasting about his sister and how she was the greatest fortune teller on earth unlike all those fakes out there. Her powers were truly genuine. We were met by a rotund pink ghost with a bamboo hat at the entrance. He bowed and told us to follow him inside. We met Baba inside one of the palace's rooms, and she started with her introduction. Welcome. To find one thing your heart desires, you have to pay one million zenny. After that, she looked towards us and her eyes narrowed at seeing her brother Rashi. She was a woman of small stature, and she wore black witch clothes, which hat and all she was sitting cross-legged on her foretelling orb. She was also missing quite a few teeth. She sneered at Rashi and asked, What have you lost this time, you old fool? Rashi looked betrayed and said, While I might have lost something big, sister, we are not here because of that. She looked puzzled if they weren't here for her to show missing items, then why were they here? I walked forward and said, Baba, I'm here to learn some of your techniques if you would be kind enough to impart them. She snorted and said, Here to learn my craft so you could make money and take away my customers no chance I will teach you that for all the zenny in the world. I sweat dropped I didn't need her fortune telling skills. I was here to learn how to summon those pink ghosts and I clarified it for her. She nodded her head thoughtfully and said, So you want ghost servants eh? This can be done. But the price isn't low for me to teach you this summoning technique. It's as much as you would get for a session of fortune telling, one million zenny, not one zenny less. It seems the rumors of her being a miser were true. Rashi shouted from behind and said, No family discounts? Baba looked at Rashi and said, For a perverted brother like you? No chance lecherous old man. Rashi was angry and said, Old man? But I'm your little brother, what would that make you ancient? Immediately Baba entered a frenzy. You could never question a woman's age, especially in the way Rashi said it. I immediately started to defuse the conflict, but it seemed she didn't want to teach me anymore even if I paid her. Rashi's comment angered her quite a lot. I insisted on her teaching me, but she said she would only teach me if I beat her champions, just like how she would act when there were people who didn't have money, and they wanted free fortune telling. We made our way outside the palace and into a fighting arena that was placed outside. I didn't want to waste time so I got up first. Fighting with her weaklings was easy enough, Vampire Man, Invisible Man both knocked out before they could do anything. Baba was dumbfounded at my strength, but she still had two aces in the holes. She changed the fighting ring into the mouth of a stone statue that looked like a demon after we entered we would have to fight on the tongues of the demon statues. Out of the dark came a mummy-like fellow which got instantly knocked out just like the other two. A blue-skinned man wearing a devil outfit came out next I didn't even let him charge his devil beam, which would turn people with wicked intentions or thoughts into stone. I'm sure the beam would work on me as I couldn't ride the nimbus. Baba was angry at how easy I disposed of her greatest warriors that almost no one could beat. She made one last warrior come out, and the warrior insisted that he would like to fight Goku and not me. He also said he wanted to fight outside. The warrior wore a green and orange martial gown. He also wore a rabbit mask, and he had a halo above his head. It was Grandpa Gohan, the poor guy who died because Goku crushed him in his Ozuru form. Goku and Gohan started to fight, but it was obvious Goku was way stronger than Gohan due to my influence. Goku easily defeated him, but his mask slipped off his face and Goku immediately started to cry rivers. He flew in the man's embrace and sobbed, calling out all the time Grandpa Gohan. Baba explained to us how she would contract strong fighters from the other world and bring them outside for a day so they could fight for her. Goku was extremely sad as his reunion with Grandpa Gohan wouldn't be very long. But he accompanied him till he started to dissipate as he was ascending back to the other world's heaven. I patted Goku on the back, and he smiled towards me. It seemed he was content that he knew his grandfather had gone to heaven. Baba gave in and taught me her summoning technique. As my mind and soul grew stronger my memory almost become photographic and in the future, it would evolve there. I could also comprehend things way faster than when I was small. So it wasn't hard for me to learn the technique. The technique used key, but it wasn't a key technique, it was more like magic. 
I used my key to draw a special array on the ground, which helped me to summon the ghost servants. I used my key and the array started to glow an ominous black and out of it didn't come any strong demon but a pink ghost with a bamboo hat which bowed to me and said, Debodo greets master. The ghost wasn't strong. It was supposed to be a caretaker for the house. So I gifted him to Rashi so he would cook food and do the housekeeping instead of launch. I still lived at Kim House so it didn't matter anymore. In the future though I would get my own house in North City. I even saved Zenny as I didn't need to pay her because I beat her champions. Now it was time to save some Senzu beans from Yajirobe's fat face. I informed the others of how I would go to Korin's tower to train some more there. Goku already trained there so he knew how things would go, Rashi was the same, but Tien and Yamcha insisted on coming with me so they could learn Korin's techniques as well. I decided to let them come so they would become stronger for the future so they wouldn't die and make us waste wishes which could be used for a better cause. We flew quickly towards Korin's tower, and we arrived a few hours later, we didn't need to climb the tower so we just flew straight up and entered one of the holes below the tower. We immediately met with Korin the fat white cat hermit and Yajirobe who was trying to stuff his fat face with a handful of senzu beans. I kicked him in the head and took the senzu beans away from his hands, those were precious resources that grew very slowly. I didn't need to let this fat slob who didn't even want to train seriously before the scions came to eat them and waste them. Corinne looked surprised at my interference he wanted to chide him. But he couldn't as Yajirobe sneakily made his way to the pot full of senzu beans. Yajirobe got up the ground and asked what was the matter. I berated him on Corinne's place and told him of the bean scarcity and importance. After Corin also chimed in on how he would have inflated like a balloon after eating these many he calmed down and shut up. Corin inquires to me how I knew about the bean's effects, and told him how Goku used them on Rashi back after King Piccolo died. Corin nodded his head and inquired why we were here. I came here to save the Senzu beans, while Tien and Yamcha wanted to train. The cat didn't have many techniques besides the knowledge of growing Senzu beans. I already knew the after image technique. So I inquired about the Senzu beans growing technique before I let Yamcha and Tien start their training with Korin. Korin said that the soil used for the beans was essential while it was supposed to be nourished by key day and night. The technique used to nourish them was also special. It was too much of a hassle to grow them by myself. Maybe I could just ask Shinran to give me a bag with an infinite amount of them. I should also make sure to ask Shinran to make the bag indestructible. I bid goodbye to Tien and Yamcha as they wanted to train with Corin. At their power level Corin's training was still effective for them. I decided that I would train my body and go to Kami's so I could learn to materialize and some of his other mind techniques it was time. I started by directly using the surrounding gravity to 10 times normal and it was a qualitative change. I see why Goku could increase his power level to 8000 in one year. It was way more effective than below 10 but it was also quite harder. I immediately started to climb the tower and I climbed and climbed, and it took me day and night under the stress of the gravity my power level was going up every day. It took me 10 days and my power level increased to 520, and it was still going strong. I didn't get exhausted and I took some senzu beans from Corin. if I got hungry I would eat one, and I didn't need to eat for half a month. After I got up so high not even the clouds remained, I spotted a ladder and the backside of the lookout. It looked just like in the anime, a big circle with a red bottom. I got up the ladder and arrived at the lookout. Kami's palace was in front, white porcelain squares on the ground. Palm trees planted around in ground took from below the lookout. Suddenly sinister laughter that sends chills down my spine came from the palace's entrance. Hua ha ha hu hu hu. Then the laughter suddenly stopped and a voice that shouldn't be heard by human ears suddenly was heard. A maggot made his way to Mr. Popo's lookout? At this moment I knew I messed up. The black genie Mr. Popo was extremely not like how he was in the anime. In the anime he was a soft-spoken servant of Kami's but this Mr. Popo was vulgar and terrifying. The most terrifying aspect about him was that I couldn't sense his power level at all. He was like a vast black hole, his power level unimaginable. He immediately appeared in front of me and threw me away from the lookout. But I started flying made my way back he frowned at me his red lips forming into a sadistic grin. And he said, It seems this maggot doesn't know the pecking order. I guess I will have to teach you. He started to punch me and kick me. 
But I used all of my six dots and started to dodge and weave around his attacks. Mr. Popo looked surprised at me. It seemed even though he was stronger than Cannon, he couldn't reach my power level with my whole six dots, which was 33,280. Mr. Popo stopped attacking me and said with a huff, It goes the dirt, the worms in the dirt, Popo's stool and Cammy. His power level was a bit stronger than Vegeta's after I took a look at it in my full power. He couldn't hide it from me. Mr. Popo just scoffed and called out, Kami, you have a visitor. An old Namekian wearing a robe inscribed with the kanji for guardian came out of the palace. He also had a staff in his left hand. He nodded his head towards Mr. Popo and asked me, Well, if it isn't the one who vanquished King Piccolo, why are you here? I bowed towards Kami as a sign of respect towards Earth's guardian, even though he couldn't do anything against Piccolo later. He would have still trained Goku and taught him so he could defeat him in his stead. He even wanted to sacrifice himself so Piccolo would die with him. I said after the bow, Great Earth's guardian Kami, I came here to seek out your techniques and training. I have heard tales about the great guardian of the earth below the tower. I had to make sure they were true so I climbed my way here. Kami nodded his head, a lot of people wanted his training back in ancient times when the martial arts were flourishing. Now very few people trained in martial arts and no one else was capable of climbing the tower to train with him. He also had high requirements of the person that could get up to the lookout. If he didn't meet them Mr. Popo would throw them out. He asked me what I wanted him to teach me and I responded with a simple, Everything that you can Mr. Kami. I know that you viewed my fight with King Piccolo and you know what I'm capable of. Kami nodded his head, he didn't have to teach me, he could just impart his techniques to me through telepathy. So he did just that, I immediately learned materialization and a bunch of tricks and tips on how to control key better and enter into a special meditative stance that could enhance my training speed both mental and physical, combined with my techniques which I trained in my training speed would increase by a lot from now on. Kami was ready to take his leave as he already gave me all of his techniques that he could give without making me his successor. I suddenly stopped him and asked, Is there anywhere I can train on this lookout? Somewhere I could train without any constraints? Popo's eyes shined at my question and he immediately appeared in front of me and said, There's a special chamber that could be used to shape you up maggot. I mean esteemed guest. Kami didn't catch Popo's words clearly when he said maggot as he whispered that part to me. Kami was getting older and more senile with time and he didn't realize Mr. Popo's true personality, it seems. Mr. Popo took me to the hyperbolic time chamber and we both entered. Immediately he locked the door behind me and threw me into the void of nothingness that was the hyperbolic time chamber. He didn't accompany me. It seemed he wanted to torture me with the constant loneliness and nothingness of the chamber. But I couldn't fall for that since my mind was extremely strong. The gravity in here was two times normal Earth's and the climate was harsh and ever-changing. But I could endure it. I started training, materialize wasn't hard technique so it was already mastered. Everything else Kami taught me wasn't things that could be mastered either so I just put them in practice. I used materialize to create a new fully weighted outfit for me which in total weighted above 1000 kilograms. I also created the gravity force field around me 10 times. Combined with the two times from the chamber it became twenty times. I immediately was squashed to the floor. A red tint appeared around me due to the intensity of the gravity. I immediately got myself up and sat cross-legged as the healing factor started to heal my broken bones and torn muscles. I could feel them getting strengthened at an amazing pace and even my chi grew stronger and stronger. Time was going by very fast in the hyperbolic time chamber. As soon as I got accustomed to the gravity I increased it 11 times, 12 times, 20 times. By the time I got used to 20 times, two days already had gone by outside while inside it was two whole years. I grew up more than the wish I already was at 1 meter and 85 centimeters. But I could feel that I won't grow by much anymore, this was the body's limit, but my full power technique will still increase my mass and height, I could reach 2 meters in height with it. I didn't stop training my techniques while training my body either, I could fully use all of my six dots without a big consumption now, and I tried to get the Azura mode to work but unfortunately I just couldn't do it, it wasn't a realistic technique I could grow two more arms like Tien but more than that and it would just fail. It was just physically impossible. 
But I got a different idea, instead of creating a physical representation of an Azura, maybe I could try to get an image behind me? I suddenly remembered about the doctrines of the Oran Temple, they were Shaolin Buddhists, maybe I could try to create a Buddha? There were different types of Buddhas, some with many arms. Some that looked like they were crying or laughing. Maybe I could create a Buddha image behind me which would increase my power, and it would help do techniques at the same time. I forgot the passage of time as two more days passed, and four years passed in total. Behind me appeared an imposing Buddha figure with six arms, he didn't have three heads, but he had three faces, each changing intermittently at my will. One was peaceful, one angry, and one benevolent like he wanted to save the world. My power level increased by ten times the amount normal, and I could also use my dots which by now didn't drain me of anything while using them. While I focused on techniques and not on the training my power level didn't increase by much, I decided that I would inspect myself after I left the chamber. I decided to name my technique Benevolent Buddha Stand, as it appeared behind me just like the stand's powers from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, and the Benevolent Buddha was the strongest form. It was time to go out, Mr. Popo finally remembered about me and he opened the door. I made my way out and Mr. Popo did a double take when he looked at me. I instilled fear in him as he remembered how I could multiply my power level by quite a lot. Combined with my new power level, he knew he was outmatched right now. I checked my internal situation and I was surprised, four years of training and my power level reached 35,000. I was almost half as strong as Goku when he landed on Namek after he trained under 100 times normal gravity, while well, I trained under 40 times normal gravity, but I guess there would also be a qualitative change in training speed when you reached 100 just like when you reached 10. I bid Mr. Popo goodbye and made my way towards Came House. I stopped by a river to clean myself and shave my beard that unknowingly grew after four years of solitude in the chamber. When I arrived at Came House everyone couldn't recognize me. But when they saw the six dots on my head they realized I was Krillin, Yamcha and Tien were still missing as they were training with Korin. But Rashi, Goku Launch and Bulma were astounded. I didn't hold anything for them telling them about how I trained with Kami. It should help them in the long run. And I wasn't selfish, I was kinda sad I was sending them towards that devil Mr. Popo. But I don't think he would kill them, he seemed like a ruthless creepy bastard. But I guess he had his limits on how he treated those he trained. I wasn't sure, since I didn't truly train with him. I just helped all of them towards the lookout by flying extremely fast. Mr. Popo was startled when he saw me come in tow with all of them. I even went down the tower to take Tien and Yamcha. After that I left them to train after I took my goodbyes. There were three more years till Piccolo Jr. was going to make his debut, and I had to do some things before then. Firstly, I would revive all the people that died in King Piccolo's attack. Secondly, I would use the Dragon Balls to go to Planet Namek, get my potential unlocked and use their Dragon Balls. Thirdly, I was thinking of touring the universe, Planet Earth was already too small to contain me. I would visit from time to time after I learned Instant Transmission, and I would help them if they were in mortal peril, but it was time for me to unfurl my wings and fly. My training speed also increased more and more as my potential was getting unearthed. By the time it was time to get the Dragon Balls, I would have already reached a power level above 100,000. It was time to adventure into the galaxy and see new things, make my plot I didn't need. To follow the original one, I already helped the main cast by quite a bit, I even left them all the Senzu beans in case of emergency. There were also some secret stashes at Korin so Yajiro wouldn't get his hands on them. I wouldn't interfere with Frisia or his family till I got strong enough. I could also weaken Cell if Dr. Jero didn't get his hands on Frisia's DNA. I would make sure I surely destroyed the tiny tyrant. I wasn't sure if Broly was the crazy one or the innocent one since God didn't specify in what continuity of Dragon Ball I was. If he was the innocent one that was full of potential I could take him on as my student. Having him as a student and friend would make for a great bodyguard that would get strong every time he fought and even exceed the one he fought it. If he was the evil crazy one I could only send his on his way when I was stronger. I decided that I would never stop the gravity field from now on and apply it only to the body and not towards the surroundings. Every time my body wouldn't feel pressured at all, 
I would increase the weights and the gravity at the same time. I would make sure to stop the gravity and unweight my clothes if there was an emergency though. I didn't want to get taken advantage of when I was in a weaker point. I decided to train in the wilderness till the dragon balls would get activated. I found a waterfall and started meditating under it the gravity was crushing me combined with the weighted clothes I had to do nothing else. I just started to focus on the continuous tempering of my mind, combined with the special sutra that purified my ki and body. I stood immobile under the waterfall for a long time. Seasons came and go and suddenly a beep from my chest pocket waked up me up. The dragon balls activated again. It was time to gather them. It was extremely easy for me now that my power level was above 55,000 with all the training under the gravity and the waterfall I could go around earth very quickly. With the help of the dragon radar it took me only a few hours to get a hold of them since some of them were scattered in ravines even volcanoes so I immediately summoned Shinran. Arise Shinran and grant me my wish. Shinran came out of the dragon balls and he started to grumble and mutter under his breath. Damn brat. Huh, it seems he grew up. Can't he let me sleep for more? He solicits me every time the dragon balls are off cooldown. Can't a dragon have his beauty sleep? After that he said out loud. Out with your wish already. I need to go back to sleep. He was grumpy it seemed Shenron liked to sleep. I directly said my wish so he could leave. Revive all the good people who were killed by King Piccolo directly or indirectly. Shenron's eyes glowed red, and he disappeared in the sky. The strange thing was the fourth dragon ball didn't even leave it just floated towards me slowly. It seemed Shenron realized I would grab it anyways so he didn't even bother to scatter it around the world. Neat. Huh? Now I just had to wait one more year before I made my way to Namek. So I decided to train with the others at the lookout to inspire them so they can become stronger. Goku was practically my bro as I grew up with him since we were 11. Yamcha and Tien weren't as close to me but I could see us becoming friends in the future. I accelerated towards the lookout as my white golden aura enveloped me after I created the benevolent Buddha stand technique. My aura changed from its black color to white gold. I wasn't truly sure why maybe it was because of the states of the Buddha. I didn't fully use it as I had no one to fight everyone was too weak. After one year everyone grew stronger. Goku was already nearing 800 power level. Yamcha was at 340. Tien at 420 and Master Rashi was actually at 650. They all grew stronger faster due to my influence. After they saw me they all started to rush towards me. They missed me after one year of not seeing each other. I nodded at them. I missed all of them as well I could feel a sense of kinship and friendship towards all of them. Goku and Rashi were like family to me. I talked to them about how they trained and gave them some tips and advice. Even though they looked exhausted and a bit scared by Mr. Popo's training regimen, they couldn't argue that it wasn't effective. Even though Yamcha would remain with a sequel even now he was muttering. You, the dirt, the worms in the dirt, Popo stool, Kemith Popo. I think he followed that code religiously now, Tien wasn't as scared, but he looked shaken, Goku and Rashi were the least affected, but it was obvious the black genie inspired fear in both of them as well. And I understand why that damn bastard appeared right in front of me with no prior response. It seemed he grew stronger as well, his power level was now around 23,000. I wonder if Mr. Popo was so strong why he never helped during the major crises in the series, but it was obvious this wasn't the same Mr. Popo from the original, maybe he just didn't want to? I could see him do that with his personality. I just ignored Popo's maggot call and continued talking with my friends. I informed them on how next year I would leave the planet to go into a space adventure. They wanted to join, but I told them they were too weak, and I would let them join when they were at least as strong as I was now. Goku pouted. Tien looked downwards and clenched his fist. Yamcha didn't care he didn't want to go to space he just said it cause the others wanted to and he didn't want to be left out. I supervised their training for a few months and they all grew enormously with me and Mr. Popo guiding them at the same time. I also grew in power. Teaching was a way of learning as well. Goku broke trough the 1000 mark and reached 1100. He could trash Raditz down with no help now. Rashi got to 860. 
Tien to 560 and Yamcha to 440. I could see a pattern here. I couldn't say that Yamcha was the least talented, but he just didn't put as much heart and soul as the others. He seemed distracted by something. Tien, Goku and Rashi always trained with their best, but Yamcha seemed like he had another thoughts in his head. I singled him out during one of the training session and asked him about it. He shook his head and responded, Hey man, it's not like I don't give my beast physically. It's just that it's lonely here all men a green weird guy that looks like Piccolo and a black sadistic genie? I can't concentrate on the training properly at all. I nodded at his words unlike me his mind wasn't tempered since a young age and he had distracting thoughts in his head. I asked him if he would feel better if I took poor here. His only companion since he was a child. He nodded his head towards me having a more familiar face with him would help him concentrate better and during breaks. He could even reminiscence with Poir about the past. I used my extremely fast speed to go to the Kame house where we left launch Poir Kayatsu and Oolong so they could take care of the house. I informed Poir about Yamcha's dilemma and he immediately wanted to come. Launch Kayatsu and Oolong wanted to come as well now that they heard where we were. I decided to amuse them and took all of them with me. I used my telekinesis to take a hold of all of them and levitated them around me just like the moon would gravitate around the earth. Launch Kairatsu and Poor giggled they seemed entertained by it. But Oolong's face started to turn green. Seemed the little bacon had motion sickness. I stopped the rotation and just quickly got them to the lookout. I didn't forget Rashi's house I put it into a capsule which I would give to him later. I arrived with all of my passengers and Toe Launch sneezed and she became blonde launch. She immediately launched herself towards Tien and gave him a bear hug. It seemed things got steamy when I wasn't around came house between blonde launch and Tien. Yamchur looked enviously at the couple but nodded towards Poir and started to talk with him. Kayatsu just looked with a smile at Tien and launch it seemed he was happy for his friend who found love. He seemed entirely supportive of their relationship. Oolong wasn't sure what he was supposed to do here so he just observed. I gave the capsule to Rashi when Mr. Popo suddenly appeared before Oolong and said with a sinister grin on his face. He licked his red lips and his one tooth showed itself as well. Our emergency food seems fresh enough. He seemingly lifted a giant black meat cleaver out of nowhere and was ready to cleave the little piglet human into two at the first notice. But I stopped him, while Oolong was perverted and a bit immature he was innocent, didn't need to kill him, we also had plenty of food, Mr. Popo was just sadistic in his way. He scoffed towards me and gave me the middle finger while saying, Lucky you maggot, you are stronger than me right now. I just ignored him. I started to doubt Kami's ability to see in others' hearts if Mr. Popo could live with him for so much time, and he still couldn't see this guy was evil incarnate. Or maybe Mr. Popo's concealing techniques were top-notch, as he could even surprise me when my power level was above his by quite a lot. Time passes by fast when you do what you like with friends and family. The Dragon Balls got activated again, and it was time for me to leave Earth. I gathered them even faster than before. My power level already reached almost 90,000. It started to grow faster and faster the higher it got. No bottlenecks were encountered. My body adapted itself more and more with the healing factor. It felt like it almost had no limits. I summoned Shinran, everyone was around me, they were ready to tell me goodbye, as I wasn't sure when I would come back, maybe before the next world tournament, maybe later. I was sure Goku would defeat Piccolo as his power level was already almost at 2000. I chanted the words, Arise Shinran and grant me my wish. And out of the balls came Shinran. For a few seconds he looked at me like he wanted to kill me and started swearing out loud. You little shit I already told you I want to sleep. Why do you summon me again? I will trash your mother you little shit. I surely just ignored the dragon since he was grumpy for wakening up so many times these years. I just told him my wish. Take me to planet Namek near a populated village. And I was gone in a flash. Shinran was too. The four-star ball just flew towards Goku now since I wasn't there. Goku was pretty startled, but he grabbed the ball anyway. Now I found myself on blue earth and green sky. Strange blue trees were around me and strangely shaped white houses. I was on Namek. 
and the natives weren't happy seeing me here. The Namikians didn't look very friendly as they pointed their arms at me fully charged with ki. It seemed the warriors weren't gone doing fieldwork today. They started to talk among themselves in their language which I didn't fully understand. This is one of the ancient albino Namikians. I thought we eliminated all of them for their transgressions. Should we inform the Grand Elder? Another one responded while he kept his arm pointed at me. I think we should. An albino Namikian still alive is a great sin. Only the Grand Elder can give out the sentence pertaining to his life. I interrupted them speaking in the common earth tongue which was English, and they responded in English as well. Hello, I um... Don't understand what you were talking about there, but I would like to meet your Grand Elder. Before they responded to me, they gasped it seemed they realized I wasn't an albino Namikian, and they responded, Ah, are you a visitor from beyond? What can we help you with besides taking you to the Grand Elder? I informed them that I would like to talk the details thoroughly with their Grand Elder. They accepted my word since their Grand Elder's word was law if the Grand Elder accepted my request they couldn't refuse it. I flew with them towards the Grand Elder's house and it didn't take us more than 10 minutes. I just grabbed them and made them tell me the directions while also sensing with my key to target the highest power level on the planet. I was met by a though looking Namikian that resembled Piccolo outside of a big white rotund house. It was Nail. When the other two Namikians explained my wish in their tongue, Nail scoffed and said, You want to meet the Great Elder? That isn't so easy, especially for an outsider like you. But from inside came a booming voice that said, Nail, do we have visitors? Nail responded with respect, Yes, Grand Elder, but... Guru cut him off and said, Bring them in. Nail was flustered and said, but Grand Elder, what if they want to hurt you? Guru just said to bring me in. And so he brought me in. Nail wasn't happy at his Grand Elder's Guru's lack of foresight. But he didn't comment more. I entered and saw the giant green fat old slug on his chair. He was goddamn humongous. Seeing him in the anime was something but seeing him in real life was truly different. Guru immediately frowned and said, An albino Namikian? Kill him like the rest. I sweat dropped and Nail was ready to attack me but I interrupted them by saying, I'm not an albino Namikian I come from Earth. I know about your race because of another Namikian that resides on the planet as the Guardian. Guru seemed like he realized something. Oh the son of Tath survived the purge. It seemed he was lucky. Let me take a look at your memories. I, of course, didn't let him look at all of my memories, I also planted some fake ones to make it seem like Kami taught me a bit about Namek and that he didn't lose all of his memories. Guru snorted and said, He calls himself Kami? Nail from now on you shall address me as Super Kami. Wait no Super Kami Guru. Yes, Super Kami Guru. Say it again Nail. Yes, Super Kami Guru. I immediately stopped them and Guru knew what I was after so, he gave me the dragon ball from above his chair and put his hand on my head again. Immediately I could feel the key unlocked deep within me stir as Super Kami Guru said, Your potential is limitless due to your special body. I can't even bring out a true fraction of it but the increase will be substantial. I could feel my power level skyrocket 100,000, 200,000. It stopped only at 900,000 just a little shy of a million. I was almost as strong as Frisia's second form in my base. Guru nodded his head and he felt quite drained at unlocking my potential while it didn't shorten his lifespan it did put quite high energy consumption on him because of my high potential. I nodded at Guru and thanked him. Nail started to accompany me but before we truly left Super Kami Guru said again. Nail the next time the Dragon Balls cool off summon Paranga and ask him for a big plasma TV. But Super Kami Guru that would be a great misuse of their powers. Did I stutter? I want a big plasma TV. Asterisk I asterisk okay super kami guru, I will see it done the next time the dragon balls are ready to be used. So you should do. After that conversation we left and it didn't take long to gather all of the dragon balls. I didn't know Namex language so I had nail to say the password. It was the same as Shenrin's but instead of Shunron they said Paranga and it was in their language. Arise Paranga and grant me my wish. 
a giant buff dragon with horns and Namekian antennae came out of the balls. Holy shit, their Shinran was jacked. It was completely different seeing him up close. He looked like he hit the gym 7 out of 7 while taking steroids by inhaling them through the nose. He started to speak in a common tongue and said, I will grant you three wishes. Nail looked at me and inquired with his eyes what my wishes were, and I told him, Firstly give me a special ship with the Super Dragon Ball radar incorporated in it. The ship should contain an infinite amount of food a gravity chamber that can increase its gravity how much I want, and it should be able to compress itself just like capsules on Earth. It should also have all of the coordinates of the populated planets within this universe, information about the planet and all, while being at it make it indestructible as well. Nail explained to the dragon but the dragon said, All of it is doable besides being indestructible. There are some forces out there that can destroy anything the most I can do for you is to be indestructible to forces below that power. I nodded my head and Nail confirmed the wish. A tiny capsule appeared in my hands. One wish was done it was time for the next one. This one would be important for me. Give me a god key training room that can be installed in the spaceship or taken away at will being just like the spaceship, meaning that I want to be able to carry it with me at will. When the dragon heard this wish, he shook his head and said in a booming voice, Impossible. My creator doesn't have god key, I cannot help you with this one. Say another one. Well, one plan was out of the window, I guess to reach god key I would have to train. Normally and accumulate it as Vegeta did. I couldn't take the easy way out like Goku did with his let's hold hands and I get god key now. Well, I guess I could use something else then. Impart to me the best magic and key techniques known in the universe. His eyes glowed and my brain instantly started to work. It was extremely strong it could take everything the dragon put into it. My eyes glowed a lot of techniques were very useful, magic was used with key but in different type of form, while key was used for attack defense and fighting in general magic was more of a supporting type of key usage. You could create beings or infuse yourself with magic to increase your power level, stop emotions, and summon beings from the other world. As for the key techniques, they were different types of beams, but there were also special techniques like my benevolent Buddha stand. With it, I even got my hands on the Kaioken and instant transmission. I didn't need to visit Yard Rat anymore. I decided that immediately when I left Namek, I would make sure to train in all of the techniques and master them. As for the last third wish, I wasn't sure what to wish for. Maybe, give me a bag of Senzu beans that has an infinite amount of them inside, while also make them as indestructible as the spaceship. The dragon shook his head again and said, These magical beans are too overpowered with no drawbacks. I can't give you an infinite amount of them. It would break the laws of balance, and it might wake up someone sooner than intended. I sweat dropped. I almost woke up Beerus by accident. Another wish out of the window, I wondered what else I could wish for. But it suddenly hit me in the head, why didn't I think about this before? I wish for all my support techniques to be combined into one super technique, that can increase my power level based on all of the other multipliers. The dragon's eyes shined and he left Nail looked at me with wonder in his eyes not being sure how many techniques I had. But with the new techniques I got from the other wish I had quite a damn lot. Combined with the others that I had maybe when I fully used the combined version I could even compare to Super Scion Blue's multiplier. I immediately tried to activate the amalgam of techniques. Firstly my Buddha stand appeared before me its strongest form on display the benevolent face. Lightning appeared around me as god speed was activated my muscles bulged up and a red aura also appeared around me at its maximum potential. All my dots activated at the same time and combined into one on my forehead which shined a pale gold. I could feel my power explode. This was the combination of all of my techniques and it was way above any super scion multipliers below the god forms. But immediately I coughed up blood and I sagged down to the green earth. My body immediately started to heal up and my power level increased breaching one million. It seemed my body wasn't ready to use the whole fusion of techniques. I could use them individually or a few of them combined, but not all of them. I nodded towards myself. Nail was shocked as he could feel my power for a second then it disappeared when I entered in my now dubbed supreme mode. I exceeded his sensing capabilities, but now it came back to above a million and the power still shocked him so hard he almost started shaking. His power level was just around 42,000, so of course he would be scared. I nodded towards him and indicated that I was going to leave, he bowed towards me and I left using the spaceship, which was extremely fast and luxurious in the inside. It seemed Purunga knew his stuff. I immediately turned the gravity to 200 while I materialized heavier weights on me. I turned the gravity field around me to 2 as well. Reaching the amount of 400, 
I already trained with a gravity above Vegeta's when he tried to surpass Goku and get the Super Saiyan form. I made the ship wander around the universe as I didn't have a certain destination in mind. Maybe I would swoop in and save someone from a villain who knows? I wasn't very top tier in power but compared to everyone else in the universe I was only rivaled and outclassed by the Frost family but that could be considered in base power alone. Now I could truly protect myself in the universe well if Beerus came now and decided to make me space dust I still couldn't do much but everyone else was game on. Well the Frost family was, I don't think I could beat Cell or Mage and Bu yet, they were way too strong maybe if I used my supreme mode, but it was impossible to use in a fight right now. I immediately started to train the other techniques that I got from Purunga, while under the stress of high gravity to temper my body, instant transmission wasn't hard as my key control and sense were impeccable I could sense Earth and countless other keys in the universe it overwhelmed me a bit, but I closed my senses to the mostly unknown or very small keys. I could feel Goku's key as I made myself familiar with it, I could also feel huge keys with a tint of frost in them, it was the frost family's keys they were all scattered through the whole galaxy. Frieza's was the nearest as I could feel he was half as strong as me in his first form. Then it was Cooler, who was extremely strong, he was stronger than Frieza's final form by a bit not counting his transformation. There was also Cold, he was also a bit stronger than Frieza's final form. Now I understood when Frieza said he was only bested by his family. They were a tiny bit stronger than Frieza, but not enough to thrash him around like a rag doll. I wasn't a saint nor a hero if Frieza intervened with me or Earth, I would let him still roam around. Lives would be lost, but as I didn't see them it was not my job. If I saw some injustice going on I would help, but I wouldn't go around parading myself as a hero of justice. I felt bad about what King Piccolo did on Earth because it was my home planet, my kin was on it, why would I care about the other alien races? Would the alien races care about my well-being or my planets? I'm sure as hell they wouldn't. While I was pondering, the Super Dragon Ball radar started beeping, it seemed a Super Dragon Ball was near. The ship was extremely fast as it made its way towards the Super Dragon Ball. The galaxy outside was beautiful, stars were shining everywhere and planets could be seen swiftly disappearing and appearing as the ship made its way within the cold space. After a few hours of traveling I finally arrived at the Super Dragon Ball's location. It looked like a dead planet. It just was covered by a layer of space dust. I looked towards it and I suddenly realized that I wasn't strong enough to get it, it was too big. I also remembered I couldn't use it as well, it required the language of the gods or something just like Namek's Dragon Balls required Namekian language. I sighed. I couldn't gather all of them anyway. I didn't know how to breach the barrier between universes, and I'm not sure if Kampa or Vados would notice if I entered Universe 6 either. The Super Dragon Balls could be collected later. I wasn't in a rush to wish on them anyway. I already had everything that I wanted and more. Not only that, but I decided to let the ship wander among the galaxy while I trained under the high gravity combined with my gravity field and weighted clothes. My power was increasing every day. I didn't forget to continue training my techniques and their combinations. All of my current power multiplying techniques were Kaioken up to 50 times multiplier, Benevolent Buddha stand 10 times increase in its weakest form 15 times at its strongest, Super mode 64 times increase, full. Power technique 1.5 increase, Godspeed 2 times increase. I also learned some foreign alien techniques but I didn't have the required physique to use them, while the strongest couldn't even rival my Buddha technique. The combination of my techniques brought a qualitative change towards me so I didn't need to learn any more than these. I didn't care about most of the techniques but some could be used by my friends on Earth. There was a special Scion technique that Goku could use before he learned to go Super Scion, the Fake Moon technique. There was also a mantra which could help him learn to control himself in the form. There was a technique for Tien's three-eyed race as well, it was a five times increase in power level, unfortunately, besides the Kaioken the humans couldn't learn other techniques. While the Kaioken wouldn't be pushed beyond 20 times in their hands as that was the limit of a normal body, Scion or not. I could combine some techniques like the Kaioken and the full power technique, Kaioken and Godspeed etc. I could even combine the Kaioken full power technique and Godspeed all together but more than that and my body would give out unable to handle the stress. And I'm not talking about normal Kaioken I'm talking about it at 50 times its maximum. It would take me a while but I could combine all of them with the benevolent Buddha stand as well. It might take whole tens of years before I fused every technique into the supreme mode though. But there was no need for such an overpowered mode till Beerus came. Speaking of Beerus, I hope my constant use of the Dragon Balls didn't hurt the balance of the universe. 
While it was unlikely what Perguna told me put me on thoughts hopefully he will sleep the same amount of time so I could prepare myself thoroughly. As my spaceship wandered around space my communicator suddenly started to beep. It was an emergency signal from a nearby planet. On the screen appeared a bug humanoid with big fly's eyes. He looked at me with a what I could only interpret as an imploring gaze as he started to talk in common tongue. Oh please help our planet traveler we are besieged by a bunch of space mercenaries. And they want to suck our planet resources dry. Quite literally they have a type of tree that sucks the energy of the planet. His explanation was cut short as two blue midgets appeared before him and snapped his neck they had huge bulbous heads and they destroyed their communicator. The midgets were kind of foreign to me. I wasn't sure of who they were, I didn't care either. I could use instant transmission relatively well now and the spaceship wasn't truly needed for me to breathe in space. My body could adapt to outer space due to its healing factor and key strengthening making me able to easily hold out on the void. My body would automatically conserve oxygen that it would reuse every time I was in an inhospitable environment. I could also use key to make a barrier around me which would extend the time I could stay in outer space. I also didn't need as much oxygen as normal humans to survive after the exposure to space. In time just like Frisia I would not need oxygen to survive in space at all. I got out of the spaceship and put it in its capsule mode. I put into my chest pocket and put two fingers on my forehead and started concentrating. The planet the signal came from was nearby and I could sense the power levels there, the highest was at 23,000, while the others were lower below 10,000. I immediately used a special magic technique to make myself invisible and teleported towards the highest power level. Surprisingly, it was a scion who looked just like Goku hairstyle face and all. He was standing on a giant tree which was endlessly growing into the red sky. The earth below was cracked buildings stood in ruin. Bug people everywhere dead. Some of his subordinates were even eating the bodies and chuckling saying that it tasted like space chicken. From their words I heard that the name of the scion was Tulls. I didn't know if he was one of Goku's relatives or not but I didn't care about that. Goku wouldn't care about him since he was evil. I immediately appeared behind him and thrust a key blade straightly in his heart and bifurcated him in two. The cronies were immediately scared shitless but I obliterated all of them with mini lightning infused Kamehameha. They were all weaklings, unfortunately for the planet I came too late, it couldn't be saved it was thoroughly drained of its core's energy and it would die soon. It also seemed that most if not all of the bug people were exterminated. It was a pity since I came too late but nothing could be done. I observed the tree and saw how it used its roots to drain energy from the depleted core of the planet. Suddenly a fruit appeared on its branch. It was extremely big and it looked quite juicy. I think I shouldn't waste it, since the planet was doomed anyway. I grabbed the fruit and took a big bite out of it and finished it in one gulp. I could feel endless energy explode inside my body as my power level jumped to 1,500,000. This was the combination of the fruit and my prior training for almost six months. There was still half a year before the next Budokai Tenkaichi tournament will start, so I still had quite a lot of time to adventure myself in the galaxy. There would also be four years after that to adventure even more before Raditz came to Earth. The planet was on its last legs, I didn't like the tree as it was feasting on planet's life energy. Even though I ate its fruit I wouldn't use it for myself, if I destroyed planets willy-nilly Beerus would go bonkers, Frisia could destroy planets from time to time because he got the okay from Beerus. From planet Vegeta till Namek Frisia never destroyed planets with high life force. Planets with high life force increased the universe's mortal level. And the best nourishment for this tree were planets with high life force. Thus if Beerus ever found it he would destroy it with whoever used it. I got out of the planet's stratosphere and made my way out of to the starry field of space. I clenched my hands and put them around my body my palms facing upwards. With all the techniques of the universe learned, I knew the Gaelic gun Vegeta's attack so I used it to exterminate this dead planet since it was useless to let it remain here anyway. There was a zero chance for it to make a comeback since the core of the planet was destroyed. Destroying the planet would destroy the tree as well. Two problems solved in one shot. I charged the key into my palms as a purple aura started to gather around me and I shot it directly into the core of the planet it was already drained so it exploded and everything from the planet became space dust. I already scanned the planet thoroughly before I made this decision. 
the space pirates were bloodthirsty and had scouters so they killed truly everyone leaving no survivors. The universe was cruel where the strong reigned supreme, as the cold clan was the strongest they pretty much controlled the whole universe. There was the galactic patrol, but they were a bunch of weaklings who could only go after secondhand villains. They didn't even have a force as strong as the Jinyu force. I popped the ship out of its capsule form and continued my wandering around the universe while training. As the ship wandered, and I trained time was just flying, with the infinite food I had in the ship there were no problems for me. Loneliness wasn't even a concept I grasped anymore as my mind and soul attained a strength that not many people would have. I could control my emotions perfectly, and I attained a perfect martial mind enhancing my training speed. By the time the Budokai Tenkechi came, I already reached a power level of 2,100,000. The higher the power level, the faster it increased. Well, if you didn't encounter a bottleneck, but with my body having its unlimited healing and my mind being extremely strong, there was no such thing as limits for me. I could train and train, and my power level will increase continuously. I didn't have a limit or a wall yet like Goku would have in the future, the wall which he would break in super to attain Ultra Instinct. I was passing by a nearby planet when I got out of the ship, and I was ready to use instant transmission to go back to Earth, but I suddenly noticed that the planet was encased in ice and its vitality was slowly getting lower and lower. This wasn't a naturally icy planet, so I decided to explore it before I got back to Earth, Goku was already extremely strong by now if my sensing of his power level was true. He breached 2000 becoming the strongest on Earth. I flew towards the planet and approached one of its more populated cities. Chaos was everywhere as armored grunts used their hand blasters to devastate the city. A giant ship was releasing a beam that was draining the planet of its warmth. I vaporized all of the grunts and took a better look around. The inhabitants of the planet were looking like humans but they had pink skin and pointy ears like elves, they were also tended to look more handsome. They were all hiding around behind rubble that the grunts created. They started cheering when they saw me kill all the grunts in one swift move. I smiled towards them and charged a big bang attack another Vegeta technique. It wasn't hard to learn it. After learning so many techniques it was easy to copy every technique of the main cast and villains. The Big Bang attack struck the ship squarely and exploded nothing remained out of it. I could swear I heard an old voice cough a curse out of it before it thoroughly exploded. Well whatever I guess. The villain was old and with one foot in the grave, I just put him in the grave completely. The cheering of the inhabitants continued for a long while after the spaceship's explosion. Out of the rubble came a beautiful woman with red hair and the characteristics of the race. She had an angular face and a small nose. She was quite a beauty if I said so myself. She bowed towards me and her voluptuous chest bounced. I averted my eyes but I still snuck a peek before she got up. She started to speak in a soft tone of voice as she blushed. I'm the daughter of the leader of this planet and I thank the great warrior from saving us from the evil Lord Slug's clutches. He has been draining our planet of vitality with his cold technology for years. If this continued for a few more years, the planet would have lost all its vitality, and it would become uninhabitable. I nodded towards her explanation as a burly middle-aged man with handsome features also came out of the rubble and said in a modest tone of voice while also bowing towards me, I'm the leader of this planet Great Warrior before you leave. I would like you to join us for a special feast our race holds for great heroes and warriors like yourself. There was still a day or so before the tournament started, so I decided to indulge in this guy's wishes. When I nodded towards him, he started to smile. While he nudged his daughter she started blushing furiously. She was already red so her skin started to take a hint of blue. I flew down and landed the middle-aged man introduced himself and his daughter. My name is Mutart, and my daughter is called Musarka. We hail from the guardian family of the planet. As guardians we are also their leaders. I nodded my head towards his explanation and asked him, What was the deal with that slug guy? His gaze became frosty at the mention of the name slug and he answered, He started to terrorize us some years ago as he heard our race has a fountain that restores the youth of a person for a certain amount of years. He wanted to take it all for himself, 
When we refused and didn't tell him the location he started to attack and terrorize us, he told us that he will destroy the planet slowly and make his grunts and warriors destroy our cities till we collapsed and gave in to his demands. If it wasn't for you great warrior we might have given in right now as we couldn't handle this anymore. If I'm not rude could great warrior tell me his name? I responded casually, Name's Krillin. He nodded his head at me like a chicken pecking rice as he guided me towards one of the more intact and grander buildings. Somehow food was already prepared as if a banquet table was prepared before they even knew I would come. He insisted on me taking the head chair as he would be on my right and his daughter on my left. She just continually blushed during the feast. There were also some other people invited at the feast. I could already hear outside the sound of machinery it seemed they were ready to fix their cities and reconstruct. After the feast, Mutart insisted for me to take a night off and sleep at the residential room I decided to humor him I could instantly teleport towards Earth whenever I wanted some hour of normal sleep instead of meditating would be relaxing even though I didn't need it physically or mentally. I stood on the bed as the door of the room suddenly opened. Musarka gently entered the room wearing nothing but a little bikini her fair red skin showing almost everything. Her voluptuous chest couldn't be hidden at all by the small cloth. I widened my eyes as she made her way towards my bed. She was blushing extremely hard as her face was all but blue. I could sense her father waiting outside the door. I used my telekinesis to close and lock the door. When Mu Tart saw this he immediately left. After a night of fun, I put on my clothes and checked that everything was where it was supposed to be. It was my first sexual experience in this life and I could say that it was pretty enjoyable Sarka was a virgin as well, and she didn't have any experience but it felt good enough. She was sleeping on the bed, the sheets covering her fair body. I made sure to not impregnate her, I didn't want any children yet, I wasn't sure if Marin would even come into being, maybe if 18 would ask for a child, I didn't like children much. She suddenly woke up and looked towards me. She was sure that I was going to leave as I was already dressed. She smiled towards me and said, It was a fun night hero, Krillin. I don't mind that you will leave. Our race has a very open mind concept about our bodily needs. You don't need to take responsibility if anything happens. I was pretty shy because it was my first time, and my father insisted saying that it would give us a good relationship in the future. I nodded my head towards her and said, Whenever you would be in trouble you can call me on this number. I handed her my spaceship communicator number and I prepared myself to leave. She was pretty cute but I didn't look for a long-standing relationship yet. It was just a little bit of fun between two consenting adults nothing more. I put two fingers on my forehead and concentrated. It was time for the last tournament before Dragon Ball Z started. I would enjoy watching the fight between Piccolo and Goku. There was no reason for me to join as I was already too strong for them. And I didn't need the money prize either I could just give some ideas to Bulma and patent them like the scouter and patent it as my idea. Getting at least 50% of the profit maybe 65% with my mind. I could already understand quite a bit of how this futuristic technology worked. I disappeared out of the bedroom and appeared on earth on Papaya's island. It seems I was early as not everyone was here. As I stood around and waited for the others to make their way towards Papaya Island, I was accosted by a blonde woman wearing a skimpy skirt and a blouse that made her assets show themselves quite nicely. She had blue highlights in her hair and wore sandals on her feet. She started to talk to me but I ignored her and she left with a huff. I wasn't interested in her anyway she looked a bit like a street worker ready to make a quick buck. Soon enough, Yamcha and Tien made their way towards the registering place and I waved towards them. They both looked at me with wide eyes almost not recognizing me as now I was standing at a 1 meter and 85 centimeters fully grew up, 10 centimeters taller than Goku. After they registered they asked me if I would participate in the tournament but I shook my head and released a bit of my aura they were both overwhelmed by it. While they were both stronger now, Tien standing at a power level of 1,100 and Yamcha at a power level of 950. They couldn't even withstand a controlled burst of my power. After a while Kaiatsu, Launch, Rashi, Puar, Oolong and Bulma came as well. 
Rashi was the most impressive besides Goku his power level reached 1300. Goku was still at the lookout and he was preparing to make his way here. I chatted with all of them and I told them a few my space adventures, they all gasped or laughed at some of my tales. Bulma was looking at me with a blush on her face and she seemed to be shy. Well I did grow to be quite a bit more handsome than the original Krillin, and Bulma dug handsome men, but I wasn't interested in her I knew her true personality since she was younger, and I could say she was a manipulative woman who would do anything to get her hands on what she wants. She was also quite bitchy and irresponsible. But I couldn't deny she was a genius when it came to tech. It was her only redeeming quality besides her above average looks. Goku came a bit later almost when the registered house closed. Piccolo was watching from a far turban and his original outfit on. He was glaring at me and Goku. It seemed Goku interacted with Piccolo when I was away. I could sense his power level while Goku's was now at 2200 Piccolo's reached 1900. I talked with Goku and it seemed while I was away Piccolo somehow got his hands on the Dragon Balls and still wished for eternal youth. He did so covertly and when the Z fighters saw the dark sky and Shinron the wish was already done. I guess I couldn't blame them I didn't kill Piloff and he still could make a Dragon Ball radar I actually couldn't kill him while he was dumb and he had a penchant of trying to rule the world he was quite innocent. From when he firstly fought he didn't truly try to kill, he was trying to incapacitate and take his wish, unfortunately for him, I knocked him out and took the wish for myself. That was the only time he could have taken his wish, we made our way inside the Tenkechi arena. This year they made it so even spectators could see the preliminaries from outside due to the huge demand. I levitated while being cross-legged and waited for the preliminaries to start. The other spectators looked strangely at me, but after a while of staring they stopped and looked towards the fighting arenas. I wasn't surprised by what I saw. Tien, Yamcha, Piccolo, and Goku made it to the finals. Mercenary Tao should have been here as well in his cyborg form, but I didn't see him. The finals would be Piccolo versus Yamcha and Goku versus Tien. The fights were interesting, Yamcha tried his best to fight Piccolo, but Piccolo just stretched his arms, grabbed him, and then broke his spine on his knee. It was quite brutal before Piccolo could do anything else to him. I intervened by pushing him away with a bit of invisible key. He staggered and looked towards me with fear in his eyes. I took Yamcha away from the stage and fed him a senza bean which Poir gave me. Yamcha got up and looked at Piccolo with uncontrollable fury in his eyes. I patted him on the back and imparted to him mentally a suited training technique and the Kaioken, I even taught him how to create his stand based on his soul quality. He looked at me with gratitude in his eyes. I just nodded my head to him. Humans should stick together. Goku and Tien fought a bit more than Piccolo and Yamcha, but it still ended in Goku's victory after both took their weighted clothes off. The power level difference was just too huge and both their martial arts skills were pretty equal. But Goku being Goku improved all of his techniques in the middle of the fight and adapted. Piccolo narrowed his eyes at the display, unsure of himself if he could take Goku out thoroughly. He knew he was no match for me so the best thing he could do was try to hurt my friends. But with me around he knew there was no chance of that. The finals began and it was quite a bloody fight. Even though there existed a power level difference between Goku and Piccolo, Piccolo had the innate advantage of recovering his injuries at the expense of Ki. The fight was long and almost like in the anime but with Goku coming out on top less injured and the stage not being destroyed. Piccolo closed his eyes. There was no reason for him to live anymore. He was waiting for the final blow. Goku shouted towards Poir to throw him two Senza beans. Poir was confused at the number but threw them to him anyways. Goku ate one and gave the other to Piccolo. Piccolo was quite stubborn not wanting to take the bean but Goku fours fed him it. Piccolo got up from the ground and glared at Goku. Goku just smiled and said, It would be too bad if you died. The Dragon Balls would be gone, and I would have one less rival to fight against, don't you think? Piccolo huffed and said, Even without the Dragon Balls, who else could terrorize this planet with that freak over there watching over it? He pointed towards me and I blushed inwardly. It seemed Piccolo lost all of his thoughts of world domination. I was just too strong and he thought he might never catch up to me. It was kind of true actually. Goku just laughed at his words, I looked better at Goku and he still had his tail. It seemed Kami decided against cutting it off this time for some reason. 
I nodded my head I could still teach Goku the fake moon technique and the mantra to control his inner beast self. Maybe he could even improvise an Ikari mode just like Broly. Goku was still a prodigy even though he wasn't on Broly's level of freakishness. After the world tournament ended I could see Chi Chi running into Goku's arms as they hugged each other. It seemed nothing deviated much of this couple's destiny. I walked towards Tien and imparted him the special three-eyed clan technique the Kaioken and the way to make a stand mentally. I did everything I could for them, everything else was on their comprehension ability. A stand power would be based on the comprehensive power of the individual who created it. My stand could go up to 15 times power level but it would be rare for others to breach 10 times. With their talent I guess Tien could reach up to 8 times and Yamcha up to 6 times. I walked towards Goku and motioned towards him with my hand that I wanted to talk something with him. He came towards me and I taught him the false moon technique and the controlling mantra. I even gave him a bit of scion history and the truth of his race. Goku eyes glazed over as he realized he was the one who killed his grandpa and asked me, Krillin where do you know all of this? I responded towards his question with a lie. During my travels in space, I found out a bit about your race on the ruins of an ancient planet. It seems that your race is also extinct and there are very few people like you out there. Goku nodded his head at the new information. He still wasn't over on how he killed his grandpa unknowingly. But suddenly his eyes started to give a determined aura. And he said, Thanks for teaching me of my origins Krillin. I will make sure I will never lose my control ever again and train fully in the techniques that you gave me. I nodded my head I didn't teach him the Kaioken, but I gave him the stand information as well, with his scion body he might master Akari faster instead of making a stand and cut off the humongous body of the Ozuru down to size so he wouldn't lose mobility or speed with the increase of 10 times power. Everyone was celebrating Goku's win at a new restaurant that just popped open near the tournament building. I looked around as the owner came to our table, I took a better look at him, and he had an afro and a mustache, he was wearing an apron and the uniform of the restaurant. It was Hercule the Fraud. It seemed he realized he wasn't cut for martial arts in this timeline and decided to open up a restaurant here. He immediately started telling us how he admired martial artists and how he wanted to become one himself but realized he wasn't talented. He even wanted to give us the food we would consume on the house. But I stopped him. Even though he would have become a phony fraud in the future, there was no reason to destroy his new business now as he didn't do anything in this timeline. The Zenny prize increased yet again this year to a 5 million amount. 1 million directly went to the bill. Chi Chi looked with wide eyes at Goku's eating habits and she started sweating imagining how much food she would have to cook in the future. Things were pretty much done on Earth and four years of peace were rapidly approaching before Raditz would make his way here to disturb it. I was pretty much done with being on Earth for at least four more years. There was no reason to stay on the planet as I already gave out all the needed training techniques to the core of the Z Fighters. I even taught Kaiatsu some ways to improve his mind and become a better psychic. His body type would never let him become a powerful martial artist but he could become a very powerful physic as he had good talents for that. Piccolo knew he could do nothing anymore as well. Now in the future maybe he would see the bright side of things and become a good guy because if he remained a bad guy he would be forever lonely even though he was strong. During the earlier sagas, Piccolo liked to be a loner, but as he continued to advance in age he realized that being alone wasn't for him. He started to interact more with others, and he even became Baby Pan's babysitter you would see him everywhere he was needed. Piccolo had a soft heart under his tough look. Goku sparing him already gave him second thoughts on his path. Even though he got his father's memories he wasn't his father. King Piccolo didn't truly reincarnate he just infused his memories and a bit of his will on his progeny. I decided to talk with Bulma about the scouters. And she agreed to it after a bit of haggling. I gave her the required information which I improved upon, as I got my hands on some scouters when I killed Tulls. I even gave her some parts so she could find replacements for the materials that weren't on Earth. I didn't know where the materials were mined so I couldn't make my way there to get the metals and required materials to create the scouter. Fortunately, 
Balma immediately listed off replacement materials that would work with my formula. Took her no more than a few hours to create the scouter and she clicked it while looking at me, and she gasped as the number on the screen appeared. Above 3 million Krill in you. She already scanned the other power level on the planet and highest was Goku's. I just made an SSH motion with my finger and closed one eye while smiling mischievously. Most of them knew I was way stronger than them but not by how much. It ignited their blood and fighting spirit if they knew there was always someone there stronger than them. It was even more effective if it was someone they knew and grew up personally with. It would make them never relax and give their all in their training. After we settled the price and how we would share the money I got 63%, I also opened a bank account and told her just to dump my share in there. Unknowingly to me, the scouters would change Earth civilization bit after I came back from my four years trip in space. I prepared my trip and announced all of my friends again of my departure. They were sad that I had to leave as soon I came back. But they understood me by now. They knew that I craved adventure and that I already saw everything the Earth had to give. They all started to wave me goodbye in the front of Capsule Corporation's building as my spaceship blasted into the sky. I also gave Bulma some spaceship blueprints and the gravity chamber idea. She should be able to make it with her father's help. Suddenly, out of nowhere, an irritated voice came into my mind. Human, who are you and why can you spread my patented technique around? I will sue you. It seemed King Kai realized I was spreading his technique without his approval. Maybe he was observing Earth when he felt the key fluctuations of Tien and Yamcha when they trained the Kaioken. I decided to respond to him by directly teleporting to his planet. The blue humanoid man who wore a cap had sunglasses and a gown with the symbol of North Kai on the front gasped and fell on his butt at my sudden appearance and said with a gasp, The Yardration Spatial Technique? I nodded my head. It seems North Kai knew his stuff as the guardian deity of the North Galaxy. He immediately got up and fixed his glasses and gown and asked with a red face, How did you learn my technique? I never showed it to anyone else. I described to him my wish using the Namekian Dragon Balls, and he nodded his head with a thoughtful look on his face. So this wish of yours granted you knowledge of my technique, hmm. I can't stop you from practicing and using it. Whatever I will just take you as a student. King Kai immediately took me as a student in an attempt to save face, knowing he couldn't do anything to me as I was so strong. Since I was his student, he offered me his other technique, the spirit bomb. But I already showed him it, and he gasped and sweat trickled off his face as he said, Ha ha ha! How silly of me as you know all the techniques in the universe, it's obvious you would know the spirit bomb as well, ha ha ha! I asked him if he wanted anything else and after that took my leave. I left a key imprint in my spaceship, which I could teleport back to with my instant transmission. It was time for the next grand adventure in space. Maybe I could kill some more space pirates? I turned on the gravity at 300 and my gravity field at 3, pushing it to a full 900. I also wore weighted clothing and my body plummeted towards the ground but I immediately started to levitate while staying cross-legged as my golden white aura started to encase me. Meditation combined with chi training under the huge stress of gravity and weights would train all the possible aspects of the body and mind at the same time. My healing factor was working tirelessly at repairing my broken bones and torn muscles, strengthening my insides at the same time. My power level was continuously growing, 3,500,000, 600, 4 million. I stopped at 4 million and decided that it was time to continue training my techniques. Unknowingly, six months had gone by during my gravity meditation session. While training my techniques, the communicator suddenly beeped as a hazy signal came from a nearby planet. It was full of static as an SOS message was sent. It was time to be a hero again, I guess. On the communicator, on the display appeared an old man, but the connection wasn't stable enough, so his words came out jumbled and incomplete. Pielahel, squad, kill. I couldn't understand much from the words alone, so I decided to investigate by scanning the planet with my key sense. 
And oh boy was I in for a treat, there was a lower level of above 20 million on the planet, and it exuded an evil presence full of malice and greed. I used my magic to make myself invisible and I hid my power level with my key control ability and teleported myself directly near the action. A bunch of grunts were shooting key blasts all around the planet which looked to be pretty advanced as a blonde haired man with blue skin wearing an armor inscribed with a symbol that I couldn't truly dischiper stood on a building with his hands behind his back. He was flanked by long haired green man who wore the same type of armor and a helmet and a tall brown reptilian man all wore scouters on their face. I wasn't sure who they were, but I kept myself hidden and started to listen to their conversation as the blonde-haired man was talking in a heavy French accent. Jewish, I wonder why Lord Cooler wants this planet. It's not like it would fetch a high price. We are wasting our time here. We aren't even needed the normal soldiers could have conquered it all by themselves. He was the head of the trio and the one with the power level above 20 million, the green-skinned man said. S. Alza, we just don't have to do anything and get paid anyway, why does it matter, Lord Cooler? Gives us easy jobs because we are his most trusted confidants, while there aren't any strong planets on his hit list that need us yet. The reptilian man nodded his head and continued. Yes, yes, door is right. Free money and relaxation is very good. We just have to observe the planet conquering proceedings and get a hefty sum for our non-existent work. Isn't it great, Salza? Salza scoffed at the two men and said, Dorney eyes, I know you two are lazy pieces of trash, but unlike you, I crave some action from time to time. Lord Cooler didn't install me as the leader of the armored squadron for nothing. He wanted for me to do great things. We already conquered most of the strong planets and only the weaker ones remain in our west galaxy. We can't go to the north one as it's in the jurisdiction of Lord Cooler's brother, Lord Frisia. Dor and Nyes nodded their heads at Salza's words, but they weren't truly interested they wanted to laze around and get the rewards. All of them had their guards down, it was an extremely good time for an ambush. I decided to kill the two lieutenants first and have a one-on-one -on -one with the captain. They were really near each other practically, they stood side by side, so I didn't have to do much besides getting behind them. Salza suddenly had a bad feeling, but before he could inform Dor and Nyes, he saw how both of them were bifurcated in two as two golden key blades appeared inside their chests. Salza cried out, Dor Nyes knew you coward show yourself. So I just did my dots were already on three shining at the same time my power level was increased by eight times so my power level was around 32 million I toned my power level down a bit and it reached 20 million. I wanted to train my techniques and skills against this guy. But before I could do anything Salza clicked his scouter and said, Lord Cooler we were ambushed on planet 683921. Door and eyes are dead we require your presence here. The assailant is supposed stronger than me and I might not survive here. Before he could continue I shot his scouter with a purple beam from my finger. It was the Coles family patented death beam. Salza paled realizing I knew this technique unsure of my origins. He shouted out loud. What are your ties to the esteemed Cold family? I just chuckled and said. No ties I'm just here to have some fun with you. Salza's already pale face turned from blue to white he knew how Lord Cooler liked to play with his victims. He thought I was the same as him and he didn't want to have the same fate. I created a wall around us with my magic and as he tried to escape he ran into it. He tried to slash it with a key blade. I raised an eyebrow at his attempts. Seems this guy's key control was pretty great being even able to shape his key into forms. I threw myself at him with a key blade of my own and we started fighting, he had a pretty good blade technique, and as our power level was pretty similar he started to fight back. I parried his blade key and threw a slash towards him which he dodged, and retaliated with an overhead slash, I blocked it and I sank a bit in the cement that made up the building's roof. I threw him back with my strength and tried to slash him in two from the waist but he jumped and tried to fly, forgetting about the box we were trapped in he hit his head on it and plummeted down. Seeing him doing such a stupid mistakes I cut off his head before he could do anything else and vaporized his body with a tiny beam. I sighed. The fight was pretty interesting but the guy wasn't particularly skilled in martial arts besides his keyblade techniques. He was also flustered and scared as he knew my power was higher than his. And he couldn't bring out his true strength. I didn't benefit much from this fight. 
I looked over as the grunts didn't know that I killed their leader, so I just vaporized all of them with my key. Unknowingly to me it seemed I drifted out of the North Galaxy to the West Galaxy while I trained intensively. I left the ship on wandering mode so it never had a destination. Suddenly out of the void came a giant spaceship that was orange in color with white and black strips a giant purple glass was in the middle of its being and out of one of the hatches came out a purple reptilian looking guy with a white headpiece and red eyes. He also had a blue gem-like protrusion on his knees and elbows his power level was massive almost 200 million in total. I felt suffocated. I could become stronger than him by 56 million if I turned on all my dots but I didn't want to spoil the surprise for him. He looked at me with a cold look in his red eyes and said, It seems Salza is dead. What kind of unique being are of you? Bald head no nose? What kind of race do you come from? He asked himself ponderingly. I'm not sure if he could sense my key, but he didn't look agitated in the slightest. It was like he was taking a walk in the park and he saw a cute dog he wanted to pet. He continued his thoughts. Whatever Salza was good, but you are stronger wanna join me. I'm treating my subordinates pretty well. He shrugged his shoulders and asked me nonchalantly. I shook my head and said, We don't have the same kind of intentions when it comes to planets. I'm one who likes the original race to have their planet. Cooler looked disappointed and said, Oh well, if that's what you think, then don't blame me for what I'm going to do now. He pointed his finger towards me as pink energy started to appear at the tip of it. He pointed it straight at my head, but immediately all of my six dots started glowing and I appeared straightly behind him and kicked him in the back. Cooler plummeted towards the planet and crashed in the buildings down below. I started to charge up a Gaelic gun towards him as he started to get up the rubble as he growled. Power multiplying techniques? I see those dots of yours increase your power level as they lighted upon your forehead. Whatever. This isn't my full power. He started to charge up his aura as his power level increased to 300 million, and he easily dismissed my Gaelic gun. I immediately used my full power technique and some strain appeared on my face. Even though I could use up to three combinations it wasn't like I used them flawlessly with no drawbacks. Cooler's eyes widened when my power level exceeded his again and I delivered a key enhanced punch towards his torso. He blocked it with both his arms which he put in an X around his body. Both of them cracked and he grimaced. He was from Frisia's clan so he should be able to transform once more. I couldn't let him, I could still use Godspeed, but I couldn't keep all of the techniques combined for a long time. But unfortunately, I wasn't fast enough, Cooler immediately started to grow taller as armor encased him. His face got covered by a spiky helmet and he grew buffer as well. His power level rocketed to above 600 million, almost 700 million. He started to batter me like no tomorrow but my healing factor could keep up. My bones would break, my internals would rupture, but they would heal seconds later. Cooler looked at me with a questioning gaze. His power level was way above mine, but he couldn't kill me with his punches. He decided to vaporize me directly afterward. He put his hand up as he charged a supernova above his head. I started to charge a final flash as I put my hands together and started to charge up as yellow key appeared in them. Cooler sneered under his armored face and said with a muffled voice, You should know your limits, your power level is way below mine. Do you think you can do anything to me? I smirked at his words as I activated Godspeed and my power level doubled, his eyes widened, but he already threw the supernova at me. I hit it head on with an electrified final flash, my power level was already nearing 800 million. But Cooler immediately started to buff up and his muscles started bulging veins appeared around his enlarged muscles as he put all of his key inside the supernova it started to overpower me. And it was coming for me closer and closer, I couldn't push it back. His power level had gone above 1 billion and it was still rising, it could destroy my body and make me weak for a while but I gritted my teeth and said, Kaioken times 2. My power level skyrocketed reaching above 1 billion and a half and it pushed the supernova back. Cooler wasn't dumb enough to take it head on and dodged it as it flew outside the atmosphere and exploded in the cold void of space. Anger was all over Cooler's face if that hit him he would have been injured quite severely. 
I panted down on the ground as my key was depleted and body injured. My healing factor worked to heal my body and internals but it was really slow. The Kaioken technique put a high burden on the body combined with all of the other techniques. Key isn't supposed to multiply that many times with no drawbacks. My body-based structure still wasn't strong enough to handle it. Cooler immediately appeared in front of me and grabbed my head as he started to run around and run me trough buildings just like the OG Broly did to Goku. I was too weak right now to stop me and he seemed intent to torture me before he killed me. After he trashed me thoroughly with his body he started to use his death beam and pierce me all over my body. I looked like a bee nest, but the holes were already starting to close. Cooler grunted as he started to get bored of playing with me. I didn't sound out a peep during the whole torture. Even though it hurt me my mental fortitude helped me to endure everything. Cooler gathered another supernova and shot it at the planet. Lava started to boil down everywhere as he left. He thought I couldn't survive in outer space as well as the explosion of a planet so he left with his spaceship and didn't look back. I grimaced as I got up the ground the planet didn't have much time left and the impacts of my fight with Cooler doomed all of the other possible survivors. I put two fingers on my head and concentrated. It was quite hard to concentrate with depleted key and a messed up body but I did it. I disappeared off the doomed planet and appeared on a planet that looked similar to Earth. Everything was red though, earth sky and trees. The person who I arrived in front of was red too. She had white hair and a voluptuous figure. Her face was pretty, and she asked with a worried face and a cute voice, Aya, are you okay, mate? I just collapsed in front of her to conserve energy and fasten my recovery. She took that as an emergency sign. I woke up a bit later in a futuristic-looking house with a towel on my forehead tucked between some fluffy sheets. I got up from the bed when the woman entered the room with a tray of food in her hands, and she put it down on the desk before taking a chair and propping herself on it, while looking at me with her hands supporting her head and asked in now what I realized to be heavy Australian accent. So what's your name big guy and what's your story? I didn't know where I was as I hurriedly checked for any kind of key and I teleported to the nearest one and I just responded with a simple, I'm just a traveler that had a bad fight. Could you tell me where I am? She looked at me with a questioning look in her gaze and answered, You are on Space Australia, darling. You must get a hard hit on the head. I blinked my eyes at her and asked myself, Did Space Australia exist in the Dragon Ball universe? What the hell was this? She looked at me and continued. Whatever, Mr. Traveler, could you at least tell me your name? I responded to her. I was grateful she took care of me and there was no reason to lie her, so I just told her my real name. Not many people knew it in this part of the galaxy anyway. My name's Krillin, what about yours? She beamed at my positive response and she answered. My name's Jika, nice to meet you, Traveler Krillin. I sweat dropped that name seemed familiar, the red skin white hair. Was this G's home planet? I shook my head to clear it and Jika started to laugh at my action and said, It seemed you took a hit to your head. You bloke. I started laughing too. It was pretty infectious coming from her. I got up and sat cross-legged on the bed. She got up from her chair and gave me the food she brought. It was an Australian breakfast which consisted of bacon toast egg sausages and fried tomato. I ate it and surprisingly it was very good. She beamed at me as I ate the food it seemed she enjoyed having people eat her. Cooking. Then she remembered something and her smile turned to a frown. I put down the fork and asked her what happened and she replied. Nothing much I just remembered when I was young and cooked for my little bro Jis. Now he is a big shot who can't visit his big sis anymore. He is an officer in a special unit in. Lord Frisia's army. Seemed I was right, she was G's sister. I nodded my head towards her and started to comfort her by patting her back. I knew how hard it was to live alone as after my parents passed away, I had no one else in my last life. She started to get up from her low mood and started to smile again. It seemed she was a happy person naturally and few things would bring her down. She started to ask me about my travels so things wouldn't become awkward and told her about some of my adventures omitting the fight with Frisia's brother. And she gasped and asked me, So you truly saved a princess and her planet from the destruction of a guy 
who wanted to drain it of its life with a cold technology? I nodded my head, it seemed she liked stories. I didn't scan her power level up till now, so I decided to do it now. It wasn't too strong, but not weak either. Her power level reached almost 10,000. It seemed she was kind of talented, just like Jeez. We took the conversation outside. As I looked around the house, I spotted a few framed photos around the wall. Some of them were of the siblings, and some of them were of a middle-aged couple hugging each other. The frame was black. I guessed it was an homage brought towards the two deceased members of the family and didn't comment on them and asked while I pointed towards a frame of her and Jis doing a victory sign while she held a big animal plush. So this is your brother? She nodded and her eyes glazed over it was obvious. She missed him enormously and said, Yeah, he is Jis. I can't believe there's been already 10 years since that photo was taken. The next day he was enrolled forcefully in Frisia's army due to his high battle power and talent and taken away. She started sobbing. It seemed Jis didn't join Frisia's army willingly. I patted her shoulder. I didn't know what to tell her. So I improvised. Doesn't he get free days or can't he call home? She brightens up a little at my words and says, Well, he calls from time to time from his unit's ship communicator. And I can see he made great friends with this guy Birder, who claims himself the fastest in the universe. She started giggling at the mention of Birder and his antics. Or how he has to do strange poses with his captain. His captain saying that they are vital to their team's formation. Here she blown in full laughter. I smiled it seemed my words took her mind off her loneliness. But she was brought down again and she said, but he can't visit at all. In Frisia's words, the Jinyu special unit doesn't get any free days. They work 364 days a year. And they don't get a day off even on Space Christmas. Frisia is a slave worker. At least G says the pay is pretty good and his friends keep off his loneliness. I nodded my head towards her words and asked her, Don't you have any friends or another immediate family around to keep you company? She shook her head but a small smile still appeared on her face as she whistled at a high pitch. Out of nowhere a black blur came into her arms, and it started barking. It was a strange type of space dog. It looked like a pug, but it wasn't a pug I couldn't describe its appearance well, but it was pretty cute. She started to pet the dog in her arms and said, This is my friend Cho Cho. He is the only one who likes my company. She seemed sadder when she said those words and I asked her tactfully, Why does no one want to hang around with you? She immediately scoffed at my question and said, It's not because of me I'm not sure myself. They are just scared to be around me for some reason. It was a strange thing. Why would anyone be scared of her? She seemed nice enough to me I asked her if we could tour the city and she nodded her head. As made our way along the sidewalk I sensed and observed the city and its people, it was like more futuristic Earth with people of red skin and white hair. Everyone was pitifully weak compared to Jaika, most not even reaching 100. I think I could understand why most people were scared of her. Her brother was in Frisia's most favored unit, and she was extremely strong. Most people were scared of strong individuals who had any kind of relationships with the Cold Clan. I couldn't help her yet in this regard. There was nothing I could do against the Cold Clan as a whole. I could kill Frisia, but the retaliation from cold and cooler wasn't something I wanted to face yet. Frisia was the weakest and youngest of the cold family. Also, he never trained one day in his life, that's why his power level was relatively very low compared to the others. His brother already had a fifth form and a power level above 1 billion at 100% of his power. Frisia barely reached 10% of his power at 100%. His 100% was even lower than Cooler's final form while being suppressed a bit. I guess Cooler was just cooler than Frisia. We wandered around the city and people looked with aversion and fear at Jaika, and she seemed even more down than when she talked about it, and we made back our way towards her house. As I observed the city I realized that her house was in a pretty good neighborhood, and it gave off rich vibes. It seemed Jis would also send money home. We made our way inside, and I thanked her for taking care of me, but she suddenly stopped me by tackling me down and starting to kiss me violently. I was extremely surprised and I pushed her back and stopped her while asking, Is this right? Her face was even redder if that was physically possible and she said, I don't care. 
I haven't had a man since ever and my body really can't handle it anymore. Please consider this as payback for me helping you. I couldn't argue with her if this was the payback she wanted to. I took her by the waist and started to kiss her back furiously. I put her back on the bed and covered her with some clean sheets. My clothes, unfortunately, got drenched and since they were quite old anyway I decided to vaporize them and get a new outfit. I decided to imitate Goku Black's look since his outfit was one of the best in the show, in my opinion. I materialized the clothes and looked myself in the mirror. It was a GI similar to Goku's but in fully black color with some red linings here and there. I nodded to myself I looked pretty good in it. I made my way outside as to not wake up Jaika and decided to make her some food before she woke up and I left. There was no reason to remain on the planet. I knew to cook a bit, after all I had quite a bit of infinite amount of ingredients on my ship, I wasn't a master chef but I could cook decently in my opinion, I decided to make some special ramen. I doubt this planet ever got to eat something like this since it was future Australia in space. It didn't take me much time and all the needed ingredients were already in the kitchen. I came out of the kitchen with a steaming bowl of ramen and made my way inside the bedroom. Jaika already got up and she was extremely embarrassed at her sudden outburst as she bowed to me and told me how sorry she was. I just smiled at her and motioned towards her to try the peeping hot bowl of ramen. She never ate something like this before and she was very curious. I materialized some chopsticks and taught her how to eat with them. She blew a bit on the noddles and put them in her mouth. Her eyes practically became stars as he engulfed the ramen bowl immediately. She almost ate the bowl too. I laughed it seemed she really liked the food. And so I gave her the recipe. She nodded her head at my instructions and she suddenly seemed sad again. I asked her what was it about and she responded, You will leave won't you? I nodded a solemn expression on my face, I couldn't stop here. I already indulged here a lot by staying here for a few days instead of training. At least Cooler thought I was dead so he didn't put a bounty on my head or anything like that. I still needed to train if I wanted to dismantle the Colts Family Planet Trading Organization and put a stop towards their evil ways. She started sniffling as tears appeared on her face. I put my hand on her chin and made her look me straight in the eye and said, I enjoyed being with you but there are greater things out there that I have to do. I will, however, Make sure your brother Jis comes back to you in time. She nodded and started smiling towards me. Her tears were all gone. She knew I was strong. It was some type of instinct I couldn't describe with words. I made my way outside and popped open my capsule ship which I changed safely from my other GI before I vaporized it. I got inside and blasted in the random wandering mode. The spaceship blasted off the surface of the planet. Jaika was waving at me while shouting, Goodbye, Mr. Krillin. I won't forget the days we spent together. It was time to intensify my training. My beating from Cooler woke me up a bit. There were still tons of people out there stronger than me. I turned the gravity up to 1,000 while I increased the field around me to 5. 5,000 times normal gravity crushed me directly to the floor of the ship so that I couldn't even get up even if I wanted to. I laid on the floor like a pancake as the gravity pushed me down. My healing factor was working overtime as my bones were breaking and healing continuously I tried to get up, but I just physically couldn't, so I just laid there while I did some mental training. After a few what I felt like were hours but were actually not, I could finally get up from the floor, my power level increased to 5 million and 500,000, while my body became way stronger than before, but it still wasn't strong enough to take on cooler without the Kaioken. I stopped the gravity and looked at the watch that would keep up the time of my training, and four months had passed. I blinked my eyes. Time around me felt slower than usual under this intense gravity, and I only thought that only a few hours had passed. It seemed after the gravity reached a thousand and above your sense of time will be distorted. I checked the communicator but no new messages appeared. It seemed I was alone for the time being. I didn't truly want to continue my training so I decided to cook something. I decided that I would make some bacon pancakes and a super sandwich, which would consist of beef sausages bacon and fried eggs, some fries on the sides and tomatoes, pickles and pickled lettuce. After I cooked and ate everything, a voice appeared in my mind, it was King Kai, and he sounded pretty urgent at the moment as he said, 
Krillin, there's an emergency in hell, because of the influx of negative energy due to the death of quite a high amount of villains these days an abnormally strong demon was created. Even though he is weaker than Dibura, no one has the time to deal with it now. A change of pace from training was good for me, I needed to fight more people, I was still too inexperienced, cooler spaceship took me by surprise. I didn't fully realize the speed of spaceships that the Cold Empire got their hands on. It was pretty impressive and just a little below mine, which was wished from an almighty magic dragon. I thought theirs would be way slower but it seemed not, fortunately, Cooler didn't kill me that day, as long as I wasn't strong enough I wouldn't start fighting randomly anywhere anymore. I already did a lot of heroic acts when I wasn't a hero, that was enough for now, helping Akai was another thing. I felt bad for King Kai as I took his technique and never gave him anything in return. I even was quite cold to him back then and even made him embarrassed. I teleported using my instant transmission towards his planet. He was expecting me and he started to explain the situation better. This demon calls himself Aatrox the World Ender. He was created due the influx of negative thoughts and sin created by the deaths of quite a bit of evildoers. Hell is a special place that takes the sin of evildoers and tries to purify it over time by torturing their residents. This time too many evildoers died, and it made the system overwork itself letting the sin transform into a new demon. I nodded my head I was embarrassed it seemed my killing of all those villains created this Aatrox guy, and he was almost as strong as a Super Scion too if he was just below Dibura. King Kai continued, I don't know anyone else as strong as you that could take on this job in our galaxy. So I need you to slay or seal this Aatrox. Make sure he can't get out of hell into the mortal world as he would create much chaos. I nodded my head towards King Kai and said, Don't sweat it, King Kai. I will do my best to beat him and stop his rampage in hell. King Kai looked visibly better after hearing my answer and said with a straight and serious face, now for you to get to hell you just have to jump down. I knew where hell was so I just did what I was told to, and I jumped down trough the yellow clouds that resembled the flying nimbus. I immediately plummeted to hell, and it was just like I expected it. Lava was flowing everywhere, demons were at large, while some were bathing in lava and others wore warden uniforms and put the sinners in their place, hitting them with police batons or punching them. It was just like a jail. I could feel immense and evil key coming from the north. The warden demons ignored me as they got the message from King Kai that I was their backup. They couldn't do anything to Aatrox so they needed me. I flew quickly towards the north my golden aura encasing me as I met with Aatrox the world ender. He was a giant monstrosity with red skin and dark horns that extended into the red sky of hell. He had a giant greatsword in his arms as he waved it around and swatted the warden demons that tried to fight and capture him. He decapitated them, cut them in two and did all of his best to make sure his victims were in true pain before they died as he laughed maniacally. He looked towards me and shouted, Come mortal as I shall sever your shoulders from your spine. Let's fight. There was no talking needed for this guy. I immediately activated my super mode and started to fight with him. To counter his great sword I made my key sword and started to slash at him. He dodged easily and slashed at me at a tricky angle, he was a sword master. His slash hit me head on, and my arm flew away. But another one grew right after. Aatrox narrowed his red pupilless eyes and said while laughing, Ah ha ha ha, you can regenerate? This is great mortal, we can fight at our heart's content then. After I will kill you, I will drown the outside world in blood and carnage. I didn't say anything there was no reason to. He had the skill advantage and he couldn't kill me directly due to my healing factor. He was a good fighting opponent as I could train my sword techniques on him. We fought for 10 days and nights. We both had pretty much inexhaustible stamina. Me from my healing factor and him because he was on his home ground in hell. At first, he dismembered me easily, he parried all my hits and dodged with ease. But the more I fought him the better I got at swordsmanship, I started to parry his shots and dodge myself, sometimes I would slash and even cut an arm or leg down. He could regenerate himself just like me, he had a source of boundless sin in hell which he could himself with. After a while I disarmed him of his greatsword, he wasn't as strong as Dibura, he was way below Super Saiyan 2 level. King Kai made a mistake. 
Everything there was to him was his limitless regeneration stamina and his great sword skills, even though he was a bit stronger than the average Super Scion. But King Kai did say there was no one else could beat him in the North Galaxy. It was true as Frisia wouldn't want to do this. He might even kill King Kai if asked. Goku didn't mature yet so there wasn't any true hero of the universe yet. I activated my benevolent Buddha stand and sent a strand of pure Buddha ki towards Aatrox it started to burn him as he shouted. Mortal I will kill you and all your loved ones. He motioned for his sword as it flew in his hand and he was ready to attack me again. But I stopped him as one giant palm from my Buddha stand grabbed him as I started saying a Buddhist chant. Amitab, go and be reborn Aatrox, be better in your next life. My key from the Buddha stand fully enveloped him and he burnt into cinders transforming into ash and drifting down. His sword was destroyed with him nothing remained of him, only ash. The wardens of hell who were watching from a distance approached me and bowed. There were all types of demons in hell, but the wardens were mostly horned demons the higher level of demons. They were the most humanoid of the bunch of demons as well. The captain of the wardens got up and said, Send our regards to King Yemma when you get out. I nodded my head towards him as one warden showed me the exit of hell. It was a crevice that was going up as a multitude of stairs were inside of it. As I got up the stairs I saw that the final exit was blocked and I pushed the thing that was blocking it. As I got outside I was surprised to see a giant red man with a beard and horns who wore a purple suit. On his head he wore a helmet that had the kanji for Yama. He opened his book at a certain page and said, Krillin, human born on earth, extremely powerful, status, alive, great good karma, chance of getting into heaven, guaranteed. I bowed towards King Yemma and said, the captain of the wardens down below sends his regards, King Yemma. Yemma nodded towards my words, and he muttered something about his mahogany table, and how he wanted to see his children and that Karen was a ruthless bitch. I sweat dropped the image of the great King Yemma who judged if souls go to hell or heaven dropped a bit in my mind. I took my leave and decided to report to King Kai as well before I took my leave back to the mortal realm. I teleported towards King Kai's planet and told him what happened he nodded his head happily and his whiskers moved in a certain pattern. He called out loud, Gregory, Bubbles, Krillin did it, it's time for celebration. Out of his house came a monkey and a big bug. They all started dancing in a happy mood and invited me to share lunch with them. I accepted after fighting 10 days with a world annihilator demon. I was a bit hungry after I ate. I bid my goodbyes towards the trio and teleported back towards my ship. I made sure to hide it on an abandoned asteroid to make sure no one got their hands on it. There were still three more years before I would go back to Earth so I just continued to train. Six more months gone by and my power level increased to almost 7 million. I was sure that by now I could handle cooler, but it wasn't the time yet. I needed to thoroughly annihilate him and his family while Frisia would be a piece of cake now. I didn't know how strong King Cold was. In the anime he was killed by Trunks while he was in his second form only. But this universe that I was in was quite a bit different than what I truly remembered. Goku was stronger in this universe than in the original when he started his journey. I realized this wasn't the original Dragon Ball universe, I was wrong. I didn't question how strong Cooler was as I didn't truly know who Cooler is. From what I observed of him he should be Frieza's sibling. Frieza talked a bit about his family when he fought on Namek but didn't mention a brother. I thought that he only had a father, but it seems I was wrong. As everything was different than the original, I wasn't sure if the events would play normally either. Up until now it was the same but what if? I shook my head what would come would come I just needed to be prepared for it. And the best preparation was higher strength. I still had two and a half years left before it was time to come back to Earth. I promised them that I would come back. And I couldn't truly break my promise to my closest family and friends. I continued to train under high gravity while simulating the fight with Cooler again, seeing what I could have done better and what I have done wrong. And I could say, I did everything wrong, I wasn't prepared for Cooler to appear and he did quite the big number on me. I would have died a nameless grave on that planet if it wasn't for my healing factor, and Cooler underestimating me. 
I realized that I was still too immature. Knowledge and mental strength didn't mean wisdom. I was still acting dumbly. Maybe I shouldn't have shabbowing G's sister either. Even though she was in heat, it was wrong for me to take advantage of her. She wasn't thinking straight. I gave her hope and took it from her when I left leaving her on a planet that feared her whole being. Maybe I wasn't such a good person I thought I was. Shabowinking that princess was a different thing. It was more of a political thing. Her father insisted on it as well. And their culture was different from Earth's. Space Australia was Australia but in space. Maybe I just took her sex for granted? In my last life, I didn't have many sexual encounters and most were paid for. Not one of them were emotionally involved. Maybe Jaika lied to me? I wasn't sure of it. Maybe she was just lonely and wanted someone to live with her. Maybe that was her way of expressing her wish of me staying with her on a planet that rejected her. I bumped my head into the ship's hard metal walls. Women were troublesome. I couldn't get them at all. And I just realized I might not get with 18 either. This universe was too different. I wasn't sure what her personality would be. Guru and Popo weren't the same. New people I didn't know off popped everywhere. This was kind of frustrating. Everything was going on all nice up till now. I guess I should think twice when a hot alien lady throws herself in my arms and says shaboink me. Whatever I promised Jaika, I would get Jeese to come back to Space Australia and I will do it. There was still a lot of time till the Namek saga so I could train enough. I was still human in the end. I wasn't sure of many things and I could make mistakes so I got up from my sulky mood and continued my training. I would make it up for Jaika in the future. 18 was still an unknown factor. I will try to live a little more till I meet her. I continued my training and six more months gone by. Two more years till Raditz came. My power level was nearing 9 million and I couldn't improve my sword skills anymore as I had no sparring partners. I could now fully fuse my super mode with Godspeed and the full power technique without much strain. I still couldn't use it with Kaioken consistently though. I drifted in space as my spaceship was going around in random patterns. The spaceship speed was unrivaled and it could get from galaxy to galaxy in months I was currently in the West Galaxy. I was just touring the galaxy, nothing big was happening currently, everything was peaceful, even though the cold empire monopolized most of the universe, they didn't truly rule all of it. I made my way around different planets and fought different martial arts masters, lowering my power level to match theirs to sharpen my skills. I fought different kind of races that used different type of martial arts that matched their body types. Some had liquid bodies, some gaseous bodies, some had four arms and focused on strength. Some focused on defense while other could redirect your attack with their body's force alone. Some martial arts weren't learnable due to the different physiques, but I could get some insights that would refine my skill from them. As I wandered the universe and beat a bit of the baddie here and there nothing else major happened, my power level didn't increase by a lot as I focused on refining my skills and I reached the power level of 10 million. There was only half a year left before Raditz was supposed to arrive at Earth, and... Somehow I found myself in the North Galaxy. I didn't control the direction the spaceship flew in, so I randomly found myself in different galaxies every time I finished one of my training sessions. I took some fruit yogurt out of the spaceship's fridge and ate it after a long training session cold yogurt was especially delicious. There wasn't much to do anymore till Raditz came, so I decided to wander the North Galaxy basically on foot. I put the spaceship in its capsule form, pocketed it, and started to fly around in space. I didn't fly randomly but more near star clusters that had key signatures. Even though I journeyed through a bunch of galaxies, I didn't visit every planet. I visited planets ranging from bug people to elves that had magical civilization and even monsters who were in the Stone Ages. Seeing such different communities and how other races lived their lives brought a qualitative change towards my mind and soul. It was also made me realize that I wasn't the most sociable guy ever, and that I didn't show as much emotion as I was supposed to. I didn't know what to think about that realization. I was just different. As I wandered the North Galaxy in the continuity of my spiritual journey, I found a habituated desert planet. This planet was special as its inhabitants believed in Buddhism. There were Buddha statues everywhere and everyone wore monk robes as they meditated. There were temples everywhere on the planet. 
I sat down under a Buddha statue and started to think. Was Buddha an actual god in the Dragon Ball universe as well? He never appeared in the anime even in Super where gods were appearing everywhere. There was a plaque under the Buddha statue that read in common language. Buddha exists in one heart. It's hard to cut off all ties to earthly needs to ascend to Nirvana if you can't do it that's not the only way. Buddha is benevolent and gives many ways. Find your way inside your heart. Don't follow the words of others as they would murk your mind and way. Follow yourself and you will be enlightened. I contemplated the words, but this mantra was so profound that even my soul couldn't understand it thoroughly. It was a different type of technique that I couldn't understand yet. It took me two months to wander around the galaxy, and two more months I just stood here to understand the mantra. There were only two months left before Raditz came to Earth. I wasn't in a hurry Goku would be able to beat him in a jiffy. I decided to continue my wandering around the universe. I made sure to stir off the cold family planets. I didn't need to meet Frisia yet. I didn't know those men were coolers and who cooler truly was till it was too late. Now, things could be avoidable. I wasn't sure if Frisia was stronger than the original, so I didn't want to meet him yet. Wandering around the universe to see its wonders was beautiful. This was my holiday before the android saga would come. Two more months went by, and it was time to go back to Earth. Wandering Universe 7 was interesting. It helped me calm myself both spiritually and physically. After I realized how much of a jerk I was, I put two fingers on my forehead and concentrated. It was time to go back home. I found Kami's energy and teleported. I was back on the lookout. I stood on the white porcelain tiles of the lookout and breathed in the cold air of the high altitude of the lookout. Mr. Popo was looking at me like a hawk would look at a hare, but he didn't dare to take action. He realized he couldn't see through me anymore at all. It was like I was a black hole with no end. Kami came from outside the palace and looked at me with wonder in his eyes as he exclaimed, Your adventure in the outer space changed you a lot, young Krillin. It seems there's a different aura about you. Your sin also seems to have become non-existent. It seemed when Kami first met me he found a little aura of evil around me. I guess the dark aura from before could be explained from this. I nodded towards Kami and told him a few of my adventures before I left towards Capsule Corporation. As I extended my key senses to envelop all the planets, I rose my eyebrows in contemplation and surprise. It seemed the general power level of the planet increased from 5 to 10 to 25 and 50. The mortal level of the planet increased by quite a lot for some reason. I flew towards the Capsule Corp building and rang the bell. Out of the building came Bulma's mother, and she ushered me in, recognizing me as one of Bulma's friends. Bulma met with me and started to tell me about the changes that happened during the four years I was away. Your invention truly increased the popularity of martial arts, you know? These people are naturally competitive, and when they saw how could they count their power in numbers and see how truly strong they were, a lot of them started to train and compare with each other. I nodded my head it was human nature to want better things, better jobs, better lives, and now to be physically better than one another. It was a normal thing, the spark that created this phenomenon was the scouters I gave them. I asked her about the gravity chamber and ship, and she smiled, it seemed she could make it, albeit it couldn't go beyond 20 times from what she told me. I got outside and looked towards the gravity chamber installed in the courtyard. It was occupied by quite a bit of people, it was Tien, Kaiatsu, Rashi, Yamcha, Goku, and even Chi Chi was inside. Outside the chamber I could see a little kid waiting, he had a red, yellow, and green gown and a hat with a four-star dragon ball on his head. It was Gohan. I approached him and made sure my face was in the most cordial expression it could do and asked him, Who's this little guy here? Gohan was startled as he didn't sense my approach, but he calmed down as he saw me coming in with Bulma. He bowed towards me and said, My name's Gohan Mister, so polite just like in the anime, it seemed even though Chi Chi wanted to train as well in this timeline, she didn't make Gohan train yet. Out of the chamber came out all of my friends and they all started to smile when they saw me chatting with Gohan. Goku and Rashi came forward and gave me a big hug while the others nodded at me. 
I could sense their power level increased by quite a lot with the help of the gravity chamber. Goku's was already at 11,000. Rashi's was at 8,000. Kairatsu at 5,000. Yamcha at 6,000 and Tien at 7,500. They all grew stronger and I could see that they could use the Kaioken up to times 3, albeit with damage to their bodies. Hell, even Chi Chi reached almost 2,000. I took a better look at Bulma and her power level was around 600 as well. It seemed everyone trained after I left. I asked Goku about Gohan and he told me that it was his son as he continued. This little guy here, I don't know what to say. I can feel quite the high amount of power locked in him. But Chi Chi told me that we would have to wait a few more years so that it wouldn't stun his growth. I nodded my head. Chi Chi's worries were unfounded, but it was normal for a human with no knowledge of scion biology to think like that. They all wanted for us to go to Came House and make a huge party as my welcome back gift. I smiled towards them and said, You guys go ahead. I have something to do in the city and I will come back to Came House shortly. I made sure to check on my bank account before I left the city and my mouth hanged open at the number. It was so high that I could feed Beerus till he became fatter than his brother and still live a life of comfort after for 10,000 years. It seemed people liked the scouters so much they bought them en masse. Some of them even crushed them with their palms and acted in a Chuyuni way to make themselves look badass in front of others. Like, OH look at that guy's power it is so high. Crack crunch and they destroyed their scouters and bought new ones. This increased the scouter sales by 300%. I decided to buy a house in the city so I could have my base on Earth. I didn't need to live with that perverted old man, and I could visit him whenever I wanted. The house came with furnishing and everything else that was needed. It was a bit near Capsule Corporation so it was quite expensive but it was practically a drop in the ocean for my account. I decided to fly towards Came House, there was no rush and I could let them prepare the party better. After a few minutes of flying I reached Came House and everyone had party hats on and a giant cake was there. Everyone was here launch, Oolong and Poor included. Even Piccolo was here. He looked at me with a begrudging expression like he didn't want to be here but Goku put an arm above his shoulders and dragged him into the party. Outside the atmosphere, a white sphere-shaped spaceship was making its way towards the Earth its inhabitant not knowing what was going to happen to him after he landed on this planet. His spaceship landed in a nearby farm's land plot and made a giant crater a fat middle-aged man who was working nearby took his trusty shotgun from the back of his truck and made his way to see what happened. A tall stranger with a big mane of unruly hair made his way out of the spaceship and clucked his tongue as he pressed the green scouter that presided over his left eye. Ding 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 the man gasped and said, the average power level of this planet increased by more than five? Are the reports wrong? As he tried to scan for the highest power level, the man with the shotgun made his way nearby and said, What are you doing on my land? I'm gonna shoot get the hell out. But the stranger ignored him, and he shot at him. Unfortunately for the poor farmer Raditz redirected the bullet, and it shot him in the stomach, his life and death unknown. Raditz clicked on the scouter again as he started to search for the highest power level on the planet, and he gasped as the number of 11,000 appeared on his scouter, and he muttered under his voice, Is this damn thing broken? It can't be this power level is almost nearing Prince Vegeta's. It's even above Nappa's. Maybe the scouter is broken, and it's 1,100. He started flying quickly towards the coordinates of the power, and he reached came house, we were all in the middle of the party so the stranger that came out of nowhere kinda killed our buzz. Everyone looked with narrowed eyes as they sensed the power level of the surrounding stranger. I knew who he was, and I shook my head. Poor thing he was as strong as in the original. Is this the curse of Raditz? Even in an alternate universe, he can't be stronger than 1000 power level? He flew down landed on the island and chuckled while looking towards Goku and saying, So Kakarot, you didn't do your mission, huh? Goku muttered to himself and told Raditz, So Kakarot was my original name? Well, whatever now I'm Goku and I grew up here on Earth. So it doesn't matter if I had to exterminate this planet's inhabitant or not. 
Goku still remembered that when I taught him the fake moon technique, I also gave him tidbits of Scion history so he knew what the mission was about. Raditz sneered and said, You grew pretty strong on this backward planet, even being a bit stronger than myself, but you are still not even able to touch Nappa's or the Prince's shoes. It would be better if you and your friends would just give up this planet. Goku was ready to show Raditz how wrong he was. But Chi-Chi interrupted him and said, Darling, it's just a weakling. Why don't I handle him and let you do whatever you want with him later? Since it seems he is of your race? Goku nodded and said, Okay then Chi-Chi. All the training you did with us made you quite strong, so you can handle this guy easily. Raditz sneered at their words and he was ready to attack but Chi-Chi appeared in front of him and sent a roundhouse kick towards his chest. Raditz didn't even see how she did it. She was practically a blur to his eyes since her power level was double his, and he had no techniques. He was a low-class scion who didn't have access to the fake moon technique, so he couldn't even turn Oozuru if he wanted to. It was in the middle of the day, so there was no chance for a comeback. Chi-Chi beat the snot out of Raditz, his armor cracked, his scouter broken. He couldn't even call for backup, nor anyone could hear anything else besides initial conversation that happened between us. He laid down on the sand, his tail twitching and his wild mane of hair full of sand. He started to cry and beg. Kakarot, I'm your big brother, please take your woman off me. She is a devil, please. Stop her. I'm going to be good. I'm going to join you. Just stop her. It seemed Chi-Chi gave Raditz PTSD already. Goku motioned with his hand and Chi-Chi stopped abusing Raditz's body. And he asked him, So you are my brother? What about the rest of the family? I'm not sure about what happened to our race, but I heard we are pretty much extinct. Raditz got up from the ground hastily as he trembled from the pain and his injuries while he explained, Well brother, our home planet was supposedly hit by an asteroid, and only very few of us survived the ones who were sent on missions at the time, the only confirmed alive science, are you me the prince and the imperial advisor Nappa? Goku nodded his head, he finally found some of his original family, and he seemed he didn't want to kill Raditz, he could be redeemed just like Piccolo was, and he was sure he could keep him in check with his higher power level even if he decided to train him, I was there anyway, and I didn't show my true power level yet to everyone else, all they could feel was mind-numbing energy for me so they didn't ask. Goku gave Raditz a Senza bean, and he ate it not knowing what it was supposed to do. But after all the damage he took from Chi-Chi healed up and his power level increased by 300, he started to flatter Goku and said, Wow brother, you have such magical things. They are way better than the healing chambers of the Frisia Force. Bulma perked up at the mention of healing chambers and dragged Raditz towards her, so he could explain to him what it was all about. After hearing about the wonders of the chambers Bulma immediately started to draw some schematics basically out of God knows where. Raditz was scared of Chi-Chi and the others as he realized that the scouter didn't malfunction. Outside the planet and the Milky Way galaxy in far far away place, a short guy with a blue and white armor who wore white gloves on his hands and had a red scouter stood on the body of an insect humanoid as he ate his remains. Nearby a buff bald man with a mustache and no armor wearing only underwear was sunbathing while also eating some bug remains as he said. Evagita, it seemed Raditz's connection with his scouter was cut out. Should we go after him? Vegeta sneered and said, Let's see where that fool lost his connection on. Oh, planet Earth, wasn't Raditz supposed to get his little brother from there? Do you think his brother became stronger and beat him to the ground? Nappa chuckled and said, The probability of that happening is quite high. Isn't that right, Vegeta? Vegeta chuckled and said, yeah, alright, that Buffon could have gotten his butt beat from his little brother from what we know about him. Let's go to Earth and recruit this cockroach since the fodder Raditz is probably dead. Raditz suddenly sneezed on Earth as he was handed a piece of the giant cake. Poor told him bless you and Raditz nodded his head at the little cat. He had a feeling like someone was cursing him. I observed Raditz thoroughly to make sure he had no other intentions but it seemed he was cowed by the power levels that were way above his. Even Piccolo's reached almost 6,000, and he didn't even train in the gravity chamber due to his stubbornness from what I heard. I guess that's why Kami had such a rudy complexion when I met him. 
Now that Raditz has been cowed with no action on my part, it was time for some relaxation for me till Nappa and Vegeta came two years later. I could even make a dojo on this planet and spread my techniques so I could increase its mortal level. It could make Beerus happy and give him no reason to even think of destroying the planet. Beerus spared the planet in the original because of Goku, but I think he spared it more because he was a glutton who loved Earth's food. It was time to make a dojo and spread my techniques on this planet. Maybe I would try to do it in the whole universe. In the future we would be excluded out of the chance of being erased if our mortal level was high enough. After the party ended and everyone made their way back to their own homes I decided that I would put my plans in motion. I bought a large plot of land near the city and used my money to create a huge dojo with all the normal training equipment and something extra that I created using my materialization skill. It took no more than three days to finish everything, and I even added ads on television, on billboards everywhere. When people heard that an ex-Budokai Tenkaichi World Tournament winner opened up his dojo, and they could learn from him all of them came towards it like a moth would be drawn towards a flame. There were thousands of people waiting outside the dojo clamoring and pushing each other wanting to enter. I made my way outside behind me was Raditz. He would be an instructor in the dojo, he had to earn his bread somewhere, he couldn't be lazy. He could teach people normal key techniques and how to fly. It was good enough for these humans who thought that flying was a myth, and they could never do it with their bodies. I officially opened up the dojo and everyone entered. It was much more spacious than what the outside would indicate. It was full of training machines, weighted clothing that could be used and taken away if they had a subscription, and special new healing chambers supplied by Capsule Corporation. Bulma wanted to test out the healing chambers at my dojo, I already knew of their effectiveness so I agreed we also had gravity machines but those would be for later. Many people came from around the world to train in my and there was even that Indian guy from before who got beaten up during the first Budokai tournament we joined, his name was Nam. I motioned towards him and he bowed, his power level increased to 100, and it seemed he knew how to use Ki but not that well, I could make him my second instructor after I trained him a bit. I told him a special mantra to train his body and mind and put him on his way, I told him to report to me his progress every day. I got up on a podium specially made for this occasion and sat cross-legged on a pillow up on the podium. Everyone looked at me strangely, but I coughed a bit and said, From here I will teach you a special mantra that you will all train in diligently every day so you would become stronger. You will be able to train your body while you chant this mantra at the same time to increase your training speed, but not everyone will be able to endure it. I will say it only once so remember it well. As I started to impart the mantra, everyone took a serious look in their eyes as they started to decipher it. Not everyone was talented in martial arts, but some people could recall the whole mantra from the first time they heard it. These people with friends who didn't understand it from the first time would explain it so everyone could train with it. It seemed this batch of people weren't greedy and wanted their friends to grow with them instead of letting them down. I nodded my head, this was a good mentality for the humans to have. I left letting Raditz take care of the menial questions while I entered in deep meditation in my room. I learned how to refine my key and increase its quality with mediation while also purifying it into a higher being of key. It was pure gold and gave a soothing feeling. It was just like my Buddha stand transformed key, but purer and truer. Right now not even 1% of all my key was transformed, and it would take me years and years of purifying it to reach perfection. But I could feel that it would bring a qualitative change to my whole body and spirit when it would be done. After a round of meditation I decided to leave the dojo. I lent Raditz the keys so he could close up when it was time and gave him his first month's pay in advance. He had to pay for his meals while he stayed with Goku. I decided that next day I will have to inform everyone of the next threat that was the two scions. Raditz didn't say they would come. I guess he thought there was nothing of importance on earth that would warrant their attention. But them thinking that Raditz was dead, they would surely want to put their hands on one of the last remaining scions that was stronger than Raditz, which was Goku. I got everyone to make their way towards Kami's lookout and told them with a serious look on my face. Two years from now, two more scions will come, and they are way stronger than Raditz. One can be beaten by all of you while the other would need you to give your best to beat him. I won't interfere in the fightings, so I decided for Goku to train in a special place while you will up your training here with Mr. Popo. 
Mr. Popo, as if summoned, came out of nowhere and shouted, Maggots! Time for another bout of training! Everyone shivered, Goku included, but I grabbed his shoulder and put two fingers to my forehead. King Kai did need a second student and some humanoid company now and then. I could teach him the Kaioken, but where was the fun in that? I left Goku with King Kai after I explained everything to him. King Kai smiled towards me with a proud look on his face and said, I got lots of favor and praise from Supreme Kai. The other Kais were very jealous. They all thought Aatrox would escape into the mortal realm. But your timely intervention granted me lots of faces. I could do this favor and teach this lad here the Kaioken and Spirit Bomb. I nodded my head at King Kai and left them with their own devices while I teleported myself back on the lookout and said, I will supervise your training with Mr. Popo for a while. But now I want you to tell me if you mastered the techniques that I taught you last time. Kairatsu immediately sprung his hand up and said, Krillin I can already lift the whole lookout with my mind if I want to. I took all the training you told me to do seriously. I looked towards the little guy and Kaiatsu immediately made the lookout fly higher and higher in the sky. We were almost out of the stratosphere, I motioned towards him, and he put the lookout back down even though his power level wasn't high his mental powers were impressive. Tien's third eye started glowing as his power level multiplied by five times, but he immediately gave up using it, it took too much of a burden on his key and body to increase his power level by five times. He could use the Kaioken up to three times maximum with his current power level, so obviously he couldn't increase it to five times with his racial skill. A blurry image appeared behind Tien after that. It looked like a green triangle with a single eye in it. I didn't recognize it at first as it was too blurry, but when I took a better look it was the Illuminati symbol. His power level would increase to eight times when he truly mastered this technique. Yamcha came up as well, I already knew about the Kaioken, so I wanted him to show me his stand. A blurry wolfman image with a star between his eyes appeared behind Yamcha, but it stopped almost immediately as he started to huff, he was weaker than Tien, and it seems he didn't put his all in training his stand either. I nodded my head towards them and said, from now on you will train to become twice as strong as Goku and master your stands. I also want you to be able to reach at least Kaioken times 5. And Tien you should be able to use your racial skill perfectly. They all nodded their heads at me as Raditz approached me as well and asked me what did I want from him. I smiled and told him. For you, I can teach you the fake moon technique. Vegeta knows it already doesn't he? Raditz gasped at my knowledge and asked me. How do you know about Vegeta and the fake moon technique? I told him how I realized it by how he called him Prince and how the higher echelons of the Scions could get their hands on the technique. I also told him how I learned it from some scattered remnants in space while I was traveling. Raditz bought it thinking that I found pieces of planet Vegeta flying in space. I let them all experience Popo's training once again but now intensified and improved. They also had to concentrate on mastering their techniques as well. I left for King Kai's planet as I forgot to ask Goku about his progress on the Akari mode. Goku was already wearing King Kai's special weighted GI while he was in the forms of starting the training for the Kaioken. He smiled towards me his silly goofy smile and asked why I was back so soon. I just got straight to the subject. How's your progress on the fake moon technique? Goku smirked and showed me his hand as he put key in his hand a little white ball came out of his hand. I nodded my head towards his showcase of the technique and he dispelled it. How about the other technique? Goku's smile turned into an awkward one. And he scratched the back of his head and said, Oh well. You see I couldn't truly master it. I could make a great ape image appear behind my back. But the power level didn't increase as much as 10. I need to practice it more. I made him show me how he initiated the technique and I found quite a bit of flaws on how he executed it and pointed them out to him. His power level increased to six times after he fixed all his mistakes. It seemed his comprehension didn't reach the needed realm to touch upon the Akari mode yet. While Goku was a genius, he wasn't much compared to Broly. But Broly was a freak of nature who had more plot armor than ten Gokus combined. I bid farewell to them afterward and made my way back to the dojo as I let only Nam man it today, and he needed me to be there as well. I needed at least two competent instructors in the dojo. Something clicked. Chi-Chi could be an instructor here as well, 
It solves their money problem and with her higher power level her cooking prowess increased by quite a lot. She could whip up food extremely fast from what Raditz told me some days ago. I flew towards her and Goku's house on Mount Paozu, and she opened up the door. Gohan was behind her he had a bunch of cookies in his hands and he ate them like a chipmunk. His puffed up face was pretty cute. I immediately cut the chit chat and told her about my proposition. She started to ponder on it for some time before she agreed. She asked me about everything, retirement plans, salary, if I gave out good health insurance. I sweat dropped at the questions but answered all of them truthfully. She seemed she liked my answers as she wanted to start teaching at the dojo straight away. She said that she wanted to take Gohan with her to the job and I agreed. He would start training next year as well so it mattered if he started to get exposed to martial arts directly earlier. He was one of the characters with the strongest potentials just below Frisia and Broly's. My power level also increased to 10 million and 500,000. I also stabilized the combination of my techniques and I could use the super mode with my full power technique Godspeed and Kaioken up to times 3 with a bit of effort. While my power level didn't increase by much my techniques got a bit more refined during my stay on Earth. I could feel the key of every inhabitant of the planet increase daily by small numbers. Slowly and surely the planet was getting stronger as a whole. Key was internal and not breathed in from the universe planets would benefit if the population was strong. The planets would get infused with key from the population as the environment would grow stronger and more hospitable for intelligent life forms. Right now the damage that was done to Earth due to pollution and irresponsible wars was slowly but surely getting reverted. Earth as a whole was getting stronger every day, itself as well as its inhabitants. After feeling the changes all around the planet, I could surely say that I was getting in the right direction with everything, considering Earth's well-being. Maybe I should let all of the Scions know the truth about their planet when they would reunite with each other. I would make sure Vegeta and Nappa knew their place. Yes, Scions were battle-thirsty warmongers who did kill the Truffles to take their planet. But their potential was extremely great and they could be redeemed. Vegeta became the kind of loving father in Dragon Ball Super, and he cleansed away all his prior sins by saving the universe with Goku a couple of times. Nappa was a blank slate for me, I knew jack shit of the guy, he was big mean and ruthless from what I saw from the anime when he fought the Z fighters, he disarmed Tien and wanted to kill Gohan. If it wasn't for Piccolo's interference at the end Gohan would have become space dust. There were only six more months left before Nappa and Vegeta landed on Earth. Somewhere in the galaxy two pods were flying near each other. Out of one of them came the voice of Nappa who asked continuously, Vegeta, are we there yet? Vegeta responded, No, and it went so on, so forth till they would reach Earth. I think both of them would be convinced just like Raditz, Goku should already have reached the power level of 40,000 by now, and he should be able to use the Kaioken well enough anyway, even the human Z fighters would be able to beat them by now, Mr. Popo's training was scarily effective for some reason on them. I think even Kaiatsu would be able to transform Nappa into a pancake on the ground with his mental power by now. He might not be able to beat Vegeta with it, but Nappa would be a goner. I could feel their powers increasing every day as they trained, they even mastered their stands, but they still couldn't combine them with the Kaioken, their bodies were too frail even though Popo whipped them into shape by torturing them. Um I mean training them thoroughly every day without rest, he even mass fed them Senza beans which now were in abundance due to Yajirob not stuffing his face full of them every 10 seconds. Corin also told me when I last visited that the more beans there were, the faster the newly planted ones would grow. He said that the old one's magical waves would influence the newly planted ones and accelerate their growth. I decided before the six months were up to thoroughly train my mental power and magic, as I kind of let them down these years in favor of training my key and martial arts. I continuously trained my mental power until something clicked inside of me. I could now create a mental domain inside my soul in which I could fight imaginary opponents to perfect my techniques, it wouldn't increase my power level but here I could train as I would in the hyperbolic time chamber. Even though the increase wasn't as high as one year into one day. It was ten days in one day. It was practically the perfect technique training place. I decided to enter into closed door training for the time being. I let the dojo in the hands of Chi Chi and Nam. 
Nam now having the power level of 250 he learn how to fly and project his aura, becoming a middle graded instructor, while Chi Chi was my best one with Raditz. But Raditz was also training on the lookout with the others, he mastered the fake moon technique and could barely control himself in his great ape form, his power level even increased to 7000. I sat cross-legged on my bed in my new house in North City. A few blocks away I could even see Bulma's house. Clearing my mind thoroughly I started to stop all distracting thoughts and enter into a limbo state. Nor alive nor dead. My breathing became so slow my heartbeat was almost nil. But if you would put your hand on my chest you would still feel a weak bump bump. I entered my mindscape and there was nothing there. As I just unlocked it nothing appeared in it till I willed it. The best way to train your techniques is in the battlefield. So I decided to create one. All around me countless dead bodies appeared. Some impaled, some decapitated or eviscerated. Flags appeared around some of the bodies depicting a red and black symbol with words that read in a special runic tongue that meant Noxus. Out of the pile of bodies a giant of a man with an axe as big as him appeared. He had an iron jaw and a furnace embedded in his stomach. He was bald and he wore armor, his skin. Was sickly gray like an undead as he shouted with a low voice, Charge for Noxus! He started to bum rush me just like a bull would do. A red aura started to encase him due to his speed and he became a blur. His charge was linear so I easily dodged it. I created this mindscape to train my mind and magic so I didn't try to fight the giant head on. I created a barrier around him with my magic and stopped his charge. The barrier started to shake and it almost broke as cracks appeared around it but it held fast. The giant started to roar as sound waves appeared out of his mouth which destroyed the barrier completely. A red aura encased him like a shield as he took his axe and slammed it into the ground. A giant shockwave traveled towards me and I used my magic to negate the damage by defusing the shockwave. I created a small invisible barrier around me which stopped all of the remaining shockwaves. After that I used my magic before the giant could continue harassing me with any other attack. I stopped all of his movement with special magic chains and ran him through with a magically blessed key spear. Magic was a support technique that could enhance the power of key. I could even create symbols that I could use to give a burst of power towards other people. I could even heal them like a Senza Bean would do, albeit it wouldn't truly restore all of their stamina. Magic had tons of possibilities. As I pondered the giant stopped struggling and died. But suddenly his furnace on his stomach started to grow to life. His eyes became fully red as he shouted, destroyed his bindings and rushed towards me. I dodged his attempts of him trying to grab my throat and sap me of my vitality with his hands. It seemed his death gave him the ability to life steal and increased his speed by quite a bit. After a few seconds, he decomposed and became a pile of ash. Without any vitality being stolen, the furnace couldn't keep him alive. A dog tag was within the ashes that read, Shown everything disappeared as this one session of training was done. By the outside time three days passed, which meant thirty days passed inside the mindscape. I could now control my magic better and my mind strengthened itself by quite a bit as well. Only three days passed and there was still quite a lot of time before the science came so I could continue my training. I appeared somewhere else now, it was a rural planet I visited once in the South Galaxy. It had a medieval Asian feel. Some lanterns with four red lines were hung around the trees and houses. Out of nowhere, a sniper shot was directed towards my forehead. I dodged it by moving my head a few centimeters to the right. It was a special magic enchanted bullet. As it skewered a person behind me the illusion of flowers appeared as his brain matter eyeballs and everything else was incinerated. The bullet was made so while it gained great penetrative force it also added the illusion to add a great execution towards its target. Out of a nearby tree, a masked man who wore an outfit made from snakeskin steel boots and a steel arm guard held his sniper rifle as he took aim again and said, Dance puppet, we shall make a great show. His aim was impeccable but with my magic, I could stop the bullets from midair. He looked shocked at my capabilities and started to run. While his figure was frail his speed was extremely quick. I started to follow him but I stepped on something that looked to be a lotus trap. Caught my leg. 
but I immediately destroyed it by putting a bit of pressure on it. The man tried to aim at me again, but when he saw that his trap did nothing, he started to run away again. This man gave me quite a good idea of how to use my magic so, I created a key rifle and infused it with magic, I took aim at his back and shot him with a magically enhanced bullet, it was enhanced for speed only so it hit him in the back and he fell. I made my way towards him and took off his mask but nothing appeared under it. It was blank. I swear I saw some eyeballs when he aimed at me back then. Everything dissolved around me. I was back in my blank mindscape. Seven more days had passed, thus ten days passed outside, and sixty inside the mindscape. Time flowed differently even though it felt like I fought for minutes in real time outside, it was one day. I willed myself to get out of the mindscape and I was outside again, closed door training was a success. All of my bodily functions regained their normal parameters as I got outside my house to smell the air outside. It felt like there was a qualitative change towards my magic comprehension. Only very few people knew how to use magic properly in this world. But with the help of my mindscape and some memories from the past life, I could create more unique ways to use magic. Key guns enchanted by magic would look cool but weren't useful in this world. But I could enchant the beams to give them special properties. Combined with elemental key, I could even challenge people with higher power levels than me now. As everyone continued training, it was almost two more months till the science came. But out of outer space earlier than intended came two rotund spaceships out of one sounded. Vegeta, are we there yet? The other voice just sighed and answered in an annoyed fashion. Yes, we are here, Nappa. Both crashed into one of the cities and Nappa said, Sweet, Vegeta time to find that cockroach, shall we? I immediately teleported near them and said, Gentlemen, I will take you to Kakarot immediately, but you are scaring the normal population. If you will stop, it would be appreciated. My towering figure, dark clothes, and gold aura made a strange combination in both of their eyes. They couldn't sense key. So Nappa decided to use his scouter, which immediately exploded when it pointed at me. Nappa started to stutter immediately. Uh, great earth protector, we, uh, are here for someone of our race and, uh, Vegeta growled at Nappa and said, Stop making a fool out of yourself, Nappa. Even if he is strong, you don't need to embarrass us. It seems he means no ill will, and he knows where Kakarot is. I nodded towards Vegeta, as always the prince was pretty smart and knew his place, that's how he survived for so many years in the Frisia Force. Then only later when he inflated himself with the thought that he became the legendary Super Scion, he started acting dumbly. If he acted like that from the start, he would have become space dust at Frisia's hand on the first day of work. I motioned towards a nearby wasteland and made them wait there. It was time for the Z fighters to meet the Scions. I made sure to get Goku from King Kai planets too. After a few minutes everyone was gathered. We made our way towards the wasteland. The group included Tien, Yamcha, Raditz, Goku, Rashi, Kaiatsu. Everyone was at its best. Tien reached a power level of 22,000, Yamchu a power level of 18,000 and Rashi a power level of 25,000. I taught him the stand technique and he made a turtle stand that increased his power level by 9 times. He was way more experienced due to his old age and he could create the stand faster than the others. Goku's power level breached 50,000 and Raditz reached 11,000 when Vegeta pointed his scouter at Raditz and saw 11,000. He clicked it again to make sure it was right. When he reached Goku, he had the longest face you could see around. When he noticed Goku still had his tail too, he knew. He couldn't beat him, so he scoffed and said, We are here to take Kakarot back with us due to Frieza's orders. Since Raditz is alive too, he needs to come with us too. I interjected and said, No, I don't think they will. Vegeta gritted his teeth. He knew he could do nothing here and he hated the feeling of being powerless his power level was just around 18,000 and Nappa's was almost around 6,000. Even in their great ape forms they wouldn't be able to defeat Goku as he could transform as well. I broke the silence and said, Do you guys truly know why your planet was destroyed? Vegeta and Nappa scoffed and said, An asteroid hit it? We already know why would you bring this up? I chuckled at their words and said, 
Wrong. Where did you hear this information? Napa said while suddenly realizing, Lord Frisia told us. But, God demit that lizard mother schmucker did it. An asteroid hit at my rear. Napa immediately started cursing Frisia. Vegeta turned his scouter off the moment he saw Napa's expression. That was his cursing expression. I nodded my head. They both realized who destroyed their planet. They weren't that dumb. I gave them something to strive for right now. We have special training areas and techniques here on Earth. As long as you don't do anything to the planet or its inhabitants, you can try to train here with Goku and Raditz. Raditz already accepted. Vegeta's pride was high and he didn't want the help of some Earthlings. But Nappa's pride wasn't that high so he immediately accepted. Vegeta is the only one left out accepted as well with gritted teeth. I took all of them to the lookout so they could train there. Gravity chambers already upgraded up to 100 times there. Bulma was waiting there with the chambers and healing pods. Mr. Popo glared at her. She invaded the sanctity of his lookout. He was ready to devour her but we suddenly all appeared due to my instant transmission. Mr. Popo immediately hinged his jaw back on and he showed his normal smile. Bulma unknowingly didn't realize what Popo was about to do behind her back. When her eyes laid on Vegeta, he immediately got towards him with basically what I could say be hearts in her eyes. Vegeta scoffed at the earthling woman, but she wasn't truly a weakling. He could see he was stronger than an average normal Frisia soldier. Frisia cannon fodder soldiers' power levels were around 100 to 500. The prince didn't know how to smile, so he didn't reciprocate her greeting. He just sneered and asked me about the special training. I told him about the gravity chambers and who their creator was. I indicated to him that he should talk to Bulma for a better experience. His eyes also narrowed when he saw the healing pods. He wasn't sure how we got our hands on technology like Frisia's, that guy was supposed to have a monopoly on it. Suddenly out of outer space a voice appeared in my head. It wasn't King Kai. It was Super Kami Guru. Earthling you used our Dragon Balls and I unlocked your potential. It's time for you to repay us. Super Kami Guru decreed so. I sweat dropped I would have helped them anyway even if he didn't say that it seemed Frisia still heard about the rumors of the Dragon Balls. And he tried his hand to take them. In the original, the rumors got confirmed by Vegeta due to the leak of the bugged scouters. But now, even though he didn't get a confirmation, his thirst for immortality made him take a bit out of his time to take a trip to Namek. Super Kami Guru continued in my head. I sense a great evil will make its way towards Namek in a few months. Take your butt and whoever else butts out here and save the goddamn planet. After that, the connection was cut off. Guru seemed a bit pissed off there, didn't he? On Namek Guru was observing a bird as he shouted outside, Nail, I saw a bird outside. Nail sighed and said, Yes, Lord Super Kami Guru. Guru continued, It was pretty. Nail just said yes again. An evil smile suddenly appeared on Guru's face as he said in a low tone, Go and kick its butt. I informed the others of Namek's plight of help and everyone wanted to help. Vegeta and Nappa didn't truly want to. But I told them I will take the gravity chambers and healing pods with me to Namek so they agreed to come in the end. They didn't know Frisia was on its way there. I made sure not to tell them it would be a surprise. I was in for a surprise myself too. In Frisia's spaceship, Frisia was in his levitating chair as he made his way to Namek. Suddenly another spaceship similar to his flew towards his spaceship and Cooler made his way inside. Cooler started grinning and said, Chasing after urban legends, little brother? Frisia scoffed an annoyed expression appearing on his face. He truly hated his big brother of his with passion. What do you want, Cooler? It's not the time for the family yearly reunion, is it? Cooler just chuckled and said, Oh no, no. I just wanted to follow you on your urban legends chase. Maybe if these things existed we could both become immortal? Frisia wanted Cooler to be the last person who gained immortality. But he couldn't say no, as a finger was already pointed to his head. A purple death beam ready to shoot trough. 
and Cooler coldly continued without a hint of mercy or familial love. And I wasn't asking for your opinion on it. Little bro, Cooler was just too cool for Frieza. We all teleported on Namek with the use of my instant transmission. I even invited Piccolo by telling him we were going to his home planet. As we made our way around the Namekian villages we met with Nail at Guru's house. Piccolo nodded at Nail and Nail nodded at Piccolo. The Namekian body language was extremely simple, especially with people of the warrior clan. Piccolo was happy to be on his home planet. He split off our group and went sightseeing it. We installed the training rooms near Guru's house as I materialized a platform that could sustain everything. It was time for some hardcore training. I wouldn't interfere with Frisia, I will let them fight with him. Frisia was just too weak and all of them needed some life and death fights to stimulate their potential. If they were almost near death I would save them, but there was a very low chance for that to happen, at least against Frisia that is. I turned the gravity up to 100 and made everyone come in, they immediately sagged down like a bunch of potato sacks, they couldn't move properly at all the gravity was too much for them, Goku included. He trained to the maximum of 20 times gravity before. Nappa and Vegeta were in the other chamber training at 30 times. After they got used to it, I will make them train with all of us here. I let their bodies get used to gravity and used my magic healing to heal their bones and muscles, facilitating an increase in power level to Goku and letting the humans get used to gravity better. I also helped Nappa and Vegeta out with my healing magic and after that put them directly inside 100 gravity. Both of their power levels increased every time they healed from damage as they were scions. The damage wasn't life-threatening though so the increase wasn't very high. But they could train in 100 times gravity normally now. I decided to take a page out of Popo's training book and said, All right maggots, it's time for some special fighting training. You will all come at me with everything you got and try to move me from my spot. My power level already touched 12 million and all of them were below 100,000. It was practically impossible to do that without any techniques. They all charged towards me in a formation trying to disorientate me. It was quite cute. It would have worked on anyone else with a weaker mind or key that was above 1 million power level so they could have put a good fight against second form Frisia. I let loose my key as I extended my arms, pushing them back. They tried to attack me again, it was obvious they had a hard time as they were sweating intensely. The gravity was taking a toll on their bodies, but I could feel their key increasing. I could not heal exhaustion but I could heal their torn muscles and broken bones. I continued to train them as a general from hell, and after two months of hellish training great results have been sprung. The Scions as always were the most impressive of the bunch. Goku reached the power level of 130,000. Vegeta reached the power level of 90,000. Nappa the power level of 70,000. Rashi's power level increased to 50,000. Tien's to 45,000. Yamcha's to 40,000. Raditz to 35,000 and Kaiatsu's to 20,000. Piccolo also came back and joined us in the training reaching a power level of 49,000. It seemed his journey among his people made him want to protect the planet against the evil that was to come. He trained like crazy and his motivation made everyone else train like crazy as well. My power level didn't increase by much but teaching others makes you reflect upon oneself so my techniques improved by quite a bit. I was sure I would even be able to take Cooler out now if we fought again. Vegeta was grumbling, he didn't like taking what was he thinking was charity for me and the others. He could have trained on his own. But he realized that his power level wouldn't have spiked so much just by sparring with Nappa on a godforsaken planet. He also didn't like how the low-class clown Kakarot surpassed him in power. He was the prince, the super elite after he learned how to sense Ki, he immediately challenged Goku to a fight. Kakarot, I'll show you what a true Scion elite can do. Goku smirked and said, I'm pumped for a fight with my fellow Scion as well Vegeta. Vegeta scoffed but didn't continue talking. He immediately started to charge his purple key. As it started to shake the whole planet Nail was watching and Super Kamiguru had his window open so he could spectate as well he was eating popcorn while saying, Nail get me more butter. Nail looked at Super Kamiguru with a puzzled look. What are you eating Lord Guru? Don't you remember that we can only drink water? And what's this butter you are talking about? Guru kept a straight face and said, 
About that drinking only water thing, it was a lie. We can eat as well. Why do you think I'm so fat? And so started the epic adventure of Nail's search for butter so Super Kami Guru could fully delectate himself with a creamy popcorn while watching sparring sessions. Back to the fight, Goku charged up his sky blue aura as well and started to clash with Vegeta. Their speeds were so fast the majority couldn't see them fight without using Ki to enhance their eyes. I could see them normally, they were trading punches and kicks and Goku was always coming up as better in the exchange. It seemed Goku was going easy on Vegeta. As the fight continued, Vegeta realized that Goku was holding back and he shouted, Kakarot stop humiliating me by holding back. Give it your all. And Goku did so. He suddenly appeared in front of Vegeta, grabbed him by a leg and started spinning him around after a while of spinning. He let go of his leg and used the Kaioken to immediately appear at the destination Vegeta would have landed. He appeared under him and punched him in the back, grabbed him and threw him down in the water. I immediately took Vegeta back out of the water and healed him. When did Goku become so brutal? Vegeta started to cough up a bit of water as he felt his power level increasing. He reached 120,000. He was ready to fight with Goku again, but he remembered how his power spiked due to the Kaioken, and he settled down this was his loss. Nappa immediately got towards Vegeta and helped him up. Vegeta scoffed and declined Nappa's hand by smacking it away. Nappa just grinned like a buffon and said, Vegeta you got your butt handed to you today. It was almost like seeing you mock fight with Frieza back then. Vegeta's face darkened, and he pointed two fingers towards Nappa. Nappa's face paled as he found himself with two tiny holes in his chest. Vegeta intentionally didn't aim at any vital areas and said, This is for speaking when you are out of line Imperial Advisor Nappa. Nappa coughed some blood and chuckled. I'll make sure to ask for your permission before speaking again, Prince. Vegeta laughed and said, Make sure to not make the same mistake again, understood? Nappa just nodded his bald head vigorously. I came near him and healed both of the holes in his chest. His power level spiking towards 75,000. Goku motioned towards me with a smile on his face. It seemed he wanted to show me something. Out of the corner of my eye I could see Bulma patting Vegeta on the back and consoling him. Vegeta seemed pretty grim but didn't refuse her pats. I followed Goku and entered the gravity chamber with him. Immediately his eyes turned feral and his power grew. His power level multiplied by ten times and an Ozuru image appeared behind him for a brief second. His smile turned wider as he waited for my comments. Good job, Goku. It seems you have mastered the Akari mode. Now you can use the power of the great ape form without the cumbersome increased body size. Goku nodded his head and he reverted his transformation. It's all due to your teachings, Krillin. You are so knowledgeable about this kind of stuff. Where did you even learn all of it? I chuckled and answered him truthfully. Well, for one I got some of my knowledge from my travels around the universe and the other. Well, I used the Dragon Balls to gather some needed information. Goku nodded his head. He wouldn't question anything that was involved with the Dragon Balls. He witnessed their prowess firsthand. After 20 more days, I could feel giant malevolent key and a smaller malevolent key approaching Namek. It seemed Cooler decided to butt in Frieza's gig this time around. I took everyone and entered Guru's house and said, Great Super Kami Guru, could you unlock everyone's potential so we would have a better chance to ward off the invaders? Super Kami Guru looked at us through his almost closed eyes and said, the one with the hippie troll hair and the bald one with the mustache gets no potential unlocked. Vegeta growled and said, We didn't need your so-called potential unlock anyway. Nappa let's wait outside. Nappa complied with Vegeta's wishes and walked outside with him, waiting for the others to get their potential unlocked. Kayatsu's power level increased to 70,000. Yamcha's to 120,000. Tien's to 170,000. Goku's to 1,500,000. Raditz-Z to 200,000 and Rashi's to 180,000. Vegeta growled outside as he sensed the new power levels. He was already at 150,000, while Nappa's breached 95,000. 
everyone was ready for the incoming fight with the two tyrant Frost Lords. Frisia's giant spaceship entered the planet's atmosphere while coolers waited outside of it. They landed and the grunts made their way outside the spaceship, ready to unleash hell upon Namek's peaceful land. Unfortunately for them, we all made our way towards the spaceship and the grunts became space dust. Out of the spaceship Frisia, Cooler, Dodoria and Zarbin flew out. Cooler narrowed his eyes at my presence while Frisia looked puzzledly at Cooler then at me and asked, Do you know this bald noseless thing, brother? Cooler gritted his teeth and said, He is the one who injured me back then. Frisia gasped. He remembered how he made fun of Cooler some years ago because he came at the family reunion battered and took a beating from him because of that. Frisia knew there was no chance of interfering in my and Cooler's fight, so he glanced at the others and when he saw Vegeta he started smiling menacingly. So this is where you hid, Vegeta you rat. It seemed my benevolence didn't stop you from trying to usurp me. Vegeta spat on the ground and growled. Benevolence? What benevolence? Killing my entire race and destroying my planet? That's what you call benevolence, Frisia. Frisia chuckled and said while seemingly reminiscing, Ah yes, those fireworks were quite sublime. Planet Vegeta made a great show before it became space dust. Vegeta, Nappa, and Raditz gritted their teeth in anger. Goku looked solemnly towards Frisia as well. Even though he didn't know anything concrete about his race besides that they were space pirates, he still felt bad about their fate. I intercepted Cooler as I used five of my six dots, increasing my power level to 384 million. Cooler immediately powered up to his maximum in his normal form, and we took the fight out of Namek's atmosphere. On the planet, Frisia remained and said, Dodoria, Zarbin you stay back. Their power levels are too high for you call the Jinyu Force for reinforcements. I still need some grunts to gather the Dragon Balls after. Goku looked solemnly at Frieza as he started to charge his Kamehameha. Frieza immediately powered up towards his second form and charged forward. Vegeta was ready to kill both Dodoria and Zarbin. But before they both died at Vegeta's hands, they could still use their scouters to call for the Jinyu Force. Vegeta laughed and said, Killing Frieza's minions and his Jinyu Force will feel pretty well. Frieza growled towards Goku as he transformed in his third form and Goku used Kaioken times two to fight against him. In the atmosphere of planet Namek, I was confronting Cooler for the second time, and this time around I wasn't going to be the one who lost. I was staring down Cooler as he kept his guard up against me. He saw how some of my dots were shining on my forehead and he knew I was already above his power level a bit. He was already trying to go on his fifth form. Cooler said after we stared at each other for a while, Your survival intrigues me. It seems you can also survive in space as my clan can. Your lack of nose seems to explain you not needing oxygen though. I kept a serious face at his words. Goku could technically fight full power Frieza with a combination of Akari mode and Kaioken without the need of Super Scion. Hopefully no one would die against Frieza. I trained all of them thoroughly to make sure nothing untoward would happen to them. Cooler shouted as his armor started to encase him and he bulked up. Veins appeared around him. He knew his energy consumption would increase by quite a lot, but he felt how I was stronger than before he decided to give his all from the start. All of my dots started shining as I buffed up using my full power technique. Our power levels now were similar both exceeding 1 billion. Cooler narrowed his red pupilless eyes at me and started to charge at me. He threw a right hook at me which I parried and countered with a roundhouse kick. He took in full brunt with his arms defending his chest in an X position. He grunted and started to charge tiny death beams on his fingers which he quickly shot at me. I dodged by milliseconds while the death beam was fast and had great piercing power. It couldn't kill if it didn't hit a vital point. It was also easily parable. For example, when Goku was below Frieza's power level in his final form and he could parry it with his hand albeit with difficulty. I used my instant transmission to directly appear behind Cooler and ran him through with a concentrated revolving sphere of ki. His back immediately exploded as a huge tear appeared in it. He growled and used his tail to grab my hand and threw me away while he charged a purple giant beam and shot it at me. I cut the beam in half with a golden key scythe which I created hastily and buffed it up with my magic to increase its sharpness. 
Cooler was annoyed as he cauterized his back wound with a bit of key stopping its bleeding. He knew I still had some techniques that could increase my power level, but I didn't use them. The only chance for him to survive was to somehow be able to escape. He didn't care about Frisia. He would be glad if Frisia died here. He was jealous of his brother's high power level upon birth and how his father viewed Frisia better than himself. I could sense several highish power levels make their way in space pods towards Namek. If my guess was right, it was the Jinyu Force. I telepathically told the people on Namek to make sure they didn't kill Jis or Birder. They could hurt them but not kill them. Vegeta grumbled down on Namek at my words he wasn't going to promise anything. Goku nodded to himself while he clashed with Frieza, while the others made sure to remember my explanation of Jis and Birder's features so they wouldn't kill them. While the two Jinyu members weren't to be killed, the others were game though. Frieza immediately used his third's form superior speed to ditz Goku in the stomach and he started to fire death beams as fast as a machine gun from his finger. Goku either deflected or dodged them after he got struck by a few due to him being stunned from the stomach hit. He started to increase his Kaioken but Frieza didn't let him concentrate on the technique properly knowing that if he let the Scion increase his power level by too much would spell his doom. He immediately started to charge upon his final form his arms by his sides as his power level increased directly to 50% of his normal. Making him reach 60 million, Goku gasped as he stopped using Kaioken and directly used Akari mode increasing his power level to 15 million. He also used Kaioken times 4 to match Frieza's power level. Frieza couldn't sense Ki, but he could sense the air of savagery around Goku as his hair started to spike up combined with the red aura that encased him now. He knew that the continuing fight won't be easy for him at all. Back with Cooler, I started to use my golden Ki Scythe to try to hack him into pieces he had his guard up against me, knowing that I could increase my power level with a burst and kill him so he was ready to make a retreat and run away with his spaceship anytime. Spaceships had void traveling capabilities which would increase their speed by quite a lot. Even though it couldn't compare to my spaceship speed, his could travel from galaxy to galaxy in few months, while mine would take half as much time. I wasn't sure where the Colt's planet was and I wasn't sure of King Colt's full power either so I needed to make sure both Cooler and Frieza died here without alerting Cold about it. If they made their way back and informed him of my power I would lose the surprise tactic I could use against him. Cooler couldn't be distracted by anything now as he dodged my attempts at hacking him in two with the scythe. He was fully concentrated on my figure and I smirked while I turned off the key scythe and put my hands near my face and shouted. Solar Flare! A blinding light engulfed Cooler's widened eyes as he screamed. You bastard! I will kill you and your whole family and planet! You monkey! How dare you! But it was too late for him, already blinded I charged my destructo disc and bifurcated him into two he gasped as he couldn't feel his lower body anymore. And I made sure he couldn't get it back as I destroyed it with a handful of key. Cooler was still alive, his species could even survive being cut into two. Their will was tenacious and so was their physique. Cooler growled as his eyesight restored and looked down at his non-existent lower part. I didn't know how his race multiplied. But now he didn't have a little friend anymore. It all became dust. Before Cooler could do anything else. I created a long golden sword which extended out of my fingers and impaled him through the head. His power level was halved as he wasn't a hole anymore. I nodded my head. Vegito spirit sword was a good technique which I added to my arsenal right now. Back on planet Namek, Goku and Frieza were interlocked in a deadly fight as the other continued to watch the fight. The Jinyu members' bodies were strewn here and there. The captain was laid down on Namek's ground face up his body had a huge hole through the middle. It seemed he couldn't use his change technique to get anyone this time. Jis and Birder were tied with key rope and were looking at everyone with fear in their eyes not knowing what their fate was. Jis said in a trembling voice towards Birder, Mate, I think this is it for us. They might eat us alive now. We don't know for sure what these triclops... Midget and Science will do to us. It was an honor to fight alongside you in the mighty Jinyu Force. Birder stuttered out and said, Well said, Jis. It seems I buffed my confidence up till now for nothing. I'm not the fastest in the universe. Jis comforted him with words making him feel better. 
Vegeta scoffed at the duo's interaction. He was ready to kill both of them. But the human Yamcha stopped him. Their power levels were similar and Yamcha still had the stand and Kaioken technique under his belt. Vegeta was humiliated at the thought of the Earthlings becoming stronger than him. But he remembered that I was an Earthling as well and didn't say anything anymore. From the reports, he got when he first came to Earth, he was sure it said that Earthlings had dirt low potential for fighting, but it seemed whoever made those reports was retarded. Apule sneezed in a faraway Frisia planet. He survived this ordeal by his post being changed at the last second. Not going to Namek. I stood hidden and observed the fight between Goku and Frisia, when suddenly out of the corner of the eye Frisia shot a death beam directly towards Yamcha's heart. Goku tried to deflect it, but he wasn't fast enough. Yamcha almost got hit by it, but I put a magic barrier between him and the beam and the beam got dispersed. Yamcha sweated intensely. He almost got yamcha today. Fortunately, I acted quickly enough so he didn't die. But Frisia wasn't done yet. He tried to hit everyone else with his beams knowing he couldn't do anything to Goku without powering up to 100%. He was reluctant to do so. His power would drain extremely fast in that form as he used it very rarely. He didn't want to get exhausted by fighting WTH Goku then possibly die at some of these weakling hands. He decided to try to attack everyone as a distraction and run away. He didn't want to fight anymore. He wasn't sure how Cooler was doing up in the stratosphere. But he didn't care much either. He could die for all he cared anyway. Frieza was ready to make a run for it. But Goku suddenly appeared around him and caught him by the tail. He was ready to do his famous meteor combination. Goku threw Frieza and appeared in front of him catching him. The impact of the throw and the immediate catch immediately put a burden on Frieza's body. Goku hit Frieza directly in the chest making him fall as he started to fly up and charge a Kamehameha at him. Frieza tried to get up but he was disorientated and his whole body hurt from the attack. He knew he couldn't hold back anymore as his body buffed up and veins appeared all over it. He charged a giant beam in his left hand and shot it at Goku. Goku also shot his Kamehameha over and they clashed in midair. The power between them reached above 120 million. Frieza was giving his all and was breaking his limits. Goku increased his Kaioken and it started to push the beam back down to Frieza. Frieza grunted as a maniacal light appeared in his eyes. If the Emperor of the Galaxy was going down, he was going to take some people with him. He was ready to directly shoot the planet with his other hand. But I stopped him with my telekinesis. He couldn't move his hand at all. His key was botched in him, unable to use his other hand to shoot the planet and destroy it. He looked at me with fear in his eyes and realized that Cooler was already dead. His brother's strongest behind his father was dead. He knew he had no chance of survival here, but out of sheer will he pointed his finger at Rashi and shot him in the lungs with a weakened death beam. He didn't know of my healing abilities so he wanted to take at least one of the weaker members of the party out. Seeing a defenseless old man it was his prime target. I was surprised then thoroughly angered by him. I immediately appeared near Rashi as he coughed up blood. Fortunately, he didn't hit his heart or else he would have died instantly. I started to heal him and after a few seconds he was right back up. Goku influenced by his Ikari mode immediately started to see red when he saw Rashi go down. His Kaioken dropped but his head veins started to show as he screamed, Grandpa! His power level was skyrocketing at enormous amounts as his Ikari mode was still on. His hair started to turn golden as his power level broke through the 150 million range and it was still increasing. It finally stopped at 350 million as his form stabilized, while he could use Akari. Mode and Super Scion, he wasn't the legendary Super Scion so he couldn't get the extremely high power level boost like Broly. The power level multiplier was a surprising 230 or so times, from a million and a half to 350 million. Goku was panting hard as his energy was going down by the second. It seemed his body couldn't adapt to the combination either. He would need to train long and hard to master it. And if he ever lost his tail, he couldn't use the Akari mode combination either. Of course, I was already impressed that he could reach this power. Goku started to calm down as his reason got back to him. He saw how Rashi was okay. But he didn't drop his transformation. He charged a Kamehameha wave and extinguished Frieza from existence right then and there. 
It seemed Ikari mode and Super Scion influenced each other and made the user way more uncontrolled and ruthless. Goku's combined transformation dropped and he flew slowly to the ground where he collapsed. Raditz came over and gave him a Senzu bean which he swallowed and he immediately got back up his power level doubled to 3 million. Vegeta was looking at Goku with envy, seemingly realizing that was the legendary transformation of the race. Nappa was looking at Goku with stars in his eyes as he made his way towards him and asked how he did it. Goku seemingly tried to explain, but he didn't know where to start. He just transformed once, and he wasn't sure of the certain trigger behind the transformation besides immense rage. Vegeta listened to the explanation from some distance away. Raditz was also listening. All of them wanted to become a Super Scion as well. I let them talk with each other, while Guru nodded from his seat and told Nail, Nail, go gather the Dragon Balls, it's time for my TV. But Lord Guru, we do not even have cable on the planet. Wish for that as well then. Get your butt in shape and go wish for it. Piccolo sweat dropped at the interaction between his fellow Namekians when suddenly Nail came towards him and said, Brother, I can't take guarding this guy anymore. Let me teach you a special technique which will increase your power level and relieve me from this eternal torture. Nail immediately grabbed Piccolo's hand as he started to transform into blue key and disappear. Piccolo's power level immediately increased to 3,500,000 and it seemed like it would increase even more in the future. Guru immediately shouted as he pointed at Piccolo's head. Nail, I know you are in there, you can't shirk of your responsibilities. You took a vow. Nail immediately said in Piccolo's head. Quick, hide me inside some of your memories or something. Piccolo was dumbfounded at all that was happening, but he was also happy at the increase in power. So he did just like Nail asked him. Guru tried to sense Nail again, but he thoroughly disappeared. Out of nowhere, a little Namekian was summoned by Guru and said, Den from now on you will be the next guardian. Your first job acquire television and cable. Den was flustered and he didn't know what to say. Guru put his hand on Den's head and he unlocked his potential and continued, Chop, chop. I want that television already. I sweat dropped as well at the interaction. I took all of the training machines and dematerialized the stage where they were put on. It was time to go back to Earth. Well, at least for the others, I had to deliver Jis back to his planet and Jika. It didn't take much time to deliver everyone back to the lookout and make my way back towards Namek. I could already see the giant dragon in the sky saying, Television? Cable? Are you sure about these wishes? Wait, you want to change cable to universal cable so you can see every show in the universe? Okay, what about the third wish, then? Uh, I can't bring back Nail since he doesn't want that. Guru immediately said, That traitor, after all, I did for him. He decided to run away with another Namekian. He took his vows. It seemed it wasn't an opportune moment, so I grabbed both Jis and Birder and used my instant transmission to go back to Space Australia. Jaika was cooking ramen in the kitchen when I suddenly appeared in two with her brother and his best friend. Jis' eyes widened when he saw his sister. I undid the key bindings on him as Jaika ran towards Jis, embraced him, and the smiled at me and said, You followed up on your promise, Mr. Krillin. Jis looked at me and Jaika with a questioning gaze Birder was just staying around awkwardly not knowing what to say. He knew of Jaika as he talked with her during the time she talked with Jis. Jaika let go of Jis and started to recount our meeting, omitting the other more sensitive parts of the story. Jis gasped then looked at me and said with a grateful tone of voice, I see mate so that's how it is. I'm grateful that you spared me and my friend Birder. I wasn't a big fan of Frisia's force anyway, but the pay was good and I was forcefully enrolled I couldn't quit even if I wanted to. Frisia would have my head and my sisters for it. So I did something that I'm not proud of during the years I worked under him. I nodded my head towards him and said, You can be redeemed as you still have a conscience. The same can be said about your friend. I can feel the aura of sin from the both of you, but it can be cleaned, be at peace both of you. They nodded their heads towards my words, 
and Jaika was glowing with happiness as I made my way back with her brother and kept my promise. I decided to do something during this time. Jaika, Jis, Birder. I know people on this planet will fear you since you previously worked with Frisia. Would you like to move with me to Earth? Also, you too could help me to root out the other forces of Frisia's and coolers of the North Galaxy and West Galaxy and East Galaxy. This could help you cleanse your sins. Jaika was already packing up while Jis and Birder were looking at each other then smiled, both nodding their head towards me. Maybe I could give them work in the Space Patrol Force or whatever it was called after this. They could use some relatively strong people in there. After Jaika packed up, I took all of them back to Earth. I left Jaika at my house and told her to get comfortable while I took Jis and Birder towards the lookout so they could train themselves with the others before we got to exterminate the remaining Cold family forces of the galaxy. Next time, King Cold will die as well, and the Cold family won't terrorize the galaxy with their antics anymore. I told Vegeta and the others of their circumstances and Nappa and Raditz agreed on coming with us so they could cleanse their sins as well. Vegeta scoffed at the invitation and continued to train in the gravity chamber, he turned the gravity directly to 300 and continued to do push-ups. He wanted to gain the power of a super scion as well. He couldn't let a low-class warrior like Kakarot continuing to surpass him the prince. I decided to let Vegeta do his thing, it wasn't my job to take care of him. He could reach the super scion form by himself just like he did in the anime, his training was effective. I decided to train Jisen Birder. But Popo came out of nowhere and said that he would train the red and blue guys himself. Popo already reached the power level of 520,000 and he could rival Frisia in his first form. I decided to let the two of them taste Popo's training and left to check up on the dojo. Everyone that trained in the dojo reached an average power level of 50 and Chi Chi also started to train Gohan. Gohan's power level already reached 10,000. His talent wasn't there for nothing. Chi Chi also grew stronger by training with her son and reached the power level of 15,000 and it was still growing. Nam's power level reached 1,500. I also added some more instructors from the more talented dojo practitioners. Somehow Hercule made his way here and his power level was already 200. It seemed he had some talent for martial arts after all. I decided to let him become an instructor as well so he could get a better income combined with his restaurant so he could support his family better from what I got from him. It seemed his wife ran the restaurant while he came to train here. He thanked me after he heard that I saw potential in him and put him in the position of instructor. He had tears in his eyes. It seemed he wanted someone to realize that he was talented in martial arts. It seemed he didn't take Vidal with him this time. Well, when the time would come, it would come. Gohan was here every day. It seemed there was fate at work with some couples around. Was there any fate between me and 18 here or did my spirit break it? I was thoroughly different from the normal Krillin. It was the difference between the sky and earth. I wasn't sure if she would even like me. I decided to make my way home on foot. When I entered my house, I was met by a half-naked Jaika eating lunch from my refrigerator. I coughed and she looked towards me with a blush on her face and she stuttered out, Oh, H-U-R, why back -a? Then she stopped stuttering and continued, Well, you know I like to be freer when I'm inside the house. It makes me feel better. She pushed her chest forward, pushing her majestic orbs forward. It seemed like they grew again. They were a bit bigger than before. She looked at me with expectant eyes. I didn't know what to say. I think it was okay since I had no other contact with 18, so it wasn't cheating on her, but... In the future would I have to break up with Jaika if 18 liked me? It didn't seem right. But what if... I could have both? Jaika seemed pretty open-minded, so I decided to ask her directly. Jaika, what would you think if I, uh... I was in a relationship with you and I wanted to add a more women in the equation? Jaika put a finger on her chin and took a pondering face and she responded seconds after. I wouldn't mind. The leader on our planet has 60 wives. People with strength and authority can have more than one wife in my opinion. If you can make the other women you are interested in agreeing as well I don't see any problem myself. What an understanding red-skinned lady. Since she was so open-minded I decided we need to have a little fun. 
before I made my way around the universe purging the remaining of Frisia's and Cooler's forces. After a fun time that consisted of three days and nights, I decided it was time to go and cleanse the universe of the remains of the Cold Empire. If I found cold as well it would be for the best I could destroy the problem at its core. I was standing on the lookout waiting for everyone to make sure they were ready. I would use my spaceship and go directly from planet to planet. If the grunts would give up I will spare them, but they would have to work restore the planets and free their population if the planets were subjugated. I thought thoroughly about the plan after I took care of King Cold and the rest of the subjugated planets I would make sure no one else would lust after the Cold's family riches by becoming the new figurehead of the intergalactic criminal organization. I would just cease all of the illegal work and transform it into something else. Maybe I could use all of the riches gathered by King Cold to restore damaged planets, save extinct species and continue growing the mortal level of the universe that way. I nodded my head towards Jis, Birder, and the two Scions. The Scions both learned how to control themselves in their Great Ape mode and their power level increased to above 150,000. Jis and Birder reached the power level of 90,000 and even created their stands with a little bit of my help. They were pretty talented. Even though Frisia was a giant egomaniac with a penchant of destroying planets that he found an eyesore, he did have a good eye for talent. Birder's stand was a blue hedgehog with green eyes. It looked quite cute. His power level increased by six times. G's stand was simply a kangaroo the mascot of his home planet Space Australia. His power level increased by 6.5 times. They were ready for the journey. The only remnants of Frisia's and Cooler's empires were only the weaklings the Jinyu Force and Cooler's armored squadron was already history. I popped open the spaceship's capsule and it appeared in all of its of glory. We entered the spaceship and with Jis and Birder's information about Frisia's planets, we started our liberation of them, with the nearest one being Frisia Planet 696932. The planet wasn't anything special its inhabitants already drained of their will to live. The grunts immediately surrendered after they heard of the news which started spreading in the galaxy of both tyrants' deaths. King Cold would be informed now as well, but my power level now reached above 15 million, almost 16 million, and I could use the super mode with the full power technique, Godspeed and Kaioken up to six times. Besides Perfect Cell, there would be no one else who would be my match. Well, besides Bu, who was way stronger than me, and Ambiris and Wiss and everyone else that came in Dragon Ball Super. I was quite strong for the time, but I couldn't slack off my training anymore. I needed to be sure I could take everything that would come next, at least Beerus could be easily appeased with good food. And I could do my best right now to increase the universe's average mortal level. It was a good thing to happen even if we didn't get excluded from the tournament. Having a stronger universe would lead to better life prospects to every living being. I could feel that my benevolent Buddha stand was quite interfering with my core personality, but it wasn't in a negative way, I could feel that it purified my mind, and it increased my key's purity as well, everything was good, even though I did become more benevolent and hero-like, it wasn't truly a bad thing as I wasn't a weakling trying to get himself killed by being too heroic. I continued to liberate planets left and right, I didn't do the groundwork myself, letting the others cleanse their sins. I could feel their aura purify with time and surprisingly, Raditz and Nappa grew stronger by doing this, I could some special cells multiplying in them waiting to be awakened, I wasn't truly familiar with Scion biology besides knowing that they got stronger every time they came from near death and the ability to evolve during extreme stress, also being known as becoming a Super Scion. I used my key sense in combination with my magic to examine deep inside their bodies and I could see some special golden cells multiplying in the back of their necks. With their auras full of sin they had none but as the sins got erased and the good karma started to gather those cells came into being. Birder and Jis got no such things, however, but they did get more proficient with their stands as they fought to liberate countless planets. It took us approximately two months to cleanse the whole North Galaxy. King Cold should have heard about everything by now, but seemingly he wasn't trying to stop us. Maybe he was scared? I was trying to bait him out of his hole and exterminate him out of his home planet, but it seemed it wasn't possible. Jis and Birder knew of the Colts clan stronghold. They got there with Frisia during one family meeting where the subordinates would have to show their might. Of course, 
they lost miserably against cooler armored squadron. Even their mighty Captain Jinyu couldn't touch Salz's boots. I decided to input the coordinates of the cold's origin planet into the spaceship and get it going. It won't take us much till we could reach the planet with my spaceship's fast speed. And so in a few days, we were there. I could feel an immense key reaching almost two billion in number waiting for us down there. It seemed cold was ready for us. I decided to let them stay on the spaceship so they wouldn't become collateral damage. I didn't save Raditz and Nappa so they just go and die again. Same could be said about Jis and Birder. I also didn't want Jaika to be sad due to her brother's death. I decided to confront him alone. I appeared directly into Cold's throne room. He was in his final form seemingly resembling Frisia's but buffer with green gems instead of purple. He was also way taller than Frisia. He was spinning a bit of wine in his glass as he looked outside at the scenery. He didn't turn towards me but started to talk. So you are the one responsible for all these damages done to my empire and the death of my two sons? He didn't sound angry, but his tone was bone-chilling cold. I grunted in affirmation. He got up from his chair that he lunged on and damn he was truly taller when he got up. He was two meters and thirty centimeters tall. He towered over my form easily as he crushed the wine glass in his pale palm and veins started to appear around him as he buffed up further. His power level doubled to four billion in number as he charges an extremely high amount of key in his hands ready to detonate at any moment. I immediately turned on my six dots combined with my full power technique as I started to buff up and grew to two meters tall. Pure white electricity started to arc around me combined with a faint red aura. I used the base form of the Kaioken to increase my power level by 1.5 times, rivaling cold in power and even eclipsing him by a 500 million. He detonated the key and the surroundings exploded. Key turned the icy planet into a water planet. At our power levels, uninhibited use of key would destroy planets in seconds. We didn't even need to hit the core of the planet to destroy it. Of course, planets with a stronger mortal level would be harder to destroy, but this planet had some of his grunts and himself it was deserted. His race was extinct after all and he now was the last survivor. He shot towards me immediately afterwards using his bulky giant form to his advantage as we clashed in power. His height and weight gave him an edge over me, even though my power level was a bit more superior. So I decided to not play into his strength. I started to dodge around quickly by emphasizing my god speed. His eyes moved around trying to predict my moves. It seemed he was a veteran at fighting. He could only create such a big empire upon a mountain of corpses. And of course, when he started he wouldn't have any henchmen to do his work. I blitzed directly to his right as his tail suddenly slapped me in the face. I decided to take a page out of Goku's book and bit it thoroughly. His face immediately turned purple as he tried to get his tail out of my mouth. I kept it tightly clenched with my teeth and I started to pour a barrage of punches towards his stomach. My superior power level gave me a higher attacking power good enough to pierce through his buff muscles and thick skin. He started to vomit bile as I let go of his tail as he shot towards a nearby mountain. I appeared in front of his figure that was clambering to get to his feet and drop kicked him in the head. He became disoriented. Even though the cold clan's physique was very strong that only counted against people with the same power level or lower power level than them. People with higher power levels could pierce through their physiques if they had the knowledge where to hit them. I could use my magic and key sense to identify weaknesses through his body so it was easy. I put one fist in front of the other and took a boxer stance. I quite liked his fighting style so I decided to copy him this time. Combined with my extremely fast speed, it was basically like using time skip against cold. I hit him over all of his body with key enhanced fists as rays of golden key started to appear behind his back and punch trough. Blood started to seep out of the corner of his mouth as he smirked. Suddenly he lunged at me and tried to give me a big hug. Unfortunately for him, I could see what he was trying to do. He wanted to use his powerful physique to overpower me in close combat. But I wouldn't let him, even though he was stronger than me his speed felt off by a lot due to his increased muscle mass. He started panting as he tried to chase me around. It was a quite fun game of tag. But it was time to end this. There was no reason to continue. I put one hand up into the air as a giant destructo disc took the form of a giant blue shuriken that was spinning at fast speeds. 
I put my other's hand free fingers on my forehead and appeared directly above cold. He ate the full brunch of the Shuriken Kienzen special. The Shuriken Kienzen immediately started spinning like a meat grinder. It started to cut off his skin, muscle, and bones into tender meat which immediately started to vaporize due to the key properties and the centrifugal force that was added to the spinning shuriken form. The cold clan was no longer existing in Universe 7, well at least in the living realm. I decided it was time to take the reins off this empire, disband it and create something else out of it. Even though the planet was damaged due to our fight, there were still some grunts here and they're shivering and waiting for the results. When they saw me, they knew Cold was dead, and so was his empire. They immediately fell to their knees and chanted out loud, Greetings towards the new emperor of the universe. Emperor of the universe Krillin sounded good, right? I didn't want the title, but I wouldn't mind being called that. I asked the grunts to show me where I could project my image towards all the active and known Cold's family empire acquisitions. The grunts didn't dare to lie and took me towards a different building that fortunately didn't get destroyed during our intense fight. I entered the building and the grunts started to input some codes and press some colored buttons on the console. A special hologram immediately started to appear on the console. It was me and it was sent across all the galaxies on all the cold planets. I cleared my throat and said, From now on, there's no cold empire anymore. King Cold and all of his heirs died to my hands. I'm the new emperor of the universe, and I command all of you to cease all the illegal activities. The planet organization trade of the former Cold Empire has been cancelled. You will be briefed of the new work you would take soon enough by one of my advisors. I decided to groom Jis and Birder into advisors. They were more in the known of the Cold's family system. I just needed to change what they did and impose bans and limits on the way they acted. I could of course still pay them what they were paid before I wasn't a tyrant. I decided that everyone would go and restore the planets how they were originally, and if any survivors remained of the original inhabitants of the planet, they would be helped to reproduce back the race and given ownership of the planet. I decided to not interfere in planetary politics if my people weren't involved, they would do whatever it was needed to be done before leaving the planet and going to the other ones. There were millions or even billions of planets in the universe and while not all of them were conquered by the planet trade organization quite a lot of them were. So it would take a while for them to fix everything. Maybe by the time Bu came everything would start to flourish again in Universe 7. I decided to take everyone back to Earth. Both Raditz and Nappa were pumped up for training while Bird and Jis didn't want to become advisors who would have to do work all day. But I told them all they would have to do is give me the important decisions, which would be reported to them by the other smaller workers who would do all the work. I need some more figureheads so the organization wouldn't feel empty of higher echelons. Former Frisia elite soldiers would put pressure under the underlings and make sure no one would defect. I didn't need bad-intentioned aliens free in the galaxy doing God knows what. I was responsible for them now. Redeeming themselves of all the evil and sins they did was the great path of the Buddha. I suddenly started to understand some of the words of the stone plaque I found on the desert planet. My power level immediately spiked to 20 million as my key became 1% truly golden and viscous. I could feel a special type of connection between me and the key now. It seemed like acknowledgement. I felt that if I understood all of those words completely, I would reach a maximum of 50% purifying of key. After that, I would need to purify it with my efforts. We all arrived back at the lookout. Goku was training very hard trying to master his Super Saiyan form combined with Akari mode so that it wouldn't drain so much ki, compared to before this combination drained way more ki than the normal Super Saiyan transformation and if he could master this one, of course, the normal one would be mastered as well. I motioned towards him and imparted the knowledge of instant transmission directly to his brain, it was one of the techniques he would have learned after he left Namek. But due to my interference, he couldn't get it. Goku smiled towards me and nodded his head. It seemed he liked the technique. That was Goku for you. Being giddy like a little kid at every cool technique he would learn or want to learn. He immediately stopped his training in his transformed state wanting to master instant transmission first. I let him be there was still a lot of time left before the supposed androids were to come. Trunks didn't even appear yet. And by the interactions of Bulma and Vegeta, 
I was sure Trunks would exist. I decided I was in for some fun time with Jika after I saved the universe from the greedy paws of a galactic overworld intending of conquering it all for profit. A time of peace would hit the universe and Earth before the androids made their entrance. On a distant planet that was shaped like a pyramid with a giant tree that stood in its middle a blue-skinned man with white hair and a peculiar outfit looked inside a crystal ball that was embedded in his staff as a nearby purple humanoid cat who wore pajamas was sleeping and muttering, Whis! Food! Destroy the planet! Food not good! Bleg! Then he made a disgusted look on his face and he was ready to shoot a purple key ball out of his hand. The blue-skinned man known as Wiss immediately used his staff to stop the key ball from destroying anything. He sighed and said, It seems this earthling is doing the work of the creator gods. Even though the Kai can't interfere themselves in this kind of thing, they could groom some champions using their divine techniques to help the mortal realm. He sighed again and continued, and Lord Beerus is still neglecting his job, at least he should try to destroy planets with no potential at increasing their mortal level, but he... Never mind, I can't do much about him, I can only instruct him and not force him. On different corners of the galaxies, multiple Kais were rejoicing as they met up for a party. The West Kai was a short portly man with a monocle and purple skin. He had big elf-like ears that pointed upwards and a hat with a top that looked like a curled pigtail. The East Kai was a portly lady with yellow skin and orange hair, who wore sunglasses with red rims and black lenses. The South Kai was a tall, burly man with pale pinkish skin who wore sunglasses with white rims and black lenses. The North Kai was a short, portly man who wears black glasses and a hat that covered his head. All of them wore the same outfit in different colors and different kanjis on the front of it. Their position was written in the front of their chest. They all wore gowns and differently colored undershirts. They all also had black antennas besides the West Kai. The North Kai immediately started gloating as he said, This guy who saved all of your quadrants is my disciple. You should repay me for teaching such a good disciple. He, of course, saved all of your galaxies while all of your champions couldn't do jack about cold and his men. The South Kai scoffed, and he said in an annoyed tone of voice, My protege Pickin just started training, but in a few years I'm sure he could have cleaned the floor with the whole cold family. King Kai looked at South Kai with a grin on his face as he continued his gloating. Yeah, but that would be in a few years. Don't you know how much damage the cold family would have done in those years? My disciple spared all of you of the damage. The West and East Kais kept mum as they didn't have champions who were strong and had high potential. They wanted to gift the blue man something just to make him shut up. He was extremely annoying. Most of the time they were the ones gloating over him. But now with his new disciple, he finally got something to back him up. And it wasn't something small. Suddenly out of nowhere a pinkish skinned man with white hair with a blue undershirt and a red and yellow tinted gown teleported over as he said in a high tone of voice. The Grand Supreme Kai is making his way over. A light purple skinned man who wore an outfit similar to the pinkish skinned man but with blue and red instead of red and yellow appeared. He said in a light tone of voice, Thanks for the introduction Kibito, but it wasn't required. I'm sure everyone here knows who I am. Every Kai bowed and nodded their heads. This was their superior. He was even higher ranked than Grand Kai, who didn't have time to join this party. The Supreme Kai known as Shin nodded towards King Kai and said with a smile on his face, I heard about your disciple's work in the mortal world, and I'm impressed with it. I also observed him and his work. His soul is pure, and he accumulated tons of good karma. He is a model citizen of the universe. I would like for you to take on this little gift of mine as a compensation for teaching such a great student. Also, send him my regards. Shin materialized a red Ferrari which he levitated nearby King Kai. King Kai gasped as his glasses almost fell off his face. He rubbed his eyes under his glasses to make sure he wasn't hallucinating. How did the Supreme Kai know of his dream car? The Supreme Kai just smiled and teleported back towards his world, with Kibito in tow. 
King Kai immediately started to gloat again in the faces of his fellow Kais. All Kais had a passion for fast vehicles for some reason. South Kai snorted again and said, What are you going to do with this fast car on your small planet anyway? At the mention of this, King Kai turned red in the face and then retorted, How is it my fault? Beerus sneezed and destroyed my other one. Everyone started to laugh at King Kai's words as the atmosphere lightened up after this story. Back on Earth. After I finished with my special time with Jaika, I decided it was time to up the training for everyone. I used one of my entries to the hyperbolic time chamber but from Popo's words I still had three more uses. I could train everyone in there and make sure we could subdue the androids peacefully if they were like in the original after they killed Jero. And they understood they couldn't kill Goku because of his immense strength, they would just give up and try to live as normal humans. I also had to make sure Cell didn't get his perfect form and maybe even absorb someone else to get stronger since he was capable of absorbing normal humans while in the first form he could absorb other people for a power boost in his final form as well. If he realized he couldn't defeat me after he would hypothetically get his final form, he would try to absorb other strong people to boost his power. I couldn't let that happen at all. So I made sure after the androids were subdued to immediately identify Cell's whereabouts and destroy him till nothing remained. I appeared on the lookout and made sure everyone was there. Raditz, Kayatsu, Nappa, Vegeta who somehow didn't go into space to train this time around, Master Rashi, Tien, Yamcha, and Piccolo. They were all sparring in the gravity chamber when I teleported on the lookout. Piccolo started to mellow out around other people more after he fused with Nail on Namek. It seemed the other Namekian was influencing him a bit. Vegeta was as angry as ever, while both Raditz and Nappa still didn't catch up to him. He realized that they started to get stronger faster than him, the prince, the most talented of the race. I looked at Vegeta and he still had zero S cells in the back of his neck. He could still awaken them with emotional and physical stress though. That's how he did it in the original, it would just be way harder for him. I motioned towards everyone to stop their training and to come to me. They all stopped, even Vegeta, from the expression on my face. He knew I was going to announce something important. I nodded towards everyone and said, I didn't inform you of the special training room that's available in this place up till now since you were too weak both mentally and physically. But now you are ready to train in there. I called Mr. Popo and he appeared out of nowhere, as usual. He had a huge grin that showed his one tooth on his face. It looked extremely unnatural like he was forcing himself to smile. He didn't say anything and just let us enter the hyperbolic time chamber. I wasn't sure what was in that black genie's mind. I made them pair with each other and spar while in their strongest forms so they could increase their base while mastering their techniques as well. Raditz and Nappa would spar with each other trying to achieve their Super Saiyan form, Goku would fight with Vegeta. I made it so Vegeta could get triggered even more because Goku would already be a Super Saiyan. I made sure to tell Goku to never turn off his Super Saiyan in Ikari mode, to taunt the prince. Yamcha would spar with Tien and Piccolo with Rashi. Kaiatsu would focus on his mental strength by himself, while I would enter further into the chamber and train in a high amount of gravity. I left all of them to train nearer the entrance of the chamber as I made my way inside the infinite white nothingness of the hyperbolic time chamber. I made sure I was far enough so my training wouldn't disturb theirs. As I turned the gravity up to 5000 times, with the gravity of the chamber being 2 times normal it became 10,000 times normal gravity. I immediately sat cross-legged and regulated my breathing while I endured the excruciating pain of my bones and muscles being torn, grow back and being torn and broken again. I decided it was time to fully master the Kaioken, Godspeed, Super Mode and Full Power Technique combination. After I mastered this combination of techniques, I could become unbeatable to everyone besides the upper echelons of the multiverse. And maybe Bu could fight to a tie with me as well, Super Bu would make me exert myself while Kid Bu would be easy to kill. Training inside a chamber of nothingness could make you forget about all notion of time. Two days already passed by when I stopped training, my base power level increased to 25 million, and I could use the combination of techniques plus the Kaioken up to 15 times. I decided to check on others and I was surprised pleasantly by them. 
Goku mastered his Super Saiyan Akari mode, making him reach the multiplier of 300x and the base power level of 5 million and 500,000. While he couldn't beat Cold with his power level now, he could still fight cooler and win. Nappa and Raditz showed signs of becoming Super Saiyan as well while their power levels reached up to 1 million plus each. Rashi reached a power level of 600,000. Piccolo's power level skyrocketed towards 3 million. Yamcha and Tien started to tie in power both reaching 900,000 and some. Kaiatsu was at 200,000. Vegeta was surprisingly reaching 2 million and 500,000. Goku was still wiping the floor with him though. Suddenly both Raditz and Nappa started to shout as their power levels skyrocketed by 50 times each. Nappa's mustache and tail turned golden while Raditz's hair and tail did the same their eyes were green teal color as well now. The combination of abundant S cells and highly intense training coupled with the adverse environment of the hyperbolic time chamber made both Scions reach their transformation. Vegeta was lying weakly on the ground after an intense sparring session against Goku, and he started grumbling, and I could even see tears in his eyes as he banged the white floor of the hyperbolic time chamber. He started to shout, I wanna be a super scion too, I wanna wanna. He immediately got up from the ground as he started to shout, and his power level started to skyrocket as well. His aura started to turn golden as his hair started to do as well his eyes started to flicker from black to green. But unfortunately for him at the last moment before he could truly transform he failed. S cells have been unlocked in the back of his neck. Though I could see them come into being and increase over time. Raditz looked smugly at Vegeta. A low class warrior outdid the prince of the race. He felt really good right now. Nappa looked with concern at Vegeta. He cared about Vegeta as he had to take care of him since he was a child. Even though Vegeta would have discarded him if he became useless. He approached Vegeta and patted him on the shoulder and said, You brothers should train with each other from now. I will tutor the prince on learning how to become a super scion from now on. Goku and Raditz looked at each other and nodded. While Vegeta looked at Nappa with what seemed to be gratitude in his eyes. Did the prince's pride mellow out a bit? After failing to become a Super Scion, I decided to let them off to their own devices while I increased the gravity around me and started to continue my training. By the time the last two years were done and we were out of the chamber, everyone grew a big beard and we each had to take a shower and shave before everyone was comfortable around each other. My power level increased to 50 million in these last two years, the higher my power level increased the faster it grew. Goku reached 10 million after focusing on his base form after mastering the Ikari mode Super Saiyan combination. Vegeta attained the Super Saiyan form as well but he couldn't master it in time. He decided that he would keep it on all the time from now on, his power level reached almost 7 million too. Nappa and Raditz had enough time to master their Super Saiyan form as well. But unlike how Goku who got a 100 times boost after their mastery both got only up to 80 times I wasn't sure why, maybe it was innate. Their power levels reached 3 million and a half though so it was something, Kaiatsu reached almost 1 million, Rashi reached 1 million and a half and he was still going strong, I was happy for him, he seemed to enjoy getting stronger, it seems he was reminiscing about his younger years by training with us. Yamcha and Tien tied directly with each other at almost 2 million and some, both could use Kaioken times 20 and their stands in combination now, Rashi could also use Kaioken up to 20 times in his stand, but he couldn't combine it with the full power technique as well. Tien also couldn't use his race's innate technique to combine it with his stand and his Kaioken. But besides being unable to use my stand combined with everything else, I could say that this training in the hyperbolic time chamber this time around was a great success. I could use the maximum amount of Kaioken up to 50 times now combined with my other techniques. It seemed I reached a wall during mental training though, while my body made my key training have no bottlenecks it didn't do so for my soul. Magic training came along nicely as well in the last few months of training. I could say everything was done well this time around. Bulma immediately greeted us. And she couldn't even take her eyes any more of the now blonde and green-eyed Vegeta. For now, I could explain why trunks of this timeline could turn Super Saiyan so easily. We still had time before the androids came. But suddenly out of nowhere a time-space portal opened above the lookout. Out of it came an intricate machine with the Capsule Corp logo on the side. Out of it came two silhouettes. 
Wait too. The silhouettes were starting to grow clearer as they made their way out of the time machine. One was a blue-haired youth with a blue jacket with the CC logo on the side. He had a sword on his back and blue eyes. The other was a dark-haired man with dark eyes and an orange and blue GI with the turtle symbol on the front and back. It was Trunks and Gohan. It seemed Gohan didn't die in the future like he would in the original. Trunks looked around as he spotted us. Gohan nodded towards Trunks and both made their way down as the machine got transformed into its capsule form. My group looked at them warily. They could feel their immense powers while both weren't strong as Goku in his Akari mode their base power level was 8 million for Trunks and 12 million for Gohan. Trunks nodded towards me seemingly knowing that I knew who he was. I nodded towards him with a smile on my face. The others looked at me and Trunks wondering how I knew who the youth is. Trunks made his way towards us with Gohan in tow as he started talking. You might not believe me, but I'm from the future, my companion as well. We came here to deliver some things that can't be made in the current times to save Goku. Goku looked at Trunks with a questioning gaze. He wasn't sure what would happen to him. So he posed a question himself. What will happen to me in the future? Trunks took a vial from his jacket's chest pocket and handed it to Goku while saying, this is an antidote that will save you later, you will encounter a deadly heart virus that would kill you in the future. Even though Krillin will expand your life a bit with his magic, he still couldn't save you in the end. The Dragon Balls couldn't help either as they can't heal diseases from natural causes. They couldn't revive you either due to the same cause. Goku nodded his head, he wasn't sure where he would get the heart virus though. I wasn't sure either, and here he didn't train on Yard Rat, but he did drink the Ultra Divine Water. I wasn't sure if the theory of the fans of the water giving him the heart disease was true. It was never explained where he encountered the heart virus. Trunks and Gohan were ready to leave. It seemed nothing else required their help besides the antidote. Seems the androids and Cell wouldn't be a problem at all in three years from now. They both nodded towards me and everyone else before they took out their time machine again and left in it. I could see Gohan shed a few tears through the glass before he thoroughly disappeared in the time rift. It seemed he would miss Goku greatly in the future. I decided to let everyone go do their things. Vegeta was invited by Bulma to go to the Capsule Corporation for a feast. I decided that I would announce the arrival of those androids later to keep them on their toes. I also decided to teach Piccolo a stand so he could get a transformation of his as well. In the original Piccolo was the guy who never had a technique that increased his power level. I also decided to teach him the Kaioken Namex had a strong constitution which could make them able to abuse the Kaioken. Piccolo didn't refuse he saw how the others benefited from the technique, and he wanted to catch up with everyone as well, especially Goku. I left him to his own devices as well so he could do his thing. One month from now, I would announce them of the androids coming so they could train harder. I teleported inside my dojo and made a head count. It seemed the people who were attending increased. I decided to open dojos on everywhere on the planet now. It was time to expand to other countries. With the use of my astronomical fortune and my connections with the Briefs family, it was easy to buy plots of land in different countries and create dojos there. I would first teach them all personally the special mantra before training the more talented individuals and making them instructors. I also decided to let Jaika be an instructor in normal Australia. She would feel just like home. Well better than home, since people would listen to her and not avoid her here. She could also train herself a bit after I taught her some more advanced training techniques. I decided to also check upon Gohan, Chi Chi, Nam, and Hercule. They all got way stronger than before. Chi Chi reached the power level of 50,000 Gohan even reached the power level of 150,000. Chi Chi was astounded at the now almost nine years old boy's speed of growth. Of course, the power level was quite negligible if you would count the original Gohan, but the original Gohan fought Frieza and also gained some Zenkai during his expedition on Namek. The current Gohan was let to have a childhood. Nam and Hercule's power level increased to 3000 and 1000 respectively, pretty strong for humans. They could even beat some of Frieza's grunts with their martial arts and their power level. I decided it was time for Gohan to take training more seriously, so I took him as my direct disciple. Gohan stood before me on a fluffy pillow on his knees, as I imparted him a special mantra to help him train his key body and mind. 
Till now he trained with Chi Chi and he only knew the basic mantra taught in the dojo. Gohan started to mumble the mantra as his eyes shined. To achieve strength one needs to temper the body. Ki is elusive, but can be increased with meditation. Train every day to achieve success in martial arts. A great foundation built will lead to a great future. As he continued to chant the mantra his white aura started to grow into a sky blue. I also decided to teach him the Kamehameha. Maybe I should let him train with Piccolo as well? Gohan was a bright young man with a great future. His potential was huge only below Frisia's and Broly's. He could grow way faster now that he got a special mantra suited for him. I also decided to teach the more advanced students at the first dojo better mantras than the basic one. The better students were called Felix Kelberg, Maximilian Muse, and Quackity. Felix Kelberg was a blonde man of average height. He had blue eyes and wore a green and brown GI. Maximilian Muse was a buff man who wore sunglasses. His hair was a dark green and he wore a gray and black GI. Quackity was an anthropomorphic humanoid duck who wanted to learn martial arts. The president of our country was an anthropomorphic dog, so I wasn't surprised at his looks. I decided to teach Felix the way of the Viking, Maximilian the way of the Barbarian, and Quackity the way of the Space Duck. Each of the mantras had their special pros that would help their constitution and key grow at faster rates than normal. After I scanned them with my key sense, their power levels and physiques were laid bare to me. Felix had a power level of 70, Maximilian a power of 50, and the duck was surprisingly the strongest at 120. Their physiques weren't special or nothing like that, but everyone had a different physique which would be suited to a different type of technique. There were no two humans who had the same physique. Even twins would have different body types that needed to train in a different type of martial techniques. If the martial techniques could complement each other, it would be the best for twins though. After I left everyone with new techniques, I decided to let the three new best students become instructors in three different locations. Felix would go to England, Maximilian to Sweden, and Quackity would go to teach a special place. I recently discovered a place where tons of anthropomorphic animals like Quackity lived. They all had their community. They were very free and let everyone come and go through their city. There was a mix of humans and humanoid animals in the city. In human cities there were also humanoid animals, but they were more of a rare find. But this city had tons. I decided to let Quackity train everyone in there at the newly built dojo. The planet was getting stronger and stronger every day. All the previous damage did by human hands was pretty much gone. Global warming was no more and the North and South Pole were starting to freeze again. In a mountainous area in an unknown location we could observe an old man with gray hair and a mustache who wore a black vest with orange pants and a top hat with the Red R logo on it mutter to himself while he typed some data into a giant computer. Mmm. I couldn't get that Krillin's DNA, but I could get my hands on Son Goku's from when he was a child and some of his other companions. Unfortunately, now that they are all gathered together, I can't let my mini droids go near them without them. Being spotted. I guess I can only create a cell with what I have. He seemed disappointed as his creation wouldn't reach true perfection. He didn't even have Frisia's and King Cold cells. He came out of the laboratory where the computer was buried and entered a different one a few kilometers distance away. He started to continue his work on a husk of a being. It had a pale like a clown face and gray eyes. He also wore a similar outfit to the old men with a cap that had the same logo on it. The old man suddenly started to cough blood as he put his hand towards his mouth as he muttered, I think my body can't last much longer. I will have to do the operation now before I can continue the modifications on Android 20. At least 17 and 18 are done. 16 can't be completed in his current state. I just have to wait for 17 and 18 to mellow out during their reprogramming now. They were quite feisty when I caught them. The old man entered a different chamber of the laboratory and after a month came out looking the same, but he had no hat on, and you could see a glass container holding his brain. He put his hat back on and continued working on the pale android. Back on the lookout, I decided to announce every one of the androids upcoming. Vegeta scoffed at my words and said that no washing machine was a match for the prince of all science. Goku was pumped up for a fight while Nappa and Raditz didn't particularly care. 
The human Z fighters got heated up for training though. They knew they weren't strong enough to fight the androids. Unlike the Scions who got their Super Scion transformation, even though they got a stand in Kaioken it was still a tiny bit inferior compared to the mastered form of the Super Scion, as the technique still drained them, while the mastered form didn't drain the Scions at all. I decided to let the Scions taste some pain so I could encourage them to train better. I turned on four dots as my power increased by 16 times reaching the power level of 800 million. I immediately blitzed in front of Vegeta as my punch made his way inside his gut. He spat some liquids as he was knocked down. His arms started to tremble as he tried to get back up. I put a foot on the prince's torso and pushed him back down as I said in a loud voice. The androids would be at least as strong as this. Nappa. Raditz you still can't beat Vegeta yet, even though you mastered the Super Scion form. What about when he does it? Raditz and Nappa looked at each other. Seemingly knowing that I would beat the shit out of them too if they didn't comply with my words. Vegeta gritted his teeth at the humiliation as he suddenly buffed up, and his power level started to rival mine. It was grade 2 Super Scion. He pushed me back, got up and threw a right hook at me. While the power increase was substantial in this form, the speed decrease was as much. I was practically dancing around Vegeta as he tried to hit me. He seemed disgruntled as he started to shout and charge his key. He put his hands together as a yellow key started to charge in it. Goku eyebrows rose as he shouted. Vegeta, don't you might destroy the planet? Vegeta growled at Goku. Shut up, Kakarot, your friend here is strong enough to take it. As he charges his final flash, his power level skyrocketed higher and higher going beyond one billion. I just activated my fifth dot. When he shot his final flash at me, I directly absorbed it with my hands and redirected it towards a not populated galaxy. Vegeta gritted his teeth as his transformation ran out. His buffed out muscles turned back to normal and his green eyes and blonde hair got back to black. He was almost ready to master the Super Scion form. The others didn't train the Super Scion form anymore so they could strengthen their base power, but Vegeta still had to. Vegeta's power level was currently 10 million. While Goku's breached 15 million, Raditzi and Napaps reached 10 million, as well because of Vegeta's negligence of his base form. My power level also increased a bit from 50 million to 65 million. I could feel that my power would take a sharp increase in the months to come and before the androids could make their way here in two more years and nine months, I would reach beyond 100 million, maybe even 150 million. The androids and even Cell won't be a threat to me. I would let the others deal with them. Maybe I could do something that would turn Cell towards us as well. What if I restructured his genes after Jero's death instead of destroying him? We could have one more strong Z fighter to help us. Cell was programmed by Jero to kill Goku. That was his main mission, which he ignored due to his genes and his nature overpowering the mission. If I could reconstruct his genes with the help of Bulma, we could have a good cell, albeit weaker due to the lack of some cells. I could make him train instead of absorbing people. Cell never trained, and I could guess he had quite the high potential himself, being an amalgamation of highly talented people. After we subdued the androids, I would make sure to reconstruct the current cell and add him to the Z fighters. One more strong ally would never hurt anyone. I decided to have some fun with Jaika before I entered into another closed-door training. It would be quite a long time before I would get with her again, since I didn't realize how time was going by when I trained seriously. I woke up from my meditation under the high stress of gravity. If my internal clock was right it's been two years since I started training. There were just a few more months before the androids were supposed to arrive. My power level reached 125 million. As for the others, I could already feel their lower level from where I was. My key sense also became a lot stronger along with my key increase. Goku's power level reached 35 million, Vegeta reached 25 million, Nappa reached 27 million and Raditz 26 million, Tien and Yamcha were tied again with 10 million each, Rashi reached 11 million and Kaiwatsu reached almost 2 million, Jis and Berta reached 900,000 each almost nearing a million. Everyone took their training seriously and became way stronger than before. I guess Vegeta mastered his Super Scion form 2 by now. 
By my guesses, unlike Raditz and Nappas, he should be as strong as Goku's at 100 times multiplier. I could also feel the sacred key in me being purer than before reaching 2.5% of the whole key. I tried to use some of this pure key to enhance my attack with it, and the results were very good. I guessed I could even beat people double my strength or more using the pure Buddha key alone. As the purity of my key increased, the power of my Buddha stand increased as well as I started to understand more of the mantra's secrets. Right now my Buddha stand could increase my power level up to 17.5 times now. After I scanned everyone I decided to check up on the dojos personally. I could feel that the average power level of the planet increased up to 120, and the upper echelons of humanity reached 1000 in number. My students Felix, Maximilian, and Quackity reached 3000, 2900, and 4000 in that order. Quackity even started to speak more correctly even though he had a speech impediment. His feathers started to turn a deep black as well because of the properties of the space duck mantra. Gohan's power level reached 1 million and a bit, while Chikai's reached 200,000. Even Jika became stronger reaching a power level of 20,000 from her original 1,000. Nam also reached a power level of 10,000, and Hercule's power level reached 1,500. During the time Hercule taught at the dojo, he took Videl from time to time and she met with Gohan. At first Videl wanted to fight with Gohan trying to show how her father taught her martial arts and that she could beat anyone near her age. Gohan easily beat her, however, her power level was just a tiny bit away from a hundred. I was observing from my office when the whole interaction happened. Gohan just pushed her away with a bit of key, and she fell on her butt and started crying calling for her father. She was just almost 11 years old. Gohan immediately bowed and excused himself, while Chi Chi berated him on not going easy on her. I sweat dropped at Chi Chi's words. It was impossible to go any easier if Gohan even blew too hard at her in his full power even dust wouldn't remain. Chi Chi was still Chi Chi after all. She decided to invite Hercule his daughter and his wife to dinner so she could mend her relationship with the fellow instructor. Hercule didn't want to impose, but he agreed in the end. I nodded my head towards them as Jis and Birder were in my office wearing glasses and reporting to me everything that happened in the galaxy currently after two years of my ruling. Krillin-sama, the West, East and North Galaxy had been thoroughly cleaned of the remaining soldiers that were still loyal to the Cold family. The restitution plan has been done up to 20%, and it's still going strong. The Galactic Police also decided to take in custody as helpers some of the grunts from our organization after they did a bit of screening on their past. Jis said as he fixed his glasses, he was now sporting a black suit instead of the armor since he and Berter became my secretaries they had less and less time to train since they had to compile all the data they were given from the galaxy through my communicator. After everything was settled, I decided to leave the dojo and return to the lookout. There were only two more months left before the androids were supposed to come. But suddenly, out of nowhere, I could feel some chaos stir under the lookout to a nearby island. Fires were spreading rapidly as the destruction continued down below. I immediately mentally summoned all the Z-Fighters and made them come to the island. I couldn't sense the androids since they weren't living beings, no one possibly could normally. We decided to split up and search the normal way. Suddenly we heard some intense battle sounds coming from a nearby street. Yamcha had found them. He was using his werewolf stand and Kaioken times 20 combined to battle the old man Jero. He was fighting him equally, but suddenly Jero struck him and grabbed him with his hands starting to drain his key. I quickly appeared near Jero and struck him in the face with a key encased fist making him go through a few buildings before he stopped. The fat clown android's eyes started to shine as he scanned me and said in a high-pitched robotic voice, Name, Krillin Race, Human power? His face started to scrunch up as he tried to go after Jero and escape, but Goku came out of nowhere and drop kicked him in as he transformed into his Super Saiyan form his power level wasn't as high as it was supposed to be. I guess the heart virus was starting to kick in. I immediately grabbed everyone the androids included and teleported all of us towards an empty wasteland so we wouldn't get casualties. Fortunately, no one died even though a few people were injured. 
Due to the increase of the average power level people could now sense danger a bit and could escape if they weren't targeted directly, which they weren't the androids only wanted to sow chaos and drag us there. Jero and the mime android gasped as they knew they couldn't do anything to us. Jero immediately bellowed towards the mime android. 19. Activate protocol 348934 hashtag. Android 19's eyes started to shine red as he didn't talk anymore. Jero was ready to make a run for it, and I let him telling everyone to not kill him, just to follow him while I would let Vegeta deal with Android 19. Goku was already panting hard as he took some of the antidotes that Trunks gave him. Unfortunately, he blacked out afterwards and fell to the ground in heap. I caught him and took him back to his house, leaving Yamcha to take care of him. I also informed Chi Chi and Gohan that both of them could come home and look after Goku. Vegeta easily destroyed 19 now being even stronger than he was in the original series, Super Saiyan mastered and all. 19 couldn't even put up a little bit of resistance before he was overflowed with energy and exploded. He tried to absorb Vegeta's Big Bang attack, but his circuitry couldn't handle the massive influx of energy. As we followed Jero around him still unknowing as I masked everyone with my magic, he made his way towards his laboratory, put in a code and entered. He immediately got towards near two giant capsules which had the numbers 17 and 18 inscribed on them. Behind him was another capsule that was inscribed 16. But he ignored that one. He immediately put in some codes as he held a remote in his hand ready to use it at the littlest wrong move made by his two creations. Out of the capsules came a dark-haired young man who wore black shirt jeans and a cowboy orange scarf. He also had a pistol holster on his right leg. As he came out of the capsule, he said in a robotic voice, Unit 17 was activated. Please tell me your instructions, Dr. Jero. Jero blinked his eyes. Was the mental reshaping done correctly? But he could see a glint inside 17's eyes which indicated otherwise. And he said, Stop fooling around 17. I know you are faking it. 17 scoffed and scowled. Out of the other capsule a blonde woman who wore a jeans jacket and skirt and brown knee-high boots came out as she tried to do the same thing as her brother. But he stopped her and said, It won't work sis, the cat's out of the bag he knows. 18 pouted as she wanted to play with the doctor a bit, but oh well. I destroyed the door leading to the laboratory and all of them were exposed to me. I could say that 18's beauty was my type. It was something else seeing her in person. With the distraction provided by me blowing the door up, Seventeen immediately took the remote from Jero's hands and crushed it while he decapitated the old man. Out of his body came oil instead of blood. His hat fell off his head, and it showed his brain inside the glass container. He started to say, But I created you, you are what you are today because of me, you can't kill me. Unfortunately for him, Seventeen stepped on his head and crushed it making him die in the process as blood started to splatter on the tiles of the laboratory from his brain. Seventeen and eighteen started to analyze us with their eyes. And they narrowed their eyes, they realized we were so strong that they couldn't fight us directly. Seventeen immediately brought his hands up and said, It's okay folks we aren't really on the old doctor's side. He kidnapped us and made us come here, we bore no ill will towards you. Uh, actually, we will be on our way now after we awaken our last brother here. He pointed towards 16's capsule. I just let them do as they wanted to. 16's giant figure came out of the capsule and said, Must eliminate Son Goku. 17 and 18 both started to sweat at the giant's words, and they said in unison, A brother? What if we didn't? The giant man who wore a green armor with black in between, and had a red mohawk shook his head and said again, My mission is to kill Son Goku. It was time for my timely help now. I immediately interjected, I know someone who could reset his mission and let him have his free will just like you too. 18 and 17 both looked at me with narrowed eyes not knowing what I was going about, but I continued, From your words from before I realized that you were unwilling, and didn't want to become androids under Jero's hands, I can try to help you to become humans and reprogram the big guy from over there, so there won't be any problems between us. Vegeta sneered. He was still in his Super Scion form as he said, 
Why do we have to help these washing machines? Let's just destroy them like the fat one. I hit him over the head as five of my dots were activated. My power level was almost double his bar. A 500,000 difference. He took a mouthful of dirt as he remained down there a bit. His super scion form knocked out of him. I arrived in front of the androids as I said, Excuse my friend's words. He is a bit aggressive now since he killed that other android created by Jero. Both of them nodded their heads, but Sixteenth's eyes glowed red as he plucked one hand from his wrist and a gun barrel was revealed. I decided to not let the giant destroy anything by directly interfering with his circuitry by hitting him with a high dose of electricity-infused key. He short-circuited and he was knocked out. I took him on my shoulder and teleported everyone towards Capsule Corporation. There I met with Bulma and her father and I explained everything. Bulma nodded her head and said, I could eliminate this program from him and give him free will with my dad's help won't take much. Maybe a couple of days at most. I left them to do their thing and met with 17 and 18 who were waiting in the lobby. I told them the news then asked them something else. What's with those devices hidden inside your chests? They look pretty explosive. While I already knew of the bombs, I made sure they were still there by looking inside of them with my magic-enhanced key sense. Both of them looked flustered as they said, Well, um, Jero made sure that we would be obedient, so he put two high-caliber bombs in our chest that would destroy us if we disobeyed him. That remote which we destroyed was what could trigger the explosives. I nodded my head towards them and said, how would you like it to be removed? Both shook their heads and said in unison, If it's removed it will explode. I smiled at the siblings' antics and said, I have a method that will make it, so they won't explode even when removed. I gathered the dragon balls and summoned Shinran at the lookout, taking both of them with me there. While I couldn't surely sense their power level I could guess they were around 2 billion or so. Vegeta was already stronger than them by 500,000 and it seemed Jero gave them an energy scanner so they knew they were outmatched. In conclusion, the android saga ended quite well. Um, what could I say kind of unsavory. But it wasn't done yet though. After I first asked Shinran if he could transform them back into humans again to make a good impression on 18. But Shinran said that it was above his power and that I should hurry up my wish. Even though it was quite some time since I last summoned him, he was still quite the grumpy dragon. I decided to just make all the androids have their bombs removed which meant 16 included. Both 17 and 18 looked like a boulder was taken away from their heart. They both sighed in relief and looked towards me with gratitude in their eyes. I asked them afterward what they would like to do. 17 answered, Well I would like to become a park ranger and maybe even marry a girl and make a family. This was my original dream before Jero took me and made me in what I am today. 18 nodded her head as well. I don't have a big dream. If I could find a man who could support me, I would be happy enough. She winked towards me. Was it this easy to take 18 as my wife? Maybe I was in luck. Inside 18's mind. Goddamn. He is so tall and so strong and so bald. She was blushing inside herself even though I couldn't see anything. This 18 had something for bald people. I decided to ask them something else before I took them towards their destinations with my instant transmission. What are your names? 17 and 18 said, Lapis Lazuli. I nodded my head towards them and said, Lapis I will let you towards a nearby park and see if you can get a job there. As for you Lazuli, what would you think if you hmm came with me? Both nodded their heads. Lazuli even blushed a bit at my words. I teleported Lapis towards a nearby park and I took Lazuli with me at my house. Coincidence made that Jaika was there as well. Jaika was, of course, half naked as she waved at us. And she said, So this can be said to be my new sister? She asked with a cheeky smile on her face. Lazuli narrowed her eyes at me and said, Who's this? I nodded my head awkwardly at Jaika and responded to Lazuli, Uh, this is Jaika, my girlfriend. Lazuli eyes widened and looked towards me and Jaika and back and forth once again. You already have a girlfriend. 
You. She seemed a bit angry. It seemed even though she still liked me, it seemed she didn't like that I already had a girlfriend. As she looked around the house, she realized that I was loaded. She bit her lip but shook her head and said, I'm not sure if I'm okay with you already having a girlfriend. This is kind of awkward for me. Well, I didn't know what to say Jaika was okay with it, but Lazuli kind of wasn't. I wasn't sure what to do here, but Jaika immediately came towards Lazuli and put an arm on her shoulder and said, Krillin is a great and strong guy. Let's not even talk about how he does in bed. You would experience it in time. In my culture, people like him can have multiple wives who are all equal in rights. I don't mind if you would become his second girlfriend and later wife. Lazuli didn't surely know what to say. She was a bit befuddled at Jaika's words. She shifted her eyes left and right. And then she looked towards my bald head and nodded. It seemed she made a decision. Wait, did she decide by my baldness? She struck up her chest forward and said, Even though I'm not okay with this, I can make a compromise. Also no touching and no shabowinking till we know each other better at least. Well, this was a pretty good outcome, right? On King Kai's planet, something that was slumbering deep inside its core suddenly woke up. A giant green-skinned man with orange hair and a bandana who wore a blue outfit and had a scar that went from the right of his forehead over the middle towards his mouth was sealed inside the core. His eyes suddenly opened as he looked around the darkness and grinned while saying, It seemed the foolish Kai isn't here anymore and the seal weakened. I can finally go out and get back with my crew. Ha ha ha. Bojack was ready to make his comeback. King Kai's planet immediately started to shake as out of it came the silhouette of Bojack. He smirked to himself and looked around the planet. Seeing only that King Kai's little friends were present, he scoffed. It seemed he didn't care about them. He teleported out of the other world using a special technique of his, making his way towards the East Galaxy, where his supposed crew was last spotted. Back on Earth, I let Lazuli and Jaika go on a shopping spree with my credit card while Bulma finished with Android 16's programmation. The giant hulking man got up from the cold steel table and looked around. He looked less angry than before, and he had a peaceful expression on his face. He looked towards me and said, Thanks to you and Bulma briefs, I can fully enjoy life now. He bowed to us and left. I could see from the glass that a bird suddenly came to him and perched itself on his shoulder. He was a good guy inside if the mission of eliminating Goku was removed. Speaking of Goku, I teleported to his house and I could see he was feeling better. Chi Chi was using a wet towel to stop his fever and Gohan was attentively watching. Yamcha left after Chi Chi and Gohan made their way back. I think it was time for Gohan to become a super scion as well now. I approached him and said, Gohan, as you can see your father will not be here forever to protect the planet. I can't promise I will be forever around. I need you to come with me for something. It will make you stronger. Gohan nodded his head. He was a smart kid and understood he was very talented regarding martial arts. His mother was also praising him quite a lot. His power level was almost at 2 million already. I took him to the lookout and made him stay cross-legged. I inserted some key infused with magic inside his mind and made him watch an alternative future, where Majin Buu would destroy everything and everyone that he loved. After a while he started grunting. Some tears even were shed from his eyes and after he started shouting. And boy was his shouting loud. Mr. Popo was even annoyed as he looked at him. He was ready to slap Gohan off the lookout but I grabbed his hand and wagged my finger at him signaling that he couldn't do that. Popo's power level already reached 2 million, a power level almost as high as Gohan's. I was impressed by his growth, but his personality still needed some work. After a while of screaming and shouting Gohan got up from his cross-legged position as his power level started to skyrocket. His hair started to spike up and turn blonde. He couldn't hold the transformation for a long time though as it drained him quite heavily. Him not being a full scion as well and how emotionally hurt he was by the illusion could be attributed to that as well. I gave him a sense of bean, and he got up. He looked at me with a strange look in his eyes, he seemed that he didn't know what to tell me. He just immediately transformed into his super scion form as his power level reached 100 million. He took a fighting position and I smirked. 
it seemed this guy wanted to spar with me. I didn't need to use any of my techniques, my power level already reached 130 million. I was stronger than him in my base. I decided to spar with him so he could get used to his super scion transformation. He immediately started with a kick towards my shins as he tried to use my height against me. The little guy was a smart fighter, unfortunately. All of my experience and high power level wouldn't let him get a win out of this spar. I jumped up letting his kick hit nothing as gravity took a hold of me, and I was staying on his leg. I punched him straightly in the face with a quick jab letting him dazed. I grabbed him and threw him out of the lookout. Mr. Popo did an internal thumbs up at my work. Gohan immediately started to levitate using his key and charged a Kamehameha towards me. I smiled and charged my own letting them clash with each other in midair. Gohan immediately started shouting as his muscles buffed and his power level spiked. Oh, that was quite interesting. It took Vegeta quite a bit of training in the hyperbolic time chamber to learn to do that and Gohan could use it form his first try. I smirked as one dot started to shine on my forehead and I pushed the Kamehameha right back at him. It engulfed him but I made sure to lower its potency and not hurt him very hard. His clothing was singed and his face was black with soot from the explosion of the key. He looked quite comical. His blonde hair turned back to black and his eyes reverted from their green color to black. He knew he couldn't get anything out of the spar so he decided to stop. I decided that I wouldn't let him leave in such a condition. I used my materialization technique in combination with some magic to clean him and change his clothes into my own personalized GI. It was a yellow and green combination of the original monk GI from the Oran Temple. It had the character of Buddha on the front and back. It looked pretty good. I decided that everyone from my dojos will wear this from now on. The Oran Temple from my childhood was never forgotten, I secretly helped them with money, and now they were well off, they were basically like an orphanage who taught children martial arts if they wanted to know. And they were funded by me and Capsule Corporation. Bulma liked my idea and decided to chip in with some money as well. I teleported back to my house and I could see it was a mess. It was full of shopping bags everywhere, I could see Lazuli and Jaika try out some of their new clothes. Jaika was wearing skin-tight jeans and a green blouse and some blue brand sneakers. Lazuli was wearing a skin-tight blouse that accentuated her mounds. She wore leggings with a red skirt and knee-high boots. They changed from outfit to outfit, unknowing that I was observing them from the side. Suddenly I coughed and both of them gasped looking at me. It seemed women took their clothing very importantly. Lazuli immediately jumped towards me and took me in an embrace while saying, I knew you were loaded, but you were the richest man on earth. You do know how to make a girl happy, don't you? She had my credit card between her fingers as she said this. Jaika looked at us and smiled. I asked if she wanted anything else, and she responded, Nothing much. Having a lot of money is good. But all of these clothes are enough for me. Maybe I don't know, let's go out on a date? Jaika interjected as well. Yeah, let's go out on a date, we never went out. All the time you are either training or helping the others save the universe or whatever. Let's have some fun. I decided to comply with the lady's will. Fortunately dating wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. We first got to an amusement park, ate some cotton candy, etc. Tried some games just like normal humans would do. It was quite a refreshing change of pace instead of meditating under a gravity machine for years on end. It was pretty fun. After we had a copious dinner at a fancy restaurant we decided to go home. We all had quite a bit of alcohol during the dinner but as martial artists, we could flush it effects at will. Lazuli wouldn't even get influenced by it due to her cyborg enchantments. We got home and Jaika was already pretty inviting with all the words she was saying. Lazuli wasn't sure what to do though. It seemed she wasn't ready to go to the last step. Besides holding hands we didn't even kiss yet. It was all too fast for her. I just kidnapped her and made her my girlfriend. While she was pretty accepting of everything, she didn't know how much she could push herself during such a short period. And I couldn't blame her, it was all too sudden. I patted her on the shoulder and said, If you don't want to join us, you don't have to. She shook her head. She was still a teenager at heart. She looked in her twenties at most. I wasn't sure when Jero got her hands on her and made her who she was but I doubt she had many dates if any at all. 
She seemingly decided in that instant when I asked her. She looked towards me then towards Jaika and said, Please instruct me well. I smiled towards her words and invited her towards the bedroom. I got out of the bed and let the two take their needed sleep. I were back my clothes and decided it was time for me to reconstruct cell. I teleported towards Capsule Corporation and called Balma over. When she heard about how I found another of Dr. Jero's projects as a scientist who loved to explore the unknown, she immediately wanted to follow me. I took her to the hidden lab and entered through the secret trap door, which didn't take me long to find. She looked at the red cell inside the glass with wonder. She looked at the words inscribed on the paper beside it, and she gasped in surprise while saying, This thing has the cells of Goku, Yamcha, Piccolo, Tien, even your girlfriend's Jika? It also seems it has some incomplete cells from Vegeta Raditz and Nappa as well. I rose my eyebrows, he got his hands on the Scion cells as well. Well, there were some times when I let them train on the lookout and I wasn't with them, maybe that was when the little droids took some of their DNA samples, but in fear of not being discovered, they couldn't take a lot so that's why it said incomplete. I decided to tell Bulma about my plan now, on how we should reconstruct the being's mission and personality attributes so we could add it to our team. Bulma hummed and said, It can be done, but not here teleport this to Capsule Corporation. It will take me and my father a while, but it can work. I decided to do as she said and teleported the whole laboratory to the free backyard of the briefs. I could sense Vegeta's key in Bulma's room, and also another small key that was in the thousand seams trunks was already born. And he was already quite old considering his power level. Bulma didn't interact with us much these days, it seemed this was why. I left Cell in the trusty hands of Bulma and Dr. Briefs. Goku was already waking up from his coma from what I could feel, and his power level increased up to 40 million due to his near-death experience from the virus. His power level increase would be welcomed, since I could feel a huge power level coming towards Earth. A spaceship suddenly struck a nearby city as some silhouettes made their way outside of it. Bojack and some people that looked like they were the same race as he appeared. Bojack gave out some orders in a loud voice. This planet is strong and full of vitality Bujin, Kogu, Zongya Baido. Clear the inhabitants so we can sell this rock to the highest bidder. Goku teleported here immediately after he felt the hostile power levels come. Vegeta, Tien, Nappa, Rashi, Yamcha flew over as well. Gohan came in tow with Goku. I decided to observe. I always fought the big fights. It was time to let the Z fighters have their own now. They needed it for their growth. And Bojack and his lackey are where what the group needed. Even though I wasn't sure who they were, I could feel their strong power levels. Goku would have some trouble against Bojack, but he could beat him in the end, while the lackeys would be a good fight for the human Z fighters. Goku looked at Bojack with wary eyes, he could feel the space pirate's power, it was pretty goddamn high for billion and some. While his power level increased from the Zenkai he got from his heart virus, he wasn't sure if he could beat him without a hard fight, but he also got excited at the prospect of a hard fight, just so Scion like the planet was in peril and he was excited. But well he knew that I could beat Bojack whenever I wanted so it wasn't a big thing for him. Vegeta looked at Bojack with the same eyes as Goku, Raditz and Nappa as well. It seemed all the Scion were itching for a fight. The human Z fighters were ready to intercept the others at a moment notice if they made the wrong move. They couldn't let them hurt the innocent humans on the planet so they could sell the planet. It seemed Bojack didn't get the news that planet trading was specifically banned nowadays. It seemed he just got his crew and searched for a nearby planet with high vitality to do his debut. So space pirate-like, and by that I mean dumb. Goku's eyes immediately started to turn feral, and his power level increased by ten times his hair started to spike and turn blonde a yellow aura started to encase him. He nodded towards the human Z fighters and his other fellow scions, indicating that he was going to take Bojack first. Vegeta grumbled and said, Kakarot! How come you were going first? Goku then said, How do you want to get this done, Vegeta? It's not enough time for a spar. What about rock, paper, scissors? The human Z fighter's sweat dropped at the two science antics. The planet was in peril. 
and they were going to fight for whoever was going first for a fight. They did a round of rock, paper, scissors, and Vegeta won. He put on a triumphant smirk towards Goku and transformed immediately into a Super Scion and launched himself towards Bojack. Bojack smirked at the prince and attacked at the same time. They met in the middle, their punches showering the planet with shockwaves. I of course cancelled the shockwaves so no civilians would be hurt. The people with higher power levels, my students could feel the power exhibited at this fight, and they were pretty startled by it. I comforted them telepathically, telling them that it would be an easy fight that won't take more than a few hours. My key sense could feel the whole planet so I knew how my students felt. As Vegeta was duking it out with Bojack, the human Z fighters were easily dispatching his cronies. Yamcha fought Baido, Tien was fighting Kogu and Gohan was fighting Zangya. Finally, Piccolo was against Bujin. The cronies' fights weren't anything. They were extremely weak compared to the collective power of the Z fighters. They couldn't put much of a fight at all and got exterminated. The main course was Bojack. Vegeta and Bojack fought back and forth. While Bojack was frowning as he saw his cronies get obliterated by the Z fighters, he didn't particularly care about their well-being. But it would be more annoying to sell the planet and exterminate its inhabitants by himself. Vegeta taking advantage of him being distracted sucker punched him in the face, and he was thrown around like a pinball. A red imprint of a fist appeared on Bojack's face as he got up from the rubble created by the impact of his back with a nearby building. Vegeta smirked at his win and started to charge a big bang attack. Bojack smirked as well as he unfurled his cloak and started to power up. His skin started to turn light green and his hair a deep red. His muscles increased as his power level increased without end. Vegeta's smirk suddenly disappeared as he let loose of his big bang attack. Bojack easily deflected it into the sky where it exploded. Vegeta knew he was no match for him anymore. But before he could let Goku take the fight, Bojack immediately appeared in front of him and kicked him in the balls. A sound like a strangled duck came out of Vegeta's mouth as he was thrown into some buildings, destroying them in the process. His Super Saiyan form was off as he got up from the ground debris falling off him as he said in a high-pitched voice, Why did he kick me in the balls? Why? I choose not to comment at Bojack's targeted area. Goku's aura immediately flared as his power level skyrocketed up to 300 plus times of his power. Bojack was equal with him now in his buff mode. Goku got into the turtle style stance and threw himself at Bojack at immense speeds. Bojack didn't know martial arts, he was simply a strong pirate. Goku fainted Bojack using the afterimage technique and appeared behind him, driving his knee in his back and punched him in the back of the head afterward with a key infused fist. Dazed by the attack, Bojack couldn't stop Goku in time as a fully charged Kamehameha wave hit him from behind. Bojack was singed and bruised. He was extremely annoyed at Goku's tactics. But he smirked. He suddenly disappeared and appeared in front of Gohan. He took Gohan by the neck and was ready to snap it. Unfortunately for him, I appeared in front of him all six dots in their splendor. My base power level was already above 200 million by now combined with my full power technique as well I could defeat him easily. I hit him in an acupoint in his hand making him let go off Gohan. I healed Gohan up and took him a bit away from Bojack. Bojack's face was unsightly as he couldn't feel his hand anymore. Goku immediately said, Krillin heal his hand back up. I want to fight him without any interruptions, and thanks for saving Gohan. His face was pretty scary right now after Gohan was almost killed by Bojack, I could already feel Goku's power level bubbling up. He wasn't going Super Saiyan 2, but he got an anger boost. I decided to let go of the key I inserted in Bojack's acupoint so he could use his hand again. Bojack started to move his hand, when suddenly Goku immediately appeared above him and kicked him in the head. Well, his hand was okay now, so he was basically at full power. He grabbed Bojack by the arm and spun him around through him in some buildings and used instant transmission to appear right behind him before he could go through more. His fist reared with yellow key. He directly punched a whole trough Bojack's chest. Bojack spouted out a mouthful of blood as he grinned and tried to ram his arm trough Goku's chest as well. 
Fortunately, Goku kept his guard up and caught his hand just right before he could penetrate his chest. He started to overpower Bojack, and he forcefully moved his arm in such a way it broke it. Goku looked at Bojack and said, You are pretty strong, but you came to Earth with evil intentions, unfortunately. That means it's the end for you here. Goku always liked to fight with stronger and stronger people, some of the time he even tried to get them to the good side, just like he converted both Vegeta and Piccolo, but for some, there was no way. Goku let go of a huge amount of ki from his hand and evaporated Bojack, transforming him into nothing but dust. He sighed as his hair and eyes reverted. He smirked towards us as I threw him a senzu bean, which he took and ate with a smile on his face. It seemed another crisis was averted for Earth. At Brief's house inside the laboratory that Cell was conceived in, the tiny cell that was in the laboratory's glass started to grow and grow. Bulma and Dr. Briefs looked on with fascination as a bug-like thing started to form. It grew from a larval state towards a more humanoid state, then fully formed as a humanoid with red skin, a strange orange face mask and elongated ears. He didn't look like the original cell at all. He broke through the glass and looked around. I already teleported over the moment I felt him. He bowed towards me and said, Master! Balma started to explain how she ingrained the memories that I was his master, and gave him a bit of free will, erased the other missions which would put innocent people in jeopardy. He didn't wear anything, but he wasn't naked, he had a red keratin armor over his skin. It also seemed he had no private parts, of course. Like the normal cell he wasn't truly male nor female. I decided to give him the same name. From now on your name will be Cell. Bulma scoffed and said, You called him Cell because he was made from the cells of others? How unoriginal of you. Well, I felt quite lazy right now, I didn't want to think of a new name for him, Cell was good enough. Even though he wasn't the same Cell, his base was the same. I could spot no tail on him, it seems Bulma removed his absorption capability. I could feel his power level being a little below 600,000. He was pretty goddamn strong considering he was just born. He also had some basic martial arts memories from the DNA. He knew a few of our techniques as well, but since the DNA was from some older times he had no stand, no Kaioken or other techniques. I decided to teach him the way to make his stand and the Kaioken and let him train on his own. I also gave him my special GI since I was practically his master. I decided to check up on my other disciples before meeting up with Lazuli and Jaika. Quackity's power level was increasing along nicely the same could be said about Felix and Maximilian. Quackity's appearance started to look more humanoid but at the same time more duck as well. He actually started to resemble Daffy Duck from Looney Tunes. Actually this gave me an idea. I asked him to come to my office in the Animal Human Dojo and told him, I have some more special work for you to do. Also, what do you think about the name Duck Dodgers? Quackity said with a no-nonsense face. Well, I don't mind some other work. Teaching these brats around here is quite boring. About the name I find it quite to my liking. It sounds pretty nice, why do you ask? I nodded my head towards him and said, From now on your name will be Duck Dodgers. I prepared a ship for you which you will use to spread my doctrine through the universe. With the brief's family help, I created some droids which can help you create dojos on every livable planet in the universe. Duck Dodgers gasped, not knowing what to say, this was a pretty important mission. But he saluted me with his arm, he now had arms and fingers everything, he was a fully humanoid duck. He said with a serious voice, I'll do my best, Master Krillin. His spaceship was just like in the show, a big blue and white spaceship. It was fully packed with robots and construction materials and books with my mantras and basic techniques. I also got him a cadet, it was a humanoid pig, he wore a purple suit and Dodgers wore a blue suit. They were special space suits made with my materialization technique, the resemblance was uncanny. Both of them saluted me and took off with the ship. With their efforts I would have dojos everywhere in the universe one day. I teleported towards my house and I could see that Lazuli was eating pickles. This was quite strange. She never told me she liked pickles. Jaika was looking at her strangely, seemingly knowing something that I didn't. Immediately, Lazuli ran over to the bathroom and vomited. 
It seemed something was wrong with the pickles. Then something hit me. Strange cravings. Sickness. Could she be pregnant? But I always made sure to not come inside them. But that first time, maybe I forgot? After she finished vomiting, she walked towards me and smiled. I wasn't sure what to say, and directly asked her, Are you pregnant? She nodded towards me, her smile was getting even bigger. It seemed she wanted a child. Yeah. Krillin isn't this great? I nodded my head, well what's done is done. Even though I didn't feel like having a child yet, there wasn't anything wrong with it, sometimes you had fun, and sometimes you ended up with a child. Since I was going to have a child, it was only proper we would be married as well. It wasn't hard to set a marriage date with my money, everything would be done extremely quickly. A few days later we were married. All of my friends were there. Rashi was ogling the maids that were serving food. Chi Chi was smiling towards me and Goku was waving his hand. Bulma looked around and nodded towards me. The others were happy for me as well. I wore a black groom suit and 18 was wearing her bride dress. The ceremony didn't take long, and we were officially married, but things weren't done yet. Jika appeared as well, similarly in another bride's dress. I was getting married to two women today. The scions were scarfing down the food like there was no tomorrow at the table. I was making a toast which everyone reciprocated. The wedding was a full success. Eight months later, Marin was born. She looked just like in the anime. I wasn't sure what power level Marin had in the show, but her power level when she was born was already at 40,000. After she was fed by Lazuli, I took her in my arms as she started to laugh at me. I put a finger up, and she grabbed it with her tiny hands. Jika got up and immediately said, I want a child as well. I already had a headache, whatever, one more child wasn't going to kill me. Marin was pretty cute as for taking care of her while she grew up. I would hire someone to take care of her and help Lazuli. I would play with her from time to time. I still had to train for Mage and Bue. I was stronger than a normal Super Saiyan 2 by now. But even a Super Saiyan 3 couldn't do jack against Fat Bue. Before I got back to training, I had some fun with Lazuli and Jika. I made sure to not stop my sperm entering Jika now. But to stop with Lazuli, two children were enough for me. It was time to train some more, there were quite a few years before Mage and Bu came. From now it would be nine years, Trunks was already three years old, and he would enroll in the Budokai Tenkaichi at thirteen years old, Goten should also be born by now. I decided to continue training in meditation under increased amounts of gravity. I let out my gold aura as I started to levitate. From now on I would train daily and sometimes come out to hang out with Marin, Lazuli and Jika, and to not forget to be present to my other child's birth as well. I closed my eyes as I set an alarm to make sure I would wake up out of meditation. I could meditate for years on end if I got entangled in it. It has been two years since the Bojack event, my power level skyrocketed to the amount of 300 million. Everyone else got stronger as well, Marin was growing along nicely. Jika also gave birth to a baby boy with pinkish skin and white hair. Like me had no visible nose, I decided to name him Ryu. Contrary to my thoughts from the past, it was quite fun being a father. Lazuli and Jika also enjoyed the company of the children. Marin also liked to play around with her little brother. Marin was now almost three years old and Ryu was one year and a half. The others also trained, but their power level didn't increase as much mine. Goku barely reached 90 million. Vegeta reached 65 million and the other Scions reached a bit below 50 million. The humans reached above 10 million in power and they could combine their stands with their Kaioken. Tien even made some progress on the combination of his racial technique with his Kaioken and stand. As for me, I could use all the techniques combined bar the benevolent Buddha stand. I feel like all the techniques could be combined into one when all the key in my body transformed in sacred key. Right then there would be a qualitative change in the key. My power level was already extremely high now if I used all the techniques. I think I could even give Super Bu a run for his money now. Also my sacred key was 10% of my whole key now. My Buddha stance power level multiplier also increased to 25 times normal. I feel when my key increased to 100%, my Buddha stand power level multiplier would increase to 250 times. As I was playing around with Ryu and Marin in my house while Jika and Lazuli were out shopping, I could feel Goku's key approaching. He was with Gohan and another small key. 
It seems Goten was already as old as Ryu by now, if not six months older. I opened the door before Goku could knock, and he had his usual goofy smile on his face. I smiled towards him and nodded, Gohan was 13 or so now. His power level also reached 11 million by now. In Goku's arms was a little guy that was the spitting image of him as a young child. They were twins. I looked at him and said, Ho ho, Goku already on your second child? Goku smiled sheepishly and handed Goten to his big brother and said, Yeah, I wondered if our children could play together while we sparred. I could feel Vegeta's key coming along as well, Trunks in tow, Trunks should be one year older than Marin by now. Vegeta came landed and scoffed at us, he was wearing his suit from the Buu Saga, it seems he gave up on the Scion armor for now. In his arms was Trunks, he was a bundle of energy as he shouted, Dad, here's where I will play with the other kids? Vegeta nodded and let him go, Goten also seemed like he wanted to go as well even though he couldn't talk. Yet there was a glint in his eyes that suggested so. Gohan let him and go and the four of them started to play in the house. I let the trained babysitter watch over them. It was a woman who frequented my dojo so she could handle the little bundles of energy. A bit. Not by much, I instructed her if anything out of hand happened she could call me. I nodded towards them and asked, How are the others? Vegeta scoffed and said, it seems Nappa was talented in what you Earthlings call being a movie producer, and he got a job in Hollywood. Goku continued after Vegeta. Raditz doesn't do much these days after he comes from the dojo, he just trains, eats, and goes back to sleep. Sometimes he goes out in the city, but I'm not sure why he is being secretive about it. Hmm, Nappa having a flair for the entertainment industries, and Raditz maybe finding love, Things happened in years while you were occupied. I asked Vegeta why he was here and he responded, I felt Kakarot come here with his sons and I knew he wanted to spar with you. I, of course, came to spar with you as well. Then he grumbled something under his breath. And that goddamn woman made me take care of Trunks as well. It seemed he wanted to put the responsibility of taking care of Trunks on someone else and fight. Well, that sounds about right. I created a stage with my materialization in my huge backyard and invited them over. Since Goku and Gohan came first, they would be the first who will get to fight. Goku stepped on the stage and entered the turtle school stance. I did the same and we both bowed towards each other. Goku immediately used the Kaioken to match my power level. I smirked as we lunged at each other. Goku immediately used the instant transmission to appear behind me and tried to kick me in the back. But I did the same thing and I used my key enhanced fist to try to hit him in the chest. He dodged using a higher burst of the Kaioken and used the after image technique to appear above me. He tried to punch me in the head, but I grabbed his fist and threw him some feet away. He almost lost his balance and I kicked him in the chin, making him fall. A key sword was put towards his neck indicating his loss. He smirked towards me as his eyes suddenly turned feral and his hair golden. He destroyed my key sword and tried to punch me in the head. I activated my six dots and the full power technique and offset his punch with my palm. Lightning started to appear around me as a ball of key was created in my palm which I rammed in his abdomen. Goku's air was taken out of him as he gasped before he could recover I kicked him in the head and his transformation receded. This was my win like always. I healed Goku and he got off the stage, it was time for Gohan now. Gohan got on the stage and directly used his Super Saiyan transformation. In the time from when he learned up till now he mastered it, I could see it by the light shading his hair had and the way he handled himself while transformed. I smirked, Gohan was way more talented than Goku but had a pacifist nature unlike the Saiyans. This held him back in fulfilling his true potential. It was sad but during the most intense moments, he would burst with potential which saved the day back in the original. I couldn't force Gohan to train if he didn't want to. It seemed he took more of a shining to martial arts now though. We both bowed as I reverted some of my techniques so I couldn't overpower him too much. He started by with a sweep kick trying to take me off my feet and offset my balance before he tried to hit me with some key blasts. Every fighter had his style, Gohan's leaned more on using the opponent's power against him. 
but if he was stronger than the opponent he would just bash them like any other scion. It was a combination of his human intellect and his scion instinct. I was impressed by his style. I decided to reflect some key blasts at him and hit him with some of my own. I was still way stronger than him even though I used fewer techniques. All he could do was dodge and not take anything head on or he would lose. I smirked even though he was smart he still had to sharpen his key sense. I didn't try to hit him with all the key blasts. As he looked around he realized he was surrounded by key balls. He gasped as I put my hands together and said, Hell Zone Grenade. Someplace in a wasteland on Earth Piccolo got up from his mediation as he cursed. Someone stole my technique. The key blasts hit Gohan head on. He got out of the cloud that appeared due to all the key blasts hitting him clutching his arm and panting hard. This was one of my wins as well. I healed him as well as he got down from the stage. Now it was time for the last fight for today, me versus Vegeta. Vegeta immediately shouted as his hair turned golden and his eyes green. But he didn't stop he continued to shout as his hair turned even spikier and electricity started to surround him. It seemed due to unknown reasons Vegeta was the first to achieve Super Saiyan 2. His power level skyrocketed beyond 13 billion. He still wasn't as strong as Goku concerning multipliers, but he did achieve a higher form than Goku. We could say he got a win this time. I didn't need to use any other technique besides all of my six dots to fight him. So I just fought with him as I fought with Gohan albeit with Gohan I used fewer dots. Vegeta just instantly threw himself at me after he finished transforming. I took him head on he was still way weaker than me. We both fought back and forth as shockwaves appeared around us. He tried to grab me and blast me with his palm. But I pushed them aside and kicked him in the knee before punching him in the face. I charged up a spirit sword on my fingers and I tried to cut him a bit to scare him. He started to dodge frantically as the surrounding lightning intensified so did his aura. I stopped using the spirit sword and appeared behind him and said, Nothing personal Vegeta. And I kicked him in the back with all of my strength making him plummet down on the stage and almost destroying it. Spider cracks appeared on its foundation and tons of dust rose in the air. Vegeta was down there his transformation knocked out of him as he was panting for breath. I made sure to control my strength so I wouldn't knock him out unconscious. I offered myself to heal him, but he declined, he was still a bit prideful after all. Somehow the children didn't destroy the house completely when we entered to get a snack. It was a mess, yes, but nothing the maids couldn't fix in a few tens of minutes. I clapped my hands and tons of robot maids made their way inside cleaning up the mess at fast speeds. Some of the maids were finishing up the cooking as we made our way to the table. The children had their table where they were eating as well. We started to eat and the scions and half scion started to eat like it was no tomorrow. I ate at a moderate pace and before long all the food was finished. Lazuli and Jaika were coming home as well. They both greeted the scions with smiles on their faces and asked how their wives were doing. Goku responded normally saying that Chi Chi was still working at the dojo while he continued to do his farming which he now took seriously. She couldn't be the only one who brought money home. Vegeta just said Bulma was working on some new gadget of hers. And that's all he told us. After all the food was eaten Vegeta Goku and Gohan decided to leave. Goku took Goten in his arms and Vegeta took trunks as they waved goodbye towards Marin and Ryu. I followed them out and bid them goodbye. It was time to do my monthly visit to Master Rashi as well. So I just teleported there. Like always the master was watching his show when I appeared on the island. I shouted to him so I could get his attention. Master I came to visit. He immediately coughed and turned off his TV. He came out in his signature outfit of a palm tree orange shirt and white shorts. He still had his turtle shell on his back and the same cane he always used. I smiled towards him. I never forgot to visit Rashi as he was like a grandfather figure to me. Goku also visited from time to time. Rashi smiled to me and said, Goku visited yesterday I wondered when you will turn up. I thought you forgot about little old me. I laughed and embraced him. Rashi reciprocated the embrace and asked, How's little Marin and Ryu? I responded with a smile on my face. They are growing up along nicely. Even though they do quite a mess from time to time, 
They are children, so I let them be. Rashi looked at me with a reminiscent gaze and said, It feels like yesterday you just started your training with the weighted turtle shell, and now you are one of the strongest in the universe. Oh, how time goes by. He continued afterward with a perverted smile on his face. So, do you know anything about launch? I coughed and sweat dropped. This old man's hobbies never changed. She's with Tian now, old man, you should take your mind off her. Rashi deflated at my response and afterwards said, Can't you find me a young woman from your disciples? Come on, do a favor for your old master. Well, I couldn't tell him no he looked at me with those pitiful eyes, so I said, If you can find one woman who decides to follow you willingly from my dojo, you can bring her home if she agrees. Rashi immediately flew at sonic speeds directly to the most nearby dojo. I sweat dropped and let him be, hopefully he won't scare too many of my disciples. Oh, who am I kidding? I directly teleported to the dojo he chose and decided to investigate everything from my office. Rashi did try to court many young ladies, but most of them didn't even try to speak with him. He looked downcast as no one tried to interact with him. A light bulb suddenly appeared over his head as he motioned to me to come out of the office, and he said in a loud voice, Disciple Krillin, master from the Turtle School, came for a visit. I sweat dropped again. It seemed this old man was bent on his shameless ways. I decided to continue entertaining him as I made my way out of the office and said, Oh, master, you came to visit? Rashi puffed up his chest as he used his full power technique and started flexing trying to get some attention from the ladies. Yes, I wanted to see how my brightest disciple is doing, and I can say you are doing pretty well for yourself right now. Some of the women's eyes started to shine as they realized our relationship. They immediately swarmed to Rashi and started to talk with him. They knew I was married, so I was off limits for them, but Rashi was my master and single. I nodded my head. This should leave the old master with his hands full for a while, and happy at the same time too. I decided to check up on Cell as well, and I was extremely surprised by his progress. His power level skyrocketed to 30 million already, and he could use the Kaioken to his maximum capability of 20 times. His stand was getting along nicely, it was quite strange. The image behind him changed from time to time to the original base form cell to the imperfect cell and sometimes to perfect cell, till it stabilized to the base form cell under my supervision. If I guessed correctly, his stand could evolve just like mine. Right now his stand gave him an increase of five times, but as it increased I wasn't sure where it would stop. After I gave him some instructions and patted him on the shoulder, I left him to his own devices. I checked upon Duck Dodgers as well, and he already created some dojos in the North Galaxy. At the rate they were going in a few tens of years, the whole North Galaxy would have my dojos, but it was too slow. I decided to send Felix and Maximilian in space as well. I gave them a similar ship to both and sent them. They didn't reject, as they wanted to have space adventures as well, while they spread my doctrine and grew stronger by fighting different martial arts as well. I needed more disciples to be instructors on Earth though, but Earth was full of talents nowadays and I could find someone quickly. This young man was going by the nickname of Rhyme Style and his power level was quite high, almost 10,000. He was of average height and he had quite the average build as well, but he was proficient in the use of key. I took him as my disciple and taught him the whale mantra since it was the best suited for his physique. I also found some others which could be used as instructors and I also gave some of them the right to appoint new instructors as well. Nam, Hercule, and Chi Chi already had those rights. Zack and Cody were a pair of twins which could use special attacks in tandem. Zack was quite a bit reckless while Cody was the brains. All of them could make up for the others who left. I decided to continue my training and wait for Majin Buu's arrival. If nothing untoward happened, I would remain on Earth till Majin Buu and Babidi made his appearance. Hopefully, nothing could happen now. Three years had passed since the last events. Marin was almost six years old and Ryu was four years old and a half. I started to teach them martial arts, and they immediately took a liking to it. Marin was growing at fast speeds. Her power level was already above 100,000 and Ryu, even though he didn't train as hard, had a power level of 50,000. 
When they trained outside me Jaika and Lazuli had our fun in the house, my power level already increased up to 650 million. No threat in the universe was yet active which I could train and pit myself against now. Goku's power level reached 150 million, and he learned how to become a Super Saiyan 2 as well combined with his Akari mode things were going very well for him in the power category. Vegeta was on his way to master Super Saiyan 2. Raditz did his things while Nappa called me and asked, You, if it isn't my favorite bald guy Krillin, I have a job that would require someone of your talents. Someone of my talents? In the film industry. It was something new so I could give it a try. I always wondered how it would feel to be a movie star. I asked him of the details and he responded, We need a bald guy to play the main character in this movie about racing and family. We decided to call it Furious and Fast. Won't it be cool? Ha ha ha. I responded with an even tone of voice. Sure. Count me in. It would be a new experience to star in a movie. So for a few months I became an actor who did his stunts, it was pretty fun, the lines were a bit cheesy and the racing scenes pretty good if you liked this type of stuff, I wasn't a big fan of it though. After all the scenes have been filmed they wanted to pay me, but I declined I was the second richest man on earth just a little behind the briefs family. Their money was no help to me. I told them they could donate it to help others who were in more need of them. I left the studio with Napa as we ate at a nearby food stand he nodded his head at me. He was now sporting a white suit and black sunglasses. He looked professional. After we finished our food, we both bid goodbye to each other. The movie would be sold in the theaters and cinemas in a few more months after all the effects and editing would be done. I decided to go home and play with my children before going back to train, when suddenly I could feel immense key coming out of the ocean. I quickly teleported towards the key, and I could see a giant yellow sponge with two gap teeth coming out of the ocean. He was shouting, I'm ready, I'm ready. Mr. Krabs, I will make all of these humans into Krabby Patties. On his shoulder was a red crustacean humanoid with big elongated eyes who was laughing. Igagaga, Spongebob me boyo, with all of this fresh meat we could sell Krabby Patties at a 300 increased price. Let's not even forget the extra vitamins from these strong humans. A blue squid humanoid scoffed and leaped off the other shoulder of the sponge creature and said in an annoyed tone of voice, I'm not paid enough for this. I couldn't let the evil sponge-like creature and his crazed crustacean boss transform the humans of Earth into patties. I charged a giant shuriken Kienzen and infused it with the wind attribute with my magic and threw it at him. The sponge immediately got cut into pieces, but he regenerated himself in an instant. What a tenacious life form. I needed to destroy him completely to make him disappear, just like the original Cell and Majin Bu. I grimaced. As the sponge was taking his steps the ground was shaking. He was immensely strong. I immediately turned my dots on and used all of my available techniques to boost myself above the giant sponge's power. The crustacean immediately shouted. We will start our first fresh crabby patty with this baldy over there. Out of nowhere the sponge took out a giant spatula and waved it towards me. I dodged it by going through its grids and hit him directly in the eyes making him lose balance and fall back in the ocean. I grabbed the humanoid crustacean and fried him thoroughly. Transforming him into a five-star meal then I threw him back in the ocean. Letting him get eaten by his people. Tons of humanoid fish started to gnaw away at the carcass of a crustacean, as a loud voice shouted in a pain tone. Mr. Krabs knew. The giant sponge's height immediately reduced by a lot, but his power level increased by so much I had to use my Kaioken immediately to the max level to keep up with him. Shockwaves started to appear as we fought on back and forth. He was a tenacious fighter with an iron will. I could feel his grief at his boss death. So I decided to give him a fast death. But out of a nowhere a pink starfish humanoid appeared and tried to tackle me away. I dodged, and he knocked into the sponge instead. The sponge immediately said in an annoyed tone of voice, Patrick, he killed Mr. Krabs, what are you doing? The star Patrick said in a dumb type of voice, I'm sorry Spongebob, he is too fast. I wanted to tackle him and eat him. The sponge and the star were equal in power. But the star was stronger physically while also being slower and dumber. 
They both started to whisper to each other which I could hear when I used my magic to eavesdrop on their conversation. Patrick, I will capture him, and you spear your sharp head directly through his body. Patrick just saluted wrongly and nodded his head while his tongue was out of his mouth. SpongeBob's aura immediately started to change as a red hue appeared around it. He was sacrificing strength for speed. He immediately appeared behind me and took me into a Nelson lock. Unfortunately for him, I already knew he would do this. I disappeared from the lock just in time as Patrick spearheaded SpongeBob. They were both stuck into each other now. It was time to end this. I charged my key into my hands as a giant electrified Kamehameha was shot towards them, evaporating both of them till not even dust was left behind. I looked into the ocean and I could see the squid humanoid observing from below. He looked happy at the things that happened and bowed towards me while saying, Our race will never fight again with you land dwellers. You have helped us take care of this cancers that existed in our society. After that, he disappeared underwater, maybe going to his house to drink some tea and play his clarinet. I could hear some of his thoughts seeping trough so I realized what he wanted to do. While the squid's power wasn't any lower than the others, his mental barriers were very lax. I could hear his thoughts, even if I didn't pry into his mind. After this event, I just got home and helped my children to train a bit before having some more fun with my wives. Life was good for me. It felt so good to just be lazing around and having fun, teaching my children, and just not be bothered by other things. Training every day was boring. Enjoying the other things about life was a good change of pace, which I would always welcome. But I didn't continuously indulge in these activities. I still wasn't strong enough to even touch Beerus' little toe yet. I needed to train myself until I could protect everything that I cared about on this planet. I could truly feel that I was a part of this universe now. As I started to ponder these wonders, my sacred key purifying speed increased during the meditation session that I just started inside my gravity chamber. It seemed that accepting myself of being in this universe now would help me understand the mantra better. I still thought if this was just a dream from time to time. My sacred key increased towards 20% and my benevolent Buddha stand could now increase my power level up to 50 times. I nodded my head this meditation session wasn't long but it gave me great results. My power level also increased to 700 million. Six months passed by. It's been five years and a half since Bojack and his cronies got destroyed. A telepathic message came from King Kai as he said awkwardly, You! Hey Krillin! I need your help with something. Some other demon popped up in hell now, and it needs your expertise. I wasn't sure why was he so panicked. I defeated the other demon easily. How could this other one be any stronger? King Kai continued. The thing is, this demon took control of an innocent soul and used it as the vessel for its revival. You can't kill him. You need to expunge him out of the vessel. My spirit bomb would do its job nicely here. Inwardly, King Kai was relieved as I didn't realize Bojack's attack was due to his negligence of the seal on his planet. I decided to help King Kai again, there wasn't anything interesting happening on Earth anyway. Everything was stale, the other Z fighters' training speed slowed as well. Without any threats to increase their motivation and training speed, they stopped growing as fast as before. But they were still pretty strong, human Z fighters broke through the 50 million mark while Goku reached 250 million in his base. Vegeta reached 190 million while Nappa and Raditz took training slower and barely reached 120 million. I made my way into hell and there I saw the new demon in all its splendor. It was just like the last demon red and with horns. Their appearance was eerily similar but also different at the same time. It seemed like they were of the same species. He was brandishing a scythe with his right hand as he was harvesting the life of wardens like wheat. I threw myself at him stopping him from killing any more wardens. I created my scythe of key and started to fight him. Scythe against scythe we clashed and he started to overpower me. He smirked as he drew the scythe back and a small cut appeared on my face. He licked the blood left on the scythe as the cut immediately healed but he laughed and he disappeared. Above my head appeared his scythe one glowing red eye at the top of it near the blade. 
I could feel him trying to destroy my insides. What kind of technique was this? I suddenly powered up with my benevolent Buddha stand. Sacred key enshrouded me as the demon started to wail inside me. He immediately left appearing outside. All the damage he did to me healed in a jiffy. His skin was burnt due to the sacred Buddha key countering him directly. He looked at me with eyes of animosity as said in a rough voice, How dare you challenge Rost? Rost? Another strange demonic name, whatever I needed to save the host. While the demon started to monologue, I gathered key inside my palm to make a mini spirit bomb that revolved extremely fast, looking like a mini tornado. I used instant transmission to appear behind him and take him by surprise while I rammed the sphere inside him. His essence started to leave the body as it entered the scythe. A shirtless human man appeared. He had his hair in a big braid and blue eyes. I healed him and he got up while saying, What a goddamn nightmare! He held his head as the pain didn't subside from his consciousness. He looked around me then down at the scythe. He gasped realizing that it wasn't a nightmare. He bowed towards me and said, Thanks for taking care of Ross, sir. He was a pretty polite guy considering he got corrupted by the scythe in the first place. I grabbed the scythe and he grimaced. It seemed he didn't want to touch that thing or see it again. Immediately the demon from inside tried to invade my consciousness but it was stopped extremely easily. Rasta, the weapon was pretty strong if you considered it in mortal ranking but it was garbage in someone of Super Scion 2 or above standard. I destroyed Rost's true body immediately transforming him into nothing. The man sighed and said, My name is Kane. I don't know who you are, but could you do me a favor? Could you take me to planet Ionia in the East Galaxy? I nodded my head. This guy was all alone and possessed by a demon. The least I could do is send him back to his home. I asked King Kai about the coordinates of the planet and after a few minutes, he telepathically transmitted them to me. I grabbed Cain by the shoulder and teleported directly to the planet. Back on his home planet, seeing the familiar surroundings, he bowed to me again and took his leave. He met with a masked man in an assassin suit which berated him coldly, then looked towards me and cupped his fists. They both left in a shadow flicker. I decided to go back to Earth since this job was done as well. According to Jis and Birder, most of the planets were fixed and a lot of the planet organization trade personnel now were either construction workers or joined the Galactic Patrol. They now were all working honest jobs. Before Bu came, everything would be okay for the planet, or so I thought. On a distant pyramid planet with a giant tree, a purple feline yawned as he asked Wis. Wis, I dreamed about a bald guy who called himself Buddha, and he hit me in the head. I want to find this guy, was chuckled putting a hand near his mouth and said, Lord Beerus, it's just a dream. What do you know about this Buddha person anyway? Beerus scratched his head and said, Well, nothing. All I know he is bald and strong, was immediately held his nose and said, Before we continue this conversation, you better go and take a bath, Lord Beerus. Beerus chuckled awkwardly and scratched the back of his head. A few tens of minutes later, he came back in his God of Destruction outfit and shouted, Oracle fish, get your butt out here. A tiny fish in a little glass started to fly quickly towards Beerus and said, Oh my lord, it isn't time to wake up yet, what's the hurry? Beerus snorted and said, I want the latest news of bald strong men of the galaxy. The tiny fish gulped and sweat dropped and said, the strongest and baldest man in the universe is this guy here. He created an image which showed my face on it. Beerus gasped as he said, This guy, this guy, I know he resembles somewhat the guy from my dream. What did this guy do? The fish continued. He eradicated the cold empire from the universe and became its new emperor. Beerus nodded his head. Frisia was a pretty strong guy. His father was also extremely strong, both dying to this guy's hand is some news. Where is he currently residing? The fish just said two words, planet earth. At those two words, I could feel a shiver go down my spine, back on earth. 
Something big was making its way to this tiny planet, and that big thing was cat-shaped. A cat humanoid with purple skin was yawning as a bubble of key moved at fast speeds in the void. Wiss was keeping a straight face as he used his powers to travel in the void towards Earth. Beerus immediately asked again, Wiss, are we there yet? No, Lord Beerus, I already told you it would take me at least half an hour before we can get to Earth. But Wiss, I'm Boreed. Please bear with it, Lord Beerus, you can exercise after we get to Earth. Eh, but I don't want to exercise much, Wiss. I'm going to Earth to check about this bald guy. Maybe if he is not up to my standards, I'll just destroy the planet and go back to sleep. I'm still tired. Beerus yawned again and scratched the back of his neck. He was quite sleepy right now. Wiss just chuckled and continued his journey towards Earth. I stood meditating in my personal gravity chamber, my power breached trough one billion in my base form. I could already use the combination of all my techniques with some strain, but I couldn't reach the stage of it being comparable to the Super Scion Blue transformation again. There was a lack of something that made them fuse perfectly. I couldn't put it in words exactly. I got out of the chamber and Marin and Ryu ran forward towards my embrace. I picked both of them up as they said in a childish voice. Daddy, you started to train in there longer and longer. You should play with us more. I smiled towards them and said, Then let's play right now. You know when I'm not around you can ask your mothers to take you to play with Goten and Trunks, you know? They both shook their little heads and said, We want to play with Daddy. I chuckled and decided to entertain the two little buggers for some time. Suddenly my danger senses went into the extremes. I could feel something so strong approaching the planet but I couldn't sense what it was. I could feel that it was strong, but I couldn't grasp how much nor its location exactly. Out of nowhere, a multicolored beam of light appeared on the planet as a loud voice was heard on all the planet. Krillin come here if you don't want Earth to become space dust. All the Z fighters flew and teleported immediately towards the location. I grimaced and teleported there as well. I cursed inside. Why did he wake up already? Beerus, the Lord of Destruction, and with his attendant and teacher were waiting for me near the ocean surface. Beerus eyed me and said with a lazy tone of voice, Hmm? I could see how you could beat Frisia, but you are really out of colds and his other Sun League. The other Z fighters appeared continuously, Goku was second teleporting to my key signature. His power level reached 260 million. Vegeta came next, then the other two Scions, lastly the human Z fighters arrived as well. Beerus eyed all of us while Wiss didn't decided to comment, he was just a spectator here. Beerus stopped observing us and pointed towards me and said, You fight me, power up to your best. I could only comply with the Lord of Destruction instructions if I didn't want everyone to get obliterated and become unrevivable as well. I concentrated as all of my six dots started to shine my power level increased by 64 times. I buffed up, and an electric red aura started to encase me as I used my Kaioken at its maximum already. Beerus started to watch with more interest as my power level increased, but then he scoffed. I see your power level is extremely high, in the mortal level you could be considered unrivaled, but you are still a long way from even touching the god level. I gritted my teeth and activated the Benevolent Buddha Stand as my power level increased by more than 35 times. With the increase of my power so did my Sacred Key Purity. Beerus' eyes immediately started to shine when he saw the figure of the Buddha behind me and launched himself directly at me with no other warnings. I tried to fight him head on, but his power was immense. He immediately punched me and the power of the punch knocked me away directly into space. Beerus followed directly. My broken bones started to mend themselves as I started to encase my body with key. A key scythe immediately appeared in my hands as I started to hack at Beerus. He dodged easily and even grabbed the key scythe and broke it with his fingers. His strength was way too high. If I didn't enter the state when I firstly used all of the techniques together I couldn't make him exert even 15% of his power. Beerus yawned and said, if this is all you got I might as well just destroy the planet already. Inside his mind Wiss's voice however interfered. Lord Beerus, don't forget what your job is actually. 
This planet mortal level is extremely high and it's still increasing. You can't destroy it on a whim. As your teacher and advisor, I advise you to not destroy it as it would lower this universe's mortal level. Also, we didn't even try to eat any of the foods yet. Beerus transmitted his thoughts back to Wiss. I'm just bluffing with him. I want to put him in a precarious position so he can unlock some more of his hidden potential. You can feel it too, right, Wiss? His power resembles of that fat bastards who disappeared some millions of years ago. Wiss chuckled inwardly as he observed the battle in the outer space from the Earth. Beerus was already charging his destruction ball which he threw directly at me. I knew that if I didn't stop it, it would truly destroy everything that I held dear about. I started to shout as I forcibly tried to increase the output of Sacred Key and increase my power level. Red blood veins appeared in my eyes, as other green veins started to appear all of over my body. Suddenly, all the other auras disappeared and all the dots combined on my forehead to resemble something of a lotus flower. All the veins calmed down as my mind became tranquil. I took the blast head on, but I could barely stop it. I counterattacked with my own key and made it implode. The explosion took both us in its radius. After the explosion calmed down, I was back to normal exhausted and falling down to earth while Beerus was all okay and dandy. He had a glint in his eyes as he looked at me and grinned. He grabbed me by the wrist, not letting me fall down and grinned. You are an interesting guy. You have the legacy of that old Buddha guy, don't you? I just smirked at him and decided to not comment. His yellow eyes narrowed, but the grin didn't disappear from his face and he continued. Well, whatever, I won't destroy your planet. It's mortal level, it's too high, and it would clash with my job if I destroyed it selfishly. I also didn't get to eat anything from Earth yet. We both teleported back to Wiss. Wiss smiled back at Beerus and said, Well, Lord Beerus, since you are free now, let's try some of the local cuisines. I decided to call Bulma for this. She should know how to fill these gluttons up. Vegeta was terrified by Beerus's presence, but he knew what to do just like in the anime. When he heard that Beerus wanted food, he immediately wanted to cook it himself. Beerus narrowed his eyes at Vegeta, seemingly trying to remember something about the past. But he was too lazy to continue thinking about it and just yawned and followed me towards Bulma's place. I informed Bulma beforehand of everything, so she created a giant feast with different Japanese dishes. There was even pizza and pudding. Wiss and Beerus's eyes started to shine as they started to eat. Beerus ate, just like a scion as he shouted, So delicious! Wiss ate like a gentleman, but from time to time stars would appear in his eyes as he would say in a peppy tone of voice, This is so good, we should come to eat here from time to time, Lord Beerus. Beerus ignored the comment as he was physically engulfing food like a black hole. He was even out eating science at this pace. After the whole table was emptied of food, Beerus punched the table as he said, More! Bulma complied. She fed two scions every day, she had tons of food and tons of cooks as well. But even the cooks started to groan strained at the pace Beerus and Wiss ate. After all the cooks were knocked out due to exhaustion. Fortunately Beerus and Wiss were satisfied. Beerus almost looked like his brother of how stuffed he became. His eyes were droopy as it seemed he was going in hibernation. The next minute he muttered to Wiss, Wiss let's go home, I'm sleepy. Was complied and told Bulma, Miss, I might come here from time to time to try out new dishes. Bulma complied after she heard of how strong they were, and when she looked at my torn clothes, she knew these guys weren't to be messed with. She would comply with Wiss's wishes. After they both left in a torrent of multicolored key, a sigh left out of my mouth. Everyone was tense, Goku included. Piccolo was still trembling due to the oppressive might he felt when I and Beerus fought. I clenched my hands. It was good Beerus was a glutton who didn't care much about his job. But if I were to anger him, things could have done south. I needed to master the combination of all the techniques. If I wasn't wrong, I could fight Beerus while he wasn't fully serious with it and might even come on top. I wasn't sure of the limits of Beerus' strength. It was said he started to learn Ultra Instinct, but he didn't master it. 
The end of the super anime left many questions to be answered. After everyone got back to train, they realized they were still weak compared to the top fishes of the universe. I had some fun with Jaika and Lazuli, played with my children, and decided it was time to enter closed door training for a much longer time. I need to at least be able to enter the supreme mode as I dubbed it by will and not accidentally. I needed to learn how to fully combine all the techniques myself and thoroughly master the mantra, so I could get my sacred key to 50% purity. After that I needed to find the latter half of the mantra to reach 100% sacred key purity. I still had lots of things to do, growing lax was a huge problem. After this closed door training I would venture in the universe and search for the next part of the mantra. I would of course warn the others of Mage and Bu before he came so they would be prepared. At the rate they grew stronger by the time Mage and Bu came Goku would be able to defeat him without getting anyone absorbed. Hopefully things would work out as everyone was way stronger than normal. I made sure to make more preparations besides leaving everything on the Z fighter's shoulders. I taught Cell the fusion dance and instructed him to teach it to the Z fighters at an opportune time. Before I entered the long closed door training followed by leaving for the universe, I tied up all of my loose ends to make sure no one would get injured or die while I was missing. I even made sure the fish mutants from the ocean wouldn't ever attack again. I made a treaty with their king Neptune. If they ever broke it I would exterminate all of them. After finally making sure everything was done and nothing could interrupt my training, I entered the gravity chamber and started to try and fuse the techniques. It would be a long time before I came out of the chamber. I stopped my training and checked my power level. It increased towards 3 billion 500 million. I could also enter the Supreme Bodhisattva mode at will now. The power level increase was maxed at 125 for my benevolent Buddha stand due to me reaching the maximum capability of the mantra's first half. I thoroughly mastered it, so now there was nothing else I could increase my sacred key purity with. I walked outside my training room and took a deep breath, taking in the purified air from earth that was laced with key. The average power level of the earthlings increased up to two to three thousand. My student's power level breached one hundred thousand, and Goku's power level reached six hundred million in his base by now. He might have even learned Super Saiyan 3 by now. Vegeta's power level increased towards five hundred million, while Nappa's and Raditz's power level remained at 350 million, it seemed they stopped training as they were concerned with other things. The human Z fighters started to catch up with the Scions, the strongest one being Tien at 310 million. Yamcha reached 280 million, while Rashi reached 300 million as well. Kaiatsu reached a power level of 100 million as well. Piccolo's power level was the most impressive, reaching 500 million, just like Vegeta's. Marin and Ryu immediately hopped towards me. They both grew now from little toddlers to young kids. Marin was eight years old while Ryu was seven and a half. By now Trunks should be ten or eleven, while Goten would be nine or ten. It seemed quite a bit of time had gone by. I embraced them both and checked their key. Their power levels already reached one million each. It seemed Ryu was more talented than Marin. He also unlocked his dots. But his were lower than mine, he only had four. I played with them for a bit and met with Lazuli and Jaika afterward. After some fun, it was time to adventure in the universe to get the latter half of the Buddha scripture. My first destination was the desert planet, where I found the first half of the scripture. But when I teleported towards the planet's coordinates and searched it, I couldn't find the statue engraved with the words again. I searched everywhere, but the statue disappeared for some reason. I scratched my head as the sunlight reflected from it. The reflection started to shine on a patch of sand on the ground. There some words were hidden which read, Only those fated can get the second half. Follow the twin universe for the latter part. Follow the twin universe for the latter part. So the next part of the scripture wasn't even in universe 7. I had to go to universe 6 since Wiss would come from time to time to try new food. I could use his help in this regard. I teleported back to Earth and waited. Wiss was supposed to come in the next few days to try a new dish after he ate his fill I would ask him to take me to Universe 6. 
Wes came after a few days and ate some new dishes he didn't try before. His eyes were glittering as he was eating the food with his chopsticks. After he finished I approached him. He looked at me with a smile and said, What would you require of me Krillinsan? I chuckled awkwardly. This angel could see through me in an instant. After all, he was way stronger than Beerus and wiser too. I told him directly, there's something in our twin universe which I require to get to become stronger. I was wondering if you could take me there? Was put a finger under his chin as if pondering my request before he nodded his head and answered. It's quite easy for me to do this, but if Lord Kampa doesn't want to let you explore his universe I won't interfere. Take this as me repaying you for all the food I ate up till now. He took his staff and told me to put a hand on his shoulder. I put a hand on his shoulder as he knocked his staff on the ground. Multicolored energy encased both of us as we started to travel at extremely fast speeds in the universe. Was turned to look back at me and said, To go between universes will take me a while. At earliest one hour and most two hours. Just wait and meditate or something. Also make sure to not take your hand off my shoulder. I nodded my head at his words and just waited. Two hours wasn't much time at all. It could go by in the blink of an eye. Wiss was humming a little song as we continued to fly at an inestimable amount of speed in theoretic terms. Stars would appear and disappear in the blink of an eye. After two hours, we were finally in Universe 6. A female-looking version of Wiss appeared. Her clothes resembled Wiss's, but they were green instead of red. She chuckled and said, What's the occasion you visit my humble universe brother? Wiss smiled and said, Vados, it's been a while. Is Lord Comper awake? Vados shook her head, then took a look at me and said, Oh, what's this? This guy gives off familiar key. It's just like that fatties from some millions of years ago. What's up with him, Wiss? Wiss said nonchalantly. He is here for the other half of that person's inheritance. Vados nodded her head at Wiss and said, You are in luck since Lord Kampa is asleep, and I still owe Wiss a favor I can just say I saw nothing. She just disappeared afterward. Wiss gave me a blue orb and said, Break this orb when you want to leave the universe. I will come and take you back. He took his leave and disappeared in the multicolored key. I started to use my sacred key in an attempt to try and see if there was someone who could respond to the key, or if the inheritance would appear if it sensed the key by itself. I started to fly around in the galaxies of Universe 6. My golden aura encased me as I tried to find the latter half of the mantra. It took me months and I visited many planets till I got a response. It was a pulse of sacred key coming from a nearby jungleish planet. I immediately flew towards the planet and approached the sacred key radiance. After a few minutes I met with a man who stood upon a pole on one leg the other crossed on his knee meditating. His chest was bare which had a black tattoo on it, and he had some black training pants, his fists were both wrapped in bandages, and he was blindfolded with a red piece of cloth, his hair was tied with the same type of cloth into a very long ponytail. His mouth opened as he said in a deep and low voice, Ah, a fellow disciple welcome! He jumped down from the pole and cupped his fists at me. I mirrored his actions and asked, Fellow disciple, my name is Krillin. Are you the one who has the other half of the mantra? The fellow chuckled and said, Well met Krillin, my name is Lee Sin, and yes I do have the other part of the inheritance. You might not know as our master is truly irresponsible on how he handled his inheritance. But the inheritance was supposed to be whole, oh whatever, there are two universes which both have a lack of a Buddha position. That old fatty gave up on the position because he couldn't be in two universes at once. He continued in his deep and low voice. But with the two us the position can be fulfilled in both universes. I cannot teach you the mantra directly though. You have to go under the same test that I had to get it. Unfortunately for me I was young and rash and the test took away my sight for me. Hopefully it won't damage you as it did me. I could sense Lee's power level. It was almost the same as mine. With the other part of the inheritance he should have something similar to my benevolent Buddha stand. He didn't ask me for the other part of the inheritance. Maybe he is the reason the inheritance disappeared from the desert planet. He guided me towards a dark cave and said, Here's how things will go. 
You enter the cave which is a different dimension where the guardian of the cave will give you a test. Good luck. I entered the cave and darkness surrounded me immediately. I couldn't see or feel anything. Out of the darkness two voices sounded at the same time. Little lamb. Another one came, is he prey? This one was masculine, gruff and deep. Dear wolf. He came for that person's inheritance. Can't you sense the aura he exudes? This voice was feminine and calm. The gruff and masculine voice continued. Whatever. The test is your domain. I got excited about nothing. Out of the darkness. I could see the shadow of a dark wolf's head. It had a line that leaned to the right on his masked face. Out of the darkness came a masked humanoid lamb. She had the other half of the symbol on her mask. Both of these beings' eyes glowed a deep blue. Their pupilless eyes could see through my whole self. Lamb looked at me and said, The test is simple. Defeat me. She took a bow out of nowhere and knocked some white arrows on it. Wolf started to pace around seemingly wanting to take a bite out of me. But Lamb admonished him, Wolf, this is not our domain you can't join. Wolf growled and after that remained silent. I couldn't feel any amount of key from Lamb's body. She either had godly key or didn't use key at all. I transformed directly into my supreme bodhisattva mode. All my aura adhered to my skin giving it a little golden glow and all of my dots fused creating a now visible lotus flower on my forehead. Lamb nodded her masked head at me and said, this is the first half of the inheritance, you have trained fully in it very good. She knocked an arrow and shoot it directly towards my eyes. I knew how Lee became blind now. I grabbed the arrow and redirected it back at her. She dodged easily and started shooting arrows at me like a machine gun while moving quickly around like an experienced hunter trying to close in to its prey. I dodged the arrows I couldn't grab and tried to get close to her. She chuckled under her mask and continued to run around. She was extremely fast, and her arrows were deadly, but if I could get near her, I could defeat her easily. It seemed she was a long-range fighter. Making use of her not knowing my abilities fully, I used the afterimage technique to get nearer to her and charged a death beam on my finger. She leaned her head to the left and dodged the beam. She knocked another arrow on her bow and shot it directly to my forehead, I created a key barrier to stop the arrow which was too fast to intercept but it pierced trough. It was ready to pierce directly through the middle of the lotus flower on my head. But I shouted and a beam of key discharged from the lotus flower directly, obliterating the arrow. I used instant transmission to directly appear behind her and I drove a key sword directly through her abdomen. She started laughing and said, Good job. You are way better than the last fellow who got here and got blinded on his first attempt. She dispersed into white mist and appeared near Wolf. She took an ancient-looking tome from Wolf's mouth. Wolf grumbled and said, If we didn't lose to that old fatty and his bet we wouldn't have to appear here every time someone enters. We are not guard dogs. Lamb nodded her head and said, A bet is a bet. Now Wolf lets go our job is done. Two mantras were imparted as per the old guy's instructions our debt is finally finished. Wolf's tongue got out of his mouth as he howled and said, Finally no more interruptions in the hunt. They both disappeared in clouds of mist one white and one black. I opened the ancient book as Buddhist characters appeared and entered my forehead. The lotus flower started to transform into a dragon tattoo with a crystal in the place where its eyes were supposed to be. My skin started to turn golden as my sacred key purity increased to 51% but stopped suddenly. The transformation reverted to its normal looks and the power increased just by a bit due to the 1% purity increase. I got ejected out of the cave and met with Lee outside, his skin was golden and his tattoos were glowing, his blindfold was off and his two eyes glowed golden he smiled towards me and said, While you were in there I got the hang of the first part, the combination is what Master liked to call his Buddha God mode. You can call it whatever you want, though. His power level was off the charts as he suddenly charged towards me. I transformed back up again and started to fight him. During the fight my transformation from before started to flicker in appearance as we clashed. But it never appeared completely. 
our power levels were equal, he didn't have something similar to my benevolent Buddha stand, he only now unlocked the technique from comprehending the first part of the mantra. His key purity was the same as mine at 51%. The transformation came from the second part of the mantra. He learned it first so he got to it faster than me. After a while of fighting back and forth we disengaged and reverted. He smiled to me. Both his eyes were scarred as he put his blindfold back on. It seemed his regain of vision was temporary. He laughed and said, it took you some time to finish the test. It was way faster than me though. Three months and half. Pretty good record. By now Mage and Bu should have come to Earth, right? I cupped my fists towards Lee and took my leave. I got back to where Wis left me and destroyed the blue orb he left me. After a while, the multicolored key appeared and we both disappeared again with it. Wis looked at me and said, Congratulations. Krill and San a bit more training and you will truly reach the realm of the gods. I nodded to him and said, Thank you, Wissan. He put a hand to his mouth as he laughed and continued. Anyways, I can tell you that I felt some kind of strange power appear on Earth. If I'm not mistaken, it should be that ancient guy, Majin Bu. He is even a bit older than Lord Beerus. Fortunately, with the powerhouses you have on Earth, he can be easily defeated. It seemed Mage and Bu appeared on Earth but wasn't unsealed yet. That was good. I could watch from the sidelines and interfere if anything happened. After another two hours and a half I got back to Earth just in time. I could feel lots of auras gather on Papaya Island. It was time for another Budokai Tenkechi tournament. Inside a hidden place on Earth and shrouded by a magic barrier was a little guy with wrinkled yellow skin who was talking with a guy with an elongated head who wore armor and had an M tattooed on his forehead. Pui Pui, those two humans should bring enough energy for Majin Buu's resurrection. Supapavich and Yamu, was it? Anyways, afterward, kill them both. Heard me, Debura? Out of the darkness, a devil with red skin horns and elongated ears appeared. He also had an M tattooed on his forehead. He wore a light blue suit which covers his entire body, minus his muscle-bound chest, along with a white spiked cape, a white circular belt, and white boots. He bowed towards the little yellow guy and said, Of course, Master Babidi, after we made use of the trash, we will dispose of it. Babidi started to laugh sinisterly. Back to Papaya Island, everyone started to gather around me as I let my key out so they can find me. I was already on my way to keeping the key in my body to reach its true divine potential. Keeping it inside and not leaking it at all helped me purify it at the same time. Goku immediately appeared, his power level was already at 750 million, he smiled towards me and put a hand on my shoulder. Behind him was Gohan who was now as tall as Goku and he changed his haircut, it was now spiked up a little bit like when he transformed into a super scion. Goten was behind Goku clutching the hems of his pants, looking at me with wariness. From behind me came Lazuli, Jika, Ryu and Marin Goten started to brighten up seeing his two playmates. I hugged both Jika and Lazuli. It has been quite some time since I left them for Universe 6. After this whole thing was done, some special activities were needed. They both started to blush at my gaze. They realized what my eyes indicated. Goku scratched his head and asked, Are you too sick? Why are you too so red in the face? Both of them returned to normal at Goku's words. Old Goku never changed up till now. Even though he was a bit smarter, he was still clueless regarding other things. Yamcha, Tien, Vegeta, and the others also made their way over, Trunks was with them as well. Even Hercule and Videl made their way over, Videl waved and Gohan and grabbed his arm when she got over to him. Gohan scratched his head awkwardly and smiled. The kids would join the newly made junior division, while the adults would join the adult division. Me, Lazuli, and Jika wouldn't join, since there was no reason to. The junior division's most exciting fights would be Trunks, Goten's, Ryu's, and Marin's. Since the junior division would fight first, I decided to ignore the other kids' fight and just focus on the main events. Trunks won all of his fights easily. The same could be said about Goten, Marin, and Ryu. They were overshadowing every kid in the tournament. 
Finally, after 30 fights, it was the time for Goten and Trunks to fight. Marin and Ryu were also fighting in an adjacent stage. The winner of those fights would get to fight in the finals. The Goten and Trunks fight was just like in canon, both going super after warming up, as for Ryu versus Marin. Ryu immediately activated his dots. For dots shining on his forehead, his power level increased by 16 times. He immediately struck forward to Marin, but she dodged easily as a red aura started to encase her. She was using the Kaioken at the maximum of her capability. Ryu smiled towards his sister and started to use his Kaioken as well. Marin didn't unlock the dots, so she couldn't keep up with her brother even though her base power level was higher and she was older. Marin's face started to scrunch up as a tall, well-built man appeared behind her. Its skin was purple and had small bits of gold around its body. It has long, flowing hair with a darker shade above its eyes and on the bridge of its nose, blurring the distinction between its hair and head. The spaces under its eyes and on its cheeks and chin are a darker color and divided clearly from the space around its nose and mouth. It wears a cap on its chin and a metallic headband in three pieces, the central piece of which is shaped as a vertical ellipse. Her stand was pretty imposing. I didn't know what it represented, though. Maybe that was the quality of her soul? A loud voice immediately came out of the stand's mouth as it started to punch towards Ryu at high speeds. ORA 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 The barrage of punches was only after images at the high speed it attacked. Ryu chuckled and said, Oh, whose sister you are approaching me instead of running away? Marin smirked and said, I can't beat your butt without approaching you. Ryu then stopped chuckling and said in a serious tone of voice, Then come as close as you like. A similarly muscular figure appeared behind Ryu. It wears a headpiece covering its face to below the place of its nose, slanting at a steep angle from the base of its forehead to a peak situated above the rear of its head by about half its height leaving the face of an inverted triangle visible to the front. It wears small, simple twin diving cylinders on its back. The stand immediately started to below as it started its rush attack. Muda, 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 muda. They both started clashing as Ryu started to overpower Marin. It seemed his stand was superior. He was ready to punch a hole through her when he stopped and said with a smile on his face, You lost, sister. Marin just sighed, cupped her fists and left the stage. Ryu waved at me with a huge smile on his face. He was proud that he beat his older sister. It was expected he would when Marin started to change with time and became less and less interested in martial arts, but Ryu just continued to train. He liked it, but I'm not sure as he grew older would he still like it. It was time for a fight between Ryu and Trunks. The fight was similar to the anime, but Trunks won in the end. Of course, Trunks was older and trained by Vegeta who was pretty much a slave trainer. If Bulma wouldn't stop him, he would run Trunks to the ground like a sergeant from hell. Ryu and Trunks both cupped their fists at each other as Trunks immediately transformed in his Super Saiyan state. Ryu used his dots and the Kaioken to rival him in power, and they started to clash. Trunks had the upper hand in experience as he was older and trained every day by Vegeta, but Ryu had his special stand. The yellow man appeared behind Ryu as suddenly time seemed to stop for a few seconds. I could shrug off the effect, so could the stronger Z fighters. But Trunks couldn't. This was similar to Hit's time skip ability. I studied the stand's ability for future references. Maybe I could learn to skip time from this. Trunks was hit four times in the chest and two times in the stomach in the stop time. Ryu immediately said afterward, Time has started again. Trunks got blown over by the punches and skidded over the stage early getting blown out. He coughed a bit of saliva but stopped himself near the edge and threw himself at Ryu. Ryu put his stand in front of him both arms crossed in an X to take the attack Heaton. Trunks punched through the stand and hit Ryu in the head, taking him out. Unfortunately, Trunks was still stronger in the end. I couldn't train Ryu every day as Vegeta did to Trunks. Trunks fed Ryu a senzu bean, and he got up. They both left the stage. It was time for the adults' division. The first fight was Yamcha versus Tien, in which they fought at a pretty equal pace. But in the end, T 
Tian won due to his racial technique which increased his power level. Piccolo fought a strange guy who I knew was Supreme Kai, but I decided to not comment on it. Piccolo gave up after Supreme Kai explained to him some things. Videl fought Supapovich and Yamu the two Babidi drones, but now they both got their butt kicked so hard they couldn't do jack. Videl trained with Gohan every day at the dojo, so her power level reached above 200,000. Both of them were above 50,000, they couldn't do anything to her. Gohan fought Videl afterward and won. Supapovich and Yamu still lingered around even though they were defeated. They looked for an opportunity to drain someone of their energy. Goku vs Vegeta was the next fight and this one would be the most interesting. Goku smirked towards Vegeta while Vegeta scoffed at Goku and said, Kakarot it's time for us to settle our debt. I have achieved another transformation and it's time for me to beat you. Goku smiled at Vegeta and said, Oh, Vegeta you ascended as well? Vegeta immediately grew grim from Goku's words. It seemed he learned Super Saiyan 3 as well. He ignored him afterward and started to power up. Blonde hair. Blonde hair spiked up and electricity around him. Goku did the same. Vegeta immediately started to scream as his power level increased at enormous amounts. The whole planet started to shake as his hair grew long like raditz and his eyebrows were gone. Goku immediately started to do the same. Both ascended to the Super Saiyan 3 state and launched at each other. They knew the form took a lot of energy so they had a very short time delay to fight. They punched each other in the face as they smirked. Their power levels were pretty equal at the moment. Goku couldn't fuse Ikari mode with Super Saiyan 2 yet. Let's not even talk about 3. So their power levels didn't have a huge difference between them. They were both geniuses at fighting so they didn't back down from each other at all. A kick which was matched there. A punch which collided with another making shockwaves appear in the air. I, of course, stopped the shockwaves before they could hurt anyone. As the fight continued, Yamu and Supapovich eyed the two of them in fear. But as their power levels started to go down due to the extreme expense of the Super Saiyan 3 transformation, the duo's eyes started to shine. They both reverted to their normal form exhausted. Vegeta fell on his butt while Goku still stood tall. It seemed Goku still won by a little here. Immediately while their guard was down Yamu and Supapovich used a gourd to absorb their energy and run away. They had some special magic cast on them so they couldn't be sensed. I could of course follow them but I decided not to. Majin Buu had to be restored and brought to the good side. He would make a good ally. He was just a misguided fat blob of gum. He wasn't evil. He was just so innocent he didn't realize his actions hurt other people. Vegeta cursed under his breath as he was out of energy, and Goku looked serious. I threw two Senzu beans to them which were now in abundance. They both ate them and got up. Supreme Kai Shin showed himself and started to explain about Majin Buu and Babidi. I made my way down and when Shin sensed my power he gasped and said, Our fellow god, did you sense Majin Buu's arrival as well, wait you? This key is foreign and familiar at the same time. It seemed he could recognize the key but didn't know where it was from. While I couldn't blame him the other Kais couldn't teach him Jack since they were absorbed by Bu. The poor guy didn't even know what his earrings were for. He cleared his throat as Kibito was analyzing me from the side and continued. Okay I can sense where these two are going. It should be the best if we stopped Bu from getting out with this fellow. Um god here we could do it easy peasy. I'm not sure about his position, but his hidden power is immense from what can I sense. The Supreme Kai had good senses if he could feel my Supreme Bodhisattva mode. I knew where Babidi was hiding, so I just decided to teleport everyone there instead of making Shin become our guide. We were welcomed with the sight of Babidi killing Yamu and Supapovich by exploding both of them, while he took the gourd thing filled with the remnants of Vegeta's and Goku's energy. Babidi immediately screamed. Tabura come and take care of these intruders while I unseal Bu with this. The energy is enough, but it would take a bit of time. Tabura smirked and came forward. He was a pretty strong guy, but Gohan would be able to beat him very easily. As on cue, Gohan came forward already in his Super Saiyan state ready to fight. Tabura smirked as the M tattoo on his forehead started to shine red. 
I narrowed my eyes so this was the correct way to use the key storage magic. Dabura shouted as he started to spit at Gohan trying to transform him into a stone statue. Gohan dodged the spit and appeared in front of Dabura punching him directly in the gut. Dabura smiled evilly and embraced Gohan. He was ready to splatter him full of spit. Gohan disgusted, immediately powered up to a Super Saiyan 2 as well, and obliterated him into nothing. In the other world, King Yema was muttering about his mahogany table and how much he wanted to see his children when Dabura appeared in front of him Halo and everything. Yema narrowed his eyes and said, You go to heaven, hell is too good for you. Dabura was then caught by some chains from above trying to drag him upwards. There were angels singing in light of good omen, but Dabura was trying his best to escape clawing at the white chains with everything he got, but he still got dragged into heaven. Back on earth we entered Babidi's building and tried to find him, it was like a maze but I easily solved it, along the way killing Pui Pui and some green giant monster who ate light. Majin Bu was already starting to hatch from a giant pink egg. Babidi rubbed his hands as he waited. We entered at the same time Bu got out of his shell. Just like in the anime, he was a big guy with pink skin who wore a purple cape. White pants had some holes in his head and protrusions which looked like a small tail. He had his eyes closed and an ever-present smile on his face. His power level was high, but Super Saiyan 3 Goku could still beat him if he didn't have a time limit. At the same time in Hell, a demon with headphones was walking around the machinery which was purifying Sin. He tripped and hit the machinery with his horn which poked a small hole in it. He seemed flustered as the sin started to engulf him transforming him into a giant blob of yellow he started to shout in a childish voice. Janemba Janemba. King Kai immediately got alerted and contacted me. Krillin there's a new demon emergence in hell. Need your help SAP. Well peace was good for some time, but I have work to do again now. I hope there won't be any problems with Majin Bu while I had to go and deal with Janemba. Supreme Kai Shin narrowed his eyes and nodded at me. It seemed he got the message as well. I teleported to hell, and there I saw my next opponent and the machine that was getting empty. It started to engulf Janemba as his power level increased. But he remained the same. Shouldn't be too hard to beat this guy. The yellow fat blob with holes in around his chest and stomach area was jumping up and down at me and continuously said, Janemba Janemba. He was just like a Pokemon who could only say his name. I could feel the sin starting to strengthen him and his power level was still increasing at fast speeds. I couldn't use any fatal technique on him though. Just like with Ross, the sin took an innocent as a host to manifest itself in a demonic form. I'm not sure why it took this form, however, the best way to purify the sin and not hurt the demon inside would be to use the spirit bomb. I started to gather energy in my palm but Janemba didn't want that. He jumped towards me with his giant fat body trying to tackle me down. I had to use the afterimage technique to flash around while I kept one hand up to gather the energy. I mixed it with some of my sacred key and it started to take a rainbow quality. Janemba attacked me again but I clenched my hand with the mini spirit bomb inside making it even smaller. I used instant transmission to appear directly near him and drove my sacred key infused spirit bomb directly into his stomach. He immediately started to cry as steam started to blow out of his holes. He spits out a demon with headphones and punk clothes. I grabbed the demon and teleported him a safe distance away with some other warden demons. Before he could thank me, I teleported back to Janemba. It seemed things weren't done yet. The fat yellow blob started to shrink and became human-sized. He gained a yellow eye scara, upper armor color being dull purple and his skin tone and tail are bright red. He also gains two dull purple curved horns on his head while gaining dull purple wristlets, pelvic armor, and ankle supports. He immediately started to shout something which I couldn't understand and he grabbed a purple handle out of air. This was spatial manipulation. The sword was long and the base of it was red while the handle was a deep purple. He started to laugh at me showing his long canines. He started to flicker out of existence like a lagging Windows XP folder. It was just like a glitched game. I couldn't sense him anymore. 
He appeared in front of me ready to drive his sword through my chest. I dodged it instinctively and shot a key blast towards his face. He immediately used his spatial powers again to disappear. I waited patiently trying to guess where else he would come from and made a plan on how to counter his ability. Back on Earth Fat Bu looked at Babidi like a child would look at a toy. Babidi immediately tried to use his mind control magic. Unknowingly to him it did not affect. Babidi started to talk. Bu attacked these guys. Bu replied with a childish voice. Are they strong? Babidi looked flustered at the question. Shouldn't his mind control give him complete control of Bu? What changed? He didn't know that the mind control he prided himself in got his father killed and that's why Bu was sealed in the first place. Well that and the Supreme Kai's sacrifice. Bu's smile immediately widened as he looked at the Z fighters and said, You guys play with Bu okay? If you aren't great at playing, you become candy. The human Z fighters immediately used all of their techniques, while the Scions turned Super Scion 2 directly. Bu said, In a miny miny mo, I choose you. He pointed towards Gohan and launched himself directly to him. Vegeta Goku and the others tried to interfere but Bu pushed them back with his gummy body and steam started to get out of his head. Not fair not fair. You all fight Bu by ganging on Bu. Not fair. He started to flicker as he multiplied. His power level very little reduced and started to laugh. Better now better now Bu can play better. Cell was watching from the distance eyeing the pink creature with weariness. His power level in base now was 1 billion and he fully mastered the Kaioken and his stand to perfection. Behind him appeared the original Cell Perfect form. His power level increased by 50 times. He was ready to swoop in and save the human Z fighters if anything happened. I ordered him to. Goku and Vegeta clashed with the clones but they were overpowered. Gohan couldn't do much if even Goku and Vegeta were getting there but beaten. The human Z fighters were at an even higher disadvantage. Bu was getting bored. He immediately pointed the protrusion from his head at Yamcha and said, You boring, become candy now bye bye. Yamcha growled as he fused the stand with his body. Fur started to appear on him as he transformed into a werewolf. He dodged the candy beam and charged a spirit ball towards Bu. Bu just ate the spirit ball and said, Not sweet enough. He punted Yamcha in the face with an enlarged fist and knocked him out. Other Bu clones fought with the other's human Z fighters. While the Bu clone was fooling around about his victory, Cell appeared out of nowhere and driven a fully charged special beam cannon trough his chest. He took Yamcha from the ground and flashed away. Bu was angry as more steam was going out of the holes of his head and he started to screech. You guys not fun? Bu angry and hungry? Seeing he couldn't defeat them in the short run, he pointed his head appendage at Babidi. Babidi started to sweat drop as he said with a shaky voice, Uh, Bu what are you doing? I'm your master you can't. Bu just said, Bu hungry. And he transformed Babidi into a ginger man and ate him. Bu patted his belly and recalled all his clones. He looked annoyed and he said with a no so cheery voice anymore, Bu bored with you if you not stronger Bu makes you all candy now. All of the remaining fighters grimaced. Cell knew that if things came to worst he should help them escape and teach them the fusion dance so they can win. Goku and Vegeta grinned as they started to shout. Both transforming in a Super Saiyan 3 at the same time. Bu looked curiously at the both of them nodding his head as he felt their power. They both charged at him at the same time and Goku hit him in the face and Vegeta in the stomach. Afterward, Goku flashed above Bu and grabbed him by his appendage and threw him upwards into the sky. Vegeta was already charging his final flash and shot it at Bu when he was thrown upwards. Bu became pieces of gum that started to rain from the sky. Goku and Vegeta reverted to their normal forms inside. A laugh could be heard from every individual piece of gum as they stuck back together. Ha 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 you guys fun. Bu can play with you guys a lot. Kayatsu took two sens of beans from his hat and threw them at Goku and Vegeta. Goku and Vegeta looked at each other with serious eyes. They knew they couldn't destroy Bu thoroughly at their level. They needed to master Super Saiyan 3 for that to happen. They could delay him and fight to a standstill even blow him up. But they could not blow every piece of him up. 
They both ate the Senza beans, and they didn't know what to do. Suddenly Cell appeared near them and told everyone, Guys, follow me. I have a way to defeat him. Unfortunately, we have to let him free for some time. Bu looked at Cell with wonder in his eyes, not being sure what he was, and asked, Bu wants to play with you too? Can you play? Cell responded to Bu. I can get you a stronger partner to play with, but you have to wait, can you do that? Bu put a hand under his chin and thought hard, and responded after a few seconds, Is he stronger than these two? He pointed towards Goku and Vegeta. Cell nodded his head and responded to his question, Way stronger. Bu smiled again, very wide his teeth were showing. Bu can wait, but Bu needs to eat too. If you guys don't give Bu food, Bu can get himself. He was ready to fly away and make people into candy. Gohan immediately stopped him by appearing in front of him and said, We have plenty of food and a place where you can wait. Please don't go. Bu nodded his head at Gohan and said, Well, Bu will follow if you have good food. Gohan's back was drenched with sweat. He knew he was no match for the pink blob. He needed everyone to make food for Bu so things would work well. Cell took Bu to the lookout with everyone else, while Gohan invited his mother, Videl, and Hercule to help with the food. They also had Bulma get some cooks and potty sri so they can make Bu food and sweets. Both Hercule and Videl were good at cooking due to them working at their restaurant for most of their life. Of course, Hercule quitted in the other half to follow his dream as a martial artist, but Videl still helped from time to time. And Gohan thought her food was heavenly. Hercule and Videl flew at high speeds towards the lookout. Hercule had a tiny dog in his hand which Videl was observing. And she said, Dad, what's with the dog? Don't we have to feed that mage in Bu? The dog looked pretty bad his left hind leg was injured. Hercule answered his daughter with an awkward laugh. Well I saw this little guy and I couldn't abandon him. Master's friends have these green beans which can heal you fast I wanted one. So the dog could get healed. Videl looked at her father and nodded her head. Hercule was a good guy. Even if his appearance didn't show it. They both arrived at the lookout and Majin Bu was playing around when he saw the dog and Hercule and said, a doggy? Funny hair man, can Bu play with doggy? Hercule looked around, but Cell was teaching the Z fighters the fusion dance, so they didn't have time to entertain Bu. Hercule thought that the guy didn't look that evil, so he gave him the dog. The dog started to lick Bu's face. As Bu observed the dog, he saw that it's injured, and he said, You feel bad? Bu makes you feel better. He healed the dog with his key, and the dog immediately started to run around and bark. Bu started to follow him and play around. Hercule afterward immediately started to cook with the help of Videl. Bu started to salivate at the aromas that were assaulting his nostrils. Bu immediately sat down with the puppy in his lap and waited for the food. Cammy was watching from inside the lookout and sighed to himself. Piccolo was with him and asked Cammy, What's up old man? Why are you sighing? Cammy responded, this guy Majin Bu, he is innocent, but there's a deep evil hidden inside of him. We don't have to kill him. I can feel that he also has some bits of sacred key hidden in him. Maybe there's something hidden about him? Piccolo looked at Kami with a questioning gaze and asked, Old man, how would you even separate the evil from him? It's impossible unless he does it himself as you did. Kami nodded his head and said, Maybe we could convince him with food. It looks like he enjoys it a lot from what I see. And enjoying it he was, he was engulfing food like a tornado not stopping at all. Whenever a plate with food was shown it would be engulfed by his mouth, plate included. Hercule the cooks and Videl sweat dropped. Popo was looking at Majin Bu from a corner with a glint in his eyes and muttered to himself, Such a pure evil inside this guy, I could use it. Then he shook his head and sighed, too bad that noseless freak exists. I can't do anything to him. What a freaking maggot. Vegeta was red in the face. He was trying to learn the fusion dance, but he didn't like the idea of fusing with Kakarot or anyone else. He wanted to go into the chamber and try to master Super Saiyan 3. Goku was of the same idea as Vegeta, but Mr. Popo barred them the entrance for some reason. 
While they trained back in hell, I was fighting Janemba with all I got. From time to time I would hit an empty space just to hit Janemba in his face. I started to guess where Janemba would come out of space, it was just like how Goku guessed where Hit would try to attack him during the time he skipped. It was, of course, way easier than what Goku did. It didn't take me much time to start to be able to hit him more and more. Janemba started to screech hysterically as he put a finger forward and drew it in the air, making shards of ki that looked like needles fly at me. I mimicked his technique and the shards collided in midair destroying each other. This fight had gone long enough I learned quite a few things from Janemba, and by observing his space manipulation I learned how to do it as well. For now, it was time for the personification of sin to be purified. I turned on my supreme bodhisattva mode as the dots on my forehead morphed into a dragon with crystals where its eyes are supposed to be. The dragon's crystal eyes started to shine as my power increased to the realm of gods. At 52% key purity, I'm pretty sure I hit levels of power comparable to Super Saiyan God Goku or even a bit higher than him, this amount of power couldn't be counted in numbers anymore. Janemba screeched and tried to run away using his space manipulation. Unfortunately for him, it was too late. I appeared near him before he could truly dissipate into space and threw a right hook infused with sacred key towards his disappearing stomach. It transformed into dust then into purified sin which flew back into the machine. The machine started to roar to life as I thoroughly destroyed Janemba and all the sin purified itself. I closed the hole into the machine with my magic key and materialization. The pipes of the machine were going directly upwards into the yellow clouds and even higher into heaven. Inside heaven we could observe Dabura, but he was different now he looked like a pious and pure follower. He was walking along a big patch of flowers and smelling them. Nearby there were the pipes of the machine that was purifying sins in hell. Out of the pipes, the form of Janemba appeared, but he was different. He took an even more humanoid form and his skin was a normal white instead. The only thing that would link him to the old Janemba was his headpiece and the sword he held in his hand. He bowed towards Dabura and said in a clear voice, Ah Dabura, it seems you have gone to heaven as well? Dabura nodded and continued to smell the flowers and enjoy life in heaven. He looked like hell didn't exist for him anymore. I teleported back to earth and felt all the powers on the lookout so I teleported back there. Shin was also there watching as the others trained in the fusion technique. He was expectant of how they would defeat Mage and Bu. He immediately got a message from King Kai nodded towards me and said, It seems you did your job perfectly back in hell. I'm not sure what god position you got, but keep doing what you do. I sweat dropped at the Supreme Kai's lack of knowledge, poor thing. I must unseal the Elder Kai so he could teach this youngster some things. After Bu ate tons of food, he patted his belly and burped. He looked at the Z fighters as they did a strange dance and said, Bu can wait for even more for the strong fighter. Actually, Bu will just take a nap here. He started to sleep like a rock a snot bubble coming out of his nose. Everyone sweat dropped this guy. Cell and the others were hard at work to master the fusion dance while I was contacted by King Kai. Good work on the hell job, my disciple. And from what I heard from Supreme Kai Shinsama, you unlocked your god key already. He started to sniffle and said how his disciple already grew so fast. He ignored the threat of Mage and Bu seemingly trusting in me to save everyone. After a few days of training, they all perfected the fusion dance and were ready to fight. Majin Buu woke up as the snot bubble burst and he yawned. Vegeta and Goku immediately started to dance. They did it perfectly as their power levels were lowered at the same amount they touched their fingers and a white flash appeared. I always wondered what the fusion of Vegeta and Goku would look with the fusion dance Vegeta was cool, but what would come out of the fusion dance instead of the Patera? I was answered by the sound of their fused voice. Yosha, Majin Buu, Gogeta is here. Be ready to get your butt kicked. They immediately powered up to their Super Saiyan form and took a combination of Goku's and Vegeta's stance. Majin Buu smiled at Gogeta as he felt the combined power of Goku and Vegeta. He started to power up himself as steam started to come out of holes on his head. He immediately started to change from his fat self as he became buff, 
His power level started to rival Gogeta's, but that was only Gogeta's in his base form. Bu started to laugh and said, All that food made Bu stronger. Let's play. They both launched at each other and started the fight. After Gogeta and Bu clashed in midair they dashed backwards due to the impact. Bu was at a disadvantage and flew away farther than Gogeta. Even though he was strong he wasn't on the level of Super Saiyan Gogeta. Gogeta smirked and started to charge a Big Bang Kamehameha. He put two hands forward and a ball of blue key appeared above his outstretched hands. He charged it as it started to revolve, and it shot at Bu at high speeds. Bu shouted as a beam of key appeared out of his mouth and clashed midair with Gogeta's beam. Gogeta smirked as he shouted, and his power level increased. His beam started to push back Boo's till it engulfed him thoroughly. Blobs of pink reconstructed themselves back into the buff Bu. Another bout of anger came out of Bu as he shouted, You know fun, Bu likes to win. Hot steam started to come out of his head holes. I observed him making sure if evil Bu came out right now I would send him on his way. Kami interrupted my thoughts by talking with me telepathically. Krillin, this is a good situation to remove the evil side of Majin Bu. Hit him with some of your sacred key right now. I could see that he was right. Bu's guard was down as he powered up. I charged a revolving ball of sacred key into my hand and threw it at his stomach. It hit directly as he started to cry. Bu doesn't feel right. He started to become a mishmash of things as a black-gray piece of gum was ejected out of him. His power level reverted to normal and his buff form was removed, making him go back to his fat form. The black-gray piece took a different form than the normal Bu. He was skinny and had the same outfit but in different colors. He grinned evilly at Fat Bu and was ready to launch himself at him and absorb him. I appeared in front of Evil Bu and kicked him in the chin launching him away. Gogeta didn't know what to do. But suddenly Gogeta defused and both Goku and Vegeta looked awkwardly at each other. The normal time of the fusion dance was 30 minutes, but it went down the more energy was expended. Super Saiyan 1 made it 10 minutes, 2 would give the Saiyans 5 minutes and Super Saiyan 3 would give them a maximum of 3 minutes. Of course, Potera wouldn't have this weakness as it was a permanent fusion. They could still diffuse with the help of the Dragon Balls though. The evil Bu narrowed his eyes at me warily looking at me as I encased myself fully in Sacred Key. There was no need to keep this Bu alive. Suddenly the mantras in my head started to ring, and they said in an old but jolly voice, This can be your first work in Universe 7 My Disciple. The mantras transformed into different words which entered my consciousness directly. It was a technique to reincarnate an evil person by purifying their sin and sending them in the reincarnation cycle directly. The old voice continued, I have high expectations of you that Lee Sin is a bit hotter-headed, it would take more time for him to mature, but for you at most 10 years would be enough to reach the peak that even I couldn't get to. I immediately started to use the technique that was imparted to me by the voice. I started by doing some strange hand seals at which Bu immediately tried to run away from seeing them. He felt great danger from the hand seals. His senses were very good, unfortunately for him. I activated my supreme Bodhis of Atom mode and slammed my hands that were in the final hand seal directly on his forehead. He started to shout and cry in agony as foul-smelling smoke came out of him. It was dark and gave the feeling of hatred and destruction. After a while no smoke came out of him anymore, and he had a serene look on his face. He seemed enlightened as he started to disintegrate on the spot. He bowed to me as his whole being turned to dust. He was on his way to get reincarnated. The old and jolly voice continued after everything was done. It was way weaker than before it seemed this was its last message. Your job in the universe is to keep the balance between the gods. The Lord of Destruction should only destroy planets with no future, while the Supreme Kais should make a habitable planet and race every 100 years. They can't interfere in mortal affairs unless it's an emergency which could destroy the universe. He continued in a low tone of voice. You are the guardian who balances yin and yang in the universe. You will also have to reincarnate evil souls with high potential. We can't let them stay forever in hell or heaven. The residents of heaven deserve their rest. But if they want to be reincarnated, they can appeal to you. However, 
the residents of hell need to be tortured till all their sin is expunged before you use the technique I taught you on them to reincarnate them. Depending on the sin, it can take even up to 100,000 years. After all of the information was transmitted, a weak sigh resounded in my consciousness, and he said his last words, I'm impressed with you. Even though you aren't from this universe originally, you did a good job. At first you were selfish and uncaring, but you grew a lot. Continue doing what you were doing. Farewell. The voice disappeared and won't be heard of again. Back on the lookout, Vegeta Goku and the Z fighters were eyeing Bu playing with the puppy that Hercule brought. It seemed his violent tendencies were completely gone. The puppy licked Boo's face as he laughed. Kami walked from the lookout's building and said in a loud voice so everyone could hear him. With the help of Krillin and his special key Majin Bu has been cleaned off his evil side. It's similar on how me and Piccolo were. Unlike me and Piccolo however the death of his evil side didn't affect him at all. Even though he is still as strong as before he is pretty harmless now. And he can be taught to differentiate right from wrong. Hercule looked at Bu and how he bonded with the puppy and said, This big guy seems to like our food. I'd like to take him with me and teach him. Everyone looked at each other unsure of what to say. It's true Hercule was pretty strong but still extremely weak compared to the Z fighters. Even Kayatsu could transform him into a meat patty by blowing at him. Bu looked towards Hercule nodded his head and said, Bu likes you? What's your name funny hair man? Hercule puffed up his chest and said, My name's Hercule and if you come with me, and you don't harm anyone else anymore unless they are evil, you can eat food like this whenever you want. Well, those words would put a big dent in his finances. I observed from nearby and decided to finance the food consumption of the Hercule household from now on. They weren't wealthy enough to be able to feed Mage and Bu. Unlike in the original where Hercule was a martial arts legend now he was just a humble instructor at my dojo. I didn't shortchange my employees. The pay was pretty good but it sure as hell wasn't enough to comply with Boo's eating habits. I came back to their view smiled and nodded my head towards Kami and everyone else indicating that it wasn't a bad idea to let Hercule take care of Bu. It was like destiny tied these two. Bu looked towards me and his tiny eyes opened up and narrowed before closing them back up his facial expression with his narrowed eyes wasn't that happy. But it returned to normal, and he came towards me patted me on the shoulder and said in his normal voice, While Bu is happy that part of him is gone, Bu and unhappy that his power is lower, it seemed Bu cared about his power. This wasn't the same Bu as the original since this one had fewer interactions with Hercule, it seemed that I gained a rival. Goku smiled while Vegeta scoffed and left. There was nothing for him here anymore. The earth was safe so he didn't care anymore. Goku looked as Vegeta left and put two fingers on his forehead and waved at us. It seemed he was gonna leave as well. Everyone started to leave from the lookout to go back to their training and activities. I left as well and met with Jaika and Lazuli. Only Kami and Piccolo were left on the lookout. Popo was nowhere in sight. Kami sighed and said in an aged voice, Things become harder and harder for this old body if there was someone else who could take over the Earth's guardian post sigh. Piccolo started to think about something. He narrowed his eyes as Nail's voice started to echo in his head. You can always find a young Namekian who wants to leave. I recommend Den the young man who is Guru's new guardian. I think he should be done with that old man already. Piccolo looked at Kami and told him about Nail's thoughts. But before he could finish, Kami put a hand on Piccolo's shoulders, and he became a blue aura which encased Piccolo. Piccolo clenched his fists as he shouted out loud, What power! I'm great! I feel it! I can do it! Both Kami and Nail started to snicker in his head. Piccolo forgot about the two people in his consciousness and started to blush. Popo appeared out of nowhere and looked around, not spotting Kami at all. He looked at Piccolo with narrowed eyes and threw him off the lookout. It seemed Popo's power level increased by a lot if he could throw away the Super Duper Namekian Piccolo now. His power level was a bit higher even than the Super Scion 3's Popo snorted and said, Now that no one is on the lookout anymore, I can call all the bitches here. Popo got a phone out of nowhere and said, Bitches? It's Big Daddy Popo here, we changing headquarters. 
Popo changed from his genie look into a purple suit and glasses and a fedora. He used his incredibly fast flying carpet to take scantily clad women from around the world and left them at the lookout. When he got everyone on the lookout he said out in a loud voice. Okay bitches here's the thing, my home is free now for some time, and I can increase the profit I make from your asses by using my carpet to fly you to your destination. You will now be milked like cows? Any disagreements? All of the women intoned in a chorus voice. No great daddy Popo. Popo smiled showing his one tooth and said, Great. He picked up his ringing phone and took a blue-haired, scantily clothed young lady and said, Marin, you go to customer 6359. Marin saluted and left. Till Dend made his way to the lookout, strange things would happen on it. Things that children shouldn't hear or see. After Piccolo got off the high of his power level, he remembered that there were no Dragon Balls anymore. It had been quite a few days, so he decided to come to me and tell me about everything. I nodded my head at him. I wasn't sure when Piccolo and Kami would fuse, but it seemed it happened. Whatever I could just get Dent from Namek, right? I teleported to Namek and I could hear Super Kami Guru. You want Tio leave too? You took the oath. Dend looked at Guru with what seemed anger and said, This is the last drop, Super Kami Guru. I have done many things I'm ashamed of under your tyrannical rule. I'm leaving. Dend looked forward and saw me. He immediately ran over and said to me, Let's get the hell out of here. Super Kami Guru seemed like he wanted to get off his chair. I didn't linger around to watch the monstrosity get out and teleported back to Earth. The lookout was full of unwashed panties and cigarette butts. I looked around and thought of what the hell happened here. Popo came faster than lighting, and before I could blink my eyes, everything was spotlessly clean. He coughed a bit in his fist and said, So this is the new Earth's guardian? I will teach him the required skills. Come after me. I left Dend with Popo, hopefully. Dend won't be scarred for life. But I could hear them laughing in chorus behind me and saying that they would make a great team. I also heard something about modifying the dragon and making it be able to grant two wishes. I sighed and left the two to their own devices. Both Ryu and Marin jumped in my embrace the moment I teleported back. I chuckled and played with them a bit, then left towards the training room. My sacred key was already at 53% purity, just 47% left and I would master the mantra. I then could be able to truly take on the title and responsibilities of the Buddha position in Universe 7. There weren't many things left to do, Beerus wasn't going to become a problem as he liked our food too much to destroy Earth, and after I mastered my sacred key fully, I could try to reincarnate the cold family and make them good. So there won't be any resurrection F. The only big problems that were still existing would be Zamasu and the Tournament of Power. I got up from my position of being cross-legged, scratched my head and yawned. Training in high gravity started to lose its efficiency. If I increased the gravity by too much it would take an effect on the environment so I couldn't increase it by too much on Earth or even in the universe. I might create a black hole and damage the universe, I'm not sure how Zeno or the Grand Priest would like that. It was time to unseal the Elder Kai. I let him stay in his sword for a bit more than he should have. I teleported to the Kai's world. Shin and Kibito were surprised at me knowing the coordinates of the world, but remembered how I had God Key as well and said, As a fellow deity, I welcome you in our humble realm Krillin. Would you mind telling us what's your position? Though your key is familiar, I remember feeling it from somewhere, but I'm not sure where from. Kibito didn't interfere in our chat as he wasn't a Kai but an attendant. Even though his position was higher than the normal Kais, he couldn't interfere in other deities' talks. I nodded towards Shin and answered him, I'm supposed to balance your work with the gods of destructions. I should make sure he does his job well while you create planets at least once every few hundred years. Shin started to sweat drop and said, Ah well, you see about that. Since Majin Buu absorbed the other Kais who were more experienced and knew how to create planets, there was no one left to teach me anything. I don't actually know how to create planets thus I can't do my job as a Kai. I sighed as I already knew of this already. 
I changed the topic and asked him, I heard something about a sword that should be around here. Would you mind showing me it? Shin immediately started to smile, feeling awkward at his lack of knowledge. By my words, he realized that I would have to punish him if he continued doing nothing. He started to walk towards the Z-Sword's location and said, Follow me, I can show you the location of the Z-Sword. While I and Kibito aren't able to get it from the stone it's lodged in, you can give it a try. With your immense power, you should be able to drag it out of there. I nodded at Shin and followed him towards the location of the sword. It was up a giant hill a few kilometers away from the initial location where I teleported to. Kibito was following us from behind with a stern look on his face. I flew up the hill directly to the top and easily dragged the sword out of the hill. Both Shin's and Kibito's jaws dropped to the floor seeing how easily I took the sword out. For them, it seemed like it wasn't sealed there at all. Of course, I was already in my supreme bodhisattva mode. The dragon's crystal eyes were sparkling as I flicked a finger on the blade of the sword. It immediately broke in two. They couldn't even their jaws back from the floor when they saw how I destroyed their precious Z-sword with only a flick of the finger. Out of the sword's remains an old Kai with a similar skin color and clothing to Shin appeared. He was wrinkled and wore pataras on his ears like Shin. He also had a small mustache and had an unkempt clump of hair on his head. He started to cough and looked around spotting me, and the Shin he immediately got down the hill and said, You goddamn failure! I was sealed in this sword for tens of thousands of years and none of the other Kais could help me get out. All generations got worse from mine, and now they were absorbed by Majin Bu too, letting only a newbie like you, Sai I guess I have to teach you the basics and everything else. The old Kai looked towards me bowed and said, I was good friends with the previous holder of your deity position. I can see that you still have some potential that has to be unleashed. I can help you with that as a reward from breaking me out of that goddamn sword. Shin looked at the old Kai with an awkward expression not knowing what to say. He could identify the Kai as one of his own kin. His key had the same quality even though it was lower than his. He bowed towards the old Kai and said in a serious tone of voice, I will follow the teacher's instructions. Kibito looked from nearby and bowed as well. He was just an attendant so he would follow whatever instruction the old Kai had for him as well. Old Kai nodded his head and smiled. His smile showed that he lacked tooths in certain spots of his mouth. I knew he looked like this because he fused with a witch, so I declined to comment on his appearance. The other two unknowingly blurted out, Uh, it seems you are really old, teacher slash Supreme Kai. The old Kai immediately started to flare up and shouted at both of them, I look like this because I was tricked into fusing with an old witch. I didn't look like this originally. Kibito and Shin looked at each other and asked simultaneously, How did you fuse unwillingly? Old Kai shook his head and said with an exasperated voice, Those guys didn't even teach you the basics, eh? He pointed towards the pot era earrings of Shin and said, You can fuse with the earrings, the power level increase is extremely high but there's a disadvantage you won't be able to diffuse back again. Shin nodded his head, absorbing the information. I coughed and stopped the old Kai's teaching session. He looked towards me and said, Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Come over here and wait. I can unlock your potential right now. I came down from the hill and approached the elder Kai. He immediately started to do a weird dance as he circled me. I waited and waited and waited some more. After a few weeks of dancing, I could see the old Kai panting his tongue stuck out of his mouth as he said in an exhausted ton of voice and fell down. I can't bring out all of your potential. This is the most I could get out. Shin and Kibito helped the old Kai up, while I clenched my fist as I observed my internal situation with my key sense. My base power level was already a little higher than Gogeta's which was already stronger than Goku in his Super Saiyan 3. I started to power up as the whole sacred world of the Kais started to shake. Old Kai immediately shouted back, Stop or you will destroy the whole world. I swiftly stopped, deciding to keep my key in check and not externalize it. After the activation of my supreme bodhisattva mode, the purity of my key directly increased to 70%.
My eyes glowed as I could feel that my power was getting to unexplainable heights. I still couldn't defeat Beerus, but I was about 35% there. As for Whis and the others not being a battle maniac like Goku, I only needed to be stronger than Beerus to keep him in check and properly do my job as the new Buddha of the Universe 7. I breathed out as I reverted my transformation. Old Kai got up from the ground and said, Well I did everything I could for you regarding the unleash of your potential. To thoroughly master that guy's technique you have to get to his sacred land. I'm not entirely sure of its coordinates though. There you could train and master his technique fully. I waved at the Kais as I left their planet after I left the old Kai looked at Shin and said, Okay, now it's time for you to learn everything I know so I can enjoy my retirement. Shin sweat dropped Kais can retire? I was back on earth as if on cue my children immediately sprang up in my embrace. Both Jaika and Lazuli were waiting for me too they got up from the table they were waiting at and said to me, Krillin it's been some time since we had some family activities. We decided today it's time for some. We let the children pick where they wanted to go. Both of my children looked at me with happy smiles on their faces. They weren't that small anymore. As Marin was eleven and Ryu was nine and a half now. I smiled back at them and said to everyone, Of course, where would you like to go? Both children smiled at each other and said at the same time, Let's visit some other planets. I decided to entertain them since the children were in my arms. I motioned for Lazuli and Jaika to grab my shoulders. I could use instant transmission without putting my fingers on my forehead by now. Combined with my mastery of the spatial elements I learned from fighting Janemba it was easy peasy to teleport wherever I wanted to. I decided to teleport to a random civilization and I appeared into a futuristic city. Tons of people with red skin looked at me with wide eyes as they started to whisper to each other. Out of a nearby big building came out. Wait I knew this guy it was Mutart. I teleported to the planet which I saved from that slug guy. Mutart immediately approached me and said in a loud voice, Our savior came back to visit. Everyone immediately bowed to me. I used my key to bring everyone up. Mutart was actually almost kneeling to me. Lazuli, Marin, and Ryu looked at me with a questioning gaze. Jaika gasped, then said, so this is the planet you saved from back then. I chuckled and asked her. You still remember about that? She nodded her head and smiled at me. Mutart immediately invited us inside the building with fervor. He clapped his hands and tens of servants put up a feast extremely quickly. Mutart bowed again and said, For our savior and his family only the best. Lazuli and Jaika giggled while the children immediately got to the food and started to eat. The servants helped Jaika and Lazuli with their chairs. They did the same thing for me and Tart as well. The children didn't care as they ate the colored food and said simultaneously that the food was extremely good. I ate some of the food myself and I could say they improved the food by quite a lot since last time. Of course, last time the feast was from the remains of the food they scavenged. By now their crops and livestock should have all been replenished. I looked around but I didn't spot Musarka at all. Mutart started the conversation after the meal. You remember my daughter Sarka? She married a nearby kingdom's prince. And now she is even expecting a child. I nodded my head it was normal for things to happen like this, it was just sex. I wasn't emotionally invested in her at all so I didn't really care what happened to her. In Tart's eyes could be seen disappointment. After the feast we toured the planet and it wasn't very different from Earth besides the different cultures, food and the skin color they were pretty much like humans. We bid our farewell towards Tart and teleported back to Earth. We all enjoyed the mini holiday on the planet which I now knew was called Rio Atoa Porit. I let the children go to play while I had some extra special fun with Jaika and Lazuli. Unknowingly, time flew by. There was just one more year before Beerus woke up, and I still didn't purify my key to 100%. I just couldn't find the sacred place where I could finish my training. Maybe it wasn't in Universe 7? I didn't fully explore Universe 6, I needed to go back. First things first I had to go and meet with Whis so he can take me to Universe 6. It would be easy since I almost had a god position now and he still ate food regularly from Earth, there was no reason for him to refuse me. 
It took a while, but Wes came back to Earth after a few months of waiting. He was like always pumped up to eat some new type of food. I decided to wait for him to finish his meal before I approached him again. He eyed me and said, Your progress is quite good Krillin-san. You are almost ready to take on your god position. Unfortunately, you still haven't reached 100% of your key purity. I smiled at Wiss, he could see through me fairly easily, it was obvious how above me he was in power, maybe if I got ultra instinct I might be able to tangle with him, but I'm not sure if I could win. I looked at him and said, could you do me another favor Wiss San? I'm not strong enough to do my work well enough currently. I need to go to Universe 6 to search for the place where the previous Buddha trained. Wiss put a hand to his mouth, laughed then took his staff in his hands. He motioned for me to put a hand on his shoulder so we could leave already. It seemed Wiss would like to see someone put Beerus in his place. I guess he didn't like when Beerus was stepping out of line and doing things that he wasn't supposed to do. Just like before in two hours or so we got to Universe 6, we met again with Vados. But unlike before a fat version of Beerus was groggily cleaning his eyes near Vados. Vados chuckled while the fat Beerus said, Angel of Universe 7, what are you doing with this guy here? Hmm. Wait a little. This guy he has the old man's inheritance. He shook his head after his sleepiness wore off and he continued, Whatever I don't want to let him in the universe. What are you going to do about it? You can't act towards me. Ha 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 ha. I frowned at the fatty's words. I needed to get to the sacred land to complete my training. If he didn't let me and I needed to force my way through. Kampa was the brother of Beerus. There weren't any official comments on who was stronger, but I think Kampa was a tad weaker than Beerus. Vados looked at Kampa and chuckled. Kampa immediately whipped his head back to her and shouted, What are you laughing at Vados? Vados smiled at Kampa and said, Kampa-sama, it seemed you got fatter again. Kampa growled as his pudgy cheeks inflated up. I'm not fatter. I coughed and interrupted their argument, which looked like it would go on for a while. I stopped in front of Kampa and said, What do you want to let me travel in Universe 6? Kampa put a finger under his fat chin and started to think hard. He also started to sweat intensely. It seemed thinking was an exercise for this fatty god of destruction. After a few minutes of no response, Wiss threw me the same type of orb he gave me last time and left, not wanting to wait after Kampa's slow thinking process. After tens of minutes, Kampa finally thought up on what he wanted and said, I want some good food from your universe. I sweat dropped while Vados said with an annoyed tone of voice, It took you 20 minutes to think up of this Kampasama. Did your fat start to get to your brain? I held in my laughter at Vados's comment but Kampa wasn't going to have any of her snarky comments. I stopped the argument again and I decided to just give him some ramen. There was no earth in Universe 6 so he never tasted such a type of food before. After I satisfied the God of Destruction culinary needs, I decided it was time to search for the blessed land left behind by the previous Buddha. I decided to first meet up with Lee Sin and ask if he knew its whereabouts. But the planet where I met him was deserted. No other living being was there anymore. What was left was just the training poles Lee used. I flew up and I could see that the training poles were arranged in such a way they left a hidden message for me that said, Look for the remains of Earth. In its vicinity use your sacred key, and you will find the blessed Buddha kingdom. We will meet there again. I flew up from the planet and tried to find the remains of Earth from what I saw in Dragon Ball Super. Planet Earth was destroyed in Universe 6 so I had to find its remains. I flew around randomly not knowing where to start. I decided to start with a nearby dead planet, but since the message said remains that meant all that remained of Earth were pieces of ground and rock. I couldn't search the whole Universe 6 for some dead pieces of ground. I immediately used my Supreme Bodhisattva mode at its full power and flew at extremely high speeds around the Universe trying to get the signal from the Blessed Buddha Kingdom. I didn't care if any other deity found about me. Kampa already knew while the Supreme Kais won't interfere with my search. I suddenly got a response from some ruins in the south part of Universe 6. There I unleashed my sacred key fully as a giant golden door appeared in the void. It was inscribed with Buddhist chants in Sanskrit. I could read it due to the mantra. 
It said, Live like a Buddha. Keep balance in the twin universes. You found your way so you are worthy. The door opened and absorbed me in. I got up from the ground and all I could see was an endless forest. Everything was back to its cleanest state. The sky was blue and the key concentration in the air was immense. I could feel the air purify my body and key at the same time. Out of the trees appeared Lee. His blindfold was off and his eyes were recovered. He smiled towards me and said, Fellow disciple Krillin, we meet again. The master left something for you. I already got what was supposed to be mine and I'm on my way already. Farewell. He opened the golden door that absorbed me in and left Trophet. No indications, nothing. He just left me alone trying to find my way through this place. Well, what a good fellow disciple he is. I started to navigate the sea of trees trying to find what was supposed to be mine. At the same time, I circulated my key with the help of the mantra, and I could see that my key was getting purified and it wasn't stuck anymore. Maybe I needed to reach 100% key purity before the remaining treasures would reveal themselves to me? I sat cross-legged in the air as I levitated using my key. Golden aura encased my body as I turned the gravity field around me on. The gravity was so high even the reinforced ground of the Buddha kingdom was cracking. But it was repairing itself at high speed as well. I started to circulate my key as its purity started to increase at fast speeds. 72%, 76, 81, 99, Finally 100, my benevolent Buddha stand appeared behind me as it fused with my body. My power level increased by 250 times permanently as the stand fused with my body and ki. The only transformation I had remaining was the supreme bodhisattva mode. I woke up, and I could feel that all my aura was internalized. I wasn't sure how much time I meditated but the gravity which was pushing me when I started to meditate under it was useless again for me. I got down to the ground as I sensed my internal condition. My sacred key purity finally reached 100% as it crystallized. My body changed too, it wasn't like it was before, it had a different feeling which I couldn't truly explain. In front of me appeared a tiny wooden boat and a bead. A voice appeared in my mind which explained the use of the two items. The bead was the Sarira left from the previous Buddha and by using it I could come back to the Buddha kingdom whenever I wanted to. I was currently on the training grounds of the kingdom, so I didn't see all of its benefits. As for the wood boat, it was a special boat that could travel through the boundary of the universes faster than any angel or god could. Well, besides the Grand Priest and Zeno, I took the miniature items and put them in my clothes pocket. They were bound to me and only Zeno could take them away or destroy them. The God of Destruction couldn't use their special destruction key to destroy them or me anymore. I was fully bequeathed the title of Buddha now that I reached 100% key purity. I decided to travel to the middle of the Buddha kingdom before I left. It wasn't anything impressive in visuals. It reminded me of the Oran Temple, but more grand and imposing. Buddha statues were lined before the temple and sticks of incense were burning at the entrance. Nothing too interesting, I decided to light a stick of incense myself. But when I lit the stick of incense, something interesting happened. I could feel that my key was moving faster and better than before, of course, the change was negligible for me as I was already in the realm of gods. Right now I would give myself a 50% to 65% chance to beat Beerus. But others could use this incense to hasten their training speed. I tried to take the incense with me and it worked. There were no restrictions. The thing was there were not many sticks of incense left. So I had to use them smartly. I teleported out of the kingdom and used the boat which enlarged at fast speeds to get to the border of the universe immediately. I decided to break the orb and call Wis I wanted to surprise him with the boat. Wiz came over after a while and gasped when he saw my boat. Oh who it seemed you got the rest of the old man's things. Good job Krillin. I see you don't need my help anymore. Why did you call me? Well I did it so you won't have to worry over me. Also I wanted to see how fast is the boat compared to you. Wiz chuckled and said, A race is it? I smiled towards Wiz and said, If you want it to be. 
was immediately left in a bunch of rainbow key while my boat started to travel at immense speeds. I was neck and neck with him. I used some of my sacred key to power the boat, and it easily took over the first position. I arrived in Universe 7 first, was smiled at me, then left towards the gods of destruction realm. I got back to Earth, and from what I could see my journey to the Buddha Kingdom took me almost one year and a half. This included the training. I met with my children and my wives. Ryu and Marin were growing along nicely from little kids into budding teens. Jaika and Lazuli were as beautiful as ever as I embraced them. After I played with the children and had some fun with my wives, I decided to invite everyone to the lookout. The human Z fighters and the Scions made their way over to the lookout in basically seconds after hearing my voice telepathically. Everyone was way stronger than before. I smiled at them and lit the stick of incense that I got from the kingdom. As they took in the smell, they could feel their ki enliven and purify. They started to gasp and Goku said, Wow, this stuff is quite good for training. Gohan chimed in as well. Yeah, I feel that it's even better than training in the time chamber. Vegeta looked at the stick of incense and was practically salivating inwardly. Raditz and Nappa weren't as interested as they became lazier with time. The human Z fighters liked that they found a way to grow stronger again. It seemed most of them reached a wall, the same could be said about Goku and Vegeta. They couldn't grow any stronger, Gohan Raditz and Nappa were the only ones who could grow stronger with conventional means. Raditz and Nappa because they didn't take their training seriously, and Gohan because he didn't hit the peak of his potential yet. I left them to their training and decided to live as a normal human while training from time to time till another crisis came. But there was no chance of anything else happening after I fully mastered my Supreme Bodice of Atomode, I was 100% sure I could beat Beerus. Peacefully sleeping on his planet, Beerus sneezed. Unknown to me, he also had some things under his sleeve. Frozen in time and space divided, but he has with the universe survived duck dodgers of the 24th and one half century protecting the powerless and the weak duck dodgers he's fighting tyranny in the 24th and one half century. These lyrics could be heard on duck dodgers ship as the pig cadet fumbled his hands on the controller of the ship. Dodgers now way buffer and taller than before came behind him and nodded at him saying, This song is good. This will be my theme song from now on. Be sure to play it every time we save a planet. Dodgers had saved quite a few planets since he started his space journey, and he loved the feeling of being adored by others. He also did his job and spread my teachings. My face appeared on the giant monitor of the ship and asked, How's the situation, Dodgers? Dodgers saluted me and started to debrief. I nodded at his information things were going very well for Universe 7. The average level of the universe was getting higher and higher these days, it would be very helpful as I wasn't sure if I could participate in the Universal Tournament anymore due to my god status. While Beerus Wiss and the Supreme Kais recognized me as a god, I haven't got any notifications from Zeno or the Grand Priest. I was laid in a hammock in the backyard of my house as I communicated with Dodgers using a special device created by Capsule Corporation for Universal Communication. After Dodgers finished his debrief, I gave him some encouraging words combined with some advice on how to get stronger and close the communication channel. I had to check on my other disciples as well, Felix was doing well himself, he started to buff up as he took on the Viking path, he wasn't the scrawny young man from before, he now had a Viking's physique and took a liking to fight with tomahawks and axes. I wasn't proficient in these weapons so I just gave him some advice on normal hand-to-hand -hand combat and asked for his debriefing as well. Rhyme Style was doing well with his instructor job. He even started a YouTube channel where he showed his collection of characters on a mobile game. It seemed most of his pay was going there. As for the others, they gradually grew stronger every day. Vegeta Goku and the other Z fighters with the help of the incense from the Buddha Kingdom were slowly but surely starting to break through the wall that was blocking their advance. My power was also increasing every day as my body was adapting and evolving according to the sacred key. My mind was getting clearer and clearer every day. My psychic bottleneck disappeared as my mind power started to increase again. I also found a few more talented individuals at my dojos. 
One was a purple little dog who seemingly wanted to protect the grandmother who took care of him since he was little. He called himself Courage, and he was a pretty cowardly individual, but he did his best in training himself. A noble goal for a little guy like himself. Some other strong individuals would be a trio of animals, a little brown mouse, a cat with a bluish coat, and a gray bulldog. They weren't humanoid just like Courage, but they could talk and think like humans. The cat and mouse had a rivalry while the dog was just there to train. Then he got entangled with the duo and they became a trio. I gave all of them instructor positions, but they choose to decline. Courage had to protect his grandma, while the trio was uninterested in money. They just came to the dojo to get stronger, plain and simple, nothing else needed. There weren't many talented people that got a power level over 15,000. But these four almost reached 20,000. Most of the people that trained at my dojos reached a power level of 1,000 or so. The average of the planet also increased to half that. The environment started to change as the trees became stronger and some even gained sentience. The animals just like those before reached human levels of intelligence, however, they were a minority. Wiss was observing the happenings on the planet with his key sense as he smiled at Bulma and ate some dessert. He was impressed with the way the planet evolved, he said to himself. Hum Krillin did a good job on Earth. Even though it isn't in his jurisdiction to strengthen a planet and the universe, he is supposed to balance things out. But I'll let this one slide just because the food is so goddamn good here. He started to giggle to himself as he stuffed his face with strawberry ice cream. Beerus was sleeping in his bed. He was snoring so hard his whole realm was shaking when he suddenly started shouting, Super Scion God, I was just don't flick my forehead. Then he just started to sleep like a rock again. There wasn't much time left before he woke up again though. After the feast on earth where he ate till he almost burst he got back to his realm to take a few years nap. He sneezed and a ball of destruction obliterated a nearby wall. Unfortunately, Wiss wasn't currently on the planet to stop the needless destruction. The oracle fish immediately came scampering forward in his bowl sweat dropping at the hole in Beerus' bedchamber. He started to swear under his breath and left. The ball of destruction almost hit him after it went through the wall. Back on Earth, Lazuli Jaika and I were doing some extra special activities while the children were away playing at Capsule Corporation. Trunks was sparring with Goten as Marin and Ryu watched. They both transformed into super science and clashed in mid-air shockwaves appearing around them when suddenly Trunks missed his punch and plowed down to the earth. Ryu giggled at Trunks' mistake, but Trunks got up from the ground and shouted, Stop doing that, Ryu. It's not fun when you stop time and make me miss my attack. Ryu just continued laughing while Marin put a hand to her mouth to stop her giggling. Goten scratched his head and reverted from his Super Scion transformation. Afterward, he said, It's okay, Trunks, we sparred enough, let's eat something. Trunks' grandmother's eyes started to glow red as she heard the mention of food. She quickly appeared out of nowhere with a tray of food cookies and juice. It was unknown how this woman was able to hear so well when mentions of food were made. Goku and Vegeta were sparring on the lookout both in their base forms. They smirked at each other as they met in midair. Controlled shockwaves spread around as the other Z fighters did the same thing. Piccolo was meditating nearby. Popo was behind the lookout backhanding a blue-haired chick who wore skimpy clothing. Bitch this is too little, go get some more Big Daddy Popo isn't protecting at such cheap prices, understand? She got up from the ground and cleaned her face, the red palm mark disappearing directly as she bowed towards Popo and said in a loud tone, but not loud enough for the others to hear. Yes, Big Daddy Popo. Popo nodded at her then slapped her butt and threw her off the lookout. The blue-haired woman started to fly towards a nearby the city to find work. Bulma was doing work on her computer, while Cell was training in a nearby gravity room. Majin Bu was eating at Hercule's home, Videl was stir-frying rice while her mother was cooking sausages and Hercule was chatting with Bu at his request. The dog which Hercule saved was under the table wagging his tail and barking. On Namek, things were peaceful. A little too peaceful in the elder's residence, two red glowing eyes could be seen before they closed themselves. No one was sure what happened on Namek after Dend left. This would be a story that won't be told.
Musarka was sighing a baby was in her rocking arms as he tried to quiet it. She started to sing a lullaby when a man came behind her and took the baby from her arms and said, Darling, go and relax, I will take care of Martok Jr. For now, you did enough. It was the prince which she married, Martok Sr. of the Garbkop Kingdom. She smiled towards Martok and started to walk towards the Imperial Chambers to take a rest. Martok started to rock his kid like Sarka did he even started to sing him a lullaby. It seemed he was a great father and Sarka didn't marry him unwillingly. Back on Earth, Rashi was having the time of his life with a redhead woman in his bedroom. He was in his buff form and did his business at fast speeds that shouldn't be possible at his old age. Being the former master of such a strong and rich disciple had its benefits. This was the fifth woman Rashi courted this week. Poir and Oolong were drinking tea at a tea shop in South City, and they sighed at each other. Poir continued Oolong's thoughts. Yeah, that's right, I miss Yamcha. All he does nowadays is train. After he got beaten by Majin Bu that day, he never stopped training. Life was going well for the Earthlings, but how were things going in large in the whole universe? After the Cold's Empire demise, countless races which were bullied or exterminated had their survivors come to claim hold of their ransacked planets. With the help of the former Planet Trade Organization employees, they got their planets back and started to repopulate. During the repopulation, the grunts that took their planets from them helped them to reconstruct and revitalize their races. After those works were done, they joined the Galactic Patrol to become officers or even captains based on their power. The criminal rating of the universe started to lower more and more as everyone started to enjoy life, even though poverty and discrimination still existed in the universe. Things were going in the right direction. Unfortunately, no godly intervention would stop these two things from popping up. The Cold Empire individuals all responded to my commands via the proxy of Birder and Jaika. Their workloads decreased with time as the Planet Trade Organization members finally all changed their profession. From time to time, Jis would come to visit and play with his nephew. He didn't like the name I gave him, saying that it should have been something more Space Australian, but I decided not to comment on it. Time was going by very quickly, day to day, month to month, year to year. It's been approximately three to four years since Majin Bu was defeated and converted to good. In his realm, Beerus was yawning and scratched his head as he looked at Wiss who was before his bed and was smiling at him. Beerus got up from the bed and told Wiss in a sleepy voice, Wiss let's get to Earth. There is one more guy I had a dream about this time. Wiss looked at Beerus with curious eyes and said, Besides Krillin, there's someone else you would dream of, Lord Beerus? Beerus nodded and said to Wiss in sleepy tone, Yeah. I think it was a super god something? Super scion something, oh yes, super scion god. Wiss bumped his staff on the ground as images projected above it. Does the scion god resemble one of those in the images? The images showed Raditz, Nappa, Goku, and Vegeta. Beerus' eyes widened as he took a good look at all of them, and he muttered, No, actually, none of them resemble the one I saw. Wiss nodded his head and the projection changed again. Now it showed Gohan and Beerus nodded with a thoughtful look in his eyes. The projection was of Gohan and Videl. Videl was massaging her stomach and smiling towards Gohan. Gohan didn't wear glasses as he did in the original Super. He was also buffer and had a serious aura. He was way stronger than before, and he was starting to catch up and even go beyond Goku's and Vegeta's power levels, unknown to them. I took him secretly to visit Elder Kai so he could get his potential unlocked. Beerus's gaze turned sharp as he observed Gohan more clearly and his sleepiness wore off. He flew over to the hot spring of the planet, took a quick bath, and wore his God of Destruction clothes as he intoned to Wiss. First we get to Earth, eat something then after that, we have to see about this new Super Scion God. Also let's check on the new Buddha guy. With staff clashed against the ground as a multicolored barrier of key encased both of them as they started to travel towards Earth. Things were peaceful for such a long time, but they would start to get more interesting from now on. Beerus yawned as he kept his hand on Wiss's shoulder and waited for them to arrive at Earth. He struck a conversation to pass the time. Wiss, 
Do you think that guy who I dreamed about is a super scion god? Was mused to himself and responded. That person is Son Goku's son and his power and potential are very high. But he didn't touch the realm of gods. His father and Vegeta are approaching the realm of gods. But without a good teacher, it will take them a long while to reach it by themselves. Beerus nodded at Wissa's explanation as they traveled in the void. After a while, they approached Earth and entered its atmosphere immediately appearing at Bulma's birthday party. Wiss looked around and spotted tons of food which he tried and also didn't try before, so he got to work. Beerus followed him. Bulma didn't comment on their arrival. Wiss already informed her of this beforehand, but she didn't know Beerus came to the party with other intentions. Beerus clashed with Majin Buu on the topic of pudding, and he was ready to obliterate the Majin even though he grew stronger than the last time he fought he wasn't on the level of Beerus yet. Even though he cared about training and power, he thought he was strong enough after training for like a few minutes. Majin Buu's potential was very high, but his mentality held him back. I approached Beerus and patted him on the shoulder he looked at me and narrowed his eyes then widened them. You! It seems you are filling that guy's role nicely, whatever I'm sure you won't need to do your job, at least with me, I won't destroy planets for no good reasons. Was coughed behind Beerus, but Beerus just chuckled and sweat dropped at the cough. Beerus wasn't intimidated by my power, but by my status as the new Buddha. If the Buddha of the universe couldn't hold the god of destruction back, he could report him to the Grand Priest and Zeno. After the dispute over pudding was over, Beerus got up from his chair and walked towards Gohan. Gohan looked at Beerus and asked, Lord Beerus-sama, what do I owe the honors? Gohan, like always, was very polite. Beerus smirked at Gohan, showing his teeth fully and said, I can feel your power, kid. Let's fight. Gohan shook his head, but he couldn't really decline Beerus as it would be impolite of him, and it would also anger the destroyer, he looked towards me and I nodded at him indicating that he can fight Beerus and I would interfere if things have gone too much out of hand. Beerus waited for Gohan to take the first action. The unlocking of potential didn't stop the Super Scion transformations. It just brought his base power level so high he didn't need to transform to deal with Super Bu in the original. Right now he got his potential unlocked and had to fight with Beerus so he couldn't hold anything back against him. He started to power up as he transformed into a Super Scion 1 then 2 and after a while, he transformed directly into 3. His power level was off the charts but Beerus didn't look that impressed. His eyes glinted with interest, but it was doused off the moment Gohan stopped transforming. Beerus continued to look at Gohan and said with a bored tone, Is this all you got? You don't resemble the Super Scion God I dreamt about at all. Gohan didn't know what to say at Beerus' words, so he just reverted to his normal form. Beerus was extremely disappointed in Gohan's lack of power. He yawned again and was ready to go back to eat, but Goku came out of nowhere with Vegeta in tow and said, What about us, Lord Beerus? The two fighting maniacs were ready to take Beerus on. Beerus squinted at both of them and waved his hand as he would do at some annoying flies. I saw your faces in my dream, but I didn't fight you whatever I ate, and I need to exercise a bit, give your best, and I'll make sure I won't beat you too hard. Goku and Vegeta immediately powered up to their Super Saiyan 3 form and attacked at the same time. It seemed since their last fusion they took a liking in fighting in tandem. I wonder how did Vegeta put his pride down to fight alongside Goku. Beerus blocked all of their attacks with his palm or diverted them, he looked bored as he put his other hand towards his mouth and yawned. He flicked both of their foreheads, and they plummeted down like two sacks of potatoes. They both clutched their foreheads as they reverted to their normal form. Yamchu threw both of them a senzubin each. Beerus was ready to get back to his table, but Goku and Vegeta stopped him again. Well, it was more Goku than Vegeta. Beerus-sama, we still have something to show you. Beerus looked at them and narrowed his eyes at both of them. He was getting bored with them, but he allowed them one more chance. Well, I still didn't finish digesting all the food. Okay, show me your last trick. Goku immediately dragged Vegeta to him, but Vegeta shook his head with a red face and told him, Kakarot, there is no threat to our planet. 
You can't make me do that stupid dance. But Vegeta, if we can last enough fighting him, we might be able to make a breakthrough. You know, we can't do it by ourselves. Even when fighting him at the same time, we get the same experience when fused. Just think about it. Vegeta closed his eyes in thought as Beerus continued yawning. Even though his sleepiness wore off, he was bored. Vegeta opened his eyes and entered the dancing stance. Goku grinned at him and entered the same stance. Both of them touched their fingers at the same time as they became one entity. Beerus looked at them with interest, their power level was extremely high now, and that was just their base forms, they might even make him even exert himself to 15% of his true power if they went all out. Gogeta smirked at Beerus and fully powered to Super Saiyan 3, they had only 3 minutes in this form, so Gogeta immediately used instant transmission to appear in front of Beerus. Beerus was caught off guard, got smacked in the face by Gogeta's fist. A red mark appeared on his nose as Beerus attacked back with an angry look on his face. They both started to punch each other at speeds only me Gohan and Whis could see. Gohan widened his eyes as he observed the fight. He knew he couldn't do anything in this fight even if he fought with 200% of all his power. After the three minutes were up they defused and fallen back on the deck. They were both panting and Beerus was annoyed at their state. He was just getting heated up for a fight. Beerus looked at them and shook his head afterward. Seems my dream was wrong. There's no Super Saiyan God. Maybe not yet. He took another glance at Gohan and was ready to leave with Whis. Bulma already packed some food for both of them. I coughed to attract everyone's attention and said, I know of a way one of the Saiyans here can achieve the Super Saiyan God form. Beerus widened his eyes while the Scions started to gather around me. I made them gather around each other and hold each other's hands. With the combination of Raditz and Nappa, there were enough Scions to perform the Super Scion God ritual. All was left was to decide who would become God. Vegeta, of course, wanted to become a Super Scion God, but Goku interjected and said, Beerus-sama did go after Gohan first. Let's try to make him a god, he also has the highest potential out of all of us. Vegeta scoffed but didn't deny the claim about potential. He nodded his head after some time but said afterward, Next time I will be the one who gets to become a Super Saiyan God. Goku laughed and said, It's okay Vegeta if there's the occasion you can get the next opportunity. All the Saiyans gathered around Gohan and I started to instruct them, Pour out your heart into him. Not your key otherwise he won't achieve the transformation. All of them closed their eyes as they started to try and make Gohan a Super Saiyan God. Unfortunately, their first try was a failure, they could only pour their key into him, even though he became way stronger than before, even a bit more than Gogeta. Beerus just shook his head, indicating that it wasn't what he wanted. The second try was a failure too. They didn't grasp the concept of heart, but like always the third try was the charm, Gohan's fiery red aura and hair attracted Beerus' attention. He nodded to himself and said, This is more like it. This is genuine God key. He approached Gohan, but Gohan didn't look at Beerus. He clenched his fists and unclenched them. He did some katas too before looking at Beerus. Gohan smiled at Beerus and said, Beerus-sama, let's not fight on the planet. We might damage it. Beerus nodded his head. He could feel Gohan was adapting to the God Key at alarming rates. They both started to fly out of the planet's range, I continued to watch them along with Whis. I was ready to interfere should the universe be in danger. Goku and Vegeta strained themselves to try and observe the fight as well. Up above the planet in the galaxy Gohan and Beerus already started clashing. The shockwaves were immense but fortunately, they weren't near any habited planets or otherwise all of them would be destroyed and their population killed. Gohan dodged a key infused claw from Beerus and threw a right hook at Beerus's head. Beerus blocked it with his palm and hit him in the chest with his other hand. Gohan's back exploded as a hole appeared in his GI. He coughed a bit of saliva, but it didn't affect his fighting ability at all. He was still adapting to the change in key. He would sometimes underestimate his power and hit Beerus when he thought he wouldn't sometimes he would overestimate it. 
but he grew stronger at extremely high speeds. Beerus was amazed at Gohan's potential, and he praised him. You are the second most talented guy I ever met in my life. Gohan chuckled and answered. You are overpraising me, Beerus-sama. Beerus shook his head and continued. Whatever now that we are warmed up, let's get a bit more serious. Gohan's eyes hardened, and he nodded. They both clashed their fists in an attempt to overpower each other. A giant shockwave started to be felt through the whole universe. It was the clash of fists that could destroy the whole universe if it wasn't contained. The Supreme Kais were alerted, but they couldn't do much. Old Kai telepathically contacted Gohan to tell him to stop, but Gohan didn't listen. I appeared nearby their fight and contained the shockwave using a Buddhist technique that stopped all the shockwaves from spreading further. The shockwaves were then extinguished in my hands. I didn't activate my supreme bodhisattva mode as it wasn't needed. I could fight Beerus as Gohan did now without it. If I activated I'm sure Beerus would have to get serious. Right now, Beerus was still playing around. Beerus and Gohan fought back and forth as the shockwaves didn't threaten the existence of the universe anymore. Gohan hit a wall after a while. He couldn't increase his power anymore. It was the peak of the Super Saiyan God. Beerus shook his head. In his dream, the Super Saiyan God flicked him on his forehead and it hurt quite a lot. This wasn't the full potential of Gohan. He attacked him at higher intervals and started to overwhelm him. Gohan gritted his teeth and started to fight back, but Beerus just dodged everything easily. Gohan couldn't do anything else but tank the attacks. After a continuous beating of a few minutes, Gohan's scarlet red aura and hair were gone. He was in his normal Super Saiyan form as he continued to fight Beerus unknowing of his lack of God Key. Beerus sighed at Gohan's potential. His body remembered the feeling of God Key and attempted to keep his power at the same level. But this state couldn't remain for a long while. After a few more minutes, Gohan coughed out blood as his normal Super Saiyan transformation faded as well. Beerus stopped fighting him and his aura returned to normal. He was content with the fight. Even though it didn't make him exert himself fully, he did digest almost all the food. I took Gohan away from Beerus and fed him a senzu bean. Gohan was still conscious, so he swallowed the bean immediately. He coughed a bit and got up. We were already back on Earth. The Z fighters looked at Gohan and then at Beerus, Goku and Vegeta already knew the results so they didn't comment on it. Beerus walked towards Whis and told Gohan, Good fight kid. Your potential is amazing. Can't wait to fight you again someday. They both left in a multicolored key aura. Gohan got back to Videl's table and sat down. Everyone else got to him and started to ask him about the fight. Gohan explained to his best ability on how things worked out, and I chimed in from time to time as well. After the explanations, Videl got up and said, Guys, I have an announcement to tell all of you. Everyone looked towards Videl with curious eyes. Videl coughed and blushed as all the eyes from the party were looking at her. I'm pregnant. Hercule started to dance around at these words and said how he will be a grandfather. Goku was pretty happy himself. Vegeta scoffed while Bulma, Lazuli, Jaika, and Chi Chi congratulated Videl. Gohan already knew, so he didn't say much. After Bulma's birthday party was over, everyone got back to their own homes. But Goku and Vegeta had other things on their mind. As soon as Wis came to get some more food, both Goku and Vegeta implored him to train them. After some persuading and food, Vegeta got him some new food he didn't try before and Goku gave him some food he cultivated himself at home. Wis took them under his mantle and left with them towards Beerus's planet slash realm. Beerus was taking a nap when they arrived. At first, they would have to do chores around the planet before Wis would start their true training. By the time a day ended they would be exhausted. But the combination of environment and hard training which made them do start to unearth their potential again and break the walls they reached again. With the extra help of some of the incense they got from the lookout it made their training even smoother. I was on earth meditating as my supreme bodhisattva mode was on. 
My body had fully adapted to the sacred key and the transformation started to drain less and less to the point it was almost negligible. My power also didn't increase as fast anymore. At this level the only thing that could make me even stronger was Ultra Instinct. But from the information I found in the mantra, I realized I couldn't learn Ultra Instinct. But there was a different mode I could learn that was comparable to Ultra Instinct. It took the Supreme Bodhisattva mode to the next level. It was called Enlightened Buddha Instinct. The contents were similar to Ultra Instinct, but instead of it being able to attack and defend without thinking, to attain the Buddha Instinct it was required to sever the seven emotions and six desires to attain enlightenment of oneself. Just like how Buddha attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. This wasn't going to be something easy for me to do, though. To attain complete emptiness of one's emotions, it wasn't humanly possible. I'm not sure if I could attain the enlightened Buddha instinct, but Buddha left many doors open if one closed itself another one would open. Maybe there was a variant of the Buddha instinct which I could learn. I tried to find some more information through the mantras, but all it said was that if I couldn't follow the original Buddha's path, I had to create a new one myself. So that meant I had to create a technique comparable to Ultra Instinct by myself. After Beerus's and Gohan's fight and the departure of the two science things were peaceful on Earth, I dedicated all of my attention on trying to make a technique similar to the Ultra Instinct, but it was very hard. The Ultra Instinct was supposedly created by the great priest then taught to all of his children who in turn taught the gods of destruction. It was unknown how strong the Grand Priest was, but speculations were that even if all of his children fought him at the same time, he still wouldn't have to get serious. The only one who could destroy the Grand Priest was Zeno himself. Lazuli entered my chamber as I stopped training in gravity. My body was nearing the limits of strengthening. My key could still be improved though. Lazuli approached me, laid down near me, and said, Krillin, shouldn't we have some more family fun? It's been quite a while since the last vacation. The children want to travel some more. I nodded at her and got up from the ground. She was right. It's been quite a while since the last family holiday. I got everyone's attention inside the house and started talking. On Lazuli's notice, I realized that it's been quite a while since our last family holiday. So I decided to ask you all, where do you want to go now? Jaika immediately piped up saying, we should visit Space Australia. Ryu should know of his roots. She continued. Also, let's invite Jis too. I bet he misses home a bit. I nodded towards her and asked the others. What's your opinion on Jaika's suggestion? Lazuli shook her head and indicated there was no problem. The children were pondering. But Ryu immediately shouted after a while of thinking. Let's go to Space Australia. He had a goofy grin on his face. Marin shook her head and responded as well. Whatever if Lil Bro wants to go to Space Australia, we can go, I guess. Jaika contacted Jis, and he flew as fast as he could to my home. I teleported all of us to Space Australia and took we started taking in the sights. Besides the more advanced civilization things were also quite different in Space Australia. There were mutant spiders 10 meters tall as well as giant blue kangaroos who weren't that friendly. Of course, they couldn't do anything to us. Jis showed his strength to his nephew only for him to be shut down by Ryu doing the same thing. Jis then realized he was weaker than his nephew, and his mood spiraled down. I took in Space Australia's sights as I flew with my family around the whole planet. We would set up a picnic on the arid plains or the top of mountains. Afterward, we would all play with the children for a while. After two days of fun in Space Australia, we got back to Earth. Holidays were good from time to time to let me relax my mind and body. Being always tense wasn't good for training or to increase your power. I got back to trying to create a technique similar to Ultra Instinct. The Buddha Enlightened Instinct was similar to Ultra Instinct, but it severed the seven emotions and six desires. I didn't want to sever my emotions, so I couldn't train in it. However, what if instead of severing them, I would enhance them? I remembered how I didn't use the other faces of the benevolent Buddha stand, and I only used the benevolent state. I started to recreate my Buddha stand, but now instead of only influencing my emotions, I also tried to make it enhance them. It was something that I could work with. 
I decided to rename the stand to Three Emotion Strengthening. Just like the previous Buddha stand a Buddha would appear behind my back but now my face and emotions would be influenced by the face that I would use. Combined with my fully purified sacred key I could guess it would be kind of similar with the enlightened Buddha instinct. I tried it out since in theory it seemed feasible I had three modes the wrath mode, the peaceful mode, and the benevolent mode. The wrath mode gave me the highest power boost at the disadvantage of becoming extremely wrathful. Every one of my enemies would lie dead before me and I could attack allies too. Not a good technique for team fights. The peaceful state cleared my emotions temporarily and gave me extreme defensive capabilities, on par with ultra instincts, well in theory. As for the benevolent mode it's supposed to combine the defensive capabilities of the peaceful mode and the power of the wrathful mode to gain a balanced state however, the power would be lower and the defense also lower compared to the full modes of wrath and peace. However, the wrath mode forsakes defense for strength and peace was the reverse. The benevolent combined both of them reaching a perfect balance. To reach this mode I needed to use the Supreme Bodhisattva mode first then stimulate these emotions to the maximum. Stimulating wrath and peacefulness were easy but combining them and balancing them was another thing. I also fully failed to enter the mode and get the power I wanted however, I was on the right path. I left the training room and decided it was time to go to hell and cleanse the sins of the cold family. I needed some more competent students who I could create the Buddha guard with. I teleported to hell and followed the cold's family special key signature. They were in a different realm where they were cocooned and made to listen to happy songs of friendship and peace. They were all going ape shit at the songs, however. They would have killed all the little critters and birds who were singing if they were free. Little bits of red sin were flowing out of their foreheads as it was cleansed at a very slow pace. While the methods of hell were good, they were very slow. I started to do some special hand seals as I activated my supreme bodhisattva mode. My hands started to glow with a gold-white aura as I finished my hand seals. I aimed the aura at the three cold family members. They started to shout in pain as their sin was forcefully purified. After what seemed like hours of screaming from the cold trio they finally stopped. I started to do some other hand seals and I put my palm on their foreheads. They disappeared from the cocoons as I tracked their key in the universe. I sped up the process of sin purification and reincarnation. I started to track them in the universe as they reincarnated. I spotted a star that gave birth to a lizard-like being with purple gems on his chest knees and his elbows. He was also very small. It was Baby Frisia. On the other parts of the universe, Baby, King Cold and Baby Cooler were born at similar times. I teleported to all of their locations and grabbed them. Their memories were removed during the reincarnation process so were their evil natures. Now they could be shaped into model citizens of the galaxy. I smiled at them as they started to giggle as babies would. I taught them how to talk and walk and in a few minutes they already learned everything. The growth ability of the cold race was extremely good. In a few days they started to use energy on their own as their bodies grew at extremely fast speeds. The cold race could live to hundreds of thousands of years. Frisia was a brat at some hundreds of years old, while the other two family members' age was unidentified. Frisia, cold and cooler, bowed to me as they said in unison, Master! I nodded at them and imparted some special frost demon techniques to them. They would learn it themselves as they grew up. It was an innate talent of theirs, but learning the techniques earlier wouldn't hurt them. After a few more months, they all grew up to their full height and their power levels stabilized. Of course, since they trained, their power levels were already higher than when they were evil. Of course, Frisia's power level was the highest. He didn't lose any of his previous talents. He was already trying to comprehend how to transform into his golden form. I gave them special instructions to protect the earth and the universe, and left them to travel the universe and learn on their own. I made sure to put some marks on them so I knew whatever they would do. Even though their sins were cleansed and memories gone, the frost demons had a little tendency for destruction, evil, and chaos. 
I, of course, taught them some Buddhist techniques which they could chant whenever they would feel these urges in them. After mastering the techniques, these emotions would forever disappear from their psyches. On the borders of the universes, Six and Seven Kampa and Beerus were arguing over something. Vedos and Wis looked at the pair of brothers and shook their heads at the same time while sighing. The brothers were arguing which of the universes had better food. Kampa won the last time they argued over this topic. And now it was Beerus's turn to win because he got his hands on Earth's food. Kampa started to whine and asked Vedos if Earth existed in their universe. But Vedos responded with, Yes, the planet called Earth indeed existed in our universe. But it was destroyed during an internal planetary war. Kampa started to sulk, but Beerus hit the table they were both situated at and growled at Kampa. I know you have been snooping around my universe in search of something. Spit it out, you fat bastard. You know that other gods of destruction aren't supposed to visit the other universes without permission. Kampa started to sweat intensely, but he didn't hold anything from Beerus. I found these giant balls in my universe and with some information and the help of Vedos I realized that they could grant wishes if seven of them are gathered. But the thing is the dragon balls are shared between universes. Beerus was ready to throw himself at Kampa, but Wiss held him back. Beerus stopped struggling against Wiss's hold and said to Kampa, You bastard! You wanted these balls for yourself? If they are shared between the universes, I want to get a wish myself. Kampa stuck his tongue out and made faces at Beerus, but Vedos hit him over the head with her staff and said, Stop making faces like that, Lord Kampa, or your face will remain stuck like that. Kampa nursed the bruise that appeared on his head, and he wanted to make faces at Vedos too. But he stopped at the thought of being hit on the head again. Beerus wanted to fight for the ownership of the Dragon Balls, but was intervened and said, Remember the last time you fought? You both ended up in a draw and half of the universe you fought in was destroyed. If not for my and Vedo's interference, both of you would have been heavily punished by the Grand Priest and Xenosama. They both started to grumble, but Beerus's eyes started to shine as an idea came to his mind. He remembered Gohan and the two others that started to train on his planet. There were quite a few strong mortals in Universe 7. Beerus told Kampa, Yo, Kampa, we can't fight, but what if the mortals from our universes fought in a tournament? The team with better mortals get the balls, what you think? Kampa was pondering over those words and after a while nodded his head and said, Of course, my universe is better than yours anyway. Just you wait, I already have all of the balls. After I win the tournament, I will just use them. Ha ha ha. Beerus left with Wiss with an annoyed look on his face. But the annoying look turned into a toothy smile. He could almost feel the super dragon balls in his claws. He was certain in his victory, with the potential of Gohan Goku and Vegeta, he was sure of his win in the upcoming Universal Tournament. Kampa grumbled under his breath as he and Vedos had to personally go to the strongest people in Universe 6 to hire them. Kampa was lazy by nature, so he didn't want to travel in the different parts of the universe even though he practically didn't do anything because Vedos was the one who flew them over. Vedos flew them over to different planets including Planet Sadala, just like in the anime, Kaba was recruited. On a yellow planet made of gum properties, a yellow bear wearing a red top and boots agreed to the destroyer's request. On a planet made of metal and granite, where scalding red-hot magma was running around the edges of the ground, was where another fighter for the Universe 6 team was recruited. On a futuristic-looking planet in a business meeting room stood a guy that looked similar to Frisia, but his skin and gem-like embeddings around his body were deep blue and a lighter shade of blue instead. He hummed a little song as he was looking at a report of a planet's rebellion being quelled. Vedos and Kampa appeared directly in front of him and said, You are Frost, right? I need you for something. Frost was very surprised at the uninvited guests, but he acted cordially with a smile on his face. With what might I help these guests? Kampa put a no-nonsense face on and started to exhibit some key. I need you to fight for me in an interuniversal tournament, of course. There will be rewards if we win. 
Frost was shaking and sweating as he felt the destroyer's power. His power level wasn't much higher than Frisia's compared to Kampa who was only a hair weaker than Beerus, the difference was enormous. Frost smiled at Kampa and agreed immediately he was going to get rewarded if he won anyway. So he wasn't losing anything. After the duo left, Frost's smile turned into a frown. He had no time for such trivial things as he was still trying to conquer the universe through his charitable acts. On an unknown planet, a purple-skinned humanoid who wore a light purplish armor on his body was meditating. Kampa and Vados appeared before him, but before Kampa could say anything, the humanoid opened his red eyes and looked at both of them. What do I owe the honors of being visited by the great Lord of Destruction himself? Kampa huffed and said, I need to hire you for some work hit. Hit nodded and said, The pay will be according to the difficulty, as you know how I work. Vados didn't let Kampa continue the conversation and interjected. This time it's not an assassination job. We need you to fight in an interuniversal tournament in which killing is not allowed. You are one of the strongest mortals in this universe, even if we exclude your killing techniques which are your main ones. Hit kept a stoic face as he said after he heard everything. The price won't be small then. I will tell you what I want after we get to the tournament. Though, as I'm not decided yet. Hit was a hired gun. As long as the price was right, he would do what he was instructed. Kampa and Vados left. They had to start constructing the tournament stage on the borders of the two universes. Back in Universe 7, Wiss and Beerus directly made their way to Earth with Goku and Vegeta in tow. Goku was excited openly at the promise of a tournament where he could fight strong guys. Vegeta was stoic on the surface, but inside he was boiling with excitement as well. All of them arrived at Earth and made their way towards Capsule Corporation, where they invited all the strong fighters on Earth. Universe 7 strongest fighters were all located on Earth so there was no reason for Beerus and Wiss to go search the universe. Beerus looked at the Scions and human Z-Fighters, he was sure he wanted Goku Vegeta and Gohan in his team, that left two spots open though. Both him and Kampa made all the rules which weren't that many. No weapons, no healing items, no killing, being out of bounds also means you lost the match. Simple rules, just like the Tenkechi Budokai ones. The trio of Scions were put to stay behind Beerus and Wiss. There were still a few days till the tournament would start, so they had enough time to choose who else was going to fight. Beerus continued to observe everyone and then said to Wiss, Wiss, who else do you think is better to fill up the rest of the team? Wiss hummed and put a finger under his chin and thought about it before saying, Well, Majin Buu could be the fourth fighter for sure, but he isn't here. Maybe get him here and see if he wants to come. I couldn't join the interuniversal tournament due to me having a god position unless instructed to. Gods couldn't fight other gods unless there were serious reasons. Bu, however, was already on his way to Capsule Corporation, but he stopped at a hot dog stand to eat some hot dog after the stand ran out of hot dog he was asked to pay. But he had no money. After some shenanigans including a paid street fight, Bu paid the money he owed to the vendor and was back on his way towards Capsule Corporation. Yamcha was instructed to go and get him, but he came minutes later with Bu ahead of him. Yamcha smiled, sheepishly scratched the back of his neck and said, Well, this guy was on his way here already, but he got sidetracked, we met nearby, and he took the lead. Even though Yamcha trained with everything he got, he still couldn't rival Bu at all. After the beating he took from Beerus Bu trained some more, and now I could feel he was just a tiny bit weaker than Gohan in his Super Saiyan God form. Of course, from what I could feel both Goku and Vegeta attained the higher forms already, however they still weren't a match for me, maybe if they fused I could have a good fight, they could even fight Beerus for some time when they fused. Now there were four people in the team, Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, and Bu. Bu said he wanted to fight strong guys too. And he also said that he wanted to be rewarded with food if he wins. Easy enough, the Scions just wanted to fight stronger opponents so they had no wishes. The objective of the tournament was already explained but not everyone cared about the Super Dragon Balls that much. I was also not interested that much in them. 
I already had everything else that I needed, a family, strength high enough to protect everyone, and I already made the universe mortal level higher than before. Unknown to me, it was still a hair away too little of being exempt from the Tournament of Power. I was also invited to the tournament between Universe 6 and 7, but to be a referee and not as a fighter. The last fighter wasn't a surprise, it was Piccolo. Piccolo was the strongest out of all of the other Z fighters after his fusion with Kami, his potential exploded and his strength increased at high speeds. Even though he wasn't at a god's level, yet he was starting to approach that level. It also seemed he trained with Gohan from time to time. Beerus smirked at his team composition, with how strong these guys were he thought that he would surely win the tournament and get the Dragon Balls for himself. Kampa was laughing as he thought the same thing back at the arena that was starting to get constructed by Vados. Wiss took a strange cube out of his staff and made all of us board it, he started to channel his key into it, and it took into the universe at high speeds. After an hour of travel, we reached an uninhabited planet and it was obvious how bare it was since you could see the stage created by Vados from space. Around the planet were seven other planetary-sized orbs with stars in them, the Super Dragon Balls. We were taken to the stage first to make sure that Kampa didn't do anything underhanded. That's what Beerus said. I wasn't sure why he needed for all of us to be here though. Maybe he just wanted to show off his team's strength? Kampa looked around at us and scoffed he didn't think that our team could beat his, of course. All of the participants' power levels were lowered so that it could make the enemy let their guard down. This was Gohan's plan, which everyone surprisingly followed for some reason. Even Vegeta and Goku didn't care about such things. After making sure everything was alright, Wiss helped with the construction of the stage and after a few tens of minutes everything was done. The stage wasn't that different compared to the world's tournament, only the materials were different even though they looked similar. I tried to puncture the stage with my finger, but it held pretty well against my power even considering that I didn't use my supreme bodhisattva mode it was still pretty impressive. We made our way back to Earth and I enjoyed some quality time with my family while also trying to train in the three emotions enhancement technique. I could use the wrath mode and peaceful mode after a few tries, but it drained heavily on my energy every time I failed to enter the states. Combining them was even harder. Back on Beerus's planet Goku and Vegeta were sparring in their Super Saiyan Blue mode after a while both of them stopped in mid-air and closed their eyes. Their blue auras started to disappear as it got internalized. Both of them gasped afterward and fell from the sky. They were on their way to Master Super Saiyan Blue. Whist scared and shook his head. Both of them already wore their super outfits. Vegeta wore his gray armor, while Goku wore his GI. Both of them had the signature of Whis on them. Beerus was yawning, laying on a chair and eating a cheesy pizza. Piccolo was sparring with Gohan in a wasteland on Earth while Bu was doing some shadow sparring with Hercule. Kampa was already gathering all of his fighters as well. Hit's eyes started to glow as he saw the cube that was supposed to take them to the tournament location. He told Vados directly, I want this cube as my payment. Vados looked at Hit but didn't comment, there was also a bunch of gold and other things in the cube, those were the rewards for the others. The tournament was a few hours away from starting, so we all were already on our way towards the barren planet. There we met directly with the opponents that the others had to fight. Vegeta scoffed at Badamo and Magetta seemingly thinking they were easy pickings, but his eyes narrowed as he saw Kaba. There was something about him that felt familiar to Vegeta. Kampa started shouting, Okay now that everyone's here how will the fights go? Beerus put his hands on his ears and grumbled, too loud, you fool. You don't have to shout. We can all hear you well enough. Kampa started to blush and toned his voice down by a bit. Okay. So how will the fights go on then? Since I was the referee, I decided to make them lot based just like the world's tournament. I got up from the stands and got to the middle of the stage. Out of the stands of Universe 6 jumped out none other than my fellow disciple Lee Sin. He smiled and bowed towards me, which I reciprocated. It seemed Universe 6 got themselves a referee as well. I told all of them in a clear tone, I think drawing lots should be the best way to arrange fights. Lee didn't interrupt me, but he said afterward, 
Lots or just making them fight randomly. There's no difference. Let's just pair them up already. He was right, but I still insisted on drawing lots. He put his hands up and shook his head. He wasn't going to fight me on such a trivial thing. After the lots were drawn, the fights were as following. Badamo versus Piccolo. Bu versus Frost. Goku versus Kaba Hit versus Vegeta and Gohan versus Magetta. Goku smiled towards Kaba while Badamo and Piccolo had an eye confrontation. Bu was ignoring Frost and Vegeta looked at Hit with a superior gaze. Gohan was mumbling something under his breath and analyzing the Iron Golem Magetta. After the fights were decided now, it was time to see who would fight first. After another lot of drawing, the fights were as follows. Bu versus Frost first, Goku versus Kaba second, Hit versus Vegeta third, Badamo versus Piccolo fourth, fifth, and last was Magetta versus Gohan. Afterward, the winners of those fights will challenge each other and after everyone from one universe was eliminated, that universe would win. This was a condition made by Kampa. He realized that this way he could increase his chance of winning by betting everything on hit. I stood in the middle of the stage and started counting. 10, 9, 1 start. Bu and Frost met in midair as I flew up from the stage letting them go at it. Lee was just behind me listening to the fight with interest. Frost and Bu punched each other in the face, but Bu didn't flinch at all while Frost shot over almost getting thrown out of the fighting stage. He balanced himself just a few meters away from being blown out of the stage. He coughed a bit of saliva and started to shout as he powered up. He realized from the first instance that he was overpowered by Bu so he skipped straight to his final form. He looked exactly like Frisia with a different color scheme. He launched himself at Bu, but Bu laughed and enlarged his gloved fist. Frost's eyes widened as the gloved fist approached him. He crossed his arms in an X position and let the fist hit him. This was a really bad decision of him as the fist broke his guard easily and hit him in the chest throwing him out from the stage directly. The fight wasn't interesting at all. Li yawned as he listened to the fight. Frost couldn't do anything to Bu at all, it was a joke of a fight actually. Bu was already just a little below Super Saiyan God level and Frost couldn't even handle a normal Super Saiyan properly. Kampa scoffed as he glared at Frost who was in a really poor state. Then his sharp eyes looked at Kaba, and he growled at him. If you don't win the next fight you won't have an easy time in the universe. Vados hit him over the head with her staff and said, Don't bring down the fighter's morale Kampasama. Also even if they lost you know you still can't do anything to them. Kaba's sweat dropped at the way Vados was handling the God of Destruction and made his way towards the stage. Frost got back to the spectator stands and grumbled to himself. Goku got to the stage as well as he observed Kaba. A smile appeared on his face as he asked, You are a scion, right? Kaba looked flustered as he answered, Yeah. How did you realize that? Goku just pointed at Kaba's furry belt which was his tail, Goku's tail also unfurled from his waist. All the science tails weren't cut due to them all learning how to control their Ozura form. Kaba's eyes widened as he saw Goku's tail. Then he bowed while saying, A fellow scion, it will be a great honor to fight against you. Goku scratched his chin and said, No need to bow. It's not like I'm scion royalty like that guy over there. He pointed towards Vegeta. Kaba looked at Vegeta and Vegeta just nodded his head at him in acknowledgement. Vegeta wanted to test Kaba himself, but he couldn't do to not drawing the right lot. Goku smiled towards Kaba and entered his battle stance. Kaba entered a stance similar to Vegeta's as Vegeta raised eyebrows at the similar fighting stance. Goku and Kaba launched themselves at each other and started fighting. Goku, of course, didn't use his full power from the start, so their fight was pretty equal. A kick there a clash of fists. Goku dodged a roundhouse kick from Kaba and said, It's time to bring this up a notch, don't you think? They both disappeared from view as shockwaves appeared all around. The fight was getting more intense as time passed. Kampa was on the edge of his seat while Beerus was yawning. Goku didn't even transform into a Super Saiyan yet. This fight was in the bag as well for him. Goku punched Kaba in the stomach as he skidded back a few meters. Kaba grunted as he stabilized himself and threw himself right back at Goku. 
but Goku dodged all of his punches and kicks easily then said, Well I'm warmed up, let's go super. Kaba had a questioning gaze but Goku didn't let him ask anything as his power level increased his eyes turned green and his hair blonde. He didn't use his Akari mode though, just plain old Super Scion. Kaba scratched the back of his head and Goku looked at him wondering why didn't he go Super Scion as well. Kaba responded, Um well, you see, I can't use this super form you are talking about. Goku scratched the top of his head as he reverted from his Super Scion state while Beerus got up from his seat and shouted at Goku. Just end the fight, you fool. You are way stronger than him. No reason to draw it out. Goku looked at Beerus and said, But Beerus-sama, he is a fellow scion. I can speak for both me and Vegeta that I wouldn't feel right if I fought him without him being at his best. Vegeta nodded his head. He had the same thoughts as Kakarot. Goku's eyes suddenly changed as they turned feral. His hair spiked up more, and his power level increased way more than before. He appeared directly in front of Kaba and hit him in the stomach. Bile and saliva were spat out as Kaba fell to the floor. Kaba's eyes widened in pain and surprise as he looked at Goku and asked, Why? Goku scoffed with a bored look on his face and said, You are just too weak, whatever I might go to Universe 6 and see if anyone there is stronger on your planet. If not, I might as well destroy it. There's no need for weak scions. Vegeta smirked in the stands. That was the same thing he wanted to do to encourage Kaba. Kaba gritted his teeth as he got up from the stage, but Goku kicked him in the head and kept him down. Kaba's eyes immediately started to change from their black color to green. His aura started to flicker as did his hair color. Goku smirked inside, but he kept his foot on Kaba's head as he continued saying, Whatever, I might just end it now since you are so weak. He charges a bit of key in his palm and was ready to fire it at Kaba. But suddenly Kaba's power level exploded, and he threw himself at Goku and threw a flurry of punches at him. The punches were all fueled by a rage, so even though they were stronger they weren't coordinated at all. There was no technique in them so Goku easily dodged everything. Kaba was ballistic but Goku counterpunched him right in the face, and he flew back making him cool off a bit. Goku said afterward with a smile on his face, Congratulations, you are a super scion now. Kaba looked down at his hands as he clenched them and felt the power he now possessed. Goku kept a grin on his face as he watched Kaba analyze himself. After a few seconds Kaba looked towards Goku and bowed towards him again. Now this bow was really from the heart. Goku just kept smiling, then said, It's okay, now let's continue our fight. They both got right back at it as they fought back and forth. Even though Kaba still couldn't match Goku at all, he could still get hit in here and there. Even though it didn't affect Goku's fighting capability at all, it was still something considering Goku's Super Saiyan was mastered and combined with the Akari mode. Goku immediately shouted as electricity started to arc around his body. He pushed Kaba back then punched him in the chest, throwing him directly off the stage. He shouted at Kaba. After you master the first transformation, train some more and learn this one. Goku reverted and made his way to the stands. Beerus smiled at him and patted him on the back, saying that he did good work. Goku didn't say anything and started to look at Hit. He could feel that the guy was more than he let on. I observed the fights and I wasn't impressed everything was as I predicted. With my interference everyone became stronger than what they were in the original, of course the others won't be a match to them. The next match was Piccolo versus the Winnie the Pooh look-alike Badamo. Piccolo looked at Badamo while Badamo made a sign with his hand, putting his thumb near his neck and slashing across it. Piccolo narrowed his eyes as he threw off his weighted cape and turban. They both left a dent in the fighting stage and the whole planet started to shake. Piccolo could lift quite a lot. Piccolo started to do some warm-up exercises as Badamo rushed at him. Piccolo just smirked and easily punched him in the chest. But his fist just directly entered his chest and did no damage. Badamo smirked at Piccolo's attempt and tried to grab him and throw him off the stage. But all he grabbed was an afterimage. Piccolo narrowed his eyes as he analyzed Batamo's body composition. It seemed it resembled Majin Buu's, but unlike Buu's strong enough physical attacks, seemed to not work at all. 
It was like he was immune to physical attacks. Piccolo tried some more. He kicked him around like a ball or even tried to punch him in the face, but nothing worked. Adamo kept a large grin on his face. But Piccolo stopped engaging him in a melee fight. He put two fingers towards his forehead and started to charge his special beam cannon. Piccolo's power level started to rise as electricity started to arc around his fingers. Adamo didn't want to let Piccolo continue charging his beam, so he directly threw a right hook at Piccolo's head. Unfortunately for him, his beam was already charged. The special beam cannon hit him head on. But Badamo had a strange smile on his face as the beam was reflected directly back to Piccolo. Piccolo dodged to the right, surprised by Batamo's body capability since he couldn't pierce him with beams or hit him with his fists or feet. He decided to just throw him off the stage. Badamo's eyes widened as he felt himself being grabbed easily by Piccolo. Piccolo didn't play around anymore. His power level was starting to rival Gohan's in his Super Saiyan God form. While I was comparing the Piccolo from now with Gohan when he first transformed into a Super Saiyan God, so it was unknown how strong was Gohan now. Badamo was thrown off the stage as Kampa started physically fuming. Smoke was coming out of the top of his head. Vegeta and Hit made their way towards the stage as Vegeta said in a confident tone of voice. I can feel you are the strongest out of this ragtag bunch. After I defeat you, the win is ours. Hit kept silent for a few seconds, then said, You overestimate yourself. Vegeta growled as the countdown finished then transformed directly to his Super Saiyan 2 form and launched himself at Hit. Hit just punched him two times in his chest area as two purple beams came out of his back. Vegeta gasped and clenched his armored chest. Hit narrowed his eyes as Vegeta didn't go down in those two hits. I observed the fight from above and analyzed how Hit used his time skip technique. It was a very useful technique that I wouldn't mind learning. Vegeta shouted as he transformed directly into his Super Saiyan Blue form. His hair turned blue and a similarly colored flaming aura encased him. He threw himself at Hit, but the same thing happened. Now three small beams of energy flew out of three parts of his back. Vegeta coughed blood and Hit wasn't impressed by him. Vegeta closed his eyes as his aura disappeared. Hit thought of this as surrender, and he was ready to give him the final punch that would end this match. Vegeta suddenly smirked as he dodged the punch. Hit's eyes widened as his fist was dodged. Vegeta counterattacked by punching Hit in the middle of his chest pushing him towards the edge of the stage. Hit disappeared from the edge of the stage and appeared near Vegeta ready to use his time skip technique again. But Vegeta dodged again then said, I have realized what you were doing. Kampa wanted to rip his hair off his head. But he had no hair. Hit was his trump card. If he lost now that meant the match was over and the Super Dragon Balls were lost. Beerus started laughing very loudly and started making faces at Kampa. Kampa immediately wanted to get up and have a brawl with Beerus. But Vados whacked him on the head with her staff again. Three bumps appeared directly on his head. Did I see that right Vados used Ultra Instinct to discipline Kampa? Back to the fight, Hit started to shout as well as he started adapting to Vegeta's power. The fight was getting more intense with time as little purple beams of ki started to appear more and more often on Vegeta's back. Vegeta growled as he tried to counterattack, but after Hit adapted to his power, he couldn't stop his punches anymore. Goku observed the fight as his eyes darted back and forth. I'm pretty sure he was already making a plan on how to fight Hit. Gohan too was observing the fight, making a plan for himself as well. Finally, with one more punch to the chest, Vegeta collapsed as his transformation reverted. Hit finally won, but he was gasping for air. It seemed he wouldn't be able to fight at 100% during the next fight. It was time for Gohan vs. Magetta. Magetta's mechanical body dropped itself on the stage as it made it shake. Gohan flew on the stage as well as he entered a stance combined from the turtle style and my style. Magetta didn't say anything as he started to spew lava from the hole that was its mouth. 
Gohan dodged the lava easily as he charged a Kamehameha in his hands and shot it over at Magetta. Magetta's body, however, was extremely sturdy and he easily tanked the Kamehameha. Gohan's eyes narrowed as he tried to punch him, but he grimaced as the damage from the punch was reflected on his fist. Magetta started to laugh in a robotic voice and tried to punch Gohan. Unfortunately for him, due to his large size and mechanical body, he was very slow. Gohan tried everything he could in his base form, then he shook his head and he directly transformed into his Super Saiyan 2 form. He put two hands over each other and put them over his head and started to charge some yellow key in them. Magetta started to charge his beam in his mouth as lava started to bubble inside of him. Gohan directly threw out his beam as it clashed in midair with Magetta's lava beam. They both started to push at each other. While Gohan was in advantage, Magetta wasn't letting himself be pushed that easily. Gohan smirked and powered up to Super Saiyan 3, pushing Magetta out of the stage and directly winning the match. Gohan sighed and he reverted to his base form. Out of all universe's six fighters, the only one remaining was hit. Now he could be challenged by Bu, Goku, Piccolo, or Gohan. Gohan and Goku said practically at the same time, I challenge you hit. Father and son looked at each other and then started to talk. Gohan let me fight hit. I think I have already figured out the most of his fighting style. Dad, I think I'm more suited to fight hit. Why don't you let me fight him? They started to argue. But Beerus came over and bonked both of them on the head and said, Play rock, paper, scissors to decide. They played rock, paper, scissors and Gohan won. It seemed he knew his father fairly well, so he guessed what would Goku choose. Gohan made his way back to the stage and Hit did the same. During the fight between Magetta and Gohan, Hit could rest a bit even though he wasn't at a full 100%, he was still above 70%. Gohan entered his fighting stance as Hit entered a boxer stance. He seemed to get serious and wanted to end things fast in this fight. Gohan smirked as he observed Hit. He was ready for whatever Hit was going to throw at him. Gohan and Hit were ready to launch themselves at each other, but suddenly out of nowhere below me, and Lee a multicolored light appeared. Out of it stepped a little child looking humanoid with a round purple and blue head with an outfit that had the same colors. Behind him were two guys who had a similar outfit in different colors. Their skins were green and only their eyes were shown as their mouths were covered by their outfits. They also wore golden pointed hats on their heads. Wisvedos, Kampa and Beerus immediately bowed towards him and said while sweating intensely, We greet Zeno-sama. Lee and I immediately did the same thing and said in unison, We greet Zeno-sama. Zeno looked at us and said in a childlike voice, Who are you two? I don't remember you. Of course, he wouldn't remember us since he never met us. But I guess he could feel the god key that was coursing through our bodies. One of his guards got nearer to him and started to whisper something to him. Zeno nodded his head, smiled then said, Aha, I see you are Discus. Disciple? Disciples, yes, of my former friend. I guess if you are his disciples, you can be my friends as well. I sweat dropped, I didn't know how to act towards this little guy who could destroy all of the universes by snapping his fingers. But Lee approached him first and said, Sure Zeno sama me and my fellow disciple would enjoy being your friends. I nodded my head and followed his lead. Keeping this little child like being happy was the thing that kept all the universes in existence. The gods of destruction and angels immediately felt like a weight was taken off their shoulders. But Zeno's next question made them feel fear again. What's going on here? Kampa and Beerus were sweating so hard. A mini lake was appearing below them. Goku immediately interjected in, saying, It's a tournament between strong people. Zeno's eyes started shining and said, Is the tournament fun? Goku nodded his head and smiled at him. Zeno looked at both Gohan and Hit who didn't do anything. Then he pouted saying, But it doesn't look that fun to me. Kampa immediately said, Zeno-sama they didn't start. Yet after they will start, it will be very fun. Kampa smiled inwardly afterward as a plan was made in his mind. 
Xenosama, my universe's hit, isn't at full power, so your fun won't be as good if he isn't fully rested. Zeno nodded his rotund head of Kampa then said, Let him get to full power then. Kampa did a victory sign towards Beerus and I interjected. There was no reason to wait, I already had a few Senza beans with me. I practically never left the planet without a few in case I found someone injured in need of one. I threw a bean at Hit, and he grabbed it analyzing it with scrutiny. I immediately said afterward, Zeno sama that little green thing can make Hit go back to full power, so the fight can start sooner. Zeno smiled at me then said, My friend is a good guy, he knows I want to see the fun sooner. Hit could feel that Zeno was dangerous. Kampa wanted to interject saying that the bean might hurt Hit, but a look from Zeno's innocent eyes made him shut his mouth. Hit ate the Senza bean and his power level was back to 100%. He clenched his fists and looked at me with a strange look in his eyes. Gohan nodded at me then looked back at Hit with a grin on his face. He was ready for the fight. Zeno couldn't wait anymore. So he immediately said, Start this tournament thing already. Gohan didn't wait for any other instructors as he powered to his Super Saiyan God form. His hair turned red, and a flowing red aura appeared around him. He closed his eyes as the aura disappeared as he internalized it. Hit was already punching him with his key infused fists while he did that, but Gohan smirked while his eyes were closed, and he batted all the fists away with his palm. Hit's eyes widened, he already used the time skip technique as his surroundings turned greenish and time seemed to crack around him. Gohan continued to keep his eyes closed and only anticipated what it would do. He didn't fight back and waited for an opening. Lee was interested in Gohan as he asked me, That guy from your universe? He is quite the thing, isn't he? I just told him three words. Yes, he is. We weren't above the stage anymore, as Zeno-sama was just near it, and I think his guardians would feel that we were impolite if we flew above his head. Hit narrowed his eyes at Gohan's ability to be able to deflect his attacks. Their power level was quite equal, so he couldn't adapt to increase his power level anymore. Gohan's smirk never faded off his face. As he defended more and more of Hit's punches, the smirk turned into a full-blown smile. He opened his eyes and told Hit, I think I figured out your technique fully, and so did I, after I'll get back on Earth I could train a bit and I should be able to use his time skip technique. Gohan's smile faded off his face as he took a stance similar to Hit's. Oh, I didn't see this one coming, Gohan would do what I think he would do. The green crack time appeared around him as he punched Hit in the chest area three times. Three tiny beams appeared out of Hit's back as his face showed surprise and bewilderment. His technique was used against him. He coughed a bit of saliva and shook off the remnants of the key that remained inside of his body, and suddenly smiled. He stopped using the time skip technique as it wasn't helpful anymore he put one arm in front of the other and launched himself at Gohan. Gohan tried to use the time skip technique again but failed. Gohan's face started to redden as a bit of blood seeped out the corner of his mouth. Hit said, Don't you think you are a bit too confident? I trained in this technique for 5,000 years before perfecting it. The time skip had a huge burden on the user body. Gohan using it without any prior training pretty much destroyed his hopes of winning. Gohan dodged around Hit's attacks and did some punches and kicks himself, but Hit was more experienced. He lived more than any of the mortals here and his technique was extremely good. His technique was actually on par with Jiren's if I said so myself. I'm pretty sure if Hit was as strong as Jiren an epic fight would have unfolded at the Tournament of Power. Gohan took some punches to his chest and more blood seeped out of his mouth. It seemed Hit targeted the injury left behind by the technique. After a few more minutes of fighting Gohan's Super Saiyan God form reverted by itself, and he kneeled on the stage, it was his loss. Goku observed the fight fully, and now he had a very good plan to defeat Hit. Even though Piccolo was almost near Gohan's strength, it was still too low to take on Hit. Even if he used his stand and Kaioken, it wouldn't be much of a difference. Hit was exhausted himself as he panted hard. The fight wasn't that easy for him. 
He was an assassin, not a brawler. He did things clean and fast. He wasn't good in protracted fights. I threw him a second senzu bean which he ate. At first Zeno didn't understand much due to hit using time skip. But after the time skip technique wasn't used anymore his eyes started shining as he took the fight in. He enjoyed it. Goku made his way to the stage and bowed towards Hit. He respected Hit's power and seniority as he heard he trained his technique for 5,000 years. Goku immediately transformed into his Super Saiyan Blue form with his aura internalized at the same time. His body buffed a bit more after his aura internalized, and he threw himself at Hit. Goku immediately dodged a fist that was going for his chest. Hit narrowed his eyes and realized he couldn't use his time skip properly against Goku either. He shouted as the fight turned into a brawl. They both punched each other in the face as they skidded to the edges of the stage. Then both grabbed the stage with their hands and threw themselves at each other again. Zeno was clapping his hands and laughing at the fight. He was shouting, Go man in orange go! It seemed he liked Goku. After a few minutes of fighting Goku said, Okay, this warm-up is done. It's time for the main course, don't you think so? Hitsan? Hit smiled at Goku's words as he started to shout. His power level increased to rival Goku's and even starting to get above. Goku thought to himself, So shouting increases his power level as well? Goku's power level started to increase as a red hue appeared around him. His internalized aura shot out of him at an incredible height as he said, Kaioken! Hit's eyes widened and he responded, Kao what? Goku immediately arrived in front of Hit and started a punch-kick combo, hitting him in the stomach with a kick sending him in the air then appearing above him and hitting him in the back sending him straight in the stage making it shake and break as spider webs cracks started to appear in it. Goku didn't give time to get up as he charged a Kamehameha at him and shot it directly at him. The Kamehameha hit the stage directly. Dust that concealed the results of the fight appeared. As the dust cleared Hit was nowhere to be seen. Hit suddenly appeared above Goku and tried to punch him in the back with a key infused fist. But Goku rotated midair and met his fist with his own, overpowering him again. Goku shouted, Kaioken times 10. His aura intensified as his power level increased again. Hit's eyes widened again even more than before. He could feel Goku's raw power that was emitting from his aura. He couldn't even prop up a decent defense before he was pummeled in the stomach. Then in the head. He was almost out of the stage, but he grabbed a corner of the stage and pulled himself up. He grumbled as he spit some blue-colored blood. Goku let him get up, but he grimaced as his body spasmed and his Kaioken form reverted. His muscles started to bulge as thick veins appeared on them. A great toll was taken on his body. Hit wanted to take advantage of that, but he suddenly kneeled on the stage. He couldn't move. The punch he took to his cranium rattled his brain. Hit started to feel dizzy as the stage started to spin around him. Goku tried to move in and finish the fight but he started to shout in pain as he tried to move. Now, the one who would win would be the one who recovered first. Hit tried to get up again, but he fell on his butt. Goku tried to move, but his muscles started to spasm uncontrollably again. Goku gritted his teeth and reverted to his Super Saiyan Blue transformation. He used his remaining energy to appear in front of Hit and throw him off the stage while he still could. Hit didn't recover off his dizziness in time and was thrown off the stage. Beerus started cheering as his win, while Kampa growled at himself and cursed Beerus under his breath. Zeno-sama cheered and clapped as he liked the fight very much. He started to run forward and asked Goku, Hey, what's your name? Goku smirked at Zeno and said, My name is Son Goku, what's yours? Zeno smirked like Goku, I'm Zeno. Goku shook Zeno's hand and said, Nice to meet you, Zeno. Beerus was ready to appear directly above Goku and punt him in the stage till his brains became like mashed potatoes. Zeno's guards were ready to do the same but with more lethality involved. But Zeno just laughed and said, I like you. Let's be friends. Goku nodded. Yeah, 
I can be friends with you, Xenochan. Beerus thought to himself, Xenochan? We are doomed. Kampa thought the same, while Wis just laughed with a palm covering his mouth. The guards stopped when they saw how Zeno liked Goku's company, and just continued to guard Zeno. Zeno nodded at Goku then said, If it's possible, I would like to see more of these tournaments. Goku then said the words that would practically doom and save the universes at the same time. Then why don't you create one yourself? Zeno's eyes shined as he said, Can I do that? Goku smiled at his words and continued, Sure you are. From the reactions of the others, I can see you are a pretty important little guy. I would also like to fight some more strong guys from other universes. If it's possible, it would be great if you made a tournament. Zeno seemingly was ready to create the tournament on the spot, but then he had a thoughtful face for a few seconds before saying, Okay, I will make this tournament. I'm going to leave now. Visit me so we can play before the tournament. Then he left in a bunch of multicolored light with his guards. I sighed as I looked at the spot the guards took. The gods of destruction did the same. Only the angels were more relaxed, of course, they were relaxed if a universe got erased they wouldn't. Kampa grumbled some curses under his breath constantly as he left with the universe six fighters in tow. Hit was still given his cube even though he didn't win, while the others also got some rewards from Vados. Kampa was ready to jump at her, but another staff hit on the head stopped him directly from taking another action. They just left sullenly. We made our way out of the atmosphere of the planet as we stood in front and said as he admired the giant balls that were hovering in space. Beerus-sama, what's your wish? Beerus thought long about it, then said, Summon the dragon and I will tell you the wish then. We started to talk in the language of the gods as he summoned the dragon. Coincidentally, Vegeta said at the same time, He is speaking the language of the gods. The giant super golden dragon appeared, but he didn't say anything. Beerus opened his mouth and he was just ready to tell was his wish. Beerus looked at the giant dragon and was ready to make his wish. He told Wis, Wis, tell him to give me the best food in all the universes. I sweat dropped this wish was not that good so I approached Beerus and told him, Beerus, don't you think that it would be a waste of a wish to wish for something that you could potentially get by yourself? Beerus scratched his head and yawned then said, Eh, I don't care about that. I just want some new good food. Well, Beerus could be explained with one word, cat. He was acting exactly how he looked. Lazy, only wanting to eat and sleep and only sometimes play. I decided to interfere with the wish and told Wis, Maybe... What if we ask the dragon to give our universe protection from Xeno-sama destruction ability, just in case? Wis eyes narrowed as he looked at me, while Beerus seemed to be in thought, then said, I'd feel more reassured if that would happen, but the food. Wis told the dragon about the wish and his red eyes started to glow, but then he said, To avoid Xeno's destruction ability, I can only make it so if you stay in your universe if you leave it, his ability will still affect you. Then he disappeared along with all of the dragon balls. Beerus then said, Phew, whatever we still have Earth with tons of good food, at least our universe will never be erased. Then he started laughing and patted Goku and Gohan on their backs. Goku started screaming as his muscles were still convulsing from the Kaioken overuse. Not even the Senza Bean could heal him fully. With Wiss's cube and my boat, we made our way back to Universe 7, Earth. Beerus and Wiss flew towards Bulma's place to get some food, while the others just got back to their homes. I left for my own home and met with my children and wives. I played some video games with Marin and Ryu and after that had some other type of fun with Lazuli and Jika. Afterward, I just got back to training my three emotions enhancement. With some insights from the fights between Universe 6 and 7 fighters, I could use the two separate forms with more ease, and I was on my way to get the third fused form down. I closed my eyes as I stood in the training chamber. Space started to crack around me as it turned a deep shade of purple. I spit a bit of blood, 
but my injury was healed immediately. The time skip burden on the body was extremely high, but continuous use would make the body immune to the secondary effects of using it. I continued to train my equivalent of Ultra Instinct and the time skip technique, only leaving the training chamber from time to time. After a few months of training, I could use time skip proficiently with no drawbacks. I wonder how would Hit's face look if he saw how fast I mastered a technique that took him thousands of years to master thoroughly. I left the chamber and I remembered something, well besides that I had to get Broly before the Tournament of Power, he would be a great addition to the team, but it wasn't time to take him off Vampa, yet he liked it there anyway. I teleported to the Supreme Kai's place and met with Kibito, Elder Kai, and Shin. I told them that I had some business in Universe 10 and asked them for the coordinates of the universe. Shin and the others just gave me the coordinates easily. They didn't even ask what I needed to do and told me to have a safe trip. I teleported to Universe 10 and searched the whole universe with my divine key sense. I could feel the Kais and the Lord of Destruction of the Universe, but they couldn't feel me. The Buddha position was unique to people with twin universes and Universe 10 didn't have a twin universe. Thus they lost the Buddha position, and they couldn't sense my power properly. The angels could as the Angel of Universe 10 narrowed her eyes and used her key to try to sense me. But I already left the location I was at previously and sealed my key away. Kusu wondered what was that foreign divine key she felt when Rumshi the God of Destruction of Universe 10 hiccuped. Kusu patted the pink-skinned elephant humanoid on the back, but Rumshi fell on the floor and said in a pained voice, Kusu, what are you doing? Why did you pat me so hard? He got up from the cracked ground of his realm as a black spot suddenly appeared where Kusu patted him. Kusu put a hand towards her mouth and said, Oh, I'm sorry, Rumshi-sama, it's just that I got distracted by something. Let me heal your back. She waved her staff and the black spot disappeared from Rumshi's back. On a desolate planet which was starting to bud life, Gawasu was instructing his disciple Zamasu on how to work as a Supreme Kai. Zamasu scoffed as he looked at the aboriginals of the world as they battled between themselves. They looked like humanoid dinosaurs, they wore nothing but pieces of cloth to cover their bodies and used unrefined bats to hit each other. Zamasu was a green-skinned Kai who had a mohawk and gray eyes. He wore the Kai's outfit in the colors of dark and yellow with purple undergarments and blue pants. His sash was also light blue. His teacher Gawasu was an old Kai with yellow skin with a similar Kai outfit. His outfit had the same colors as Zamasu, but his sash wasn't tied as loosely. Gawasu opened his mouth as he continued to teach Zamasu. Zamasu, as Supreme Kais, we have to observe the mortals and not interfere in their skirmishes unless it involves the safety of the universe. Do you understand me? Zamasu bowed at Gawasu and said, But teacher, these barbarians, these mortals, why don't we just destroy them? They seem to lack the potential to become civilized beings like us. Gawasu immediately said, Stop that nonsense. That's the job of the God of Destruction and not ours. Let's just get back to our realm. Gawasu shook his head. Zamasu was always like this. His hatred for mortals was unique, to say the least. I observed the interactions between master and disciple and shook my head. Poor Gawasu, he would have been poisoned and died at Zamasu hands if it wasn't for Goku and the others. As they teleported back to their realm, I teleported after them. Gawasu widened his eyes as I let my key out. Ah, uh, it's a fellow god. Might I ask where do you come from? Your divine key is unknown to me. Zamasu observed me as I opened my mouth and said, I'm the Buddha of Universe 7. I came here to teach this lad of yours about his job properly. I heard what he said when you taught him about the work of the Supreme Kais. I was in passing back towards my universe, as I had to visit Universe 10 due to some work given to me by Zenosama himself. Gawasu started to tremble at the mention of Zeno, while Zamasu wasn't taught about who Zeno was yet. At the confused look in his eyes, Gawasu immediately explained about Zeno's existence. Zamasu narrowed his eyes, then looked at me and bowed while saying, I would like to hear Buddha's teachings. 
I smiled towards Zamasu then told Gawasu he could leave. What I was going to tell Zamasu was for his ears only. Gawasu just complied and left. But he still left a silver of key to observe what I and Zamasu were going to talk about. I didn't mind, I wasn't going to kill him, I would try the pacifist approach first, but if he moved my hand, I sat cross-legged on the ground and invited Zamasu as well as we stood in the shade of the tree. I started the conversation by asking him something. What do you think about mortals in general? Tell me I won't tell Gawasu. Zamasu looked at me, then said, Mortals have to be left to their own devices. I could see how he gnashed his teeth when he said that, he didn't believe in those words at all. I shook my head and said, Tell me your true thoughts, Zamasu. Zamasu immediately got up and said in anger-induced tone of voice, I find all of these mortals to be pests that need to destroy it. All they do is sully the universe with their being. I nodded at Zamasu and did some hand seals infusing some key into him to make him calm down then said, Zamasu, do you know why you kais create planets? so mortals can spawn on them? Zamasu shook his head he was still being taught by Gawasu, and he didn't finish his training. I could answer him those questions earlier. Let me give you an example. I materialized an empty bowl in my hand which I filled with water, then said, If the bowl is the planet, then the people are the water. I threw the water out of the bowl and cracked it a bit. If the bowl has no reason to exist, what would you do with it? Zamasu had a thoughtful expression on his face and he answered, I should just keep it, right? I nodded and said, Yes, you could keep it. But why would you keep something useless to you? The water gave the bowl a meaning. If it's empty and there's no more water to fill it, why would it exist anymore? I stopped him from thinking anymore and told him directly, If mortals don't exist the planets would just die, the environment needs mortals, beasts to thrive. If you want to kill the mortals you would destroy the planet as there would be no ecosystem anymore. I know you would kill all the beasts as well by the look in your eyes don't try to fool me. You would raise the planet to the ground if you could. Zamasu's eyes widened as I saw through his thoughts. Then he asked me. Then do I have to let the mortals do whatever they want? These disgusting beings waging wars on each other. Destroying the hard work of the gods and the blessings they were given. I shook my head at his words again, then said, Zamasu, if there is no balance, there will not be any order. With no order, chaos would run rampant. You do know about the god of destruction, right? Zamasu nodded, and I continued, What are you talking about is the god of destruction job? If he saw a planet unfit, he would destroy it. It's that simple. If you want to continue down your path, you would have to become a god of destruction and not a supreme Kai. Your personality is not suited for this job. Gawasu came back suddenly and said, What are you trying to say, sir? Zamasu is a Kai so he should become a Supreme Kai and take my mantle. Zamasu seemed to think about something, and he shook his head at Gawasu. I don't think I truly want to become a Supreme Kai teacher. Gawasu. Gawasu's eyes widened as he said, Zamasu you. It's true. You truly don't want to become a Supreme Kai. Zamasu nodded and said, Yes, it's true. I never wanted to become a Supreme Kai. Seeing these mortals sully the planets you created with your own hands with their acts. I just can't do it. I can't become someone who doesn't interfere in the universe at all. I nodded and stopped my hand seals my sacred key didn't influence Zamasu anymore as it did its job. While it didn't erase his hatred for mortals by 100%, he wouldn't attack them indiscriminately just because they were mortals. I told Gawasu, Maybe you can try to talk with your god of destruction and make Zamasu a god of destruction candidate. I can sense his potential is pretty high. It would be a waste of his fighting potential if he didn't do something else considering he doesn't want to take a Kai title. Gawasu nodded it seemed he realized he couldn't make Zamasu a supreme Kai even if he wanted to. If he still pushed him to become one, it would have great adverse effects instead of the desired results. Gawasu bowed towards me and grabbed Zamasu's shoulder then said, Well, I'm off with Zamasu to Rumshisama realm. I hope you will have a good journey back to your universe. Um, my name is Krillin. Ah yes, Krillin-sama have a safe journey back. Then they disappeared from me.
teleporting directly towards the God of Destruction realm. I left Universe 10 and got back to Universe 7, Earth. Another villain turned to good. Well, somewhat good? Chaotic neutral, maybe. Without Zamasu there won't be a second Zeno and Trunks's future timeline won't be erased. Everything was good. Now next would come the Tournament of Power, and I had the best team in mind for it. It will be a while before the Tournament of Power started, but before then I needed to create the perfect team that would be able to defeat everyone else. Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, and Bu were going to be in the tournament for sure. I could also feel that the Cold Family Trio's power was increasing every day. Frieza already attained his golden form, and the other two were on their way to reach the Realm of the Gods as well. Seven participants out of ten, as for the other three Broly was going in for a spot and Piccolo would take the other one. As for the final spot I might be the one who filled it if the Xeno let me fight. My participation depended on Zeno if he wanted to let me fight or not. Of course, if I entered, Lee would enter as well. There was no reason to put Lazuli or Lapis in danger. They should just chill and relax in the universe while we won the tournament. I changed my outfit to a blue GI with black lines and a red undershirt. I wore white boots and a yellow belt. I had my own Buddha symbol on the front and the back of the GI in a white circle. This would be my outfit for the Tournament of Power, hopefully, Zeno would want to see his friend fight as long he said anything the Grand Priest wouldn't interfere. Near Zeno's realm in the Null Void, the Grand Priest was listening towards Zeno's words and said with a thoughtful look on his face, Well Zeno-sama we can make this tournament. We shall invite all the universes and do just like Universe 6 and 7 did make the prize be the Super Dragon Balls. I shall also unlock some of their powers and let them have a wish with no limitations, what do you say? Zeno clapped his hands like the child he was and said, Yes, that would be very good. The Grand Priest then continued, Of course the tournament wouldn't be fun if there were no rules. You shouldn't bother with these things however Zeno-sama, I shall create all the rules and present them to you and explain them as well so you can agree to them is that right? Zeno nodded his rotund head and said afterward, While you do that, invite my friend Goku and my other friend to play. I'm bored by myself. The Grand Priest bowed and said, Of course, Zeno-sama. The Grand Priest teleported over to one of the guards and told him to call the Kai of Universe 7 over. Shin came over as fast as he could as he realized he was called over to Zeno's place. He was met with the Grand Priest at the entrance of the palace and then informed of Zeno's invitation of Goku and I to the palace. Shin teleported back to Universe 7 after he bid his goodbyes towards the Grand Priest and called both of us and explained why he was so hurried. We three teleported to Zeno's palace using Kai Kai, and we met the Grand Priest who invited us in the palace while saying, It's rare for Zeno-sama to make friends, of course. There were some exceptions in the past. He glanced at me and smiled. Goku scratched the back of his head and laughed while we continued to follow the Grand Priest deeper in the palace. Guards were standing solemnly watching over Zeno as we entered the throne room. Zeno floated over from his throne and ran towards both of us and said, Both of my friends are here. He took us both by one hand each and we started to play some games he created, of course, he won all of the rounds because he was a master at all his self-made games. It didn't help he didn't explain the rules properly either, but making the little guy happy meant he wasn't going to snap his fingers anytime soon. After a while, it was time for us to go and Zeno was sad. He gave Goku a button which he could use to call him so they could play together and we left the palace. Shin was waiting for us outside the palace and we got back to Universe 7. Now it was time to assemble the team. I called the trio of the Cold Clan back to Earth and informed the others to all get to Capsule Corporation. Beerus and Wiss were already there waiting. As we all made our way over, all of them tensed as they felt the powers of Cooler Cold and Frisia approach from the galaxy. When they saw them and felt how stronger they became they looked towards each other than to me not knowing how they got revived. Goku was practically ready to launch himself at Frisia and tear him limb for limb, he was still mad he almost killed Rashi back then. Frisia was different from before, 
and he didn't have the memories of his past life while he also became more experienced by helping the universe killing evildoers and such with his family, he was still scared by Goku's look in his eyes. I coughed and told all of them telepathically. Guys guys it's okay I used my Buddha power to cleanse them of their sins and reincarnate them as good people. They are all on our side now. They don't even remember their past lives. All of them started to relax as they took another look at the cold family trio. I decided to not make the trio feel like outsiders and made them chat with the others. Beerus started counting and he said, Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, Piccolo, Krillin, Cooler, Cold, Frieza. You aren't we missing one person. Don't tell me you want to get another one of your earthlings in. This tournament is serious stuff. Even though they are way stronger than most of the mortals in this universe, they aren't at the very top. I want only the best in my team. He huffed as he continued to eat some strawberry ice cream. I nodded my head at Beerus's words and said, There's one more guy that I know of. I felt his power level and potential some while ago but didn't interact with him until now. I can take him over here. Then I pointed at Goku and Vegeta and continued. He is a scion just like you guys. But his potential is nothing to scoff about. You will see when I take him here. I closed my eyes and concentrated on Broly's energy. It was relatively high and it had a pure attribute to it. It was due to him being very inexperienced and having no desires. He lived like a monk on Vampa. Another way smaller power level was with him Paragus his father. I teleported over to planet Vampa and took in the surroundings. It was pretty desolate and not a good living environment. I approached the auras and Paragus started to rub his hands on his eyes thinking he was hallucinating then he shouted. Over here over here. -y. He started to run towards me. Broly was just behind him. He had a wild mane of hair and a cracked armor from since it was a child. He also had a green pelt that he used as a belt. Paragus wore the same type of armor like him also cracked and visibly destroyed. Paragus' hair was starting to turn gray from age and there were wrinkles here and there. He also sported a mustache. I approached them and said, It's okay. I felt some high power on this planet and I decided to visit it. I pointed at Broly and said, He would be a great addition to a tournament that would affect the fate of the universe. Paragus gasped as he didn't believe his ears. Then he said, But what about Lord Frisia? We also would like to see our planet, what happened in all these years. I started explaining to him, The planet trade organization of Frisia's and the Cold family was disbanded while they returned to the good side. Planet Vegeta was destroyed at Frisia's hands quite a long time ago. Very few scions survived. Some of the survivors are living with me on my home planet, you should remember Nappa, right? Paragus nodded his head as if in thought and said, That slimy Imperial advisor survived, huh? Broly didn't say anything and just looked at me. I opened a capsule which I took with me from Earth and threw some food and water at the both of them. Broly looked at them with a perplexed look on his face and he tried to bite them. But Paragus stopped him and shown him how he was supposed to open the water bottle and unpack the food. I watched how they interacted and waited till they finished the water and food. I nodded towards them afterward and said, If you are done we can teleport back to my planet. The living environment there is way better. We can also train your son a bit before the tournament began, so he can increase his power level for the upcoming fights. Paragus looked at me then closed his tired eyes and a smile suddenly appeared on his face as he patted Broly's shoulders then said in a quiet voice to the both of them. It's finally the time we leave this cursed planet, son. Broly could talk and said afterward. Do we follow him? Paragus nodded his head and he and Broly approached me. I smiled at both of them and made them put their hands on my shoulders. Then I teleported all of us to Earth. Beerus narrowed his eyes as he saw Broly and Paragus then said, This guy you came with is pretty strong but still not strong enough. I smiled towards Beerus and said, You will see after he starts training. Beerus frowned and let it go, the team was created, and it was only a few weeks till the Tournament of Power was supposed to start. The other gods of destruction started to panic as they heard of how their universe would be destroyed if they lost the tournament. When Beerus got the news he just slapped me on the shoulder then laughed. 
Very good wish, very good wish. At least the universe and its inhabitants would be safe. Beerus wanted to stay in the universe during the tournament, but the rules said that the gods of destruction should spectate the tournament. I was of course allowed in the tournament. Zeno would surely like to see me in a fight as he didn't see me fight before, and he was very interested in what I was able to do. In the other universes, other teams were made up, Universe 10 had some strange fighters, but their biggest boost was on the God of Destruction candidate Zamasu. Other universes had robots or other things like transforming idols who worked with some type of love energy. Of course, the biggest rival of ours was Universe 11. Jiren opened his eyes as he was meditating inside a gravity chamber. His red aura vanished as he looked at Topo who entered the room and said, Why do you disturb me, Topo? Topo immediately got straight to business, saying, There's a multi-universal tournament coming, and we need your help, Jiren. Jiren immediately said, I refuse. Topo coughed a bit, then continued, of course I know you value justice over everything else, but whoever wins will get a wish with no limitations, meaning you can wish for whatever your heart desires. Jiren looked at Topo, closed his black pupilless eyes, and then said after a few more seconds, I will participate now leave and don't disturb me till the tournament starts. Topo smiled towards Jiren and said, Of course Jiren of course. Outside the chamber, the clown god of destruction Belmond and his angel Margarita were waiting. When they saw Topo getting out of the chamber with a smile, Belmond was relieved and said, Very good with Jiren's help the win is in the bag. Topo nodded and got back to gathering the others from his team. Goku and Broly were fighting back and forth as Goku transformed from transformation to transformation while Broly immediately adapted after a few rounds. Goku sweat dropped at Broly's insane potential. By the time two weeks were up Goku and Vegeta were both bruised and beaten by Broly every time they fought. Beerus's eyes shined as he looked at Broly better. Whisk got up from the table he was enjoying food at and said, The Grand Priest contacted me and said there will some preliminaries fight so Zen Osama can observe the fighters and he chose us to fight some other universe while the remaining universes will be also spectating. Wis then continued, Only half the fighters will be needed for the preliminaries, so please choose whoever will fight now. We have a few hours before we need to get to the preliminaries place. I nodded at Wis then said, Me, Goku, Vegeta, Broly, and Gohan. Beerus narrowed his eyes at me, then said, you are sending the strongest fighters for the preliminaries? I shook my head at Beerus then continued. There's no need for plans considering our strength, don't you think? Then I pointed at Broly with my eyes. Beerus nodded to himself then said, Whatever. I don't care the preliminaries don't matter. Just win the tournament and don't make our universe a laughingstock. I laughed at his words then said, it would be quite impossible to do that considering our power. Beerus smirked then gave me a thumbs up. Wis took us all to the preliminaries place which was actually in the palace of Zeno in one of his more remote rooms. There was a stage made by the grand priest himself. As we arrived, we looked at the fighters from the other universes. There were three humanoid wolf brothers each in a different color and height. The strongest and tallest was the one with blue fur, he wore black pants and a red scarf he had no shirt on. The other two had red and yellow fur and were shorter than the blue-furred one. They also wore pants and no shirt. There was only one other fighter on a different platform watching us over with scorn in his eyes. His skin was brown, and he had a big mustache-beard combination. He wore a latex bodysuit with half being colored black and other red. This was Topo while I didn't remember the wolf trio's name. The wolf trio was aggressive, and they told us how they would beat us in the ground such and such. The Grand Priest interrupted them with a cough which made them sweat, then said, As per instructed you can challenge Universe 7, this is a preliminaries round, so it doesn't matter. This was made to show Zeno-sama what he will see at the real tournament in advance. The other gods of destruction and their kais nodded. The wolf trio was practically ready to jump from their stands, Kampa was grumbling under his breath his stand had a few people too. Namely Kaba, Frost, and an unknown Namikian. 
He wanted to challenge Universe 7, but he knew he couldn't defeat them even if he gave his best. He didn't even recognize the tall guy with wild hair. But he gave him the vibes that he was pretty strong. The wolf trio was pretty dumb in his opinion. Out of the stands, Bergamo the blue-furred wolf jumped down and pointed towards Goku while saying, You come over here and fight. Goku smiled and jumped from the stands as well. Bergamo crouched down as he was ready to jump at Goku while Goku took his fighting stance. The Grand Priest smiled towards Zeno, and he started to count down before the full countdown finished, he said. Oh my, I almost forgot about the rules, let me tell them to you now, no flying, no hidden weapons, no healing items, no lethal force as killing your opponent would get you disqualified, there will be some more rules added to the actual tournament, but these are the main ones. Then he finished the countdown and both fighters launched themselves at each other. Bergamo threw a right hook at Goku which he easily dodged then Goku counterattacked with a kick to the face which threw Bergamo to the edge of the stage. Bergamo then used his claws to stop himself from being thrown out and losing the match. He laughed as he started to buff up and threw himself at Goku again now with more vigor and strength than before. He was getting stronger every time Goku hit him. After a few tens of hits he started to match Goku and he was even pushing Goku back. Goku smirked at Bergamo's power then shouted and transformed in his Super Saiyan form. Bergamo was immediately outclassed. Goku started punching him like he was a nothing but an empty sack of flour. Bruises and blood started to splatter out of cracked skin. And it turned his fur coat a dirty red. He started to howl as his muscles started to increase in mass and veins appeared around them and counter-punched Goku in the jaw knocking him a few meters away from him. Goku spit out a bit of blood from his mouth and launched himself right back at Bergamo not letting him rest at all. Fighting with Broly every day for two weeks tempered Goku's fighting style to the point he didn't let his enemy rest at all, because if Broly got to rest even a bit his power level would adapt to the one he fought. Bergamo having a similar ability to Broly's potential gave Goku a bit of PTSD, considering how many beatings he took from Broly in two weeks. Vegeta was also the same as him. Bergamo started to cave in as his ability was starting to be unable to bear Goku's power. Goku was already starting to use his Ikari mode in combination with his Super Scion form. Bergamo's muscles were already starting to give out due to the pressure of Goku attacking him and his ability overloading them. But if he gave up using his ability all his power he gathered would dissipate, and he would lose the match getting his universe and himself humiliated. There haven't been even five minutes since the fight began. Zeno's eyes shined as he looked at the fight with wonder and gleefulness in his eyes. It just looked like he found a new toy that he couldn't wait to play with. I observed the fight and nodded to myself. Goku's power level was getting higher and higher after he trained with Broly and Vegeta stimulating their potentials. Even though he wasn't ready for Ultra Instinct yet, if he trained in the time chamber and with the pressure in the tournament of power, he could still reach the state. Bergamo spat out blood as his internals were injured when Goku hit him directly in the chest with a key infused fist. He was ready to pass out, but Goku grabbed him by his tail and threw him out of the ring directly. Topo narrowed his eyes seeing how the other universe lost so easily to Goku. It seemed he took Goku as a worthy enemy already and he didn't even transform into a Super Saiyan God yet. The Redford Wolf came down from the stands and took his stance sweating knowing his bigger brother was already defeated by our universe. Goku got out of the stage as his fight was over. Vegeta made his way down to the stage and harumphed, making the Redford Wolf humanoid to shudder a bit. Vegeta took his stance and smirked coldly at the poor wolf then appeared directly in front of him kicking him in the chin. The wolf however dodged. He was sweating intensely however, and he had a scared look on his face. The yellow furred one shouted and said, Basil, don't let him have an easy time, you hear me? Basil shook his head and didn't say anything at all. He knew he was outmatched, but he still tried to do something he didn't want to go down without a fight. His scrawny form buffed up as his muscles inflated, and his power level increased by a large margin. Then as his hind legs enlarged he threw himself at Vegeta. Vegeta smirked and they headbutt each other. 
Basil came out as the weaker party but Vegeta got pushed a bit as well. Vegeta shouted as he transformed directly into his Super Saiyan form then threw a punch right towards Basil's face. Basil put his arms in a crossed position right at the moment the punch was ready to hit him in the face and blocked. But his arms made a sickening crunch as both of them broke. And he shouted afterward, I surrender. Then he flew away from the stage and landed on the stands. Bergamo patted Basil on the shoulder and sighed. Universe 7 was full of monsters. He looked towards the yellow-furred wolf and said, Lavender, if that other guy is as strong as the others, I'm not sure if you should even go up. Let's not disgrace our universe anymore. Lavender growled, but he didn't know what to say. They came in strong and insulted Universe 7 only to be trashed around like they were grunts. His ears dropped down as he muttered to himself. Then he ignored Bergamo's advice and jumped on the stage. Beerus yawned as the fights were boring for him. His universe had a very high mortal level and his fighters were also of the highest quality with even a god in their midst. Seeing that Zeno and the Grand Priest didn't comment on my appearance in the fighter's position, it seemed both of them agreed to my presence in the Tournament of Power. Lee was meditating on Universe 6 platform, and he didn't greet me since the fights began, he was just staying there behind the fighters. From his aura, I could infer that he didn't want to listen to the fights and fight, but it wasn't the time for him to fight yet. His aura was almost inexistent as I didn't observe him in the start, it seemed he trained into a special concealing technique or trained for a special transformation. Gohan was ready to make his way down to the fight, but Broly put an arm in front of him and said, I would like to fight now. Gohan just nodded. He didn't Broly's power to be shown yet, but he couldn't stop Broly to fight if that's what he wanted to do. Broly jumped down to the stage and smiled towards Lavender. Lavender didn't know what to infer from that smile. But he grinned himself. He thought that Broly was an easy target as he looked a bit innocent with his hair down and his easygoing look about him. Lavender approached Broly at quick speeds then blew a purple cloud out of his mouth. But Broly just used his key to disperse it then grabbed Lavender by the neck then face planted him directly into the stage. The stage cracked as Broly's greenish aura leaked out. Lavender was already out cold. Broly looked at his hands then at Lavender and scratched the back of his head. He always similarly fought with Goku and Vegeta so he didn't know why Lavender was so easily knocked out. He bowed towards Lavender's unconscious body and left the stage. Goku and Vegeta shuddered as they looked at Lavender, seemingly pitying him. Topo grunted, then without any other instruction jumped down to the stage himself. Belmond the clown god of destruction wanted to tell him something but refrained to speak after he saw the look in Topo's eyes. Gohan thought it was his time to fight, but I narrowed my eyes at Topo and put an arm in front of Gohan and said, I haven't stretched myself in a while, Gohan. Give me this fight. Gohan scratched the back of his head a tick that he mimicked from his father. Then he said, But Krillin San you are our strongest fighter. It's not strategically correct for you to fight already. I smirked at Gohan and told him, I know, but it seems this will be our last fight for today. The Grand Priest was observing Zeno-sama, and he saw how he enjoyed the fights and he smiled himself as well. Also, the stage won't take many beatings anymore. It was already on its last legs and the fight between me and Topo would be the proverbial last straw on a camelback. I jumped down from the stands, put both my hands together and said, Amitba fellow fighter, I will be your opponent this round. Topo narrowed his yellow eyes as his beard bellowed while his aura appeared. He couldn't see through my power at all. He shouted as he buffed up and entered his full power mode. I smiled, then used my full power technique as my physique buffed up as well. Topo launched himself at me, but I used my peaceful state from my three emotions enhancement to easily dodge all of his attacks. The angel's god of destructions and the grand priest himself gasped as they saw me. Then the grand priest took a better look and said, This is similar to Ultra Instinct but different as well. Topo was getting flustered as I was dodging all his attacks as he powered up even higher, 
but I always kept my power near his. This was a good fight to see what my three emotions enhancement could do. The peaceful state was pretty strong he couldn't do anything to me at all as I dodged all of his attacks. My mind was clear and in a pure state. I stopped my dodging and caught his fist as a red wrathful aura started to appear around me. Topo started to sweat as his brows got up and his widened. A savage smile appeared on my face as I hit him directly in the face, and he skidded over more than a few meters. He almost couldn't catch himself before he was thrown out of the stage. Some trenches were made in the stage as he anchored himself with his feet and arms, stopping himself from being thrown out. Zeno started to laugh happily, then said, My friend is so great, and he clapped afterward and continued saying how this was so exciting and cool. My mind was clouded in the wrathful state and I just threw myself at Topo without any regards of my safety. Topo seeing my state of mind started to fight more safely and smartly, but no plans in the world could triumph over pure power. Every time he tried to dodge my punch found him immediately and threw him off balance. My power was also draining faster in this mode, but I couldn't stop myself easily after entering the wrathful state willingly. I shouted as my power level increased, even more, the red aura around me intensified as Topo took hit after hit. His chest was starting to cave in as his bones were making crunches. His arms were failing him as he shouted to himself. He was ready to go in his destroyer mode. Suddenly, my eyes cleared as my power level returned to normal and my red aura dispersed. A combined aura of peacefulness and wrath started to appear around me for a few milliseconds before the transformation reverted. My full power technique turned itself off and I gasped. My power level, however, turned immediately back to normal. Topo tried to take advantage of this to turn the fight in his favor, but I stopped him and said, Amitba, I injured you a bit too much during my other state, and I'm extremely sorry for that. Let me heal you and take this fight as a draw, what do you think? Fighting Topo right now would give me no more benefits. I only toyed with him in my peaceful mode and if I didn't stop myself at the final moment I might have killed him. Even though he would have gone in his destroyer mode my punch would have gone directly through his chest and end him. I might have even been disqualified from the tournament of power. Topo huffed, but suddenly he vomited a mouthful of blood and collapsed to his knees. I used my healing technique to heal all of his injuries and then left the stage. I felt bad for beating him so hard, of course, he would become stronger after this beating, so I guess we were even. With the insights from this fight, I could learn to control my wrathful state better and approach the combination of states easier. Zeno nodded at the Grand Priest, then the Grand Priest said in a loud voice which everyone could hear. Zeno Sama said that he enjoyed these preliminaries fight very much, and he is looking forward to the real tournament. You can all disperse and go back to finish the creation of your teams or train. There's only one week left till the tournament begins. Remember that? Everyone teleported out of the palace in different types of colored auras. Which took us back to Earth as well. Paragus was waiting at Capsule Corporation while talking to Nappa and sipping some tea from time to time. When he saw us come back, he left his tea on the table and approached Broly while asking us, did the boy do well? We all nodded, and he smiled at Broly then patted him on the shoulders. Even though his father treated him suboptimally on Vampa, Broly still loved Paragus quite a lot, and he thoroughly enjoyed the change of heart his father had. Frisia Cooler and Cold came forward and bowed towards me. Ryu and Marin were just behind them with Lazuli and Jaika. I smiled towards all of them. I gave some more pointers to the Cold Trio, then left with my family. Lazuli dragged me by the hand and said, We haven't visited my brother at all during all these years. I think it's time to give him a visit. I talk with him from time to time, and he is doing good for himself. He even has sixteenth help at his job. I smiled and nodded at Lazuli. I could go with them to visit Lapis. The children could see their other uncle as well. Afterward, I could go back to training. We flew directly to the island where Lapis worked and we met there. On Earth everyone was on the lookout as I called them over. Broly was sitting down and waiting while Vegeta and Goku were just waiting. The cold family trio was meditating while Bu was eating. 
Gohan was talking with Piccolo while I just teleported over after some time with my family and Lapis. Lapis was doing well for his own he married and had two children. Android 16 helped him from time to time with his park ranger job as he liked to interact and protect nature. I coughed and everyone's attention was on me. We will have to do some special training before the tournament of power will start. The limit to the chamber has been increased by quite a lot with Den's help. Den waved his hand at all of us from behind me. Popo was just smiling like always. I continued. We will enter all at once. And we will intensely train for four years. Broly scratched his head. Not knowing of the chamber's properties. But he decided to not comment at all. I nodded towards all of them and invited all of them in. Immediately they powered to their best form, Goku and Vegeta transformed into Super Saiyan Blue while Gohan directly transformed into one as well. Broly shouted as he transformed into his legendary Super Saiyan form. His eyes started to whiten as his irises disappeared. He was ready to go berserk, but I infused some sacred key inside of him to make him calm down. With my help Broly will master his Akari Mode Super Scion combination that resulted in his legendary transformation easily enough. While I kept Broly in check, the others trained with each other. The Cold Family Trio was training with Bu and Bu was already starting to overpower them only a few minutes in the chamber. It took them their new transformations to keep Bu in check. Piccolo was a little bit weaker than Gohan, but his power was starting to catch up. After the first year of training, Broly could control himself enough. With the insights I gained from Broly's wrathful state, I could now try to control my wrath mode easier while my power in it also got a sizable boost. Two more years went by and all the humanoids had beards on them by now, but we just ignored everything and continued training. I could fully control my wrathful state and my peaceful state by now. A little more and they would both be perfect, with the certain conditions I could also combine them. Goku and Vegeta perfected their Super Saiyan Blue transformations and Gohan was just behind them. Only a little more and he would catch up to them and maybe even go beyond them. Their power levels started to hit a wall and they couldn't increase anymore, so they decided to train their techniques. The same could be said for Broly, as Broly was a mutant and his legendary Super Saiyan form was already equivalent to Super Saiyan Blue, his other forms were kind of lackluster, he could achieve Super Saiyan 2 and 3, but why would he need to when their multiplier was smaller? I tried to make him combine his Ikari mode and his Super Saiyan 2 to create something like Legendary Super Saiyan 2, but he just couldn't do it. His Super Saiyan 2 form would immediately revert when he tried to do it, it only worked with his normal Super Saiyan. Goku could combine the Ikari mode with his other Super Saiyan forms, but of course, the boost Broly got from it was way higher than Goku's in his first Super Saiyan form couldn't even compare. After the last year was over we all got out of the chamber and four days were gone by in the real world. We still had three days left before the Tournament of Power started officially. Everyone was gone to their own houses after they cleaned themselves and shaved their beards. All of our techniques were honed and our power reached the peak. We were all ready for the Tournament of Power. Wiss was observing everyone as we gathered at Capsule Corporation. The three days of rest helped us to calm our raging key and our bodies after four whole years of intense training with few rests between. Beerus nodded his head as he looked at us. Especially when he saw me he narrowed his eyes as he couldn't see through me anymore at all. Even though I failed to fully control the combined mode I could still invoke its powers in short bursts. Goku and Vegeta already mastered their Super Saiyan Blue transformations fully and their techniques also improved quite a lot after four years of training and sparring. Goku was already on his way to gain Ultra Instinct. The Tournament of Power would be that catalyst that would help him gain the form. In the void in a nearby empty zone of Zeno's Palace, the Grand Priest just finished creating the fighting stage for the universes. It was completely circular with a giant pillar in the middle, it was colored in ashen brown and gray. Zeno was looking at the stage and clapping his heads while smiling. The Grand Priest nodded his head and smiled at Zeno while saying, Zeno-sama, should we invite the universes? There's only one day left. Maybe let's invite the gods of destruction to test the sturdiness of the stage. 
Zeno's little eyes started to shine then he said, Yes, yes, invite the gods of destruction and make them fight. The grand priest coughed. Then he telepathically informed every angel to take their god of destruction to the coordinates he gave them. All the angels complied and after a few minutes, all the universes came. Universe 2 God of Destruction was a woman who looked like Cleopatra and her name was Helles. The angel looked the same as was only with long flowing hair that reached his back. Beerus and Wis came afterward. Then the God of Universe 3 which was a green mecha looking guy. His angel had a big nose and slicked back hair. Afterward, it was Universe 9 the dwarf-like green-skinned god of destruction with a red beard and bald head made himself known by coughing. His angel was behind him, he sported short hair. Afterward, every other universe came. Lastly, Universe 11 made their way over. The Grand Priest opened his mouth. I invited all of you here to test the durability of the stage. We wouldn't want our participants to destroy the stage wholly and making them unable to fight anymore, right? The gods of destruction nodded their heads almost all at the same time then made their way to the stage. It was a god of destruction battle royale. Beerus, of course, made himself known as the top god of destruction by being able to beat his brother and universe's nine gods of destruction by himself. Afterward, some of the other gods of destruction wanted to team up on Beerus, but when Beerus got serious the stage which was already starting to break down was starting to fall in the void at high speeds. The Grand Priest immediately intoned. Stop this is enough. I will have to reinforce the stage even more, of course it's impossible to make it indestructible with my powers only. But it should be enough to not get destroyed as fast as it was now even if some participants have powers comparable to gods of destruction. He eyed universe 7 and universe 11 when he said that. The gods of destruction and their angels left afterward, while the grand priest quickly fixed and reinforced the stage. Afterward, when everything was done and fixed it was time for everyone to get to the stage and fight. We are all at Capsule Corporation. Supreme Kai and Elder Kai were with us as well as they said they wanted to watch the fight as well even though their presence wasn't needed. The other Z fighters wanted to join as well to observe. Wis didn't see anything wrong with it so he let them come with us. We all clasped the hands of each other as Wis struck the ground with his staff and we teleported directly to the stage. We were there, met with all of the other fighters. Wis Beerus and the Kais made their way to the observer stands as the Grand Priest started talking. There are some additional rules to the others, we added a time limit of 48 minutes in mortal time. Flying is allowed now for people who can fly naturally, the other rules stand as before. I observed the other fighters and shook my head. The only one who would give us problems now would be Jiren. I looked towards Universe 6 and Kale Kaba and Cauliflow were arguing about something. Even if the two fused Broly would mop the floor with Kefla. His power wasn't anything like before, and he now could control himself as well. After four years of training only I could defeat him now, and it would be quite a hard fight of course if I used the combined mode he would go down easily, he was the strongest mortal but he didn't reach Ultra Instinct's level. Jiren opened his eyes and took a look at me then nodded to himself. It seemed he could feel my power even when I was hiding it. Jiren was quite the peculiar guy. As I observed everyone, I ignored the others, the only would-be problems would be the combination of Kale and Cauliflo and Universe 11, mostly Jiren, the others while strong and having abilities that were somewhat advantageous to their current environment would still be unable to throw us out of the stage. I made sure so by strengthening everybody to the maximum before the tournament. Kale, Cauliflo and Kaba approached Goku, Vegeta and Broly, Cauliflo said with a haughty tone. I heard you old dudes are the strongest scions around. Don't blink during the fights, or I might throw you all off the stage. Kale didn't say anything but she looked at Broly with a strange look in her eyes. It seemed like something was attracting her to him. Broly had the same look in his eyes but Cauliflower dragged Kale back after she saw she didn't move after her speech was done. Vegeta snorted at her words while Goku laughed. Gohan scratched his head and wondered what was that all about. The cold trio ignored everyone else and only interacted with each other. While Bu shouted and Piccolo waited the beginning of the tournament with eyes closed. 
I looked towards the Grand Priest as he smiled towards all of us and moved near Zeno while saying, Zeno-sama will count down when he reaches to zero the fight will start. Zeno started counting down in his childlike voice. 10, 9, 3, 2, 1, 0. All of the fighter teams took the distance between each other and eyed their enemies warily. Jiren was meditating on the stage, not moving from where he was before. A pigman from Universe 10 tried to attack Jiren, but a green hand stopped him. It was Zamasu. He was clad in the same Kai clothes he had before. But something was different about him. He also didn't have the Padera earrings anymore. Zamasu shook his head. Then he cleaned his hand using a handkerchief and muttered under his breath. I had to touch this dirty mortal to... I narrowed my eyes as I couldn't see Zamasu from the beginning. I thought they came with the same team as the one they had in the anime, but it seems I was wrong. It also seemed Zamasu was hiding his power level, as not a bit of aura was escaping from him. I thought only the Scions from Universe 6 and Universe 11 would be a problem to us, but it seems I was wrong. Other teams started to battle each other, but they were also eyeing our team from the side trying to see if we would make any moves. They knew of our strength, and they were wary of us. The same could be said about Universe 11. They eyed both us and waited for us to clash against each other. They would be very glad if we exhausted each other or even eliminated each other from the tournament so they would have a chance of winning. Officially the tournament of power started. I narrowed my eyes as I started walking towards Jiren. Goku was defending against some strange alien that decided to attack him then he easily pushed the alien off him when he saw that I was walking towards Jiren. Krillin, why don't you let me take him on? I shook my head then said, While you have to break through your limits, you think I don't? Goku scratched the back of his head afterward. He tried to find another target to fight against. Vegeta scoffed as the trio of Scions started to approach him and Broly. The cold trio was raising through the other fighters like a hot knife through butter. There were elimination sounds every second. It seemed 48 minutes weren't needed. Of course, the other participants wanted to play safe, but we didn't let them. Gohan Piccolo and Bu also took care of the others easily. By the time 10 minutes were passed, only Universe 11, 6, and 10 were still standing on the stage. All of the other universe's participants had gloomy expressions as they stood in their universe stands. The gods of destruction were also sad, while the angels were stoic. We reached the finals of the Tournament of Power. I was staring down Jiren for ten minutes and he did the same. We were fighting using our mental power, as when someone tried to attack me, he got slapped out of the stage by a mental wave. The same happened with Jiren too. Lee was watching everything happening as his blindfold was off. It was time for him to get serious as well. He had to protect his universe. He was waiting for me to fight with Jiren then swoop in and end me knowing that I was the biggest threat in my team. It was time for the Tournament of Power to reach its climax. Lee was observing us ready to gank any of the other whenever an opportunity would present itself. It was time to get serious as I launched myself directly at Jiren with a key enhanced fist. Jiren didn't hold back at all, and we hit each other in the chest directly at the same time, Golden and Red Key came respectively out of our backs and we staggered back. Jiren smirked as he finally found someone strong enough to fight him. But his smirk immediately disappeared from his face, and a serious expression overtook it. Back with the others, Goku was fighting Kaba while Vegeta was fighting Kalifla. Kale and Broly were also trading blows at a slower pace. Piccolo Gohan Bu and the Cold Trio were fighting off Universe 10 and 11 remaining fighters. Zamasu was hiding around the other fighters ready to give a counterattack while the fighters from Universe 6 were ready to take advantage of the others fighting. Hit had his eyes narrowed as he observed the fight between Goku and Kaba. He knew Goku's strength was way above his, but he didn't know why he was still fighting him. Goku and Kaba were trading punches both in their Super Saiyan form. Kaba suddenly smiled as he shouted, and electric arcs started to envelop him. He was pushing Goku back afterward with his power. Goku laughed as similar electric arcs enveloped him as well and Kaba's advantage was gone. Then he said, 
You are talented Kaba. Good job on learning Super Saiyan 2 already. Then his laughter stopped and he continued. Unfortunately, I still have to throw you out. He started to charge Ki in his fist and punched Kaba directly in the chest, throwing him out of the stage. He appeared on Universe's six benches. Kampa grumbled. Then he became sad at the realization he might be erased. The other universes who lost weren't erased yet, so he didn't know what would truly happen but the words that came out of the Grand Priest's mouth next sealed the deal. Aha! I forgot to say something. The erasure of the universes will happen after the winning universe is coronated. Forgive me for not informing you earlier. The hope of all the universes who lost was crushed directly into dust the moment those words came out of the Grand Priest's mouth. The remainders of Universe 11 team were getting eliminated leaving only Topo and Jiren behind. Topo suddenly powered up and appeared behind Piccolo tackling him down with his huge frame then throwing him out of the stage. It seemed Topo's power increased as well after he fought me, and he still wasn't using his destroyer mode yet. Jiren and I traded blows as we put each other off balance with our punches and kicks. Lee suddenly appeared behind me shooting a key blast in my face which made a mark appear over my head. Then he threw himself at me and kicked me in the stomach throwing me a few meters away. Then he did a roundhouse kick that made Jiren fly away almost reaching the edge of the stage. He dashed towards one of his teammates afterward two shiny white shields appearing over him and his teammates. I grabbed the stage and embedded my feet in it making myself stop skidding on it. Jiren grabbed the edge of the stage and launched himself back on it then I'd Lee. Lee just smiled at both of us. I guess it was time to get rid of Universe 6 then. Jiren and I both nodded at each other. We needed no interventions in our fight. Zamasu appeared behind King Cold and smiled coldly at him, then used a key blade to hack away at him. Cold dodged but Zamasu grabbed him by the tail and threw him off the stage using his divine key to power himself. A purple aura started to appear around Zamasu as destroyer energy stored in himself started to surface. Vegeta scoffed at Caulifla's attacks. Even though she was talented she was an amateur fighter. Vegeta directly kicked her in the stomach, making her throw spit out of her mouth. But she got up from the stage afterward and threw herself at Vegeta again while saying, that's all you got old man? Vegeta narrowed his eyes at her toughness, then transformed directly into Super Saiyan 3. Cauliflow widened her eyes at Vegeta's sudden transformation, then her eyes started to shine while she said, This is the fabled Super Saiyan 3? So cool! Vegeta's eyes softened at her words. After all, she was a fellow Scion. His race was almost extinct so he had a soft spot for fellow pure science. He coughed a bit and continued fighting with her, of course. She was getting pummeled left and right like she was a sandbag but her power level started to adjust to Vegeta's during the beating. She shouted as electric arcs started to surround her being as she reached Super Saiyan 2. When Kale saw how hard her sis was being beaten she shouted to herself as her power level increased by a goddamn freaking lot. Her muscles started to bulge and the white of her eyes was showing indicating she was losing control. Broly eyes widened as her transformation resembled his. He transformed as well, but he could control himself. He grabbed her in a full Nelson lock, making her unable to help Caulifla. She was starting to overpower Broly, but Broly grunted and his Akari mode activated in tandem with his Super Scion form, making her unable to budge at all. Caulifla seeing her sister plight ran off from Vegeta and tried to kick Broly in the face but Broly didn't even flinch from her flimsy kick. Vegeta appeared behind her and said, Nothing personal, we are fellow Scions, so I will be more gentle. Vegeta punched her directly in the stomach with a fully key enhanced fist. Key started to appear on her back as she was thrown out the stage blood and spittle coming out of her mouth. Where was the I will be more gentle there, Vegeta? Broly grunted and knocked out Kale then threw her out of the stage as well. Even though he was interested in her, he knew that the fate of his universe was at stake. Zamasu was keeping the cold trio off by himself, while Bu and Gohan were fighting Topo off. 
Jiren was finishing the other weaker participants from Universe 6, while I was handling Hit. But Jiren suddenly appeared behind me and hit me directly into Lee's direction, saying, I still need to win this tournament, and your team has too many members remaining. Lee was ready to roundhouse kick me out of stage, but suddenly something inside my mind clicked insert ultimate battle by Akira Ushida here. I suddenly disappeared from Lee's sight and appeared behind him. Flustered, he directly transformed into his Bodhisattva mode as his skin turned gold and his eyes started glowing. However, three hits that appeared out of nowhere hit him in the chest, head, and stomach at the same time. He coughed blood and his transformation left him, then his eyes widened. You! You attained it? No, this is different. It's not enlightened Buddha instinct. Jiren narrowed his eyes and sped forward to me. His red, fiery aura encasing him as he powered up. Hit was taking advantage of this and skipped time to try and directly punch me with his assassination technique in a vital spot. But I dodged everything flawlessly, like I knew what everyone was going to do before they even knew. I smirked, but the state I was in suddenly reverted as I dodged everything. I shouted as I used my supreme bodhisattva mode instead and started fighting all three of them at the same time. Zamasu was having a hard time to fend off all of the others at the same time, but he suddenly smirked as he started shouting himself. His purple aura encased him fully as he started to buff up and his eyes turned to full purple. He started using his destruction energy blatantly as he easily threw off cooler and cold out of the stage. Frisia transformed directly into his golden form then started laughing. Ho ho ho! With Krillin-sama help, I already achieved something else besides this. His shout never stopped as his power level climbed higher and higher his skin turning from gold to platinum. His deep purple gems turned blue instead, but he grimaced inside. Even though he achieved this form, it was very draining on him. Gohan and Byu were now fighting Topo who directly transformed in his destroyer form. Gohan dodged everything he could as his Super Scion Blue transformation was in full effect while Bu wasn't fat anymore. He had a sportily built body and his face was serious. Frieza knew that he couldn't fight a protracted battle, and he threw himself at Zamasu with all he had while Zamasu shouted. How could a mortal like you achieve such power, you? You said you are that Buddha's disciple. But before he could continue his questioning, Frisia appeared directly in front of him and blasted him point-blank with his palm. A blue-white combination of a blast threw Zamasu in the air, but he didn't fly off the stage. He grabbed the stage and threw himself right back at Frisia. Frisia didn't have much gas in the tank left. He couldn't master this transformation, as he just unlocked it in the last few months of training in the chamber. He put everything he had in a punch as his transformation left him, he directly got back to his final normal form and threw himself at Zamasu. He hit him directly in the stomach, but Zamasu grabbed his arm, taking him off the stage with him. End of song, they both appeared in their respective booths. Beerus patted Frisia and the other cold family members on the back and said, You did well. It's everything left on these other guys. Goku, Vegeta, and Broly joined me, fighting back against the last three fighters left. Goku took over Hit while Vegeta and Broly ganked Lee. I started to fight Jiren seriously as I directly used my wrath state to start pummeling him, but he clenched his muscles as his shirt exploded and his power level increased, starting to rival mine in the wrath state. We punched each other in the face then in the stomach as shockwaves started to appear around us, pushing the others back from our fight. Topo was laughing maniacally as he threw a giant destruction ball at Bu. Bu tried to deflect it, but it started to engulf him. He started to disperse in different pieces of pink gum to dodge the attack, which destroyed a bit of the stage. Bu appeared behind Topo as all the pieces of gum started to restrain his extremely muscled form. Bu then told Gohan. Bu holds big guy and Gohan pushes us both out. Gohan nodded his head and formed a Kamehameha in his hands which he threw at the both of them pushing them out of the stage, 
Even though Topo struggled and almost escaped from Boo's bindings in the end, it was too late to dodge the Kamehameha. It pushed him off, with Bu in tow trenches left down below on the stage as he tried to deflect it upwards. Goku used his Kaioken directly to times 20 to end the fight with Hit, but Hit continued to adapt to his power, punching him in his vital points over and over. Suddenly Goku's transformation reverted as a strange aura started to encase him. His eyes turned silver, and his hair started to stand up. The angels and gods of destruction started to gasp as they all said in unison, A mortal is achieving. Ultra instinct. Goku appeared behind Hit as three invisible punches headed directly for Hit. They weren't invisible per se but extremely fast. They had achieved such a speed they couldn't be seen with the naked eye anymore. Hit took all the punches directly. His balance fell and Goku attacked him again, starting to push him towards the direction of the edge of the stage. Lee was fighting both Broly and Vegeta off, but he was at a disadvantage while he simultaneously was starting to chant something. Buddha says that severing the seven emotions and six desires makes you achieve enlightenment, so I shall do it. His chants became unhearable afterward as all emotions were wiped away from his face. Insert Ultra Instinct theme official version Lee immediately started dodging every attack from both Scions easily. Then his key encased punch directly threw off Vegeta from the stage. Vegeta coughed blood while he skidded on the stage. Then he flew directly in the void. Broly growled as his power level started to adapt towards Lee's. But Lee was even faster. He grabbed Broly by the neck and hit him ten times over all of his body simultaneously in his acupoints. Broly's transformation reverted and Lee started to pant. Enlightened Buddha Instinct put a high burden on the user's body just like Ultra Instinct. Without anything else happening Broly was thrown off the stage as well. Hit was overwhelmed by Goku's new power and he couldn't keep up at all. After being battered continuously, he was thrown off the stage himself. Lee appeared in front of Goku thinking that he was off guard since he took care of Hit. But both of their punches met in midair. The shockwaves rivaled the ones from Mai and Jiren's fight. I couldn't look over at their fight because all my attention was on Jiren. Goku and Lee clashed against each other as Zeno clapped his hands and said, So exciting! My friends are fighting! So exciting, Goku punched Lee in the face, while Lee punched Goku in the stomach. Both of them grabbed the hurting parts and then resumed the fight. Goku's power suddenly started to take a dip as he reverted from his Ultra Instinct Omen. Lee tried to attack him while he was weak, but he coughed a bit of blood and his power started to take a dip as well, but not as huge as Goku's. Goku started to dodge Lee's punches at a slow pace, but he was nicked from time to time, and he was almost thrown from the stage. Goku smirked as whenever he was thrown down on the stage, he planted little bombs on the stage with his key, and Lee already treaded on one. The explosion engulfed Lee as Goku charged a Kamehameha that hit Lee full on. But Lee threw a stick with a yellow end from God knows where, and he dashed towards it through the Kamehameha and roundhouse kicked Goku. Goku was on the edge of the stage, one of his hands dangling off at the limit of his powers. His brows furrowed as Lee slowly started to approach the end of the stage. His face was emotionless as he wanted to stamp on Goku's hand and throw him off the stage directly. Goku immediately smirked when Lee's feet hit Goku's hand. An explosion occurred that destroyed the remaining stage Lee was on and both of them got eliminated. Gohan and I were the only ones left on the stage, along with Jiren. As I clashed with Jiren, Gohan was resting and watching from the sidelines. I started using my peaceful state from time to time as my body's healing factor started to slow due to its overuse. I couldn't let him hit me as much as anymore, or it would be dangerous. I changed from my peaceful state to my wrathful one every time an opening came and hit him in the ribs, chest, and head. However, Jiren was extremely sturdy, as when I hit him he traded with me and hit me back. All his openings were traps. I coughed some blood, and he did as well, but we continued fighting. 
The changing from a wrathful state to a peaceful state gave me more control over the forms, and I suddenly started to combine them directly in the middle of the fight. Jiren's punch was ready to touch my jaw, but I suddenly caught it with my hand. I succeeded. The combination of switching between states and the intense fighting made me able to succeed in combining the two states consciously. Or how is it better called plot armor? Jiren shouted as he liberated his hand with a burst of red fiery key. He threw another punch at me, but I dodged it easily, then hit him three times in the chest in the same spot. His heart almost stopped there for a minute as he pumped key in his chest to restore it, but it was already too late. Gohan approached him from behind and threw a fully powered punch onto the back of his head, making him dizzy. I charged a key blast in my hands and pushed it directly into him throwing him off balance combined with his dizziness he was directly thrown off the stage. Universe 7 cheered, while all the other universes were gloomy and sad. The Grand Priest coughed a bit, then Zeno's hands started to glow. Every other universe besides Universe 7 were erased. Beerus looked till the last moment at his brother. Even though they didn't like each other that much, they were still brothers. Goku had a serious look on his face as Kaba hit and the others disappeared. Jiren had an enlightened look on his face in his last seconds, as if he grasped something about him before that he couldn't understand. Lee was of course emotionless as all of his emotions and desires were severed. He failed his objective. The Grand Priest turned to me and Gohan and said in a loud voice so that everyone else who remained heard him. Universe 7 is the winner of the Tournament of Power, and now for their reward. Out of nowhere, seven gigantic balls appeared below the stage as the Grand Priest started to speak in the language of the gods. Vegeta muttered under his breath again, something about speaking the language of the gods. The giant gold dragon appeared as the Grand Priest turned his eyes to me and said, Tell me your wish, Krillin. He had a smile on his face as he said that. I coughed a bit and said, I wish for all the destroyed universes and their inhabitants to be restored back to normal. The Grand Priest's smile never left his face as he told the wish to the dragon, whose eyes started to shine then left directly, not saying anything else. All the mortals and gods of destruction from the other universes came back into being as they looked at each other with bewilderment on their faces. They didn't know what to say, one moment they became nothingness and the next they are back. The Grand Priest informed all of them of my wish, and they looked at me with gratefulness in their gazes. Was chuckled while Beerus kept his head high. He was proud of having such a great universe. Afterward, Zeno-sama started to speak. I truly enjoyed this tournament. All of you can leave now. Then he left into a multicolored beam of light with his guards leaving the Grand Priest behind. He smiled then left as well. Everyone made it back to their own universe safely where they were asked about the tournament from the ones in the known. The Z fighters and the Kais were still talking about the fights and how they liked everything about them and how cool me and Goku were during the tournament. I smiled towards all of them as we arrived back to Earth. From now on I could relax fully. I would just train from time to time to master the combined state. From now on I could enjoy life with my family and friends without any other beings who would want to destroy the universe appear randomly. I thought that my life was going to be peaceful after so many fights and tons of training I did to continue keeping the universe peaceful, but after a few months of resting things went up in flames again. Vegeta and Goku were now fighting on Namek against a goat-like humanoid. His fur was blue, and he smiled creepily at both of them. Vegeta scoffed at him then directly transformed into his Super Saiyan form and attacked him. The goat-like fellow was immediately overwhelmed by Vegeta's quick attacks, but the goat man's smile never left his face as he grabbed Vegeta's fist and started to drain him of his power. Vegeta's transformation left him and the goat man started to power up higher and higher. Goku immediately appeared above the goat man Kamehameha in charging in his hands ready to shoot it at him but the goat man opened his mouth wide and ate the Kamehameha. Goku's eyes widened at the results. Then he transformed into his Super Saiyan Blue form. 
But the more the goat man fought, the stronger he became. The goat man chuckled and said in a sinister tone of voice, It's been a while since I moro, have had such delectable treats throw themselves at me with such ease, come more and more. Before Goku and Vegeta made their way to Namek Moro already drained some of the Namekians off their energy, of course, if he was at his weakest Goku and Vegeta might have been able to defeat him there and then, but unfortunately he got his hands on some energy. Goku and Vegeta couldn't beat Moro directly so they had to leave the planet, they got back to Earth with Goku's instant transmission. There they met with an official from the Galactic Patrol. The official gave them the information about Moro and his powers, Moro the Planet Eater was an old villain that was captured a long time ago by the Galactic Patrol. He escaped during a moment of negligence and now was on his way to gain his power from before. He was using magic to absorb others' ki so Goku and Vegeta weren't sure at all how to defeat such an opponent. This was new for the both of them. They immediately decided to confront me with the problem. I was on a long holiday with my family when Goku suddenly appeared near me. After he informed me about the things that happened, I sighed, then followed him to Moro's location. Moro still wasn't that particularly strong. After the Tournament of Power, I could use the fusion of the Wrathful State and Peaceful State for shorter durations on command, so it wasn't going to be anything hard for me to defeat Moro. I also dabbled in magic, so I was sure I could disable his ability of absorbing key. We appeared on a different planet that Moro was draining of his key as I suddenly threw myself at him. I used magic to insulate myself of other foreign keys and also infused my key with the same property to make sure he wouldn't be able to steal any of my key. The fight wasn't anything hard, the goat man was old, and his body was frail. After a few rounds of him being unable to absorb my key and with the help of Goku, the planet inhabitants were evacuated so he couldn't drain anyone else of their key. With no other batteries to charge him, Moro fell flat on his back coughing and gasping for air. I started to chant my Buddhist Sanskrit as golden words started to appear and engulf Moro directly. His soul was taken out of his body directly as his body turned into ash, and all the energy he took was returned to the planets and people he took it from. His soul was shouting out curses, but the words applied themselves to his skin and took away his ability to talk. Finally, my hand seals finished and he was taken to the cycle of reincarnation to become a better person in his next life. I sighed and left the planet, helping Goku to take all of the evacuated people back to their planet. I made sure that no one else that was linked to him escaped from the galactic prison to avoid any future troubles. Goku found an interesting guy in the galactic patrol who resembled an angel and asked him to train him in fully mastering Ultra Instinct. Vegeta started to take a different path in training, visiting planets like a nomad trying to learn from the universe. Broly visited Universe 6 from time to time due to reasons only known to himself. Other universes also started to unravel as stronger people made their way out of them. Goku Vegeta and the others had to take on other challenges which they didn't need my help with. With my help, both of my wives and children wouldn't die of old age and we could always be forever with each other. It's been a few hundred years already and things changed drastically in the universe. I was hailed as a hero and god on all of the planets while the Z fighters and my students were hailed as heroes of the universe. The evil parts of the universe were destroyed every day by the combination of the galactic patrol and the descendants of the Z fighters. I let Ryu and Marin in the world while I lived a peaceful life in the Buddha kingdom with my wives. Everything was going alright for me, I at first thought that my life as Krillin would be a hard and unforgiving one, but with my efforts and the special effects of the Dragon Balls I reached the peak of the multiverse, of course I wasn't sure if I could defeat the Grand Priest at all, but why would I? The Grand Priest's job was to protect Zeno and I had no problems with Zeno. Everything was going well and nothing was out of order. Goku appeared in the middle of the Buddha Kingdom, as he transported himself to his family kids' grandkids and all included coming in. They were followed in by Ryu and Marin, each with their kids. We were reminiscing under a Bodhi tree and for old time's sake, we decided to spar. 
I powered up fully as my combined state came into being while Goku's eyes turned a full silvery along with his hair which also arced up. We smiled towards each other and started the fight. We clashed at extremely high speeds. None of the spectators could see us at all punch for punch kick for kick shockwaves made their way around the Buddha Kingdom. I kicked Goku in the stomach while he punched me in the face and we both skidded on the hard ground of the kingdom. We started laughing as we increased the intensity of the fight. After a few weeks of fighting we finally stopped then collapsed on the ground. After we rested enough, we both hugged each other and continued reminiscing while asking each other about what we have been doing. Goku told me on how he trained with an angel from a different universe who decided to join the Galactic Patrol and how he saved the multiverse and other universes different times. He also sometimes wanted to call me to help, but he also wanted to challenge himself thus after his internal conflict was over he decided to do things by himself. As we chatted in the time realm, the Supreme Kai of Time was gasping as crystals of time were destroyed in her giant cabinet. She widened her eyes as she looked at the crystals. The demon realm was also revolting in the underworld due to some reasons unknown to her. She called over her time patrol members and put them to work, but they couldn't help with everything. So the next best thing she did was call me Goku and the others over. We accepted and took upon the job easily quelling the demon's realm rebellion. As for the time crystals, this took us more time it was the emergence of two strong demons from the demon realm that messed up the timeline. Tawa and Mira, they wanted to take energy from the timelines for a reason they didn't want to disclose. With the help of the Supreme Kai of Time, we, however, were fast enough to defeat them then put an end to their plan. With my help and the dojos that I planted all over the universe, our mortal level increased every day thus making my work easier and easier when crises appeared, it came up to a point that I wasn't needed anymore. I decided it was time to retire and I left my inheritance in the mortal world. Whoever was able to comprehend it would be summoned to the Buddha kingdom where I would impart to him my techniques so he could become the next Buddha. Since the start of everything that happened up till now, it's been hundreds of thousands of years already. I was meditating inside the temple as everything started to shake the world and universes at large start to rip into nothingness. Then one giant white hand approached me and grabbed me. All the universes were destroyed. The face of God which I never forget appeared as I was in his palm. He looked at me with an impish smile then said, You did a good job. Very entertaining work you did there. I didn't create that universe for nothing. I shook my head and looked at him. Then said, You created that universe for me? God continued, Of course. Why do you think everything went along so well for you? I just wanted to see how you will end up as your karma was so average. I wanted to see what the true you would do. I nodded my head afterward. God was omnipotent and omniscient. Didn't that mean I played in the palm of his hands from the very start? Since he could see the past and the future, it didn't matter what I did now, did it? God shook his head at my thoughts, then continued. I can see the future and the past. But that doesn't mean you can't change your future. There are countless alternate timelines out there, you know? Even though I know everything there is to know, and I can do everything that I want this power gets boring from time to time, so I restrict it, it was pretty enjoyable to see you struggle and become a type of god yourself. God seemed to have fun at my own expense, but what was I to do? God controlled everything and everyone. He could create universes only in one thought and destroy them the same. God nodded at me, then continued. You did well, very well, you gathered quite a bunch of good karma. I can give you some options now. I looked at God and didn't stop him from talking. I can now send you to heaven if you want to. You can meet all your loved ones from the past life there. What do you think? I widened my eyes as memories started to come flooding back from the past and my childhood. I was besides a bed crying my eyes out as my grandmother stood there and said to me in a weak voice, It's okay, Sonny. Cough, cough, this is an old disease of mine that resurfaced, don't blame yourself for it. It's been a few tens of years when I miraculously got through it instead of dying. It seems now my time has come. My grandfather was on her side as he was crying silently as well. My aunt and my father were crying their eyes out as well. 
My grandfather was massaging her arms in the hope that it would make her feel better. She suddenly said, Massage my other arm. Then she started to spew gibberish as her last breath left her. Her eyes widened, and her face started to turn pale at fast speeds. I kept crying continuously as the memory faded, going through the deaths of all my close relatives. I sucked in a mouthful of cold air and then nodded at God. I missed my parents and grandparents, especially my grandma. She was like a second mother to me as my mother abandoned me at a young age. Instead, Grandma took care of everything as a mother would. God nodded at me then I was directly teleported to heaven. My appearance of Krillin disappeared as I turned back to how I looked before. I was met with my parents and grandparents as we hugged each other. Tears were falling out of our eyes as we were finally reunited. Okay, I'm sure everyone here won't like the ending of this fanfiction as it was kinda anticlimactic, but... I'm kind of running out of ideas here, I wasn't sure how to end it. Thus it might end up a bit cliched for you. I'm sorry if your expectations weren't met with this chapter, and I will try to improve more in the future. Tomorrow I will start writing the first chapter of my original novel. Hopefully, you will support me through it just like you did with this one. I already know what to write, and I will take opinions and advice on how to advance the novel after the first chapter is posted. Check out the author, Kaioken Guy, to support and check more of his work. Thank you for following the story this far. See in the next one. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.